by Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen. Lo, I the man whose muse whilome did mask as time her taught in lowly shepherd's weeds, am now enforced a far unfitter task for trumpets stern to change mine oaten reeds, and sing of knights and ladies' gentle deeds, whose praises, having slept in silence long, me all too mean the sacred muse of reeds to blazon broad amongst her learned throng. Fierce wars and faithful loves shall moralize my song. Help then, O holy virgin, chief of nine, thy weaker novice to perform thy will, Lay forth out of thine everlasting scrine the antique rolls, which there lie hidden still, of fairy knights and fairest Tanaquil, whom that most noble Briton prince so long sought through the world and suffered so much ill, that I must rue his undeserved wrong. O oh, help thou my weak wit, and sharpen my dull tongue. And thou, most dreaded imp of highest Jove, fair Venus' son, that with thy cruel dart at that good knight so cunningly disdrove, that glorious fire it kindled in his heart, lay now thy deadly heaven bow apart, and with thy mother mild come to mine aid, come both, and with you bring triumphant mart in loves and gentle jollities arrayed, after his murderous spoils and bloody rage allayed. And with the meek, O goddess, heavenly bright, mirror of grace and majesty divine, great lady of the greatest isle, whose light like Phoebus' lamp throughout the world doth shine, shed thy fair beams into my feeble eyne, and raise my thoughts too humble and too vile, to think of that true glorious type of thine, the argument of mine afflicted style, the which to hear vouchsafe, O dearest dread, a while. Canto One. The patron of true holiness, foul error doth defeat, hypocrisy him to entrap, doth to his home entreat. A gentle knight was pricking on the plain, clad in mighty arms and silver shield, wherein old dints of deep wounds did remain, the cruel marks of many a bloody field. Yet arms till that time did he never wield, his angry steed did chide his foaming bit, as much disdaining to the curb to yield. Full jolly knight he seemed, and fair did sit, as one for knightly justs and fierce encounters fit. But on his breast a bloody cross he bore, the dear remembrance of his dying lord, for whose sweet sake that glorious badge he wore, and dead as living ever him adored. Upon his shield the like was also scored for sovereign hope, which in his help he had. Right faithful true he was in deed and word, but of his cheer did seem too solemn sad, yet nothing did he dread, but ever was it dread. Upon a great adventure he was bond, that greatest Gloriana to him gave, that greatest glorious queen of Fairyland, to win him worship and her grace to have which of all earthly things he most did crave, and ever as he rode his heart did earn to prove his puissance in battle brave upon his foe, and his new force to learn. Upon his foe, a dragon, horrible and stern. A lovely lady rode him fair beside, upon a lowly ass more white than snow, yet she much whiter, but the same did hide under a veil that wimpled was full low, and over all a black stole she did throw as one that inly mourned. So was she sad, and heavy sat upon her palfrey slow. Seemed in heart some hidden care she had, and by her in a line a milk-white lamb she lad. So pure and innocent as that same lamb she was in life and every virtuous lore, and by descent from royal lineage came of ancient kings and queens, that had of yore their scepters stretched from east to western shore, and all the world in their subjection held, till that infernal fiend with foul uproar for wasted all their land and them expelled, whom to avenge she had this night from far compelled. 
Behind her, far away, a dwarf did lag, that lazy seemed in being ever last, or wearied with bearing of her bag of needments at his back. Thus, as they passed, the day with clouds was sudden overcast, and angry Jove in hideous storm of rain did pour into his lemon's lap, so fast that every wight to shroud it did constrain, and this fair couple eat to shroud themselves were fain. And forced to seek some covert nigh at hand, a shady grove not far away they spied that promised aid the tempest to withstand, whose lofty trees, clad with summer's pride, did spread so broad that heaven's light did hide, not pierceable with power of any star, and all within were paths and alleys wide, with footing worn and leading inward far. Fair harbor that them seems... So in they entered are, and forth they pass with pleasure forward led, joying to hear the bird's sweet harmony, which therein shrouded from the tempest dread, seemed in their song to scorn the cruel sky. Much can they praise the trees so straight and high, the sailing pine, the cedar proud and tall, the vine-prop elm, the poplar never dry, the builder oak, sole king of forests all, the aspen good for staves, the cypress funeral, the laurel, mead of mighty conquerors and poet sage, the fir that weepeth still, the willow worn of forlorn paramours, the yew obedient to the bender's will, the birch for shafts, the sallow for the mill, the myrrh sweet bleeding in the bitter wound, the warlike beech, the ash for nothing ill. The fruitful olive and the platen round, the carver home, the maple seldom inward sound. Led with delight, they thus beguile the way until the blustering storm is overblown. When, weaning to return whence they did stray, they cannot find that path which first was shown, but wander to and fro in ways unknown, furthest from end then when they nearest wean, that makes them doubt their wits be not their own, so many paths, so many turnings seen, that which of them to take in diverse doubt they been. At last, resolving forward still to fare, till that some end they find, or in or out, that path they take that beaten seemed most bare, and like to lead the labyrinth about, which when by tract they hunted had throughout, at length it brought them to a hollow cave amid the thickest woods. The champion stout eftsoons dismounted from his courser brave, and to the dwarf a while his needless spear he gave. Be well aware, quoth then that lady mild, lest sudden mischief ye too rash provoke. The danger hid, the place unknown and wild, breeds dreadful doubts. Oft fire is without smoke, and peril without show. Therefore your strokes are night withhold till further trial made. Ah, lady, said he, shame were to revoke the forward footing, for an hidden shade. Virtue gives herself light through darkness for to wade. Yea, but, quoth she, the peril of this place I better wot than you. Though now too late to wish you back return with foul disgrace, yet wisdom warns whilst foot is in the gate to stay the step, ere forced to retreat. This is the wandering wood, this error's den, a monster vile whom God and man does hate. Therefore I read, beware. Fly, fly, quoth then the fearful dwarf, this is no place for living men. But, full of fire and greedy hardiment, the youthful knight could not for aught be stayed, but forth unto the darksome hole he went, and looked in. His glistering armor made a little glooming light much like a shade, by which he saw the ugly monster plain, half like a serpent horribly displayed, but the other half did woman shape retain, most loathsome, filthy, foul, and full of vile disdain. And as she lay upon the dirty ground, her huge long tail, her den all overspread, yet was in knots and many bots upwound, pointed with mortal sting. Of her there bred a thousand young ones, which she daily fed, sucking upon her poisonous dugs, each one of sundry shapes, yet all ill-favoured. Soon as that uncouth light upon them shone, into her mouth they crept, and sudden all were gone. Their dam up start, 
Out of her den afraid, and rushed forth, hurling her hideous tail about her cursed head, whose folds displayed were stretched now forth at length without entrail. She looked about, and seeing one in mail armed to point, sought back to turn again, for light she hated as the deadly bale, a want in desert darkness to remain, where plain none might her see, nor she see any plain which when the valiant elf perceived, he leapt as lion fierce upon the flying prey, and with his trenchant blade her boldly kept from turning back, and forced her to stay. Therewith enraged she loudly gan to bray, and turning fierce her speckled tail advanced, threatening her angry sting him to dismay, who not aghast, his mighty hand enhanced, the stroke down from her head unto her shoulder glanced. Much daunted with that dint, her sense was dazed, yet kindling rage, herself she gathered round, and all at once her beastly body raised with doubled forces high above the ground, though, wrapping up her wreathed stern around, leapt fierce upon his shield, and a huge train all suddenly about his body wound, that hand or foot to stir he strove in vain. God help the man so wrapped in error's endless train! His lady, sad to see his sore constraint, cried out, Now, now, Sir Knight, show what ye be, add faith unto your force, and be not faint. Strangle her, else she sure will strangle thee. That when he heard, in great perplexity, his gall did great for grief and high disdain, and knitting all his force, got one hand free, wherewith he gripped her gorge, with so great pain that soon to loose her wicked bands did her constrain. Therewith she spewed out of her filthy maw a flood of poison, horrible and black, full of great lumps of flesh and gobbets raw, which stunk so violently that it forced him slack his grasping hold, and from her turn him back. Her vomit full of books and papers was, with loathly frogs and toads which eyes did lack, and creeping sought way in the weedy grass. Her filthy par break all the place defiled has. As when old father Nilus skins to swell with timely pride above the Egyptian veil, his fatty waves do fertile slime outwell and overflow each plain and lowly dale. But when his later spring gins to avail, huge heaps of mud he leaves, wherein there breed ten thousand kinds of creatures, partly male and partly female of his fruitful seed, such ugly monstrous shapes elsewhere may no man read. The same so sore annoyed has the knight, that well nigh choked with the deadly stink his forces fail, ne can no longer fight, whose courage, when the fiend perceived to shrink, she poured forth out of her hellish sink her fruitful cursed spawn of serpents small, deformed monsters, foul and black as ink, which swarming all about his legs did crawl, and him encumbered sore, but could not hurt at all. As gentle shepherd in sweet eventide, when ruddy Phoebus skins to whelk in west, high on an hill his flock to view in wide marks which do bite their hasty supper best, a cloud of cumbrous gnats do him molest, all striving to infix their feeble stings, that from their noyance he nowhere can rest, but with his clownish hands their tender wings he brusheth oft, and oft doth mar their murmurings. Thus ill bestead, and fearful more of shame than of the certain peril he stood in, half furious, unto his foe he came resolved in mind all suddenly to win, or soon to lose, before he once would lin, and stroke at her with more than manly force, that from her body full of filthy sin he raft her hateful head without remorse, a stream of coal black blood forth gushed from her course. Her scattered brood, soon as their parent dear they saw so rudely falling to the ground, groaning full deadly, all with troublous fear, gathered themselves about her body round, weaning their wanted entrance to have found at her wide mouth. But being there withstood, they flocked all about her bleeding wound, and sucked up their dying mother's blood, making her death their life, and eke her hurt their good. 
that detestable sight him much amazed to see the unkindly imps of heaven accursed devour their dam, on whom while so he gazed, having all satisfied their bloody thirst, their bellies swoln he saw with fullness burst, and bowels gushing forth. Well were the end of such as drunk her life the which them nursed, now needeth him no longer labor spend, his foes have slain themselves with whom he should contend. His lady, seeing all that chanced from far, approached in haste to greet his victory, and said, Fair knight, born under happy star, who see your vanquished foes before you lie, well worthy be you of that armory wherein ye have great glory won this day, and proved your strength on a strong enemy, your first adventure. Many such, I pray, and henceforth ever wish that like succeed it may. Then mounted he upon his steed again, and with the lady backward sought to wend. That path he kept, which beaten was most plain, ne ever would to any byway bend, but still did follow one unto the end, the which at last out of the wood them brought. So forward on his way, with God to friend, he passed forth, and new adventure sought. Long way he travelled before he heard of aught. At length, they chanced to meet upon the way an aged sire in long black weeds clad, his feet all bare, his beard all hoary gray, and by his belt his book he hanging had. Sober he seemed, and very sagely sad, and to the ground his eyes were lowly bent, simple in show, and void of malice bad. And all the way he prayed as he went, and often knocked his breast as one that did repent. He fair the knight saluted, louting low, who fair him quited, as that courteous was, and after asked him if he did know of strange adventures which abroad did pass. Ah, my dear son, quoth he, how should a last silly old man that lives in hidden cell, bidding his beads all day for his trespass, tidings of war and worldly trouble tell, with holy father sits not with such things to mell? But if of danger which hereby doth dwell, and home-bred evil ye desire to hear, of a strange man I can you tidings tell, that wasteth all this country far and near. Of such, said he, I chiefly do in queer, and shall you well reward to show the place in which that wicked wight his days doth wear. For to all knighthood it is foul disgrace that such a cursed creature lives so long a space. Far hence, quoth he, in wasteful wilderness his dwelling is, by which no living wight may ever pass, but there a great distress. And now, said the lady, draweth toward night, and well I wot that of your later fight ye all for wearied be. For what so strong but wanting rest will also want of might? The sun that measures heaven all day long at night doth bait his steeds the ocean waves among, then with the sun take, sir, your timely rest, and with new day new work at once begin. Untroubled night, they say, gives counsel best. Right well, sir knight, ye have advised been, quoth then that aged man, the way to win is wisely to advise. Now day is spent, therefore with me ye may take up your inn for this same night. The knight was well content. So, with that godly father to his home they went. A little lowly hermitage it was down in a dale hard by a forest side, far from his sort of people that did pass in travel to and fro. A little wide there was an holy chapel edified, wherein the hermit duly wont to say his holy things each morn and eventide. Thereby a crystal stream did gently play, which from a sacred fountain welled forth all way. Arrived there, the little house they fill, they look for entertainment where none was. Rest is their feast, and all things at their will. The noblest mind the best contentment has. With fair discourse the evening so they pass, for that old man of pleasing words had store, and well could file his tongue as smooth as glass. He told of saints and popes, and evermore he strode an Ave Mary after and before. 
The drooping night thus creepeth on them fast, and the sad humor, loading their eyelids as messenger of Morpheus on them cast sweet slumbering dew, the which to sleep them bids. Unto their lodgings then his guests he rids, where when all drowned in deadly sleep he finds, he to his study goes, and there, amidst his magic books and arts of sundry kinds, he seeks out mighty charms to trouble sleepy minds. Then, choosing out few words most horrible, let none them read, thereof did verses frame, with which, and other spells like terrible, he bade awake black Pluto's grisly dame, and cursed heaven, and spake reproachful shame of highest God, the Lord of life and light, a bold, bad man that dared to call by name great Gorgon, prince of darkness and dead night, at which Cositus quakes and sticks is put to flight. And forth he called out of deep darkness dread legions of sprites, the which like little flies fluttering about his ever damned head, await whereto their service he applies, to aid his friends or fray his enemies. Of those he chose out two, the falsest two, and fittest for to forge true-seeming lies. The one of them he gave a message to, the other by himself stayed other work to do. He, making speedy way through spursed air and through the world of waters wide and deep, to Morpheus' house doth hastily repair, Amid the bowels of the earth full steep and low, Where dawning day doth never peep his dwelling is, There Pethys his wet bed doth ever wash, And Cynthia still doth steep in silver dew his ever-drooping head, While sad night over him her mantle black doth spread whose double gates he findeth locked fast, the one fair framed of burnished ivory, the other all with silver overcast, and wakeful dogs before them far do lie watching to banish care their enemy, who oft is one to trouble gentle sleep. By them the sprite doth pass in quietly, and unto Morpheus comes, whom drowned deep in drowsy fit he finds, of nothing he takes keep. And more to lull him in his slumber soft, A trickling stream from high rock tumbling down, And ever drizzling rain upon the loft, Mixed with a murmuring wind, Much like the sound of swarming bees, Did cast him in a swoun. No other noise, nor people's troublous cries, As still a one to gnaw the walled town, Might there be heard, But careless quiet lies, Wrapped in eternal silence, Far from enemies. The messenger approaching to him spake, but his waste words returned to him in vain. So sound he slept that naught mote him awake. Then rudely he him thrust and pushed with pain, whereat he gan to stretch. But he again shook him so hard that forced him to speak, as one then in a dream whose drier brain is tossed with troubled sights and fancies weak, he mumbled soft, but would not all his silence break. The sprite then gan more boldly him to wake, and threatened unto him the dreaded name of Hecate, whereat he gan to quake, and lifting up his lumpish head, with blame half angry asked him for what he came. Hither quoth he, me Archimagos sent, he that the stubborn sprites can wisely tame. He bids thee to him send, for his intent, a fit false dream that can delude the sleepers sent. The god obeyed, and calling forth straightway a diverse dream out of his prison dark, delivered it to him, and down did lay his heavy head devoid of careful cark, whose senses all were straight benumbed and stark. He, back returning by the ivory door, remounted up as light as cheerful lark, and on his little wings the dream he bore in haste unto his lord, where he him left afore who all this while with charms and hidden arts had made a lady of that other sprite, and framed of liquid air her tender parts, so lively and so like in all men's sight, that weaker sense it could have ravished quite. The maker's self, for all his wondrous wit, was nigh beguiled with so goodly sight. Her all in white he clad, and over it cast a black stole, most like to seem for Una fit. Now when that idle dream was to him brought, unto that elfin knight he bade him fly, where he slept soundly, void of evil thought, and with false shows abuse his fantasy, in sort as he him schooled privily. 
And that new creature, born without her due, full of the maker's guile, with usage sly, he taught to imitate that lady true, whose semblance she did carry under feigned hue. Thus well instructed, to their work they haste, and coming where the knight in slumber lay, the one upon his hardy head emplaced, and made him dream of loves and lustful play, that nigh his manly heart did melt away, bathed in wanton bliss and wicked joy. Then seemed him his lady by him lay, and to him plained how that false-winged boy her chaste heart had subdued to learn dame pleasure's toy. And she herself, of beauty sovereign queen, fair Venus, seemed unto his bed to bring her whom he waking evermore did ween to be the chastest flower that aid did spring on earthly branch, the daughter of a king, now a loose lemon to vile service bound. And eke the graces seem it all to sing hymen, your hymen dancing all around, whilst freshest flora her with ivy garland crowned. In this great passion of unwanted lust, or wanted fear, of doing aught amiss, he started up, as seeming to mistrust some secret ill, or hidden foe of his. Lo, there before his face his lady is, under black stole hiding her baited hook, and, as half blushing, offered him to kiss, with gentle blandishment and lovely look, most like that virgin true which for her knight him took. All clean dismayed to see so uncouth sight, and half enraged at her shameless guise, he thought of slain her in his fierce despite, but hasty heat tempering with sufferance wise, he stayed his hand, and gan himself advise to prove his sense, and tempt her feigned truth. Wringing her hands in women's piteous wise, though can she weep to stir up gentle ruth, both for her noble blood and for her tender youth, and said, Ah, sir, my liege lord and my love, shall I accuse the hidden cruel fate and mighty causes wrought in heaven above, or the blind god that doth me thus amate, for hoped love to win me certain hate? Yet thus perforce he bids me do or die, die is my due. Yet rue my wretched state, you whom my hard avenging destiny hath made judge of my life and death indifferently. Your own dear sake forced me at first to leave my father's kingdom. There she stopped with tears. Her swollen heart, her speech seemed to bereave, and then again begun. My weaker years, captived to fortune and frail worldly fears, fly to your faith for succor and sure aid. Let me not die in languor and long tears. Why, dame, quoth he, what hath thee thus dismayed? What phrase ye, that were wont to comfort me afraid? Love of yourself, she said, and a dear constraint lets me not sleep, but waste the weary night in secret anguish and unpitied plaint, whilst you in careless sleep are drowned quite. Her doubtful words made that redoubted knight suspect her truth, Yet, since no untruth he knew, her fawning love with foul, disdainful spite he would not shen, but said, Dear dame, I rue that for my sake, unknown, such grief unto you grew. Assure yourself it fell not all to ground, for all so dear as life is to my heart I deem your love, and hold me to you bound. Now let vain fears procure your needless smart where cause is none, but do your rest depart. Not all content, yet seemed she to appease her mournful plaints, beguiled of her art, and fed with words that could not choose but please. So sliding softly forth she turned as to her ease. Long after lay he musing at her mood, much grieved to think that gentle dame so light for whose defence he was to shed his blood. At last, dull weariness of former fight, having a rock to sleep his irksome sprite, that troublous dream can freshly toss his brain with bowers and beds and ladies' dear delight. But when he saw his labor all was vain, with that misformed sprite he back returned again. The guileful great enchanter parts the Red Cross Knight from truth, into whose stead fair falsehood steps and works him woeful ruth. By this the northern wagoner had set his sevenfold team behind the steadfast star that was in ocean waves yet never wet, but firm as fixed, and sendeth light from far to all that in the wide deep wandering are, and cheerful Chanticleer, 
With his note, Shrill had warned at once that Phoebus' fiery car in haste was climbing up the eastern hill, full envious that night so long his room did fill. When those accursed messengers of hell, that feigning dream and that fair forged sprite, came to their wicked maester, and gan tell their bootless pains and ill-succeeding night, who all in rage to see his skilful might deluded so gan threaten hellish pain and sad preserpent's wrath than to affright. But when he saw his threatening was but vain, he cast about and searched his baleful books again. Eftsoons he took that miscreated fair, and that false other sprite on whom he spread a seeming body of the subtle air, like a young squire, in love's and lusty head his wanton days that ever loosely led, without regard of arms and dreaded fight. Those two he took, and in a secret bed, covered with darkness and misdeeming night, them both together laid, to joy in vain delight. Forthwith he runs with feigned faithful haste unto his guest, who after troublous sights and dreams gan now to take more sound repast, whom suddenly he wakes with fearful frights as one aghast with fiends or damned sprites, and to him calls, Rise, rise, unhappy swain, that here wax old in sleep while wicked whites have knit themselves in Venus' shameful chain. Come see where your false lady doth her honour stain. All in amaze he suddenly upstart with sword in hand, and with the old man went, who soon him brought into a secret part, where that false couple were full closely meant in wanton lust and lewd embracement, which when he saw he burnt with jealous fire, the eye of reason was with rage ablent, and would have slain them in his furious ire, but hardly was restrained of that aged sire. Returning to his bed in torment great, and bitter anguish of his guilty sight, he could not rest, but did his stout heart eat and waste his inward gall with deep despite, irksome of life and too long lingering night. At last fair Hesperus in highest sky had spent his lamp and brought forth dawning light. Then up he rose and clad him hastily. The dwarf him brought his steed, so both away do fly. Now when the rosy-fingered morning fair, weary of aged Tython's saffron bed, had spread her purple robe through dewy air, and the high hills Titan discovered, the royal virgin shook off drowsy head, and rising forth out of her baser bower, looked for her knight, who far away was fled, and for her dwarf that went to wait each hour. Then gan she wail and weep to see that woeful stour and after him she rode with so much speed as her slow beast could make, but all in vain, for him so far had borne his light-foot steed, pricked with wrath and fiery fierce disdain, that him to follow was but fruitless pain. Yet she her weary limbs would never rest, but every hill and dale each wood and plain did search, sore grieved in her gentle breast, he so ungently left her whom she loved best. But subtle Archimago, when his guests he saw divided into double parts, and Una wandering in woods and forests, then of his drift, he praised his devilish arts that had such might over true meaning hearts. Yet rests not so, but other means doth make how he may work unto her further smarts. For her he hated as the hissing snake, and in her many troubles did most pleasure take. He then devised himself how to disguise, for by his magic science he could take as many forms and shapes in seeming wise as ever Proteus to himself could make, sometime a fowl, sometime a fish in lake, now like a fox, now like a dragon fell, that of himself he oft for fear would quake, and oft would fly away. Oh, who can tell the hidden power of herbs, and might of magic spell? But now seemed best the person to put on of that good knight his late beguiled guest. In mighty arms he was a in on, and silver shield. Upon his coward breast a bloody cross, and on his craven crest a bunch of hairs discoloured diversely. Full jolly knight he seemed, and well addressed, and, when he sate upon his courser free, St. George himself he would have deemed him to be. But he, the knight whose semblant he did bear, the true St. George, was wandered far away, still flying from his thoughts and jealous fear. Will was his guide, and grief led him astray. 
At last him chanced to meet upon the way a faithless Saracen, all armed to point, in whose great shield was writ with letters gay sans foy. Full large of limb and every joint he was, and carried not for God or man a point. He had a fair companion of his way, a goodly lady clad in scarlet red, purfled with gold and pearl of rich assay, and like a Persian mitre on her head she wore, with crowns and ouches garnished, the which her lavish lovers to her gave. Her wanton palfrey all was overspread with tinsel trappings, woven like a wave, whose bridle rung with golden bells and bosses brave. With fair disport and courting dalliance, she entertained her lover all the way, but when she saw the knight his spear advance, she soon left off her mirth and wanton play, and bade her knight address him to the fray. His foe was nigh at hand. He pricked with pride and hoped to win his lady's heart that day, forth spurred fast. Adown his courser's side the red blood trickling stained the way as he did ride. The knight of the red cross, when him he spied spurring so hot with rage despiteous, gan fairly couch his spear and towards ride. Soon meet they both, both fell and furious, that daunted with their forces hideous, their steeds do stagger and amazed stand, and eke themselves too rudely rigorous, astonied with the stroke of their own hand, do back rebut, and each to other yieldeth land. As when two rams, stirred with ambitious pride, fight for the rule of the rich fleeced flock, their horned front so fierce on either side do meet, that with the terror of the shot astonished, both stand senseless as a block forgetful of the hanging victory. So stood these twain, unmoved as a rock, both staring fierce, and holding idly the broken relics of their former cruelty. The Saracen, sore daunted with the buff, snatcheth his sword, and fiercely to him flies, who well it wards, and quiteth cuff with cuff. Each other's equal puissance envies, and through their iron sides, with cruel spies, does seek to pierce. Repining courage yields no foot to foe. The flashing fire flies as from a forge out of their burning shields, and streams of purple blood new dyes the verdant fields. Curse on that cross! quoth then the Saracen, that keeps thy body from the bitter fit. Dead long ago I what thou hadst been, had not that charm from thee forewarned it. But yet I warn thee now, assured sit, and hide thy head. Therewith upon his crest, with rigor so outrageous he smit, that a large share he hewed out of the rest, and glancing down his shield from blame him fairly blessed. Who thereat wondrous wroth, the sleeping spark of native virtue, Ganeft soons revive, and at his haughty helmet making mark so hugely stroke, that it the steel did rive and cleft his head. He, tumbling down alive, with bloody mouth his mother earth did kiss, greeting his grave. His grudging ghost did strive with the frail flesh. At last it flitted is, whither the souls do fly of men that live amiss. The lady, when she saw her champion fall, like the old ruins of a broken tower, stayed not to wail his woeful funeral, but from him fled away with all her power, who after her as hastily gan scour, bidding the dwarf with him to bring away the Saracen's shield, sign of the conqueror. Her soon he overtook, and bade to stay, for present cause was none of dread her to dismay. She, turning back with rueful countenance, cried, Mercy, mercy, sir, vouchsafe to show on silly dame, subject to hard mischance and to your mighty will. Her humblest low, in so rich weeds and seeming glorious show, did much enmove his stout heroic heart, and said, Dear dame, your sudden overthrow much rueth me, but now put fear apart, and tell both who ye be, and who that took your part. Melting in tears, then gan she thus lament, the wretched woman, whom unhappy hour hath now made thrall to your commandment, before that angry heaven's list to lower, and fortune false betrayed me to your power, was, oh, what now availeth that I was? Born the sole daughter of an emperor, he that the wide west under his rule has, and high hath set his throne where Tiberus doth pass. He, in the first flower of my freshest age, betrothed me unto the only heir of a most mighty king, most rich and sage, was never prince so faithful and so fair, was never prince so meek and debonair. 
But ere my hope a day of spousal shone, my dearest lord fell from high honour's stare into the hands of his accursed phone, and cruelly was slain, that shall I ever moan. His blessed body, spoiled of lively breath, was afterward, I know not how, conveyed and from me hid, of whose most innocent death, when tidings came to me, unhappy maid, oh, how great sorrow my sad soul essayed. Then forth I went his woeful course to find, and many years throughout the world I strayed, a virgin widow, whose deep wounded mind with love long time did languish as the stricken hind. At last it chanced this proud Sarazen to meet me wandering, who perforce me led with him away, but yet could never win that fort that ladies hold in sovereign dread. There lies he now with foul dishonour dead, who, whiles he lived, was called Proud Sans Foy, the eldest of three brethren, all three bred of one bad sire, whose youngest is Sans Joy, and twixt them both was born the bloody bold Sans Loy. In this sad plight, friendless, unfortunate, now miserable I, Fidessa, dwell, craving of you, in pity of my state, to do none ill if please ye not do well. He in great passion all this while did dwell, more busying his quick eyes, her face to view, than his dull ears to hear what she did tell, and said, Fair lady, heart of flint would rue the undeserved woes and sorrows which ye shew. Henceforth in safe assurance may ye rest, having both found a new friend you to aid, and lost an old foe that did you molest. Better new friend than an old foe, is said. With change of cheer the seeming simple maid let fall her eyne as shamefast to the earth, and, yielding soft, in that she not gainsaid, so forth they rode, he feigning seemly mirth, and she coy looks. So dainty, they say, maketh dearth. Long time they thus together travelled, till weary of their way they came at last, where grew two goodly trees, that fair did spread their arms abroad with grey moss overcast, and their green leaves, trembling with every blast, made a calm shadow far in compass round. The fearful shepherd, often there aghast under them, never sat, ne want there sound his merry oaten pipe, but shunned the unlucky ground. But this good knight, soon as he them can spy, for the cool shade him thither hastily got, for golden Phoebus, now mounted high, from fiery wheels of his fair chariot hurled his beam so scorching cruel hot, that living creature mote it not abide, and his new lady it endure it not. There they alight in hope themselves to hide from the fierce heat, and rest their weary limbs atide. Fair seemly pleasance each to other makes, with goodly purposes there as they sit, and in his falsed fancy he her takes to be the fairest white that lived yet, which to express he bends his gentle wit, and thinking of those branches green to frame a girland for her dainty forehead fit, he plucked a bough, out of whose rift there came small drops of gory blood that trickled down the same. Therewith a piteous yelling voice was heard crying, O oh, spare with guilty hands to tear my tender sides in this rough rind embarred, but fly, ah, fly far hence away, for fear lest to you hap what happened to me here, and to this wretched lady, my dear love. O oh, too dear love, love bought with death too dear. Astonned he stood, and up his hair did hove, and with that sudden horror could no member move. At last, when as the dreadful passion was overpast, and manhood well awake, yet musing at the strange occasion, and doubting much his sense, he thus bespake, What voice of damned ghost from limbo lake, or guileful sprite wandering in empty air, both which frail men do oftentimes mistake, sends to my doubtful ears these speeches rare, and rueful plaints me bidding guiltless blood to spare? Then, groaning deep, Nor damned ghost, quoth he, Nor guileful sprite to thee these words doth speak, But once a man, fra dubio, Now a tree, wretched man, 
wretched tree, whose nature weak, a cruel witch, her cursed will to wreak, hath thus transformed, and placed in open plains, where Boreas doth blow full bitter bleak, and scorching sun does dry my secret veins. For though a tree I seem, yet cold and heat me pains. Say on, for Dubio then, or man or tree, quoth then the knight, by whose mischievous arts art thou misshaped thus, as now I see? He oft finds medicine, who his grief imparts, but double griefs afflict concealing hearts, as raging flames who striveth to suppress. The author, then, said he, of all my smarts is one duessa, a false sorceress that many errant knights hath brought to wretchedness. In prime of youthly years, when courage hot, the fire of love and joy of chivalry first kindled in my breast, it was my lot to love this gentle lady whom ye see now not a lady but a seeming tree, with whom, as once I rode accompanied, me chanced of a knight encountered be that had a like fair lady by his side, like a fair lady but did foul duessa hide, whose forged beauty he did take in hand all other dames to have exceeded far, I in defense of mine did likewise stand, mine that did then shine as the morning star, so both to battle fierce arranged are, in which his harder fortune was to fall under my spear. Such is the die of war. His lady, left as a prize martial, did yield her comely person to be at my call. So doubly loved of ladies, unlike fair, the one seeming such, the other such indeed, one day, in doubt, I cast forth to compare whether in beauty's glory did exceed. A rosy girland was the victor's mead. Both seemed to win, and both seemed one to be. So hard the discord was to be agreed. Frylissa was as fair as fair mote be, and ever false Duessa seemed as fair as she. The wicked witch, now seeing all this while the doubtful balance equally to sway, what not by right she cast to win by guile, and by her hellish science raised straightway a foggy mist that overcast the day, and a dull blast that breathing on her face dimmed her former beauty's shining ray, and with foul ugly form did her disgrace. Then was she fair alone, when none was fair in place. Then cried she out, Fie, fie, deformed white, whose borrowed beauty now appeareth plain to have before bewitched all men's sight. Oh, leave her soon, or let her soon be slain. Her loathly visage viewing with disdain, eftsoons I thought her such as she me told, and would have killed her. But with feigned pain the false witch did my wrathful hand withhold. So left her, where she now is turned to tree and mould. Thenceforth I took Duessa for my dame, and in the witch, unweeting, joyed long time, nay ever wist but that she was the same, till on a day, that day is every prime, when witches want do penance for their crime, I chanced to see her in her proper hue, bathing herself in Oregon and time. A filthy, foul old woman I did view, that ever to have touched her I did deadly rue. Her nether parts, misshapen, monstrous, were hid in water that I could not see, but they did seem more foul and hideous than woman's shape man would believe to be. Thenceforth from her most beastly company I gan refrain, in mind to slip away, soon as appeared safe opportunity, for danger great, if not assured, decay I saw before mine eyes, if I were known to stray. The devilish hag, by changes of my cheer, perceived my thought and drowned in sleepy night with wicked herbs and ointments did besmear my body all through charms and magic might that all my senses were bereaved quite. Then brought she me into this desert waste, and by my wretched lover's side me pite, where now, enclosed in wooden walls full fast, banished from living whites, our weary days we waste. But how long time, said then the elfin knight, are you in this misformed house to dwell? We may not change, quoth he, this evil plight, till we be bathed in a living well. That is the term prescribed by the spell. 
Oh, how, said he, mote I that well out find that may restore you to your wanted well. Time and sufficed fates to former kind shall us restore. None else from hence may us unbind. The false Jewessa, now Fidessa hight, heard how in vain for Dubio did lament, and knew well all was true. But the good knight, full of sad fear and ghastly dreariment, when all this speech the living tree had spent, the bleeding bough did thrust into the ground, that from the blood he might be innocent, and with fresh clay did close the wooden wound. Then, turning to his lady, dead with fear her found. Her seeming dead he found with feigned fear, as all unweeting of that well she knew and pained himself with busy care to rear her out of careless swoun. Her eyelids blue and dimmed sight, with pale and deadly hue at last she up gan lift. With trembling cheer her up he took, too simple and too true, and oft her kissed. At length, all passed fear, he set her on her steed, and forward forth did bear. Forsaken truth long seeks her love, and makes the lion mild, Mars blind devotion's mart, and falls in hand of lecher viled. Naught is there under heaven's wide hollowness that moves more dear compassion of mind than beauty brought to unworthy wretchedness through envy's snares or fortune's freaks unkind. I, whether lately through her brightness blind, or through allegiance and fast fealty, which I do owe unto all womankind, feel my heart pierced with so great agony when such I see, that all for pity I could die. And now it is impassioned so deep for fairest Una's sake, of whom I sing, that my frail eyes these lines with tears do steep to think how she through guileful handling, though true as touch, though daughter of a king, though fair as ever living white was fair, though nor in word nor deed ill-meriting, is from her night divorced in despair, and her due loves derived to that vile witch's share. Yet she, most faithful lady, all this while forsaken, woeful, solitary maid, far from all people's press, as in exile, in wilderness and wasteful desert strayed, to seek a knight who, subtly betrayed, through that late vision which the enchanter wrought, had her abandoned. She, of naught afraid, through woods and wasteness wide him daily sought, yet wished tidings none of him unto her brought. One day, nigh weary of the irksome way, from her unhasty beast she did alight, and on the grass her dainty limbs did lay, in secret shadow, far from all men's sight. From her fair head her fillet she undight, and laid her stole aside. Her angel's face, as the great eye of heaven shined bright, and made a sunshine in the shady place. Did never mortal eye behold such heavenly grace. It fortuned, out of the thickest wood a ramping lion rushed suddenly, hunting full greedy after savage blood. Soon as the royal virgin he did spy, with gaping mouth at her ran greedily, to have at once devoured her tender course. But to the prey, when as he drew more nigh, his bloody rage assuaged with remorse, and with the sight amazed, forgot his furious force. Instead thereof, he kissed her weary feet, and licked her lily hands with fawning tongue, as he her wronged innocence did weet. Oh, how can beauty maester the most strong, and simple truth subdue avenging wrong? Whose yielded pride and proud submission, still dreading death when she had marked long, her heart gan melt in great compassion, and drizzling tears did shed for pure affection. The lion, lord of every beast in field, quoth she, his princely puissance doth abate, and mighty proud to humble weak does yield, forgetful of the hungry rage which late him pricked, in pity of my sad estate. But he, my lion, and my noble lord, how does he find in cruel heart to hate her that him loved, and ever most adored as the god of my life? Why hath he me abhorred? Redounding tears did choke the end of her plaint, which softly echoed from the neighbor wood. 
And sad to see her sorrowful constraint, the kingly beast upon her gazing stood. With pity calmed, down fell his angry mood. At last, in close heart shutting up her pain, arose the virgin born of heavenly brood, and to her snowy palfrey got again, to seek her strayed champion if she might attain. The lion would not leave her desolate, but with her went along, as a strong guard of her chaste person, and a faithful mate of her sad troubles and misfortunes hard. Still when she slept, he kept both watch and ward, and when she waked, he waited diligent, with humble service to her will prepared. From her fair eyes he took commandment, and ever by her looks conceived her intent. Long she thus travelled through deserts wide, by which she thought her wandering night should pass. Yet never show of living white espied, till that at length she found the trodden grass in which the tract of people's footing was, under the steep foot of a mountain hoar. The same she follows, till at last she has a damsel spied slow footing her before, that on her shoulders sad a pot of water bore. To whom approaching, she to her again call, to weet if dwelling place were nigh at hand. But the rude wench her answered not at all, she could not hear, nor speak, nor understand. Till seeing by her side the lion stand, with sudden fear her pitcher down she threw and fled away. For never in that land face of fair lady she before did view, and that dread lion's look her cast in deadly hue. Full fast she fled, ne ever looked behind, as if her life upon the wager lay, and home she came, whereas her mother blind sate in eternal night. Naught could she say, but sudden catching hold did her dismay with quaking hands and other signs of fear. Who, full of ghastly fright and cold affray, gan shut the door. By this arrived there Dame Una, weary dame, and entrance did requeer which, when none yielded, her unruly page with his rude claws the wicket open rent, and let her in, where, of his cruel rage nigh dead with fear and faint astonishment, she found them both in darksome corner pent, where that old woman day and night did pray upon her beads, devoutly penitent, nine hundred paternosters every day, and thrice nine hundred aves, she was wont to say, and to augment her painful penance more, Thrice every week in ashes she did sit, and next her wrinkled skin rough sackcloth wore, and thrice three times did fast from any bit. But now for fear her beat she did forget, whose needless dread for to remove away fair Una framed words and countenance fit, which hardly done, at length she gan them pray that in their cottage small that night she rest her may. The day is spent, and cometh drowsy night, when every creature shrouded is in sleep. Sad Una, down her lays in weary plight, and at her feet the lion watch doth keep. Instead of rest, she does lament and weep for the late loss of her dear loved night, and sighs and groans, and evermore does steep her tender breast in bitter tears all night. All night she thinks too long, and often looks for light. Now when Aldebaran was mounted high above the shiny Cassiopeia's chair, and all in deadly sleep did drowned lie, one knocked at the door, and in would fare. He knocked fast, and often cursed and swear that ready entrance was not at his call, for on his back a heavy load he bare of nightly stealths and pillage several, which he had got abroad by purchase criminal. He was, to wit, a stout and sturdy thief, one to rob churches of their ornaments, and poor men's boxes of their due relief, which given was to them for good intents. The holy saints of their rich vestments he did disrobe, when all men careless slept, and spoiled the priests of their habiliments, whilst none the holy things in safety kept. Then he by cunning slights in at the window crept. And all that he by right or wrong could find, unto this house he brought, and did bestow upon the daughter of this woman blind, Abessa, daughter of Cochicha Slow. 
with whom he hoard amused, that few did know, and fed her fat with feast of offerings, and plenty which in all the land did grow, nisperity to give her gold and rings, and now he to her brought part of his stolen things. Thus long the door with rage and threats he bet, yet of those fearful women none durst rise, the lion frayed them, him in to let. He would no longer stay him to advise, but open breaks the door in furious wise, and entering is, when that disdainful beast, encountering fierce him sudden doth surprise, and seizing cruel claws on trembling breast, under his lordly foot him proudly hath suppressed. Him booteth not resist, nor succor call, his bleeding heart is in the venger's hand, who straight him rent in thousand pieces small, and quite dismembered hath. The thirsty land drunk up his life, his course left on the strand. His fearful friends wear out the woeful night, ne dare to weep, nor seem to understand the heavy hap which on them is a light, afraid lest to themselves the like mishappen might. Now, when broad day the world discovered has, up Una rose, up rose the lion eke, and on their former journey forward pass, in ways unknown her wandering night to seek, with pains far passing that long wandering Greek, that for his love refused deity. Such were the labors of this lady meek, still seeking him that from her still did fly, then furthest from her hope, when most she weaned nigh. Soon as she parted thence, the fearful twain, that blind old woman and her daughter dear, came forth, and finding Kirkrapine there slain, for anguish great they gan to rend their hair, and beat their breasts, and naked flesh to tear. And when they both had wept and wailed their fill, then forth they ran like two amazed deer, half mad through malice and revenging will, to follow her that was the causer of their ill whom overtaking they gan loudly bray, with hollow howling and lamenting cry, shamefully at her railing all the way, and her accusing of dishonesty, that was the flower of faith and chastity. And still amidst her railing she did pray that plagues and mischiefs and long misery might fall on her, and follow all the way, and that in endless error she might ever stray. But when she saw her prayers not prevail, she back returned with some labor lost, and in the way, as she did weep and wail, a knight her met in mighty arms embossed. Yet knight was not for all his bragging boast, but subtle Archimob, that Una sought by trains into new troubles to have tossed. Of that old woman tidings he besought, if that of such a lady she could tell a not. Therewith she gan her passion to renew, and cry, and curse, and rail, and rend her hair, saying that harlot she too lately knew, that caused her shed so many a bitter tear, and so forth told the story of her fear. Much seemed he to moan her hapless chance, and after for that lady did inquire, which being taught, he forward gan advance his fair enchanted steed, and eke his charmed lance. Ere long he came where Una travelled slow, and that wild champion waiting her beside, whom seeing such, for dread, he durst not show himself too nigh at hand, but turned wide unto an hill, from whence, when she him spied, by his like-seeming shield, her knight, by name she weaned it was, and towards him gan ride. Approaching nigh, she wist it was the same, and with fair fearful humblest towards him she came, and weeping said, Ah, oh, my long-lacked lord, where have ye been thus long out of my sight? Much feared I to have been quite abhorred, or aught have done that ye displease in might. That should as death unto my dear heart light, for since mine eye your joyous sight did miss, my cheerful day is turned to cheerless night, and eke my night of death the shadow is. But welcome now my light and shining lamp of bliss. He thereto, meeting, said, My dearest dame, far be it from your thought and from my will to think that knighthood I so much should shame as you to leave, that have me loved still, and chose in very court of mere good will, where noblest knights were to be found on earth. The earth shall sooner leave her kindly skill to bring forth fruit, and make eternal dearth, than I leave you, my leaf, born of heavenly birth. 
and, sooth to say, why I left you so long was for to seek adventure in strange place, where Archimago said a felon strong to many knights did daily work disgrace. But knight he now shall never more disface, good cause of mine excuse, that mote ye please well to accept and evermore embrace my faithful service, that by land and seas have vowed you to defend. Now then your plaint appease. His lovely words her seemed you recompense of all her passed pains. One loving hour for many years of sorrow can dispense. A dram of sweet is worth a pound of sour. She has forgot how many a woeful stour for him she late endured. She speaks no more of past. True is that true love hath no power to look and back. His eyes be fixed before. Before her stands a knight for whom she toiled so sore. Much like as when the beaten marinere that long hath wandered in the ocean wide, oft soused in swelling tethys saltish tear, and long time having tanned his tawny hide with blustering breath of heaven that none can bide, and scorching flames of fierce Orion's hound, Soon as the port from far he has espied, his cheerful whistle merrily doth sound, and Nereus crowns with cups, his mates him pledge around. Such joy made Una when her knight she found, and eke the enchanter joyous seemed no less than the glad marchant that does view from ground his ship, far come from watery wilderness. He hurls out vows, and Neptune oft doth bless. So forth they passed and all the way they spent discoursing of her dreadful late distress, in which he asked her what the lion meant, who told her all that fell in journey as she went. They had not ridden far, when they might see one pricking towards them with hasty heat, full strongly armed, and on a courser free, that through his fierceness foamed all with sweat, and the sharp iron did for anger eat, when his hot rider spurred his chafed side, his look was stern, and seemed still to threat cruel revenge, which he in heart did hide, and on his shield sans loy in bloody lines was dyed. When nigh he drew unto this gentle pair, and saw the red cross which the knight did bear, he burnt in fire, and gan eftsoons prepare himself to battle with his couched spear. Loath was that other, and did faint through fear to taste than try a dint of deadly steel. But yet his lady did so well him cheer, that hope of new good hap he gan to feel, so bent his spear and spurred his horse with iron heel. But that proud pain him forward came so fierce and full of wrath, that with his sharp-head spear, through vainly crossed shield, he did quite pierce, and had his staggering steed not shrunk for fear, through shield and body eke he should him bear. Yet so great was the puissance of his push, that from his saddle quite he did him bear. He, tumbling rudely down, to ground did rush, and from his gored wound a well of blood did gush. Dismounting lightly from his lofty steed, he to him leapt in mind to reave his life, and proudly said, Lo, there the worthy meed of him that slew Sans Foy with bloody knife. Henceforth his ghost, freed from repining strife in peace, may pass an over Lethe Lake, when morning altars purged with enemies' life, the black infernal furies done a slake. Life from Sans Foy thou took'st, Sans Loy shall from thee take. Therewith in haste his helmet gan unlace, till Una cried, O oh, hold that heavy hand, dear sir, whatever that thou be in place. Enough is that thy foe doth vanquished stand now at thy mercy. Mercy notwithstand, for he is one the truest knight alive, though conquered now he lie on lowly land, and whilst him fortune favoured, fair did thrive in bloody field. Therefore of life him not deprive. Her piteous words might not abate his rage, but rudely rending up his helmet would have slain him straight. But when he sees his age and hoary head of Archimago old, his hasty hand he doth amazed hold, and half ashamed wondered at the sight. For that old man well knew he, though untold, in charms and magic to have wondrous might, ne ever want in field, ne in round lists to fight, 
and said, Why, Archimago, luckless sire, what do I see? What hard mishap is this that hath thee hither brought to taste mine ire? Or thine the fault, or mine the error is, instead of foe to wound my friend amiss? He answered not, but in a trance still lay, and on those guileful dazed eyes of his the cloud of death did sit, which done away he left him lying so, nay would no longer stay. But to the virgin comes, who all this while amazed stands, herself so mocked to see by him who has the guerdon of his guile, for so misfeigning her true knight to be. Yet is she now in more perplexity left in the hand of that same pain embold, from whom her booteth not at all to fly, who by her cleanly garment, catching hold, her from her palfrey plucked her visage to behold. But her fierce servant, full of kingly awe and high disdain, when as his sovereign dame so rudely handled by her foe he saw, with gaping jaws full greedy at him came, and ramping on his shield did ween the same have reft away with his sharp rending claws. But he was stout, and lust did now inflame his courage more, that from his griping paws he hath his shield redeemed, and forth his sword he draws. Oh, then too weak and feeble was the force of savage beast, his puissance to withstand. For he was strong, and of so mighty course, as ever wielded spear in warlike hand, and feats of arms did wisely understand. Eftsoons he pierced through his chafed chest with thrilling point of deadly iron brand, and launched his lordly heart. With death oppressed, he roared aloud, whiles life forsook his stubborn breast. Who now is left to keep the forlorn maid from raging spoil of lawless victor's will? Her faithful guard removed, her hope dismayed, herself a yielded prey to save or spill. He now, lord of the field, his pride to fill, with foul reproaches and disdainful spite her vildly entertains, and will or nil bears her away upon his coarser light. Her prayers not prevail, his rage is more of might. And all the way, with great lamenting pain and piteous plaints, she filleth his dull ears, that stony heart could riven have in twain, and all the way she wets with flowing tears. But he, enraged with rancor, nothing hears. Her servile beast, yet would not leave her so, but follows her far off, nay aught he fears to be partaker of her wandering woe more mild in beastly kind than that her beastly foe. To sinful house of pride Duessa guides the faithful knight, where brother's death to wreak, sans joy doth challenge him to fight. Young knight whatever that dost arms profess, and through long labours huntest after fame, beware of fraud, beware of fickleness, in choice and change, of thy dear loved dame, lest thou of her believe too lightly blame, and rash misweening do thy heart remove. For unto night there is no greater shame than lightness and inconstancy in love. That doth this Red Cross Knight's example plainly prove. Who, after that he had fair Una lorn, through light misdeeming of her loyalty, and false Duessa in her stead had borne, called Fides, and so supposed to be, Long with her travelled, till at last they see a goodly building, bravely garnished, the house of mighty prince it seemed to be, and towards it a broad highway that led, all bare through people's feet which thither travelled. Great troops of people travelled thitherward, both day and night, of each degree and place, but few returned, having scaped hard with baleful beggary or foul disgrace, which ever after in most wretched case like loathsome lazars by the hedges lay. Thether Duessa bade him bend his pace, for she is weary of the toilsome way, and also nigh consumed is the lingering day. A stately palace built of squared brick, which cunningly was without mortar laid, whose walls were high but nothing strong nor thick, and golden foil all over them displayed that purest sky with brightness they dismayed. 
high lifted up were many lofty towers and goodly galleries far overlaid, full of fair windows and delightful bowers, and on the top a dial told the timely hours. It was a goodly heap for to behold, and spake the praises of the workman's wit, but full great pity that so fair a mould did on so weak foundation ever sit. For on a sandy hill that still did flit and fall away, it mounted was full high, that every breath of heaven shaked it. And all the hinder parts that few could spy were ruinous and old, but painted cunningly. Arrived there, they passed in forthright, for still to all the gates stood open wide, yet charge of them was to a porter height called Malvenu who entrance none denied. Thence to the hall, which was on every side with rich array and costly aristite, infinite sorts of people did abide there waiting long to win the wished sight of her that was the lady of that palace bright. By them they pass, all gazing on them round, and to the presence mount, whose glorious view their frail amazed senses did confound. In living prince's court, none ever knew such endless riches and so sumptuous you. Ne Persia self, the nurse of pompous pride, like ever saw. And there a noble crew of lords and ladies stood on every side, which with their presence fair the place much beautified. High above all a cloth of state was spread, and a rich throne as bright as sunny day, on which there sate, most brave, embellished with royal robes and gorgeous array, a maiden queen that shone as Titan's ray, in glistering gold and peerless precious stone. Yet her bright blazing beauty did essay to dim the brightness of her glorious throne, as envying herself that too exceeding shone. Exceeding shone like Phoebus' fairest child, that did presume his father's fiery wane, and flaming mouths of steeds unwanted wild through highest heaven, with weaker hand to reign. Proud of such glory and advancement vain, while flashing beams do daze his feeble line, he leaves the welkin way most beaten plain, and wrapped with whirling wheels in flames the skine with fire not made to burn, but fairly for to shine. So proud she shined in her princely state, looking to heaven, for earth she did disdain, and sitting high, for lowly she did hate. Lo, underneath her scornful feet was lain a dreadful dragon with an hideous train, and in her hand she held a mirror bright, wherein her face she often viewed fain, and in her self-loved semblance took delight. For she was wondrous fair as any living wight. Of grisly Pluto she the daughter was, And sad Proserpina the queen of hell. Yet did she think her peerless worth To pass that parentage, With pride so did she swell, And thundering Jove that high in heaven doth dwell And wield the world she claimed for her sire, Or if that any else did Jove excel. For to the highest she did still aspire, Or, if aught higher were than that, did it desire. And proud Lucifera men did her call, That made herself a queen, and crowned to be, Yet rightful kingdom she had none at all, The heritage of native sovereignty, But did usurp with wrong and tyranny Upon the scepter which she now did hold, Ne ruled her realms with laws, but policy and strong advisement of six wizards old, that with their counsels bad her kingdom did uphold. Soon as the elfin knight in presence came, and false Jewessa, seeming lady fair, a gentle husher, vanity by name, made room, and passage for them did prepare, so goodly brought them to the lowest stair of her high throne, where they, on humble knee, making obeisance, did the cause declare why they were come her royal state to see, to prove the wide report of her great majesty. With lofty eyes, half loath to look so low, she thanked them in her disdainful wise, 
The other grace vouchsafer them to show a princess worthy, scarce them bad arise. Her lords and ladies all this while devise themselves to set and forth to stranger sight. Some frounce their curled hair in courtly guise, some prank their ruffs, and others trimly dight their gay attire. Each other's greater pride does bite. Goodly they all that night do entertain, right glad with him to have increased their crew. But to duess each one himself did pain all kindness and fair courtesy to shew. For in that court while home her well they knew. Yet the stout fairy, amongst the middest crowd, thought all their glory vain in nightly view, and that great princess to exceeding proud, that to strange knight no better countenance allowed. Sudden apriseth from her stately place the royal dame, and for her coach doth call, all hurtling forth, and she with princely pace, as fair Aurora in her purple pall, out of the east the dawning day doth call, so forth she comes, her brightness broad doth blaze, the heaps of people thronging in the hall do ride each other upon her to gaze, her glorious glittering light doth all men's eyes amaze. So forth she comes, and to her coach does climb, adorned all with gold and girlands gay, that seemed as fresh as Flora in her prime, and strove to match in royal rich array great Juno's golden chair, the which, they say, the gods stand gazing on when she does ride to Jove's high house through heaven's brass-paved way, drawn of fair peacocks that excel in pride, and full of Argus eyes their tails to spread and wide. But this was drawn of six unequal beasts on which her six sage counsellors did ride, taught to obey their bestial behests, with like conditions to their kinds applied, of which the first, that all the rest did guide, was sluggish idleness, the nurse of sin, Upon a slothful ass he chose to ride, arrayed in habit black, and amis thin, like to an holy monk the service to begin. And in his hand his portess still he bare, that much was worn, but therein little red, for of devotion he had little care, still drowned in sleep, and most of his days dead, Scarce could he once uphold his heavy head to look in whether it were night or day. May seem the wain was very evil led, when such an one had guiding of the way, that knew not whether right he went or else astray. From worldly cares himself he did esloin, and greatly shunned manly exercise, from every work he challenged a soin for contemplation's sake. Yet otherwise his life he led in lawless rioties, by which he grew to grievous malady, for in his lustless limbs, through evil guise, a shaking fever reigned continually. Such one was idleness, first of this company. And by his side rode loathsome gluttony, deformed creature on a filthy swine. His belly was ablown with luxury, and eke with fatness swollen were his eyne, and like a crane his neck was long and fine, with which he swallowed up excessive feast, for want whereof poor people oft did pine, and all the way most like a brutish beast he spewed up his gorge, that all did him detest. In green vine leaves he was right fitly clad, for other clothes he could not wear for heat and on his head an ivy garland had, from under which fast trickled down the sweat. Still as he rode, he somewhat still did eat, and in his hand did bear a boozing can, of which he supped so oft, that on his seat his drunken course he scarce upholden can, in shape and life more like a monster than a man. Unfit he was for any worldly thing, and eke unable once to stir or go, not meet to be of counsel to a king, whose mind in meat and drink was drowned so, that from his friend he seldom knew his foe. Full of diseases was his carcass blue, and a dry dropsy through his flesh did flow, which by misdiet daily greater grew. Such one was gluttony, the second of that crew.
And next to him rode lustful lechery upon a bearded goat, whose rugged hair and wally eyes the sign of jealousy was like the person's self whom he did bear, who, rough and black and filthy, did appear, unseemly man to please fair lady's eye. Yet he of ladies oft was loved dear, when fairer faces were bid stand and by. Oh, who does know the bent of women's fantasy? In a green gown he clothed was full fair, which underneath did hide his filthiness. And in his hand a burning heart he bare, full of vain follies and newfangleness. For he was false and fraught with fickleness, and learned had to love with secret looks, and well could dance and sing with ruefulness, and fortunes tell and read in loving books, and thousand other ways to bait his fleshly hooks. Inconstant man that loved all he saw, and lusted after all that he did love, now would his looser life be tied to law, but joyed weak women's hearts to tempt and prove, if from their loyal loves he might them move, which lewdness filled him with reproachful pain of that foul evil which all men reprove, that rots the marrow and consumes the brain. Such one was lechery, the third of all this train. And greedy avarice by him did ride upon a camel, loaden all with gold. Two iron coffers hung on either side, with precious metal full as they might hold. And in his lap an heap of coin he told, for of his wicked pelf his god he made, and unto hell himself for money sold. A cursed usury was all his trade, and right and wrong alike in equal balance weighed. His life was nigh unto death's door replaced, and threadbare coat and cobbled shoes he wear. Nick scarce good morsel all his life did taste, but both from back and belly still did spare to fill his bags, and riches to compare. Yet child and a kinsman living had he none to leave them to, but there are daily care to get, and nightly fear to lose his own. He led a wretched life, unto himself unknown. Most wretched wight, whom nothing might suffice, whose greedy lust did lack in greatest store, whose need had end, but no end covetous, whose wealth was want, whose plenty made him poor, who had enough, yet wished evermore, a vile disease. And eke in foot and hand a grievous gout tormented him full sore, that well he could not touch, nor go, nor stand. Such one was avarice, the fourth of this fair band. And next to him malicious envy rode upon a ravenous wolf, and still did chaw between his cankered teeth a venomous toad, that all the poison ran about his chaw, but inwardly he chawed his own maw at neighbor's wealth that made him ever sad. For death it was when any good he saw, and wept that cause of weeping none he had. But when he heard of harm he wexed wondrous glad. All in a kirtle of discolored say he clothed was, it painted full of eyes, and in his bosom secretly there lay an hateful snake, the which his tail upties in many folds, and mortal sting implies. Still as he rode he gnashed his teeth to see those heaps of gold with gripple covetes, and grudged at the great felicity of proud Lucifera and his own company. He hated all good works and virtuous deeds, and him no less that any like did use, and who with gracious bread the hungry feeds, his alms for want of faith he doth accuse. So every good to bad he doth abuse, and eke the verse of famous poet's wit he doth backbite, and spiteful poison spews from leprous mouth on all that ever writ. Such one vile envy was, that fifth in row did sit. And him beside rides fierce revenging wrath upon a lion, loath for to be led, 
and in his hand a burning brand he hath, the which he brandisheth about his head. His eyes did hurl forth sparkles fiery red, and stared stern on all that him beheld, as ashes pale of hue and seeming dead. And on his dagger still his hand he held, trembling through hasty rage when choler in him swelled. His roughened raiment all was stained with blood, which he had spilt, and all to rags arent, through unadvised rashness walks and wood. For of his hands he had no government, ne cared for blood in his avengement, but when the furious fit was overpast, his cruel facts he often would repent. Yet, willful man, he never would forecast how many mischiefs should ensue his heedless hast. Full many mischiefs follow cruel wrath, abhorred bloodshed and tumultuous strife, unmanly murder and unthrifty scath, bitter despite with rancor's rusty knife, and fretting grief the enemy of life. All these and many evils mow haunt ire, the swelling spleen and frenzy raging rife, the shaking palsy and St. Francis' fire. Such one was wrath, the last of this ungodly tire. And after all, upon the wagon beam rode Sathan, with a smarting whip in hand, with which he forward lashed the lazy team, so oft as sloth still in the mire did stand, Huge routs of people did about them band, shouting for joy, and still before their way a foggy mist had covered all the land, and underneath their feet all scattered lay dead skulls and bones of men whose life had gone astray. So forth they march, and in this goodly sort, to take the solace of the open air, and in fresh flowering fields themselves to sport. Amongst the rest rode that false lady fair, the foul Duessa, next unto the chair of proud Lucifer, as one of the train, but that good knight would not so nigh repair, himself estranging from their joyance vain, whose fellowship seemed far unfit for warlike swain. So, having solaced themselves a space with pleasance of the breathing fields, if ed, they back returned to the princely place. Whereas an errant knight in arms declared, and heathenish shield, wherein with letters red was writ sans joy, then you arrived find, inflamed with fury and fierce hardihead, he seemed in heart to harbor thoughts unkind, and nourish bloody vengeance in his bitter mind. Who, when the shamed shield of slain sans foy he spied, with that same fairy champion's page bewraying him that did of late destroy his eldest brother, burning all with rage, he to him leapt, and that same envious gage of victor's glory from him snatched away. But the elfin knight, which ought that warlike wage, disdained to lose the meaty one in fray, and him recountering fierce rescued the noble prey. Therewith they gan to hurtlin' greedily, redoubted battle ready to derain, and clash their shields and shake their swords on high. That with the stir they troubled all the train, till that great queen, upon eternal pain of high displeasure that ensue in might, commanded them their fury to refrain, and if that either to that shield had right, in equal lists they should the morrow next it fight. Ah, dearest dame, quoth then the pain in bold, pardon the error of enraged wight, whom great grief made forget the reins to hold of reason's rule, to see this recreant knight, no knight, but treacher full of false despite and shameful treason, who through guile hath slain the prowest knight that ever field did fight, even stout sense foy. Oh, who can then refrain? whose shield he bears when versed, the more to heap disdain. And to augment the glory of his guile, his dearest love, the fair Fidessa, lo, is there possessed of the traitor vile, who reaps the harvest sown by his foe, sown in bloody field and bought with woe, that brother's hand shall dearly well requite, so be, O queen, you equal favor show. Him little answered the angry elfin knight, 
He never meant with words, but swords, to plead his right. But through his gauntlet, as a sacred pledge, his cause in combat the next day to try. So been they parted both, with hearts on edge to be avenged, each on his enemy. That night they pass in joy and jollity, feasting and courting both in bower and hall. For Stuart was excessive gluttony, that of his plenty poured forth to all, which done the chamberlain's sloth did to rest them call. Now, when as darksome night had all displayed her coal-black curtain over brightest sky, the warlike youths on dainty couches laid did chase away sweet sleep from a sluggish eye to muse on means of hoped victory. But when as Morpheus had with leaden mace arrested all that courtly company, up rose Duessa from her resting place, and to the Paynim's lodging comes with silent pace, whom broad awake she finds in troublous fit, forecasting how his foe he might annoy, and him amoves with speeches seeming fit. Ah, dear sans joy, next dearest to sans foy, cause of my new grief, cause of my new joy, joyous to see his image in mine eye, and grieved to think how foe did him destroy that was the flower of grace and chivalry. Lo, his Videssa, to thy secret faith I fly. With gentle words he can her fairly greet, and bad say on the secret of her heart. Then, sighing soft, I learn that little sweet oft-tempered is, quoth she, with muttle smart. For since my breast was launched with lovely dart of dear sense foy, I never joyed hour, but in eternal woes my weaker heart have wasted, loving him with all my power, and for his sake have felt full many and heavy stour. At last, when perils all I weaned past, and hoped to reap the crop of all my care, into new woes unweeting I was cast by this false fater, who unworthy wear his worthy shield, whom he with guileful snare and trappet slew, and brought to shameful grave. Me, silly maid, away with him he bear, and ever since hath kept in darksome cave, for that I would not yield that to sans foy I gave. But since fair sun hath spursed that lowering cloud, and to my loathed life now shows some light, under your beams I will me safely shroud from dreaded storm of his disdainful sprite. To you the inheritance belongs by right of brother's praise. To you eke longs his love. Let not his love, let not his restless sprite be unrevenged that calls to you above from wandering Stygian shores where it doth endless move. Thereto said he, Fair dame, be not dismayed for sorrows past, their grief is with them gone. Nay yet of present peril be afraid, for needless fear did never vantage none, and helpless hap it booteth not to moan. Dead is sans foy, his vital pains are past, though grieved ghost for vengeance deep do groan. He lives that shall him pay his duties last, and guilty elf in blood shall sacrifice in haste. Oh, but I fear the fickle freaks, quoth she, of fortune false, and odds of arms in field. Why, dame, quoth he, what odds can ever be, where both do fight alike to win or yield? Yea, but, quoth she, he bears a charmed shield and eke enchanted arms, that none can pierce, nor none can wound the man that does them wield. Charmed or enchanted, answered he then fierce, I know wit wreck, nay you the like need to rehearse. But fair Fidessa, Scythian's fortune's guile or enemy's power hath now kept tived you, return from whence she came, and rest a while, till morrow next that I the elf subdue, and with sans foy's dead dowry you endue. 
Ay, me, that is a double death, she said, with proud foe's sight my sorrow to renew. Wherever yet I be, my secret aid shall follow you. So passing forth she him obeyed. The faithful knight in equal field subdues his faithless foe, whom false Duessa saves, and for his cure to hell does go. The noble heart that harbors virtuous thought, and is with child of glorious great intent, can never rest until it forth have brought the eternal brood of glory excellent. Such restless passion did all night torment the flaming courage of that fairy knight, devising how that doughty tournament with greatest honor he achieven might. Still did he wake, and still did watch for dawning light. At last the golden oriental gate of greatest heaven gan to open fair, and Phoebus fresh, as bridegroom to his mate, came dancing forth, shaking his dewy hair, and hurled his glistering beams through gloomy air, which when the wakeful elf perceived, straightway he started up, and did himself prepare in sun-bright arms and battleless array, for with that pagan proud he combat will that day. And forth he comes into the common hall, where early wait him many a gazing eye, to weet what end to stranger nights may fall. There many minstrels make a melody to drive away the dull melancholy, and many bards that to the trembling chord can tune their timely voices cunningly, and many chroniclers that can record old loves and wars for ladies done by many a lord. Soon after comes the cruel Saracen, in woven mail all armed warily, and sternly looks at him, who not a pin does care for look of living creature's eye. They bring them wines of Greece and Araby, and dainty spices fetched from furthest Ind, to kindle heat of courage privily. And in the wine a solemn oath they bind, to observe the sacred laws of arms that are assigned. At last comes forth that far-renowned queen with royal pomp and princely majesty. She is a brought unto a paled green, and placed under stately canopy, the warlike feats of both those knights to see. On the other side, in all men's open view, Duessa place it is, and on a tree, sans foyer's shield, is hanged with bloody hue. Both those, the laurel girlands, to the victor view. A shrilling trumpet sounded from on high, and unto battle bade themselves address. Their shining shields about their rests they tie, and burning blades about their heads do bless the instruments of wrath and heaviness. With greedy force each other doth assail, and strike so fiercely, that they do impress deep-dinted furrows in the battered mail. The iron walls toward their blows are weak and frail. The Saracen was stout and wondrous strong, and heaped blows like iron hammers great, for after blood and vengeance he did long, the knight was fierce, and full of youthly heat, and doubled strokes like dreaded thunder's threat, for all for praise and honor he did fight. Both stricken, strike, and beaten, both do beat, that from their shields forth flieth fiery light, and helmets hue and deep show marks of either's might. So the one for wrong, the other strives for right, as when a griffin sees it of his prey, a dragon fierce encountereth in his flight, through widest air making his idle way, that would his rightful raven rend away. With hideous horror both together smite, and souse so sore that they the heavens affray. The wise soothsayer, seeing so sad sight, the mazed vulgar tells of wars and mortal fight. So the one for wrong, the other strives for right, and each to deadly shame would drive his foe. The cruel steel so greedily doth bite in tender flesh that streams of blood down flow, with which the arms that erst so bright did show into a pure vermilion now are dyed. Great ruth in all the gazers' hearts did grow, seeing the gored wounds to gape so wide that victory they dare not wish to either side. At last the Paynim chanced to cast his eye, his sudden eye flaming with wrathful fire, upon his brother's shield which hung thereby. Therewith redoubled was his raging ire, and said, Ah, wretched son of woeful sire, dost thou sit wailing by black Stygian lake, whilst here thy shield is hanged for victor's hire, and sluggish German dost thy forces slake, to after send his foe that him may overtake? Go, caitiff elf, him quickly overtake, 
and soon redeem from his long wandering woe. Go, guilty ghost, to him my message make, that I his shield have quit from dying foe. Therewith upon his crest he stroke him so that twice he reeled, ready twice to fall. End of the doubtful battle deemed though the lookers on, and loud to him can call the false Jubessa, thine the shield and I and all. Soon as the fairy heard his lady speak, out of his swooning dream he gan awake, and quickening faith, that erst was waxen weak, the creeping deadly cold away did shake, though moved with wrath and shame and lady's sake, of all at once he cast avenged to be, and with so exceeding fury at him strake, that forced him to stoop upon his knee, had he not stooped so, he should have cloven be, and to him said, Go now, proud miscreant, thyself thy message do to German dear, alone he wandering thee too long doth want. Go, say his foe thy shield with his doth bear. Therewith his heavy hand he high gan rear him to have slain, when, lo, a darksome cloud upon him fell, he nowhere doth appear but vanished is. The elf him calls aloud, but answer none receives, the darkness him to shroud. In haste, Duessa from her place arose, and to him running said, O oh, prowest knight, that ever lady to her love did chose, let now abate the terror of your might, and quench the flame of furious despite and bloody vengeance. Lo, the infernal powers covering your foe with cloud of deadly night have borne him hence to Pluto's baleful bowers. The conquest yours, I yours. The shield and glory, yours. Not all so satisfied, with greedy eye he sought all round about his thirsty blade to bathe in blood of faithless enemy, who all that while lay hid in secret shade. He stands amazed how he then should fade. At last the trumpets triumph sound on high, and running heralds humble homage made, greeting him goodly with new victory and to him brought the shield to the cause of enmity, wherewith he goeth to that sovereign queen, and falling her before and lowly knee, to her makes present of his service seen, which she accepts with thanks and goodly gree, greatly advancing his gay chivalry, so marcheth home, and by her takes the knight, whom all the people follow with great glee, shouting and clapping all their hands on height, that all the air it fills and flies to heaven bright. Home is he brought and laid in sumptuous bed, where many skilful leeches him abide, to salve his hurts that yet still freshly bled. In wine and oil they wash his wound as wide, and softly can embalm on every side. And all the while most heavenly melody about the bed sweet music did divide, him to beguile of grief and agony. And all the while Duessa wept full bitterly. As when a weary traveller that strays by muddy shore a broad seven-mouthed Nile, unweeting of the perilous wandering ways, doth meet a cruel, crafty crocodile, which in false grief hiding his harmful guile, doth weep full sore and sheddeth tender tears. The foolish man that pities all this while his mournful plight is swallowed up unwares, forgetful of his own, that minds another's cares. So wept Duessa until eventide that shining lamps in Jove's high house were light. Then forth she rose, Nelenga would abide, but comes unto the place where the heathen knight in slumbering swound, nigh void of vital sprite lay covered with enchanted cloud all day, whom when she found, as she him left in plight, to wail his woeful case she would not stay, but to the eastern coast of heaven make speedy way, where grisly night, with visage deadly sad, that Phoebus' cheerful face durst never view, and in a foul, black, pitchy mantle clad she finds, forthcoming from her darksome mew, where she all day did hide her hated hue. Before the door her iron chariot stood, already harnessed for journey new, and coal-black steeds are born of hellish brood, that on their rusty bits did champ as they were wooed. Who, when she saw Duessa, sunny bright, adorned with gold and jewels shining clear, she greatly grew amazed at the sight, and then acquainted light began to fear, for never did such brightness there appear, 
and would have back retired to her cave until the witch's speech she gan to hear, saying, Yet, O thou dreaded dame, I crave abide, till I have told the message which I have. She stayed, and forth do us again proceed. O thou most ancient grandmother of all, more old than Jove, whom thou at first didst breed, or that great house of God celestial, which wast begot in Demogorgon's hall, and sawst the secrets of the world unmade. Why sufferedst thou thy nephews dear to fall with elfin sword most shamefully betrayed? Lo, where the stout sand's joy doth sleep in deadly shade! And him before I saw with bitter eyes the bold sand's foy shrink underneath his spear, and now the prey of fowls in field he lies, nor wailed of friends, nor laid on groaning beer, that whilom was to me too dearly dear. Oh, what of gods then boots it to be born, if older Virgla's son so evil here? Or who shall not great Nita's children scorn, when two of three her nephews are so foul forlorn? Up, then, up, dreary dame of darkness, queen, go gather up the relics of thy race, or else go them avenge, and let be seen that dreaded night in brightest day hath place, and can the children of fair light deface. Her feeling speeches, some compassion moved in heart, and change in that great mother's face. Yet pity in her heart was never proved till then, for evermore she hated, never loved, and said, Dear daughter, rightly may I rue the fall of famous children born of me, and good successes which their foes ensue. But who can turn the stream of destiny, or break the chain of strong necessity, which fast is tied to Jove's eternal seat? The sons of day he favoureth I see, and by my ruins thinks to make them great, to make one great by others' loss his baddest cheat. Yet shall they not escape so freely all, for some shall pay the price of others' guilt, and he the man that made sense for to fall shall with his own blood price that he hath spilt. But what art thou that tellst of nephews killed? I that do seem not I Duessa am, quoth she, however now in garments gilt and gorgeous gold arrayed I to thee came, Duessa I, the daughter of deceit and shame. Then, bowing down her aged back, she kissed the wicked witch, saying, In that fair face the false resemblance of deceit I wist it closely lurk, yet so true-seeming grace it carried that I scarce in darksome place could it discern, though I the mother be of falsehood and root of Duessa's race. O oh, welcome child whom I have longed to see, and now have seen unwares, lo, now I go with thee. Then to her iron wagon she betakes, and with her bears the foul well-favoured witch. Through murksome air her ready way she makes, her twifold team, of which two black as pitch and two were brown, yet each to each unlitch did softly swim away, ne ever stamp, unless she chanced their stubborn mouths to twitch. Then, foaming tar, their bridles they would champ, and trampling the fine element would fiercely ramp. So well they sped, that they become at length unto the place whereas the Paynim lay, devoid of outward sense and native strength, covered with charmed cloud from view of day and sight of men since his late luckless fray. His cruel wounds with cruddy blood congealed, they bind him up so wisely as they may, and handle softly till they can be healed. So lay him in her chariot, close in night concealed. And all the while she stood upon the ground, the wakeful dogs did never cease to bay, as giving warning of the unwanted sound, with which her iron wheels did them affray, and her dark, grisly look them much dismay. The messenger of death, the ghastly owl, with dreary shrieks did also her bewray, and hungry wolves continually did howl at her abhorred face, so filthy and so foul. Thence turning back in silence soft they stole, and brought the heavy course with easy pace to yawning gulf of deep Avernus hole. By that same hole an entrance dark and base with smoke and sulphur hiding all the place descends to hell. There creature never passed that back returned without heavenly grace, but dreadful furies, which their chains have brassed, and damned sprites sent forth to make ill men aghast. 
By that same way the direful dames do drive their mournful chariot filled with rusty blood, and down to Pluto's house are come belive, which passing through, on every side them stood the trembling ghosts with sad amazed mood, chattering their iron teeth and staring wide with stony eyes, and all the hellish brood of fiends infernal flocked on every side, to gaze on earthly white that with the night durst ride. They passed the bitter waves of Acheron, where many souls sit wailing woefully, and come to fiery flood of Phlegatum, whereas the damned ghosts in torments fry, and with sharp shrilling shrieks do bootless cry, cursing high Jove, the which them thither sent. The house of endless pain is built thereby, in which ten thousand sorts of punishment the cursed creatures do eternally torment. Before the threshold dreadful Cerberus his three deformed heads did lay along, curled with thousand adders venomous, and lidded forth his bloody flaming tongue. At them he gan to rear his bristles strong and felly gnar, until day's enemy did him appease. Then down his tail he hung and suffered them to pass in quietly, for she in hell and heaven had power equally. There was Ixion turned on a wheel for daring tempt the queen of heaven to sin, and Sisyphus and huge round stone did reel against an hill, ne might from labor lin. There thirsty Tantalus hung by the chin, and Titius fed a vulture on his maw. Typhius' joints were stretched on a gin, Theseus condemned to endless sloth by law, and fifty sisters water in leak vessels draw. They, all beholding worldly whites in place, leave off their work, unmindful of their smart, to gaze on them, who forth by them do pace till they become unto the furthest part, where was a cave wrought by wondrous art, deep, dark, uneasy, doleful, comfortless, in which sad Esculapius, far apart imprisoned, was in chains remediless, for that Hippolytus rent course he did redress. Hippolytus, a jolly huntsman, was that wont in chariot chase the foaming boar. He all his peers in beauty did surpass, but ladies love as loss of time forbore. His wanton stepdame loved him the more, but when she saw her offered sweets refused, her love she turned to hate, and him before his father fierce of treason false accused, and with her jealous terms his open ears abused who all in rage his sea-god sire besought some cursed vengeance on his son to cast. From surging gulf two monsters straight were brought, with dread whereof his chasing steeds aghast, both chariot swift and huntsman overcast. His goodly corpse on ragged cliffs errant was quite dismembered, and his members chased scattered on every mountain as he went, that of Hippolytus was left no monument. His cruel stepdame, seeing what was done, her wicked days with wretched knife did end, in death avowing the innocence of her son, which hearing, his rash sire began to rend his hair and hasty tongue that did offend, though gathering up the relics of his smart, by Dion's means, who was Hippolyte's friend, them brought to Esculape, that by his art did heal them all again and join at every part. Such wondrous science in man's wit to reign when Jove advised that could the dead revive, and fates expired could renew again, of endless life he might him not deprive, but unto hell did thrust him down alive, with flashing thunderbolt a wounded sore, where long remaining he did always strive himself with salves to health for to restore, and slake the heavenly fire that raged evermore. There ancient night arriving did alight from her nigh weary wane, and in her arms to Esculapius brought the wounded knight, whom having softly disarrayed of arms, though gan to him discover all his harms, beseeching him with prayer and with praise, if either salves or oils or herbs or charms a fordone white from door of death mote raise, he would at her request prolong her nephew's days. Ah! Dame, quoth he, thou temptest me in vain to dare the thing which daily yet I rue, and the old cause of my continued pain with like attempt to like end to renew. Is not enough that thrust from heaven due here endless penance for one fault I pay, 
But that redoubled crime with vengeance new thou biddest me to eke? Can night defray the wrath of thundering Jove that rules both night and day? Not so, quoth she. But, sith that heaven's king from hope of heaven hath thee excluded quite, why fearest thou that canst not hope for thing, and fearest not that more thee hurten might, now in the power of everlasting night? Go to then, O thou far-renowned son of great Apollo, show thy famous might in medicine, that else hath to thee won great pains and greater praise, both never to be done. Her words prevailed, and then the learned leech his cunning hand gan to his wounds to lay, and all things else the which his art did teach, which, having seen, from thence arose away the mother of dread darkness, and let stay a Virgla's son there in the leech's cure, and back returning took her wonted way, to run her timely race, whilst Phoebus pure in western waves his weary wagon did recure. The false Duessa, leaving Noyus night, returned to stately palace of Dame Pride, where when she came she found the fairy knight departed thence, albeit as wound as wide not throughly healed, unready were to ride. Good cause he had to hasten thence away, for on a day his wary dwarf had spied where in a dungeon deep huge numbers lay of caitive wretched thralls that wailed night and day, a rueful sight as could be seen with eye, of whom he learned had in secret wise the hidden cause of their captivity, how mortgaging their lives to covetize, through wasteful pride and wanton riotize, they were by law of that proud tyrannous, provoked with wrath and envy's false surmise, condemned to that dungeon merciless, where they should live in woe and die in wretchedness. There was that great proud king of Babylon that would compel all nations to adore and him as only God to call upon, till through celestial doom thrown out of door into an ox he was transformed of yore. There also was King Croesus that enhanced his heart too high through his great riches store, and proud Antiochus the which advanced his cursed hand against God and on his altars danced. And them long time before great Nimrod was, that first the world with sword and fire wore aid. And after him, old Ninus far did pass in princely pomp of all the world obey. There also was that mighty monarch laid low under all, yet above all in pride, that name of native sire did foul upbraid, and would as Ammon's son be magnified, till scorned of God and man a shameful death he died. All these together in one heap were thrown like carcasses of beasts in butcher's stall, and in another corner wide were strown the antique ruins of the Romans' fall, great Romulus, the grandsire of them all, proud Tarquin, and too lordly Lentulus, stout Scipio, and stubborn Hannibal, ambitious Scylla, and stern Marius, high Caesar, great Pompey, and fierce Antonius. Amongst these mighty men were women mixed, proud women vain, forgetful of their yoke, the bold Semiramis, whose sides transfixed with sun's own blade her foul reproaches spoke, fair Stenobia, that herself did choke with willful cord for wanting of her will, high-minded Cleopatra, that with stroke of Aspis sting herself did stoutly kill, and thousands mo the like that did that dungeon fill. Besides the endless routs of wretched thralls, which thither were assembled day by day, from all the world after their woeful falls, through wicked pride and wasted wealth's decay. But most of all which in the dungeon lay fell from high princes' courts, or ladies' bowers, where they in idle pomp or wanton play consumed had their goods and thriftless hours, and lastly thrown themselves into these heavy stowers whose case, when as the careful dwarf had told, and made an example of their mournful sight unto his master, he no longer would there dwell in peril of like painful plight, but early rose, and ere that dawning light discovered had the world to heaven wide, he by a privy postern took his flight, that of no envious eyes he mote be spied, for doubtless death ensued if any him descried. 
Scarce could he footing find in that foul way for many courses like a great lay stall of murdered men which therein strowed lay without remorse or decent funeral, which all through that great princess pride did fall and came to shameful end, and then beside, forth riding underneath the castle wall, a dunghill of dead carcasses he spied, the dreadful spectacle of that sad house of pride. From lawless lust, by wondrous grace, fair Una is released, whom salvage nation does adore and learns her wise behest. As when a ship that flies fair under sail, and hidden rock escape it hath unwares, that lay in wait her rack for to bewail, the mariner yet hath amazed stares at peril past, and yet in doubt ne dares to joy at his fool happy oversight, so doubly is distressed twixt joy and cares the dreadless courage of this elfin knight, having escaped so sad examples in his sight. Yet sad he was that his too hasty speed the fair duess had forced him leave behind, and yet more sad that Una, his dear dreed, her truth had stained with treason so unkind. Yet crime in her could never creature find, but for his love and for her own self's sake she wandered had from one to other eind, him for to seek, nay ever would forsake, till her unwares the fierce sands loy did overtake who, after Archimago's foul defeat, led her away into a forest wild, and turning wrathful fire to lustful heat, with beastly sin thought her to have defiled, and made the vassal of his pleasures vile. Yet first he cast, by treaty and by trains, her to persuade, that stubborn fort to yield, for greater conquest of hard love he gains that works it to his will than he that it constrains. With fawning words he courted her a while, and looking lovely, and oft sighing sore, her constant heart did tempt with diverse guile. But words, and looks, and sighs she did abhor, as rock of diamond steadfast evermore. Yet for to feed his fiery lustful eye he snatched the veil that hung her face before. Then gan her beauty shine as brightest sky, and burnt his beastly heart to force her chastity. So when he saw his flattering arts to fail, and subtle engines bet from battery, with greedy force he gan the fort assail, whereof he weaned possessed soon to be, and win rich spoil of ransacked chastity. Ah, heavens that do this hideous act behold, and heavenly virgin thus outraged see, how can ye vengeance just so long withhold, and hurl not flashing flames upon that pain bold? The piteous maiden, careful, comfortless, does throw out thrilling shrieks and shrieking cries, the last vain help of women's great distress, and with loud plaints importunate the skies, that molten stars do drop like weeping eyes. And Phoebus, flying so most shameful sight, his blushing face in foggy cloud implies and hides for shame. What wit of mortal wight can now devise to quit a thrall from such a plight? Eternal providence, exceeding thought, where none appears can make herself away, a wondrous way it for this lady wrought from lion's claws to pluck the gripe and prey. Her shrill outcries and shrieks so loud did bray that all the woods and forests did resound. A troop of fawns and satyrs far away within the wood were dancing and around, whilst old Sylvanus slept in shady arbor sound who, when they heard that piteous strained voice, in haste forsook their rural merriment, and ran towards that far-rebounded noise to weet what white so loudly did lament. Under the place they come incontinent, whom when the raging Saracen espied, a rude, misshapen, monstrous rabblement, whose like he never saw, he durst not bide, but got his ready steed and fast away gan ride. The wild wood gods arrived in the place, there find the virgin, doleful, desolate, with ruffled raiments and fair blubbered face, as her outrageous foe had left her late, and trembling yet through fear of former hate. All stand amazed at so uncouth sight, and gin to pity her unhappy state. All stand astonished at her beauty bright, in their rude eyes, unworthy of so woeful plight. She, more amazed, in double dread doth dwell, and every tender part for fear to shake. As when a greedy wolf, 
Through hunger fell a silly lamb far from the flock does take, of whom he means his bloody feast to make. A lion spies, fast running towards him, the innocent prey in haste he does forsake, which, quit from death, yet quakes in every limb with change of fear to see the lion look so grim. Such fearful fit assayed her trembling heart, ne word to speak, ne joint to move she had. The savage nation feel her secret smart, and read her sorrow in her countenance sad. Their frowning foreheads, with rough horns clad and rustic horror, all aside do lay, and gently grinning, show a semblance glad to comfort her, and fear to put away. Their backward bent knees teach her humbly to obey. The doubtful damsel dare not yet commit her single person to their barbarous truth, but still twixt fear and hope amazed does sit, late learned what harm to hasty truth ensueth. They, in compassion of her tender youth and wonder of her beauty sovereign, are one with pity and unwanted ruth, and all prostrate upon the lowly plain do kiss her feet, and fawn on her with countenance vain. Their hearts she guesseth by their humble guise, and yields her to extremity of time. So from the ground she fearless doth arise, and walketh forth without suspect of crime. They, all as glad as birds of joyous prime, thence lead her forth about her dancing round, shouting and singing all a shepherd's rhyme, and with green branches strowing all the ground, do worship her as queen, with olive girland crowned. And all the way their merry pipes they sound, that all the woods with doubled echo ring, and with their horned feet do wear the ground, leaping like wanton kids in pleasant spring. So towards old Sylvanus they her bring, who with the noise awaked cometh out to weet the cause, his weak steps governing and aged limbs on cypress stadle stout, and with an ivy twine his waist is girt about. Far off he wonders what them makes so glad, or Bacchus' merry fruit they did invent, or Sibylle's frantic fits have made them mad. They, drawing nigh unto their god, present that flower of faith and beauty excellent. The god himself, viewing that mirror rare, stood long amazed, and burnt in his intent. His own fair dry up now he thinks not fair, and folo foul, when her to this he doth compare. The wood-born people fall before her flat, and worship her as goddess of the wood, and old Sylvanus' self bethinks not what to think of white so fair, but gazing stood in doubt to deem her born of earthly brood. Sometimes Dame Venus self he seems to see, but Venus never had so sober mood. Sometimes Diana he her takes to be, but misseth bow and shafts and buskins to her knee. By view of her he ginneth to revive his ancient love and dearest Cyparus, and calls to mind his portraiture alive, how fair he was, and yet not fair to this and how he slew with glancing dart amiss a gentle hind, the which the lovely boy did love as life above all worldly bliss, for grief whereof the lad knowed after joy, but pined away in anguish and self-willed annoy. The woody nymphs, fair Hamadryades, her to behold do thither run apace, and all the troop of light-foot Naiades flock all about to see her lovely face. But when they view it have her heavenly grace, they envy her in their malicious mind, and fly away for fear of foul disgrace. But all the satyrs scorn their woody kind, and henceforth nothing fair but her on earth they find. Glad of such luck, the luckless lucky maid did her content to please their feeble eyes, and long time with that salvage people stayed to gather breath in many miseries during which time her gentle wit she plies to teach them truth, which worshipped her in vain, and made her the image of idolatries. But when their bootless zeal she did restrain from her own worship, they her ass would worship fain. It fortunate, a noble warlike knight, by just occasion to that forest came to seek his kindred, and the lineage right from whence he took his well-deserved name. He had in arms abroad won muchal fame, and filled far lands with glory of his might, plain, faithful, true, and enemy of shame, and ever loved to fight for lady's right. But in vain glorious phrase he little did delight. 
A satyr's son, he born in forest wild by strange adventure, as it did betide, and there begotten of a lady mild, fair Thyamus, the daughter of Labride, that was in sacred bands of wedlock tied to Therian, a loose, unruly swain, who had more joy to range the forest wide and chase the salvage beast with busy pain than serve his lady's love and waste in pleasures vain. The forlorn maid did with love's longing burn and could not lack her lover's company but to the wood she goes to serve her turn and seek her spouse that from her still does fly and follows other game and venery. A satyr chanced her wandering for to find and kindling coals of lust in brutish eye, the loyal links of wedlock did unbind and made her person thrall unto his beastly kind. So long in secret cabin there he held her captive to his sensual desire till that with timely fruit her belly swelled and bore a boy unto that savage sire. Then home he suffered her for to retire for ransom, leaving him that late-born child, whom till to riper years he can aspire he nursled up in life and manners wild, amongst wild beasts and woods from laws of men exiled. For all he taught the tender imp was but to banish coward eyes and bastard fear, his trembling hand he would him force to put upon the lion and the rugged bear, and from the she-bear's teats her whelps to tear, and eke wild roaring bulls he would him make to tame and ride their backs not made to bear, and the roebucks in flight to overtake that every beast for fear of him did fly and quake. Thereby so fearless and so fell he grew that his own sire and maester of his guise did often tremble at his horrid view, and oft for dread of hurt would him advise the angry beasts not rashly to despise, nor too much to provoke, for he would learn the lions stoop to him in lowly wise, a lesson hard, and make the libbered stern leave roaring when in rage he for revenge did earn, and for to make his power approve it more, wild beasts in iron yokes he would compel, the spotted panther and the tusked boar, the pardale swift and the tiger cruel, the antelope and wolf both fierce and fell, and them constrain in equal team to draw. Such joy he had their stubborn hearts to quell, and sturdy courage tame with dreadful awe, that his behest they feared as a tyrant's law. His loving mother came upon a day unto the woods to see her little son, and chanced unwares to meet him in the way after his sports and cruel pastime done, when after him a lioness did run, that roaring all with rage did loud requeer her children dear whom he away had won. The lion whelped she saw how he did bear and lull in rugged arms without an childish fear. The fearful dame all quaked at the sight, and turning back gan fast to fly away, until, with love revoked from vain fright, she hardly yet persuaded was to stay, and then to him these womanish words gan say, Ah, Saturnine, my dearling, and my joy, for love of me leave off this dreadful play, to dally thus with death is no fit toy, go find some other play for those, mine own sweet boy. In these and like delights of bloody game he trained was till riper years he wrought, and there abode, whilst any beast of name walked in that forest whom he had not taught to fear his force. And then his courage hot desired a foreign foeman to be known, and far abroad for strange adventure sought, in which his might was never overthrown, but through all fairy land his famous worth was blown. Yet evermore it was his manner fair, after long labours and adventures spent, unto those native woods for to repair to see his sire and offspring ancient. And now he thither came for like intent, where he unwares the fairest Una found, strange lady, in so strange habiliment, teaching the satyrs which her sat around true sacred lore which from her sweet lips did redound. He wondered at her wisdom heavenly rare, whose like in women's wit he never knew, and when her courteous deeds he did compare, gan her admire, and her sad sorrows rue, blaming a fortune which such troubles threw, and joyed to make proof of her cruelty on gentle dames so hurtless and so true. Thenceforth he kept her goodly company, and learned her discipline of faith and verity. But she, 
all vowed unto the Red Cross Knight, his wandering peril closely did lament, nay in this new acquaintance could delight, but her dear heart with anguish did torment, and all her wit in secret counsel spent how to escape. At last, in privy wise, to Saturnine she showed her intent, who, glad to gain such favor, gan devise how with that pensive maid he best might thence arise. So, on a day when satyrs all were gone to do their service to Sylvanus old, the gentle virgin, left behind alone, he led away, with courage stout and bold. Too late it was to satyrs to be told, or ever hope recover her again. In vain he seeks that having cannot hold. So fast he carried her with careful pain, that they the woods are past, and come now to the plain. The better part now of the lingering day they travelled had, when as they far espied a weary wight for wandering by the way, and towards him they gan in haste to ride, to wheat of news that did abroad betide, or tidings of her knight of the Red Cross. But he them spying gan to turn aside, for fear as seemed, or for some feigned loss, more greedy they of news, fast towards him to cross. A silly man in simple weeds forworn, and soiled with dust of the long dried way, his sandals were with toilsome travel torn, and face all tanned with scorching sunny ray, as he had travelled many a summer's day through boiling sands of Araby and Ein, and in his hand a Jacob's staff to stay his weary limbs upon, and eke behind his script did hang in which his needments he did bind. The knight approaching nigh of him inquired tidings of war and of adventures new, but wars nor new adventures none he heard. Then Una gan to ask if aught he knew or heard abroad of that her champion true, that in his armor bare a crosslet red. Ay me, dear dame, quoth he, well may I rue to tell the sad sight which mine eyes have read. These eyes did see that night both living and eke dead. That cruel word her tender heart so thrilled that sudden cold did run through every vein, and stony horror all her senses filled with dying fit, that down she fell for pain. The knight her lightly reared up again, and comforted with courteous kind relief. Then, won from death, she bade him tell in plain the further process of her hidden grief, the lesser pangs can bear who hath endured the chief. Then gan the pilgrim thus, I chanced this day, this fatal day, that shall I ever rue, to see two knights in travel on my way, a sorry sight, arranged in battle new, both breathing vengeance, both of wrathful hue. My fearful flesh did tremble at their strife to see their blade so greedily embrue, that drunk with blood yet thirsted after life. What more? The Red Cross Knight was slain with pain and knife. Ah, oh, dearest Lord, quoth she, how might that be, and he the stoutest knight that ever won? Ah, oh, dearest dame, quoth he, how might I see the thing that might not be and yet was done? Where is, said Saturnine, that Paynim's son, that him of life and us of joy hath reft? Not far away, quoth he, he hence doth won, for by a fountain, where I late him left washing his bloody wounds, that through the steel were cleft. Therewith the knight thence marched forth in haste, while Zuna, with huge heaviness oppressed, could not for sorrow follow him so fast. And soon he came, as he the place had guessed, whereas that pagan proud himself did rest in secret shadow by a fountain side. Even he it was that erst would have suppressed fair Una, whom when Saturnine espied, with foul reproachful words he boldly him defied, and said, Arise, thou Cursed miscreant, that hast with nightless guile and treacherous train fair knighthood foully shamed, and dost vaunt that good knight of the Red Cross to have slain. Arise, and with like treason now maintain thy guilty wrong, or else thee guilty yield. The Saracen this hearing rose amain, and catching up in haste his three-square shield and shining helmet, soon him buckled to the field, and drawing nigh him said, Ah, misborn elf, in evil hour thy foes thee hither sent, another's wrongs to wreak upon thyself, yet ill thou blamest me for having blent my name with guile and traitorous intent, 
That Red Cross knight for thee I never slew. But had he been where erst his arms were lent, then chanter vain his error should not rue. But thou his error shalt, I hope, now proven true. Wherewith they gan, both furious and fell, to thunder blows, and fiercely to assail, each other bent his enemy to quell. That with their force they pierced both plate and mail, and made wide furrows in their fleshes frail, that it would pity any living eye. Large floods of blood adown their sides did rail, but floods of blood could not them satisfy. Both hungered after death, both chose to win or die. So long they fight and fell revenge pursue, that fainting each themselves to breathe and let, and oft refreshed, battle oft renew. As when two boars with rankling malice met, their gory sides fresh bleeding fiercely fret, till breathless both themselves aside retire, where foaming wrath their cruel tusks they whet and trample the earth the whiles they may respire, then back to fight again, new breathed and entire. So fiercely when these knights had breathed once, they gan to fight return, increasing more their puissant force and cruel rage at once with heaped strokes more hugely than before, that with their dreary wounds and bloody gore they both deformed, scarcely could be known. By this fair Una, fraught with anguish sore, led with their noise, which through the air was thrown, arrived where they in earth their fruitless blood had sown. Whom all so soon as that proud Saracen espied, he gan revive the memory of his lewd lusts and late attempted sin, and left the doubtful battle hastily to catch her newly offered to his eye. But Saturain, with strokes him turning, stayed, and sternly bade him other business ply than hunt the steps of pure unspotted maid, wherewith he all enraged these bitter speeches said, O oh, foolish fairy son, what fury mad hath thee incensed to haste thy doleful fate? Were it not better I that lady had, than that thou hadst repented it too late? Most senseless man, he that himself doth hate to love another. Lo, then for thine aid, here take thy lover's token on thy pate. So they to fight, the whilst the royal maid fled far away, of that proud Paynim sore afraid. But that false pilgrim, which that leasing told, being indeed old Archimage, did stay in secret shadow all this to behold, and much rejoiced in their bloody fray. But when he saw the damsel pass away, he left his dawn, and her pursued a pace in hope to bring her to her last decay. But for to tell her lamentable case, and eke this battle's end, we'll need another place. The Red Cross Knight is captive made by giant proud oppressed. Prince Arthur meets with Una greatly with those news distressed. What man so wise, what earthly wit so ware, as to descry the crafty, cunning train by which deceit doth mask in visor fair, and cast her colors dye it deep in grain to seem like truth, whose shape she well can feign, and fitting gestures to her purpose frame the guiltless man with guile to entertain? Great maestress of her art was that false dame, the false Duessa, cloaked with Fidessa's name who, when returning from the dreary night, she found not in that perilous house of pride where she had left the noble Red Cross Knight, her hoped prey, she would no linger bide, but forth she went to seek him far and wide. Ere long she found, whereas he weary sate, to rest himself for by a fountain side, disarmed all of iron-coated plate, and by his side his steed the grassy forage ate. He feeds upon the cooling shade, and bays his sweaty forehead, in the breathing wind, which through the trembling leaves full gently plays, wherein the cheerful birds of sundry kind do chant sweet music to delight his mind. The witch, approaching, gan him fairly greet, and with reproach of carelessness unkind upbraid for leaving her in place unmeet, with foul words tempering fair, sour gall with honey sweet. Unkindness past, they gan of solace treat, and bathe in pleasance of the joyous shade, which shielded them against the boiling heat, and with green boughs decking a gloomy glade about the fountain like a girland maid, whose bubbling wave did ever freshly well, nay ever would through fervent summer fade. 
The sacred nymph which therein went to dwell was out of Dian's favor as it then befell. The cause was this. One day, when Phoebe Fair with all her band was following the chase, this nymph, quite tired with heat of scorching air, sat down to rest in middest of the race. The goddess, wroth, gan foully her disgrace, and bade the waters which from her did flow be such as she herself was then in place. Thenceforth her waters waxed dull and slow, and all that drunk thereof did faint and feeble grow. Hereof this gentle knight unweeting was, and lying down upon the sandy grail, drunk of the stream as clear as crystal glass. Eftsoons his manly forces gan to fail, and mighty strong was turned to feeble frail. His changed powers at first themselves not felt, till cruddled cold his courage gan assail, and cheerful blood in faintness chilled it melt, which like a fever fit through all his body swelt. Yet goodly court he made still to his dame, poured out in looseness on the grassy ground, both careless of his health and of his fame, till at the last he heard a dreadful sound, which through the wood loud bellowing did rebound, that all the earth for terror seemed to shake, and trees did tremble. Belf therewith astound, upstarted lightly from his looser make, and his unready weapons gan in hand to take. But ere he could his armor on him dight, or get his shield, his monstrous enemy with sturdy steps came stalking in his sight, an hideous giant, horrible and high, that with his tallness seemed to threat the sky, the ground he groaned under him for dread. His living light saw never living eye, ne durst behold. His stature did exceed the height of three, the tallest sons of mortal seed. The greatest earth his uncouth mother was, and blustering Aeolus his boasted sire, who with his breath, which through the world doth pass, her hollow womb did secretly inspire, and filled her hidden caves with stormy ire that she conceived. And trebling the due time in which the wombs of women do expire, brought forth this monstrous mass of earthly slime puffed up with empty wind and filled with sinful crime. So growing great through arrogant delight of the high descent whereof he was born, and through presumption of his matchless might, all other powers and knighthood he did scorn. Such now he marcheth to this man forlorn and left to loss. His stalking steps are stayed upon a snaggy oak which he had torn out of his mother's bowels, and it made his mortal mace, wherewith his foemen he dismayed. That when the knight he spied, he gan advance with huge force and in supportable mane, and towards him with dreadful fury prance, who, hapless and eke hopeless, all in vain did to him pace, sad battle to derain, disarmed, disgraced, and inwardly dismayed, and eke so faint in every joint and vein through that frail fountain which him feeble made, that scarcely could he wield his bootless single blade. The giant struck so mainly merciless that could have overthrown a stony tower, and were not heavenly grace that did him bless, he had been powdered all as thin as flour. But he was wary of that deadly stour, and lightly leapt from underneath the blow. Yet so exceeding was the villain's power, that with the wind it did him overthrow, and all his senses stound, that still he lay full low. As when that devilish iron engine, wrought in deepest hell, and framed by fury's skill, with windy nitre and quick sulphur fraught, and rammed with bullet round, ordained to kill, conceiveth fire, the heavens it doth fill with thundering noise, and all the air doth choke, that none can breathe, nor see, nor hear at will through smouldry cloud of duskish stinking smoke, that th only breath him daunts, who hath escaped the stroke. So daunted, when the giant saw the knight, his heavy hand he heaved up on high, and him to dust thought to have battered quite, until Duessa loud to him gan cry, O great Orgolio, greatest under sky, O hold thy mortal hand for lady's sake, hold for my sake, and do him not to die, but vanquish thine eternal bond-slave make, and me thy worthy meed unto thy lemon take. He hearkened, and did stay from further harms, to gain so goodly guerdon as she spake. So willingly she came into his arms, who her as willingly to grace did take, and was possessed of his new-found make. Then up he took the slumbered senseless course, and ere he could out of his swoon awake, him to his castle brought with hasty force, and in a dungeon deep him threw without remorse. 
From that day forth Duessa was his dear, And highly honoured in his haughty eye. He gave her gold and purple pall to wear, And triple crown set on her head full high, And her endowed with royal majesty. Then, for to make her dreaded more of men, And people's hearts with awful terror tie, A monstrous beast he bred in filthy fen he chose, Which he had kept long time in darksome den. Such one it was as that renowned snake, Which great Alcides in Stremona slew, Long fostered in the filth of Lerna Lake, Whose many heads, outbudding ever new, Did breed him endless labor to subdue. But this same monster much more ugly was, For seven great heads out of his body grew, An iron breast and back of scaly brass, And all imbrued in blood, his eyes did shine as glass. His tail was stretched out in wondrous length, That to the house of heavenly gods it wrought, and with extorted power and borrowed strength the ever-burning lamps from thence it brought and proudly threw to ground as things of naught, and underneath his filthy feet did tread the sacred things and holy hests foretaught. Upon this dreadful beast with sevenfold head he set the false Duessa for more awe and dread. The woeful dwarf, which saw his maesters fall whilst he had keeping of his grazing steed, and valiant knight become a caitiff thrall, when all was past, took up his forlorn weed, his mighty armor, missing most at need. His silver shield, now idle, maesterless, his poignant spear that many made to bleed, the rueful monuments of heaviness, and with them all departs to tell his great distress. He had not traveled long, when on the way he woeful lady woeful Una met, fast flying from the Paynim's greedy prey, whilst Saturnine him from pursuit did let, who, when her eyes she on the dwarf had set, and saw the signs that deadly tidings spake, she fell to ground, for sorrowful regret, and lively breath her sad breast did forsake, yet might her piteous heart be seen to pant and quake. The messenger of so unhappy news would fain have died, dead was his heart within, yet outwardly some little comfort shows. At last, recovering heart, he does begin to rub her temples and to chafe her chin, and every tender part does toss and turn. So hardly he the flitted life does win unto her native prison to return. Then gins her grieved ghost thus to lament and mourn. Ye dreary instruments of doleful sight, that do this deadly spectacle behold. Why do ye linger feed on loathed light, or liking find to gaze on earthly mould, sith cruel fates the careful threads unfold, the which my life and love together tied? Now let the stony dart of senseless cold pierce to my heart and pass through every side, and let eternal night so sad sight from me hide. O lightsome day, the lamp of highest Jove, first made by him men's wandering ways to guide. When darkness he in deepest dungeon drove, henceforth thy hated face for ever hide, and shut up heaven's windows shining wide. For earthly sight can naught but sorrow breed, and late repentance, which shall long abide. Mine eyes no more on vanity shall feed, but sealed up with death shall have their deadly meed. Then down again she fell into the ground, but he her quickly reared up again. Thrice did she sink adown in deadly swound, and thrice he her revived with busy pain. At last, when life recovered had the rein, and over-wrestled his strong enemy, with faltering tongue and trembling every vein, Tell on, quoth she, the woeful tragedy the which these relics sad present unto mine eye. Tempestuous fortune hath spent all her spite and thrilling sorrow thrown his utmost dart. Thy sad tongue cannot tell more heavy plight than that I feel and harbor in mine heart. Who hath endured the whole can bear each part. If death it be, it is not the first wound that launched hath my breast with bleeding smart. Begin and end the bitter baleful stound. If less than that I feared, more favor I have found. Then gan the dwarf the whole discourse declare, The subtle trains of Archimago old, The wanton loves of false Fidessa fair, Bought with the blood of vanquished Paynim bold. 
the wretched pair transformed to tree and mould, the house of pride and perils round about, the combat which he with sense joy did hold, the luckless conflict with the giant stout, wherein captived of life or death he stood in doubt. She heard with patience all unto the end, and strove to maister sorrowful essay, which greater grew the more she did contend, and almost rent her tender heart in tway, and love fresh coals unto her fire did lay. For greater love, the greater is the loss. Was never lady loved dearer day than she did love the knight of the red cross, for whose dear sake so many troubles her did toss. At last, when fervent sorrow slake it was, she up arose, resolving him to find alive or dead, and forward forth doth pass, all as the dwarf the way to her assigned. And evermore, in constant careful mind, she fed her wound with fresh renewed bale, long tossed with storms and bet with bitter wind, high over hills and lower down the dale, she wandered many a wood and measured many a vale. At last she chanced by good hap to meet a goodly knight, fair marching by the way together with his squire arrayed meet. His glitter and armor shined far away like glancing light of Phoebus' brightest ray. From top to toe no place appeared bare that deadly dint of steel and danger may. Athwart his breast a baldric grave he wear that shined like twinkling stars with stones most precious rare. And in the midst thereof, one precious stone of wondrous worth, and eke of wondrous mites, shaped like a lady's head, exceeding shone, like Hesperus amongst the lesser lights, and strove for to amaze the weaker sights. Thereby his mortal blade full comely hung in ivory sheath, the carved with curious lights, whose hilts were burnished gold, and handles strong of mother pearl, and buckled with a golden tong. His haughty helmet, horrid all with gold, both glorious brightness and great terror bred. O'er all the crest a dragon did unfold with greedy paws, and over all did spread his golden wings. His dreadful, hideous head, close couched on the beaver, seemed to throw from flaming mouth bright sparkles, fiery red, that sudden horror to faint hearts did show and scaly tail was stretched adown his back full low. Upon the top of all his lofty crest, a bunch of hairs discolored diversely with sprinkled pearl and gold full richly dressed, did shake and seem to dance for jollity, like to an almond tree mounted high on top of green Salinas, all alone, with blossoms brave bedecked daintily, whose tender locks do tremble every one at every little breath that under heaven is blown. His warlike shield all closely covered was, they might of mortal eye be ever seen, not made of steel, nor of enduring brass. Such earthly metals soon consume it been, but all of diamond perfect, pure and clean it frame it was, one massy entire mould, hewn out of adamant rock with engines keen, that point of spear it never piercing could, a dint of direful sword divide the substance wood. The same to white he never wont disclose, but when as monsters huge he would dismay, or daunt unequal armies of his foes, or when the flying heavens he would affray, for so exceeding shone his glistering ray, that Phoebus' golden face it did attaint, as when a cloud his beams doth overlay, and silver Cynthia wexed pale and faint, as when her face is stained with magic art's constraint. No magic arts hereof had any might, nor bloody words of bold enchanters call, but all that was not such as seemed in sight before that shielded fade and sudden fall. And when him list the rascal routs appall, men into stones therewith he could transmew, and stones to dust and dust to naught at all. And when him list the prouder looks subdue, he would them gazing blind, or turn to other hue. Ne let it seem that credence this exceeds, for he that made the same was known right well to have done much more admirable deeds. It Merlin was, which whilom did excel all living whites in might of magic spell. 
Both shield and sword and armor all he wrought for this young prince, when first to arms he fell. But when he died, the fairy queen it brought to Fairyland, where yet it may be seen, if sought, a gentle youth, his dearly loved squire, his spear of heavenwood behind him bear, whose harmful head, thrice heated in the fire, had riven many a breast with pikehead square. A goodly person, and could manage fairy's stubborn steed with curbed cannon bit, who under him did trample as the air, and chafed that any on his back should sit, the iron rowels into frothy foam he bit. When as this knight nigh to the lady drew, with lovely court he gan her entertain. But when he heard her answers loath, he knew some secret sorrow did her heart distrain, which to allay and calm her storming pain, fair feeling words he wisely gan display, and for her humor, fitting purpose fain, to tempt the cause itself for to be ray, wherewith moved, these bleeding words she gan to say. What world's delight or joy of living speech can heart so plunged in sea of sorrows deep and heaped with so huge misfortunes reach? The careful cold beginneth for to creep, and in my heart his iron arrow steep, soon as I think upon my bitter bale. Such helpless harms it's better hidden keep than rip up grief, for it may not avail. My last left comfort is my woes to weep and wail. Ah, lady dear, quoth then the gentle knight, Well may I ween your grief is wondrous great, For wondrous great grief groaneth in my sprite, Whiles thus I hear you of your sorrows treat. But, woeful lady, let me you entreat For to unfold the anguish of your heart. Mishaps are maestered by advice discreet, And counsel mitigates the greatest smart. Found never help, who never would his hurts impart. Oh, but quoth she, great grief will not be told, And can more easily be thought than said. Right so, quoth he, but he that never would, could never, Will to might gives greatest aid. But grief, quoth she, does greater grow displayed, If then it find not help, and breeds despair. Despair breeds not, quoth he, where faith is stayed. No faith so fast, quoth she, but flesh does pair. Flesh may impair, quoth he, but reason can repair. His goodly reason and well-guided speech so deep did settle in her gracious thought that her persuaded to disclose the breach which love and fortune in her heart had wrought, and said, Fair sir, I hope good hap hath brought you to inquire the secrets of my grief, or that your wisdom will direct my thought or that your prowess can me yield relief. Then hear the story sad which I shall tell you brief. The forlorn maiden, whom your eyes have seen the laughing stock of fortune's mockeries, and the only daughter of a king and queen, whose parents dear whilst equal destinies did run about, and their felicities the favorable heavens did not envy, did spread their rule through all the territories which Pison and Euphrates floweth by, and Gion's golden waves do wash continually till that their cruel, cursed enemy and huge great dragon, horrible in sight, bred in the loathly lakes of Tartary, with murderous raven and devouring might their kingdom spoiled, and country wasted quite. Themselves, for fear into his jaws to fall, he forced to castle strong to take their flight, where, fast embarred in mighty brazen wall, he has them now four years besieged to make them thrall. Full many knights adventurous and stout of enterprise that monster to subdue. From every coast that heaven walks about have thither come the noble martial crew that famous hard achievements still pursue. Yet never any could that girland win, but all still shrunk, and still he greater grew. All they, for want of faith, or guilt of sin, the piteous prey of his fierce cruelty have been. At last... They led with far-reported praise, which flying fame throughout the world had spread, of doughty knights whom fairyland did raise, that noble order height of maidenhead, forthwith to court of Glorianne I sped, of Glorianne great queen of glory bright, whose kingdom's seat Cleopolis is red, there to obtain some such redoubted knight that parents dear from tyrants' power deliver might. It was my chance, 
my chance was fair and good, therefore to find a fresh unproved knight, whose manly hands, imbrued in guilty blood, had never been, ne ever by his might had thrown to ground the unregarded right. Yet of his prowess proof he since hath made, I witness am, in many a cruel fight. The groaning ghosts of many one dismayed have felt the bitter dint of his avenging blade. And ye the forlorn relics of his power, his biting sword and his devouring spear, which have endured many a dreadful stour, can speak his prowess that did erst you bear, and well could rule. Now he hath left you here to be the record of his rueful loss, and of my doleful disadventurous dear. O oh, heavy record of the good Red Cross, where have you left your lord that could so well you toss? Well hoped I, and fair beginnings had, that he my captive languor should redeem, till all unweeting an enchanter bad his sense abused, and made him to misdeem my loyalty, not such as it did seem, that rather death desire than such despite. Be judge, ye heavens, that all things right esteem how I him loved, and love with all my might, so thought I eke of him, and think I thought aright. Thenceforth me desolate he quite forsook, to wander where wild fortune would me lead, and other byways he himself betook, where never foot of living white did tread that brought not back the baleful body dead, in which him chanced false Duessa meet, mine only foe, mine only deadly dread, who with her witchcraft and misseeming sweet inveigled him to follow her desires unmeet. At last, by subtle slights, she him betrayed unto his foe, a giant huge and tall, who him disarmed, dissolute, dismayed, unwares surprise it, and with mighty maul the monster merciless him made to fall, whose fall did never foe before behold, and now in darksome dungeon, wretched thrall, remidless, for a he doth him hold. This is my cause of grief, more great than may be told. Ere she had ended all, she gan to faint, but he her comforted and fair bespake, Certes, madame, ye have great cause of plaint, That stoutest heart I ween could cause to quake. But be of cheer and comfort to you take, For till I have acquit your captive knight, Assure yourself, I will you not forsake. His cheerful words revived her cheerless sprite, So forth they went, the dwarf them guiding ever right. Fair virgin, to redeem her dear, brings Arthur to the fight, who slays the giant, wounds the beast, and strips Duessa quite. Ay me, how many perils do enfold the righteous man to make him daily fall, were not that heavenly grace doth him uphold, and steadfast truth acquite him out of all. Her love is firm, her care continual. So oft is he, through his own foolish pride or weakness, is to sinful bands made thrall. Else should this Red Cross Knight in bands have died, for whose deliverance she this prince doth thither guide. They sadly travelled thus, until they came nigh to a castle builded strong and high. Then cried the dwarf, Lo, yonder is the same in which my lord, my liege, doth luckless lie, thrall to that giant's hateful tyranny. Therefore, dear sir, your mighty powers assay, the noble knight alighted by and by from lofty steed, and bade the lady stay to see what end of fight should him befall that day. So with the squire, the admirer of his might, he marched forth towards that castle wall, whose gates he found fast shut, ne living white toward the same, nor answer comer's call. Then took that squire an horn of bugles small, which hung adown his side in twisted gold and tassels gay. Wide wonders over all of that same horn's great virtues were untold, which had it proved been in uses manifold. Was never white that heard that shrilling sound, but trembling fear did feel in every vein. Three miles it might be easy heard around, and echoes three answered itself again. No false enchantment nor deceitful train might once abide the terror of that blast, but presently was void and wholly vain. 
No gate so strong, no lock so firm and fast, But with that piercing noise flew open quite, or brast. The same before the giant's gate he blew, That all the castle quaked from the ground, And every door of free will open flew. The giant's self, dismayed with that sound, Where he with his duessa dalliance found, In haste came rushing forth from inner bower with Staring countenance stern as one astound and staggering steps to weet what sudden stour had wrought that horror strange and dared his dreaded power. And after him the proud Duessa came high mounted on her many headed beast, and every head with fiery tongue did flame, and every head was crowned on his crest, and bloody mouthed with late cruel feast. That when the knight beheld his mighty shield upon his manly arm he soon addressed, and at him fiercely flew with courage filled, and eager greediness through every member thrilled. Therewith the giant buckled him to fight, inflamed with scornful wrath and high disdain, and lifting up his dreadful club on height, all armed with ragged snubs and naughty grain, him thought at first encounter to have slain. But wise and wary was that noble peer, and lightly leaping from so monstrous main, did fair avoid the violence him near. It booted not to think such thunderbolts to bear. Ne shame he thought to shun so hideous might, the idle stroke and forcing furious way, missing the mark of his misaimed sight, did fall to ground and with his heavy sway so deeply dinted in the driven clay that three yards deep a furrow up did throw. The sad earth, wounded with so sore a say, did groan full grievous underneath the blow, and trembling with strange fear did like an earthquake show. As when Almighty Jove, in wrathful mood, to wreak the guilt of mortal sins is bent, hurls forth his thundering dart with deadly food, enrolled in flames and smouldering dreariment, through riven clouds and molten firmament, the fierce three-forked engine making way both lofty towers and highest trees hath rent, and all that might his angry passage stay, and shooting in the earth casts up a mount of clay. His boisterous club so buried in the ground he could not rear it up again so light, but that the knight him at a vantage found, and whilst he strove his cumbered club to quite out of the earth, with blade all burning bright he smote off his left arm, which like a block did fall to ground deprived of native might. Large streams of blood out of the trunked stock forth gushed like fresh water stream from riven rock. Dismayed with so desperate deadly wound, and eke impatient of unwanted pain, he loudly brayed with beastly yelling sound that all the fields rebellowed again, as great a noise as when in Cimbrian plain, and herd of bulls, whom kindly rage doth sting, do for the milky mother's want complain, and fill the fields with troublous bellowing. The neighbor woods around with hollow murmur ring. That when his dear Duessa heard, and saw the evil stound that dangered her estate, unto his aid she hastily did draw her dreadful beast, who, swollen with blood of late, came ramping forth with proud presumptuous gait, and threatened all his heads like flaming brands. But him the squire made quickly to retreat, encountering fierce with single sword in hand, and twixt him and his lord did like a bulwark stand. The proud Duessa, full of wrathful spite and fierce disdain to be affronted so, enforced her purple beast with all her might that stop out of the way to overthrow scorning the let of so unequal foe. But now the more would that courageous swain to her yield passage gainst his lord to go, but with outrageous strokes did him restrain, and with his body barred the way atwixt him twain. Then took the angry witch her golden cup, which still she bore replete with magic arts. Death and despair did many thereof sup, and secret poison through their inner parts, the eternal bale of heavy wounded hearts, which after charms and some enchantments said, she lightly sprinkled on his weaker parts. Therewith his sturdy courage soon was quayed, and all his senses were with sudden dread dismayed. 
So down he fell before the cruel beast, who on his neck his bloody claws did seize, that life nigh crushed out of his panting breast. No power he had to stir, nor will to rise. That when the careful knight gan well advise, he lightly left the foe with whom he fought, and to the beast gan turn his enterprise, for wondrous anguish in his heart it wrought to see his loved squire into such thraldom brought and high advancing his bloodthirsty blade, stroke one of those deformed heads so sore that of his puissance proud example made. His monstrous scalp down to his teeth it tore, and that misformed shape misshaped more. A sea of blood gushed from the gaping wound, that her gay garments stained with filthy gore, and overflowed all the field around, that over shoes in blood he waded on the ground. Thereat he roared for exceeding pain, that to have heard great horror would have bred, and scourging the empty air with his long train, through great impatience of his grieved head, his gorgeous rider from her lofty stead would have cast down and trod in dirty mire, had not the giant soon her succored, who all enraged with smart and frantic ire came hurtling in full fierce and forced the knight retire. The force which want in two to be dispersed, in one alone left hand he now unites, which is through rage more strong than both were erst, with which his hideous club aloft he dights, and at his foe with furious rigor smites, that strongest oak might seem to overthrow. The stroke upon his shield so heavy lights, that to the ground it doubleth him full low. What mortal wight could ever bear so monstrous blow? And in his fall, his shield that covered was, did lose his veil by chance, and open flew. The light whereof that heaven's light did pass, such blazing brightness through the air threw, that I moot not the same endure to view. Which, when the giant spied with staring eye, he down let fall his arm, and soft withdrew his weapon huge, that heaved was on high, for to have slain the man that on the ground did lie. And eke the fruitful-headed beast, amazed at flashing beams of that sunshiny shield, became stark blind, and all his senses dazed, that down he tumbled on the dirty field, and seemed himself as conquered to yield. Whom, when his maestress proud perceived to fall, whilst yet his feeble feet for faintness reeled, unto the giant loudly she gan call, O oh, help, Orgolio, help, or else we perish all. At her so piteous cry was much amoved her champion stout, and for to aid his friend again his wanted angry weapon proved, but all in vain, for he has read his end in that bright shield and all their forces spend themselves in vain. For since that glancing sight, he hath no power to hurt, nor to defend. As where the Almighty's lightning brawn does light, it dims the day's adine, and daunts the senses quite. Whom when the prince to battle new addressed, and threatening high his dreadful stroke, did see, his sparkling blade about his head he blessed, and smote off quite his right leg by the knee, that down he tumbled as an aged tree high growing on the top of rocky cliff, whose heart strings with keen steel nigh to and be, the mighty trunk half rent, with ragged rift, doth roll adown the rocks, and fall with fearful drift. Or, as a castle reared high and round, by subtle engines and malicious slight, is undermined from the lowest ground, and her foundation forced and feebled quite, at last down falls, and with her heaped height her hasty ruin does more heavy make, and yields itself unto the victor's might. Such was this giant's fall, that seemed to shake the steadfast globe of earth, as it for fear did quake. The knight then, lightly leaping to the prey, with mortal steel him smote again so sore that headless his unwieldy body lay, all wallowed in his own foul bloody gore, which flowed from his wounds in wondrous store. But soon as breath out of his breast did pass, that huge great body which the giant bore was vanished quite, and of that monstrous mass was nothing left, but like an empty bladder was.
whose grievous fall when false duessa spied her golden cup she cast unto the ground and crowned mitre rudely threw aside such piercing grief her stubborn heart did wound that she could not endure that doleful stound but leaving all behind her fled away the lightfoot squire her quickly turned around and by hard means enforcing her to stay so brought unto his lord as his deserved prey the royal virgin which beheld from far in pensive plight and sad perplexity the whole achievement of this doubtful war came running fast to greet his victory with sober gladness and mild modesty and with sweet joyous cheer him thus bespake fair branch of noblesse flower of chivalry that with your worth the world amazed make how shall i quite the pains ye suffer for my sake and you fresh bud of virtue springing fast whom these sad eyes saw nigh unto death's door what hath poor virgin for such peril past wherewith you to reward except therefore my simple self and service evermore and he that high does sit and all things see with equal eyes their merits to restore behold what ye this day have done for me and what i cannot quite requite with usury but sith the heavens and your fair handling have made you maester of the field this day your fortune maester eke with governing and well begun end all so well i pray now let that wicked woman scape away for she it is that did my lord bethrall my dearest lord and deep in dungeon lay where he his better days hath wasted all o oh, hear how piteous he to you for aid does call Forthwith he gave in charge unto his squire that scarlet whore to keep and carefully, whilst he himself with greedy great desire into the castle entered forcibly, where living creature none he did espy. Then gan he loudly through the house to call, but no man cared to answer to his cry. There reigned a solemn silence over all, nor voice was heard, nor white was seen in bower or hall. At last, with creeping crooked pace, forth came an old, old man, with beard as white as snow, that on a staff his feeble steps did frame, and guide his weary gait both to and fro. For his eyesight him failed long ago, and on his arm a bunch of keys he bore, the which unused rust did overgrow. Those were the keys of every inner door, but he could not them use, but kept them still in store. But very uncouth sight was to behold how he did fashion his untoward pace, for as he forward moved his footing old, so backward still was turned his wrinkled face, unlike to men who ever as they trace both feet and face one way are wont to lead. This was the ancient keeper of that place, and foster father of the giant dead. His name Ignaro did his nature right or read. His reverend hairs and holy gravity the knight much honoured as beseemed well, and gently asked where all the people be which in that stately building want to dwell. Who answered him full soft he could not tell. Again he asked where that same knight was laid whom great Orgoglio with his puissance fell had made his caitive thrall. Again he said, he could not tell, nay ever other answer made. Then asked he, which way he in might pass? He could not tell, again he answered. Thereat the courteous knight displeased was, and said, Old sire, it seems thou hast not read how ill it sits with that same silver head in vain to mock, or mocked in vain to be. But if thou be, as thou art portrayed with nature's pen, in age's grave degree, a reed in graver wise what I demand of thee. His answer likewise was he could not tell, who senseless speech and doted ignorance, when, as the noble prince had marked well, he guessed his nature by his countenance, and calmed his wrath with goodly temperance. Then to him stepping, from his arm did reach those keys, and made himself free entrance. Each door he opened without any breach. 
There was no bar to stop, nor foe him to impeach. There all within full rich arrayed he found, with royal arras and resplendent gold, and did with store of everything abound, that greatest prince's presence might behold. But all the floor, too filthy to be told, with blood of guiltless babes and innocents true, which there were slain as sheep out of the fold, defiled was, that dreadful was to view, and sacred ashes over it was strowed new. And there beside of marble stone was built an altar, carved with cunning imagery, on which true Christian's blood was often spilt, and holy martyrs often done to die, with cruel malice and strong tyranny, whose blessed sprites from underneath the stone to God for vengeance cried continually, and with great grief were often heard to groan, that hardest heart would bleed to hear their piteous moan. Through every room he sought, and every bower, but nowhere could he find that woeful thrall. At last he came unto an iron door, that fast was locked, but key found not at all amongst that bunch to open the fall. But in the same a little grate was pight, through which he sent his voice, and loud did call with all his power to wit if living wight were housed there within, whom he enlarge in might. Therewith an hollow, dreary, murmuring voice, these piteous plaints and dolors did resound. Oh, who is that which brings me happy choice of death, that here lie dying every stound, yet live perforce in baleful darkness bound? For now three moons have changed thrice their hue, and have been thrice hid underneath the ground since I the heaven's cheerful face did view. O oh, welcome thou that dust of death bring tidings true. Which when that champion heard, with piercing point of pity dear his heart was thrilled sore, and trembling horror ran through every joint for ruth of gentle knight so foul forlore. Which shaking off, he rent that iron door with furious force and indignation fell. Where entered in, his foot could find no floor, but all a deep descent as dark as hell, that breathed ever forth a filthy, baneful smell. But neither darkness foul, nor filthy bands, nor noyous smell his purpose could withhold. Entire affection hateth nicer hands but that with constant zeal and courage bold, after long pains and labors manifold, he found the means that prisoner up to rear, whose feeble thighs, unable to uphold his pined course, him scarce to light could bear, a rueful spectacle of death and ghastly drear. His sad, dull eyes, deep sunk in hollow pits, could not endure the unwanted sun to view, his bare, thin cheeks, for want of better bits and empty sides, deceived of their due, could make a stony heart his hap to rue. His raw-bone arms, whose mighty brawned bowers were wont to rive steel plates and helmets hue, were clean consumed, and all his vital powers decayed, and all his flesh shrunk up like withered flowers. Whom when his lady saw, to him she ran with hasty joy, to see him made her glad, and sad to rue his visage pale and wan, who erst in flowers of freshest youth was clad. Though when her well of tears she wasted had, she said, Ah, dearest Lord, what evil star on you hath frowned, and poured his influence bad, that of yourself ye thus be robbed are, and this misseeming hue your manly looks doth mar. But welcome now, my lord, in weal or woe, whose presence I have lacked too long a day, and fie on fortune mine avowed foe, whose wrathful wreaks themselves do now allay, and for these wrongs shall treble penance pay of treble good, good grows of evil's brief. The cheerless man whom sorrow did dismay had no delight to treaten of his grief, his long-endured famine needed more relief. Fair lady, then said that victorious knight, the things that grievous were to do or bear, them to renew I want breeds no delight. 
Best music breeds delight in loathing ear, but the only good that grows of passed fear is to be wise and wear of like again. This day's example hath this lesson dear deep written in my heart with iron pen that bliss may not abide in state of mortal men. Henceforth, Sir Knight, take to you wanted strength, and maister these mishaps with patient might. Lo, where your foe lies stretched in monstrous length, and lo, that wicked woman in your sight, the root of all your care and wretched plight, now in your power to let her live or die. To do her die, quoth Una, were despite and shame to venge so weak an enemy. But spoil her of her scarlet robe, and let her fly. So as she bade that which they disarrayed, and robbed of royal robes and purple pall, and ornaments that richly were displayed, nespered they to strip her naked all. Then, when they had despoiled her tire and call, such as she was their eyes might her behold that her misshaped parts did them appall, a loathly, wrinkled hag, ill-favored, old, whose secret filth good manners biddeth not be told. Her crafty head was altogether bald, and, as in hate of honorable eld, was overgrown with scurf and filthy scald. Her teeth out of her rotten gums were felled, and her sour breath abominably smelled. Her dryad dugs, like bladders lacking wind, hung down, and filthy matter from them welled. Her rizzled skin, as rough as maple rind, so scabby was, that would have loathed all womankind. Her nether parts, the shame of all her kind, my chaster muse, for shame doth blush to write. But at her rump she growing had behind a fox's tail, with dung all foully dight, and eke her feet most monstrous were in sight, for one of them was like an eagle's claw, with griping talents armed to greedy fight, the other like a bear's uneven paw, more ugly shape, yet never living creature saw, which when the knights beheld amazed they were, and wondered at so foul deformed white. Such, then, said Una, as she seemeth here, such is the face of falsehood, such the sight of foul duessa, when her borrowed light is laid away, and counterfeasance known. Thus, when they had the witch disrobed quite, and all her filthy feature open shone, they let her go at will, and wander ways unknown. She, flying fast from heaven's hated face, and from the world that her discovered wide, fled to the wasteful wilderness apace, from living eyes her open shame to hide, and lurked in rocks and caves long unespied. But that fair crew of knights, and Una fair, did in that castle afterwards abide to rest themselves, and weary powers repair where store they found of all that dainty was and rare. His loves and lineage Arthur tells, the knights knit friendly bands. Sir Trevisan flies from despair, whom Red Cross Knight withstands. O goodly golden chain, wherewith a fear the virtues linked are in lovely wise, and noble minds of your alliad were in brave pursuit of chivalrous emprise, that none did other safety despise, nor aid and vie to him in need that stands, but friendly each did other's praise devise how to advance with favorable hands, as this good prince redeemed the Red Cross Knight from bands, who, when their powers impaired through labor long, with due repast they had recured well, and that weak captive white now wexed strong, them lest no longer there at leisure dwell, but forward fare as their adventures fell. But ere they parted, Una fair besought that stranger knight his name and nation tell, lest so great good as he for her had wrought should die unknown and buried be in thankless thought. Fair virgin, said the prince, ye may require a thing without the compass of my wit. For both the lineage and the certain sire from which I sprung from me are hidden yet. 
For all so soon as life did me admit into this world and showed heaven's light, from mother's pap I taken was unfit, and straight delivered to a fairy knight, to be upbrought in gentle thews and martial might. Unto old Timon he me brought belive, old Timon, who in youthly years hath been in warlike feats the expertest man alive, and is the wisest now on earth, I ween. His dwelling is low in a valley green, under the foot of Roran, mossy hoar, from whence the river Dee, as silver clean, his tumbling billows rolls with gentle roar. There all my days he trained me up in virtuous lore. Thither the great magician Merlin came, as was his use, oft times to visit me, for he had charged my discipline to frame, and tutor's nourisher to oversee. Him oft and oft I asked in privity of what loins and what lineage I did spring, whose answer bade me still assured be that I was son and heir unto a king, as time in her just term the truth to light should bring. Well, worthy imp, said then the lady gent, and pupil fit for such a tutor's hand, but what adventure or what high intent hath brought you hither into fairyland? A reed, Prince Arthur, crown of martial band. Full hard it is, quoth he, to read aright the course of heavenly cause, or understand the secret meaning of the eternal might that rules men's ways and rules the thoughts of living wight. For whither he, through fatal deep foresight, me hither sent, for cause to me unguessed, or that fresh bleeding wound, which day and night, while on doth rankle in my riven breast, with forced fury following his behest, me hither brought, by ways yet never found, you to have helped, I hold myself yet blessed. Ah, courteous knight, quoth she, what secret wound could ever find to grieve the gentlest heart on ground? Dear dame, quoth he, you sleeping sparks awake, which troubled once into huge flames will grow, ne ever will their fervent fury slake, till living moisture into smoke do flow, and wasted life do lie in ashes low. Yet sith in silence lesseneth not my fire, but told it flames and hidden it does glow, I will reveal what ye so much desire. Ah, love, lay down thy bow the whiles I may respire. It was in freshest flower of youth the years, when courage first does creep in manly chest, then first the coal of kindly heat appears to kindle love in every living breast. But me had warned old Timon's wise behest those creeping flames by reason to subdue, before their rage grew to so great unrest as miserable lovers used to rue, which still wex old in woe, whiles woe still wexeth new. That idle name of love and lover's life, as loss of time and virtue's enemy, I ever scorned, and joyed to stir up strife in midst of their mournful tragedy. I want to laugh when them I heard to cry, and blow the fire which them to ashes print. Their god himself, grieved at my liberty, shot many a dart at me with fierce intent, but I them warded all with wary government. But all in vain. No fort can be so strong, ne fleshly breast can armed be so sound, but will at last be won with battery long, or unawares at disadvantage found. Nothing is sure that grows on earthly ground, and who most trusts in arm of fleshly might, and boasts in beauty's chain not to be bound, doth soonest fall in disadventurous fight, and yields his caitive neck to victor's most despite. And sample make of him your hapless joy, and of myself, now mated as you see, whose prouder vaunt that proud avenging boy did soon pluck down and curbed my liberty. For on a day pricked forth with jollity of looser life and heat of hardiment, ranging the forest wide on coarser free, the fields, the floods, the heavens, with one consent did seem to laugh on me and favor mine intent. For wearied with my sports, I did alight from lofty steed, and down to sleep me laid. 
The verdant grass my couch did goodly dight, And pillow was my helmet fair displayed. Whiles every sense the humor sweet embayed, And slumbering soft my heart did steal away, Meseemed by my side a royal maid Her dainty limbs full softly down did lay. So fair a creature yet saw never sunny day. Most goodly glee and lovely blandishment she to me made, And bade me love her dear, for dearly sure her love was to me bent, As when just time expired should appear. But whether dreams delude or true it were, Was never heart so ravished with delight, Ne living man like words did ever hear, As she to me delivered all that night. And at her parting said she, Queen of fairy sight. When I awoke and found her place devoid, And naught but pressed grass where she had lien, I sorrowed all so much as erst I joyed, And washed all her place with watery iron. From that day forth I loved that face divine, From that day forth I cast in careful mind To seek her out with labor and long time, And never vow to rest till her I find. Nine months I seek in vain, yet nil that vow unbind. Thus as he spake his visage wexed pale, And change of hue great passion did bewray. Yet still he strove to cloak his inward bale, And hide the smoke that did his fire display. Till gentle Una thus to him gan say, O happy queen of fairies, That hast found mongst many One that with his prowess May defend thine honor, And thy foes confound. True loves are often sown, But seldom grow on ground. Thine, O oh, then, said the gentle Red Cross Knight, Next to that lady's love shall be the place, O fairest virgin, full of heavenly light, Whose wondrous faith, exceeding earthly race, Was firmest fixed in mine extremest case. And you, my lord, the patron of my life, Of that great queen may well gain worthy grace, For only worthy you through prowess brief, If living man mote worthy be to be her leaf. So diversely discoursing of their loves, The golden sun his glistering head gan shew, And sad remembrance now the prince moves, With fresh desire his voyage to pursue, All's Una earned her travel to renew. Then those two knights, fast friendship for to bind, And love establish each to other true, Gave goodly gifts, the signs of grateful mind, and eke as pledges firm, right hands together joined. Prince Arthur gave a box of diamonds sure, embowed with gold and gorgeous ornament, wherein were closed few drops of liquor pure, of wondrous worth and virtue excellent, that any wound could heal incontinent, which to requite the Red Cross Knight him gave a book, wherein his Saviour's testament was writ with golden letters rich and brave, a work of wondrous grace, and able souls to save. Thus been they parted, Arthur on his way to seek his love, And other for to fight with Una's foe, that all her realm did pray. But she, now weighing the decayed plight And shrunken sinews of her chosen knight, Would not a while her forward course pursue, Ne bring him forth in face of dreadful fight, Till he recovered had his former hue. For him to be yet weak and weary well she knew. So as they travelled, lo, they gan espy an armed knight towards them gallop fast, That seemed from some feared foe to fly, Or other grisly thing that him aghast. Still as he fled, his eye was backward cast, As if his fear still followed him behind. Alls flew his steed, as he his bands had brassed, And with his winged heels did tread the wind, As he had been a foal of Pegasus's kind. Nigh as he drew, they might perceive his head to be unarmed, And curled uncombed hairs upstaring stiff, Dismayed with uncouth dread. 
nor drop of blood in all his face appears, nor life in limb, and to increase his fears, in foul reproach of knighthood's fair degree, about his neck an hempen rope he wears, that with his glistering arms does ill agree. But he of rope or arms has now no memory. The Red Cross Knight toward him crossed fast to weet what Mr. White was so dismayed. There he him finds all senseless and aghast, that of himself he seemed to be afraid, whom hardly he from flying forward stayed, till he these words to him deliver might. Sir Knight, a reed who hath ye thus arrayed, and eke from whom make ye this hasty flight? For never knight I saw in such misseeming plight. He answered not at all, but adding new fear to his first amazement, staring wide with stony eyes and heartless hollow hue, astonished stood, as one that had espied infernal furies, with their chains untied. Him yet again and yet again bespake the gentle knight, who not to him replied, but trembling every joint did inly quake, and faltering tongue at last these words seemed forth to shake. For God's dear love, Sir Knight, do not me stay, for lo, he comes, he comes fast after me. Eft, looking back, would fain have run away, but he him forced to stay and tell him free the secret cause of his perplexity. Yet now the more by his bold, hearty speech could his blood-frozen heart emboldened be, but through his boldness rather fear did reach. Yet forced, at last he made through silence sudden breach. And am I now in safety sure, quoth he, from him that would have forced me to die? And is the point of death now turned from me, that I may tell this hapless history? Fear not, quoth he, no danger now is nigh. Then shall I you recount a rueful case, said he, the which with this unlucky eye I late beheld, and had not greater grace me reft from it, had been partaker of the place. I lately chanced, would I had never chanced, with a fair knight to keep in company, Sir Terwinheit, that well himself advanced in all affairs, and was both bold and free, but not so happy as most happy be. He loved, as was his lot, a lady chent, that him again loved in the least degree. For she was proud and of too high intent, and joyed to see her lover languish and lament, from whom returning sad and comfortless, as on the way together we did fare, we met that villain, God from him me bless, that cursed wight, from whom I scaped while e'er, a man of hell that calls himself despair, who first us greets, and after fair reads of tidings strange, and of adventures rare. So creeping close as snake in hidden weeds, inquireth of our states, and of our knightly deeds, which when he knew, and felt our feeble hearts embossed with bale, and bitter, biting grief, which love had launched with his deadly darts, with wounding words and terms of foul reprief, he plucked from us all hope of due relief, that erst us held in love of lingering life, then, hopeless, heartless, gan the cunning thief persuade us die to stint all further strife. To me he lent this rope, to him a rusty knife, with which sad instrument of hasty death that woeful lover, loathing linger light, a wide way made to let forth living breath. But I, more fearful, or more lucky wight, Dismayed with that deformed, dismal sight, Fled fast away, half dead with dying fear, Nay yet assured of life by you, Sir Knight, Whose like infirmity, like chance may bear, But God you never let his charmed speeches hear. How may a man, said he, with idle speech, Be one to spoil the castle of his health? I wot, quoth he, whom trial late did teach, That like would not for all this world is wealth. His subtle tongue like dropping honey melteth into the heart, and searcheth every vein, that ere one be aware, by secret stealth his power is reft, and weakness doth remain. Oh, never, sir, desire to try his guileful train. Certes, said he, hence shall I never rest, till I that treacherous art have heard and tried. And you, sir knight, whose name mote I request, 
of grace do me unto his cabin guide. I that hight Trevisan, quoth he, will ride against my liking, back to do you grace. But nor for gold nor glee will I abide by you when ye arrive in that same place, for lever had I die than see his deadly face. Ere long they come where that same wicked wight his dwelling has, low in an hollow cave, far underneath a craggy cliff to pite, dark, doleful, dreary, like a greedy grave that still for carrion carcasses doth crave. On top whereof, a dwelt the ghastly owl, shrieking his baleful note, which ever drave far from that haunt all other cheerful fowl. And all about it wandering ghosts did wail and howl. And all about old stalks and stubs of trees, whereon nor fruit nor leaf was ever seen, did hang upon the ragged rocky knees, on which had many wretches hanged been, whose carcasses were scattered on the green and thrown about the cliffs. Arrived there, that barehead knight, for dread and doleful teen, would fain have fled, ne durst approach a near, but the other forced him stay and comforted in fear. At darksome cave they enter, where they find that cursed man low sitting on the ground, musing full sadly in his sullen mind. His greasy locks, long rowan and unbound, disordered hung about his shoulders round, and hid his face, through which his hollow eyne looked deadly dull, and stared as astound. His raw-boned cheeks, through penury and pine were shrunk into his jaws as he did never dine. His garment, not but many ragged clouts, with thorns together pinned and patched was, the which his naked sides he wrapped about, and him beside there lay upon the grass a dreary corse, whose life away did pass, all wallowed in his own yet lukewarm blood, that from his wound yet welled fresh, alas, in which a rusty knife fast fixed stood, and made an open passage for the gushing flood. Which piteous spectacle approving true the woeful tale that Trevisan had told, when as the gentle Red Cross Knight did view, with fiery zeal he burnt in courage bold him to avenge before his blood were cold, and to the villain said, Thou damned wight, the author of this fact we here behold, what justice can but judge against thee right, with thine own blood to price his blood here shed in sight? What frantic fit, quoth he, hath thus distraught thee, foolish man, so rash a doom to give? What justice ever other judgment taught but he should die who merits not to live? None else to death this man despairing drive, But his own guilty mind deserving death. Is then unjust to each his due to give? Or let him die that loatheth living breath? Or let him die at ease that liveth here uneath? Who travels by the weary wandering way To come unto his wished home in haste, And meets a flood that doth his passage stay? Is not great grace to help him overpast, Or free his feet that in the mire stick fast? Most envious man that grieves at neighbor's good, And fond that joyest in the woe thou hast, Why wilt not let him pass that long hath stood upon the bank, Yet wilt thyself not pass the flood? He there does now enjoy eternal rest and happy ease, which thou dost want and crave, and further from it daily wanderest. What if some little pain the passage have, that makes frail flesh to fear the bitter wave? Is not short pain well born that brings long ease, and lays the soul to sleep in quiet grave? Sleep after toil? Port after stormy seas, ease after war, death after life, does greatly please. The knight much wondered at his sudden wit, and said, The term of life is limited, nay may a man prolong nor shorten it. The soldier may not move from watchful stead, 
nor leave his stand until his captain bed. Who life did limit by almighty doom, quoth he, knows best the terms established, and he that points the sentinel his room doth license him depart at sound of morning droom. Is not his deed whatever thing is done in heaven and earth? Did not he all create to die again? All ends that was begun. Their times in his eternal book of fate are written sure and have their certain date. Who then can strive with strong necessity that holds the world in his still changing state, or shun the death ordained by destiny? When hour of death is come, let none ask whence nor why. The longer life, I wot, the greater sin, the greater sin, the greater punishment. All those great battles which thou boasts to win through strife and bloodshed and avengement, now praised, hereafter, dear thou shalt repent. For life must life, and blood must blood repay. Is not enough thy evil life forspent? For he that once hath missed the right way, the further he doth go, the further he doth stray. Then do no further go, no further stray, but here lie down, and to thy rest betake, vill to prevent that life ensuing may. For what hath life that may it love it make, and gives not rather cause it to forsake? Fear, sickness, age, loss, labor, sorrow, strife, pain, hunger, cold, that makes the heart to quake. And ever fickle fortune rageth rife, all which and thousands mo do make a loathsome life. Thou, wretched man, of death hast greatest need, if in true balance thou wilt weigh thy state. For never knight that dared warlike deed more luckless disadventures did a mate. Witness the dungeon deep wherein of late thy life shut up, for death so oft did call, and... Though good luck prolonged hath thy date, Yet death then would the like mishaps forestall, Into the which hereafter thou mayest happen fall. Why then dost thou, O man of sin, Desire to draw thy days forth to their last degree? Is not the measure of thy sinful hire high heaped up with huge iniquity Against the day of wrath to burden thee? Is not enough that to this lady mild thou falsed hast thy faith with perjury, and sold thyself to serve Duessa viled, with whom in all abuse thou hast thyself defiled? Is not he just that all this doth behold from highest heaven, and bears an equal eye? Shall he thy sins up in his knowledge fold, and guilty be of thine impiety? Is not his law, let every sinner die, die shall all flesh? What then must needs be done? Is it not better to do willingly than linger till the glass be all outrun? Death is the end of woes. Die soon, O fairy son. The knight was much and moved with his speech that as a sword's point through his heart did pierce and in his conscience made a secret breach, well knowing true all that he did rehearse, and to his fresh remembrance did reverse the ugly view of his deformed crimes, that all his manly powers it did disperse, as he were charmed with enchanted rhymes, that oftentimes he quaked, and fainted oftentimes. In which amazement, when the miscreant perceived him to waver weak and frail, whilst trembling horror did his conscience daunt, and hellish anguish did his soul assail, to drive him to despair and quite to quail, he showed him, painted in a table plain, the damned ghosts that do in torments wail, and thousand fiends that do them endless pain with fire and brimstone, which for ever shall remain. The sight whereof so throughly him dismayed, That naught but death before his eyes he saw, And ever burning wrath before him laid, By righteous sentence of the Almighty's law. 
Then gan the villain him to overcraw, and brought unto him swords, ropes, poison, fire, and all that might him to perdition draw, and bade him choose what death he would desire. For death was due to him that had provoked God's ire. But when as none of them he saw him take, he to him wrought a dagger sharp and keen, and gave it him in hand. His hand did quake and tremble like a leaf of aspen green, and troubled blood through his pale face was seen to come and go with tidings from the heart, as it a running messenger had been. At last, resolved to work his final smart, he lifted up his hand that back again did start, which, when as Una saw, through every vein the cruddled cold ran to her well of life as in a swoon, but soon relieved again, out of his hand she snatched the cursed knife, and threw it to the ground, enraged rife, and to him said, Fie, fie, faint-hearted knight, what meanest thou by this reproachful strife? Is this the battle which thou vaunts to fight with that fire-mouthed dragon, horrible and bright? Come, come away, frail, silly, fleshly white. Ne let vain words bewitch thy manly heart. Ne devilish thoughts dismay thy constant sprite. In heavenly mercies hast thou not a part. Why shouldst thou then despair the chosen heart? Where justice grows, there grows eke greater grace, the which doth quench the brand of hellish smart, and that accursed handwriting doth deface. Arise, Sir Knight, arise, and leave this cursed place. So up he rose, and thence amounted straight, which, when the carl beheld and saw his guest, would safe depart, for all his subtle slight, he chose an halter from among the rest, and with it hung himself, unbid, unblessed. But death he could not work himself thereby, for thousand times he saw himself addressed. Yet, nevertheless, it could not do him die, till he should die as last, that is, eternally. Her faithful knight, fair Una, brings to house of holiness, where he is taught repentance and the way to heavenly bless. What man is he that boasts of fleshly might and vain assurance of mortality, which all so soon as it doth come to fight against spiritual foes yields by and by, or from the field most cowardly doth fly. Now let the man ascribe it to his skill that thorough grace hath gained victory. If any strength we have, it is to ill, but all the good is God's, both power and eke will. By that which lately happened, Una saw that this her knight was feeble and too faint and all his sinews waxen weak and raw through long imprisonment and hard constraint which he endured in his late restraint, that yet he was unfit for bloody fight. Therefore to cherish him with diet's daint she cast to bring him where he cheerin might till he recovered had his late decayed plight. There was an ancient house not far away renowned throughout the world for sacred lore and pure unspotted life. So well they say it governed was, and guided evermore through wisdom of a matron grave and whore, whose only joy was to relieve the needs of wretched souls and help the helpless poor. All night she spent in bidding of her beads, and all the day in doing good and godly deeds. Dame Celia, men did her call, as thought from heaven to come or thither to arise, the mother of three daughters well upbrought in goodly thews and godly exercise. The eldest two, most sober, chaste, and wise, Fidelia and Speranza virgins were, though spoused, yet wanting wedlock solemn eyes. But fair Carissa to a lovely fear was linked, and by him had many pledges dear. Arrived there, the door they find fast locked for it was warily watched night and day for fear of many foes. But when they knocked, the porter opened unto them straightway. He was an aged sire, all hoary gray, with looks full lowly cast and gait full slow, want on a staff his feeble steps to stay, hide humilta. They pass in stooping low, for straight and narrow was the way which he did show. Each goodly thing is hardest to begin, 
But entered in a spacious court they see, Both plain and pleasant to be walked in, Where then does meet a Franklin, fair and free, And entertains with comely courteous glee. His name was Zeal, that him right well became, For in his speeches and behavior He did labor lively to express the same, And gladly did them guide till to the hall they came. There, fairly, them receives a gentle squire of mild demeanor and rare courtesy, right cleanly clad in comely sad attire, in word and deed that showed great modesty and knew his good to all of each degree, height reverence. He them with speeches meet, does fair entreat, no courting nicety but simple true and eke unfeigned sweet, as might become a squire so great persons to greet. And afterwards them to his dame he leads, that aged dame, the lady of the place, who all this while was busy at her beads, which done she up arose with seemly grace, and toward them full matron lay did pace. Where when that fairest Una she beheld, whom well she knew to spring from heavenly race, her heart with joy unwanted inly swelled, as feeling wondrous comfort in her weaker eld. And her embracing said, O happy earth, whereon thy innocent feet do ever tread, most virtuous virgin born of heavenly birth, that to redeem thy woeful parents' head from tyrant's rage and ever dying dread, hast wandered through the world now long a day, yet ceasest not thy weary souls to lead. What grace hath thee now hither brought this way, or done thy feeble feet unweeting hither stray? Strange thing it is an errant night to see here in this place, or any other wight that hither turns his steps. So few there be that chose the narrow path, or seek the right. All keep the broad highway, and take delight with many, rather for to go astray, and be partakers of their evil plight, than with a few to walk the rightest way. O oh, foolish men, why haste ye to your own decay? Thyself to see, and tired limbs to rest, O matron sage, quoth she, I hither came, and this good knight his way with me addressed, led with thy praises and broad blazed fame, that up to heaven is blown. The ancient dame him goodly greeted in her modest guise, and entertained them both as best became, with all the curtsies that she could devise, nor wanted aught to show her bounteous or wise. Thus, as they gan of sundry things devise, Lo, two most goodly virgins came in place, a linked arm in arm, in lovely wise, with countenance demure and modest grace. They numbered even steps and equal pace, of which the eldest, that Fidelia hight, like sunny beams threw from her crystal face, that could have dazed the rash beholder's sight, and round about her head did shine like heaven's light. She was arrayed all in lily white, and in her right hand bore a cup of gold, with wine and water filled up to the height, in which a serpent did himself enfold, that horror made to all that did behold. But she no whit did change her constant mood, and in her other hand she fast did hold a book, that was both signed and sealed with blood, wherein dark things were writ hard to be understood. Her younger sister, that Speranza hight, was clad in blue that her beseemed well. Not all so cheerful seemed she of sight as was her sister, whether dread did dwell or anguish in her heart is hard to tell. Upon her arm a silver anchor lay, whereon she leaned ever as befell. And ever up to heaven as she did pray, her steadfast eyes were bent, in a swarved other way. They seeing Una, towards her gan wend, who them encounters would like courtesy. Many kind speeches they between them send, and greatly joy each other well to see. Then to the knight with shamefast modesty they turn themselves at Una's meek request, and him salute with well-beseeming glee, who fare them quite, says him beseemed best, and goodly gan discourse of many a noble jest. Then Una thus, But she your sister dear, the dear Carissa, where is she become? or wants she health, or busy is elsewhere. Ah, no, said they, but forth she may not come, for she of late is lightened of her womb, and hath increased the world with one son more, that her to see should be but troublesome. 
Indeed, quoth she, that should her trouble sore, but thanked be God, and her increase so evermore. Then said the aged Celia, Dear dame, and you good sir, I wot that of your toil and labours long, through which ye hither came, ye both forwearied be. Therefore a while I read you rest, and to your bowers recoil. Then called she a groom, that forth him led into a goodly lodge, and gan to spoil of puissant arms, and laid in easy bed. His name was Meek Obedience, rightfully a red. Now when the weary limbs with kindly rest and bodies were refreshed with due repast, fair Una gan Fidelia fair request to have her knight into her schoolhouse placed, that of her heavenly learning he might taste and hear the wisdom of her words divine. She granted, and that knight so much agraced that she him taught celestial discipline and opened his dull eyes that light mote in them shine and that her sacred book with blood writ that none could read except she did them teach, she unto him disclosed every wit, and heavenly documents thereout did preach, that weaker wit of man could never reach, of God, of grace, of justice, of free will, that wonder was to hear her goodly speech, for she was able with her words to kill and raise again to life the heart that she did thrill, and when she list pour out her larger sprite, she would command the hasty sun to stay, or backward turn his course from heaven's height. Sometimes great hosts of men she could dismay. Dry shod to pass she parts the floods in tway, and eke huge mountains from their native seat she would command themselves to bear away and throw in raging sea with roaring threat. Almighty God her gave such power and puissance great. The faithful knight now grew in little space by hearing her and by her sister's lore to such perfection of all heavenly grace that wretched world he gan for to abhor, and mortal life gan loathe as thing forlore, grieved with remembrance of his wicked ways and pricked with anguish of his sin so sore that he desired to end his wretched days. So much the dart of sinful guilt the soul dismays. But wise Peronsa gave him comfort sweet, and taught him how to take assured hold upon her silver anchor as was meet, else had his sins so great and manifold made him forget all that Fidelia told. In this distressed, doubtful agony, when him his dearest Una did behold, disdaining life, desiring leave to die, she found herself assailed with great perplexity, and came to Celia to declare her smart who, well acquainted with that common plight which sinful horror works in wounded heart, her wisely comforted all that she might, with goodly counsel and advisement right, and straightway sent with careful diligence to fetch a leech, the which had great insight in that disease of grieved conscience, and well could cure the same. His name was Patience, who, coming to that soul disease at night, could hardly him entreat to tell his grief, which known, and all that gnawed his heavy sprite well searched, eftsoons he gan apply relief of salves and medicines which had passing grief, and thereto added words of wondrous might, by which to ease he him recured brief, and much assuaged the passion of his plight, that he his pain endured as seeming now more light. But yet the cause and root of all his ill, inward corruption and infected sin, not purged nor healed, behind remained still, and festering sore did rankle yet within, close creeping twixt the marrow and the skin, which to extirp he laid him privily down in a darksome lowly place far in, whereas he meant his corrosives to apply, and with straight diet tame his stubborn malady. In ashes and sackcloth he did array his dainty course, proud humours to abate, and dieted with fasting every day the swelling of his wounds to mitigate, and made him pray both early and eke late, and ever as superfluous flesh did rot, amendment ready still at hand did wait, to pluck it out with pincers fiery hot, that soon in him was left no one corrupted jot. And bitter penance with an iron whip was wont him once to dispel every day, and sharp remorse his heart did prick and nip, that drops of blood thence like a well did play, 
and sad repentance used to embay his body in salt water, smarting sore, the filthy blots of sin to wash away. So in short space they did to health restore the man that would not live, but erst lay at death's door. In which his torment often was so great that like a lion he would cry and roar and rend his flesh and his own sinews eat, his own dear Una, hearing evermore his rueful shrieks and groanings, often tore her guiltless garments and her golden hair for pity of his pain and anguish sore. Yet all with patience wisely she did bear, for well she wist his crime could else be never clear. Whom thus recovered by wise patience and true repentance they to Una brought, who joyous of his cured conscience him dearly kissed, and fairly eke besought himself to cherish, and consuming thought to put away out of his careful breast. By this Carissa, late in childbed brought, was waxen strong, and left her fruitful nest. To her fair Una brought this unacquainted guest. She was a woman in her freshest age, of wondrous beauty, and of bounty rare, with goodly grace and comely personage, that was on earth not easy to compare, full of great love, but Cupid's wanton snare as hell she hated, chaste in work and will. Her neck and breasts were ever open bare, that a thereof her babes might suck their fill, the rest was all in yellow robes arrayed still. A multitude of babes about her hung, playing their sports that joyed her to behold, whom still she fed whilst they were weak and young, but thrust them forth still as they waxed old. And on her head she wore a tire of gold, adorned with gems and ouches wondrous fair, whose passing price aneath was to be told, and by her side there sate a gentle pair of turtle doves, she sitting in an ivory chair. The knight and Una entering, fair her greet, and bid her joy of that her happy brood, who them requites with curtsies seeming meet, and entertains with friendly cheerful mood. Then Una her besought to be so good as in her virtuous rules to school her knight. Now, after all his torment well withstood in that sad house of penance, where his sprite had passed the pains of hell and long enduring night. She was right joyous of her just request, and taking by the hand that fairy son, gan him instruct in every good behest of love and righteousness and well to done, and wrath and hatred warily to shun that drew on men God's hatred and his wrath. And many souls in dolors had fordone, in which, when him she well instructed hath, from thence to heaven she teacheth him the ready path, wherein his weaker wandering steps to guide, an ancient matron she to her does call, whose sober looks her wisdom well descried, her name was Mercy, well known over all to be both gracious and eke liberal to whom the careful charge of him she gave to lead aright, that he should never fall in all his ways through this wide world as wave, that mercy in the end his righteous soul might save. The godly matron by the hand him bears forth from her presence by a narrow way, scattered with bushy thorns and ragged briars, which still before him she removed away, that nothing might his ready passage stay. And ever when his feet encumbered were, or gan to shrink, or from the right to stray, she held him fast, and firmly did up bear, as careful nurse, her child from falling off does rear. Eftsoons unto an holy hospital that was for by the way she did him bring, in which seven beadmen that had vowed all their life to service of high heaven's king, did spend their days in doing godly thing. Their gates to all were open evermore, that by the weary way were travelling, and one sate waiting ever them before to call incomers by that needy were and poor. The first of them that eldest was and best, of all the house had charge and government, as guardian and steward of the rest. His office was to give entertainment and lodging unto all that came and went, not unto such as could him feast again and double quite, for that he on them spent, but such as want of harbour did constrain, those for God's sake his duty was to entertain. The second was an omner of the place, his office was the hungry for to feed, and thirsty give to drink, a work of grace. He feared not once himself to be in need, ne cared to hoard for those whom he did breed. 
The grace of God he laid up still in store, which as a stock he left unto his seed. He had enough, what need him care for more? And had he less, yet some he would give to the poor. The third had of their wardrobe custody, in which were not rich tires nor garments gay, the plumes of pride and wings of vanity, but clothes meet to keep keen cold away and naked nature seemly to array, with which bare wretched whites he daily clad the images of God in earthly clay, and if that no spare cloths to give he had, his own coat he would cut and it distribute glad. The fourth appointed by his office was poor prisoners to relieve with gracious aid and captives to redeem with price of brass from Turks and Saracens which them had stayed. And though they faulty were, yet well he weighed that God to us forgiveth every hour much more than that why they in bands were laid. And he that harrowed hell with heavy stour the faulty souls from thence brought to his heavenly bower. The fifth had charged sick persons to attend and comfort those in point of death which lay, for them most needeth comfort in the end, when sin and hell and death do most dismay the feeble soul departing hence away. All is but lost that living we bestow, if not well ended at our dying day. O man, have mind of that last bitter throw, for as the tree does fall, so lies it ever low. The sixth had charge of them now being dead, in seemly sort their courses to engrave, and deck with dainty flowers their bridal bed, that to their heavenly spouse, both sweet and brave, they might appear when he their soul shall save. The wondrous workmanship of God's own mould, whose face he made all beasts to fear, and gave all in his hand, even dead we honour should. Ah, dearest God, me grant I dead be not defold. The seventh, now after death and burial done, had charged the tender orphans of the dead and widows' aid, lest they should be undone. In face of judgment he their right would plead. Now ought the power of mighty men did dread in their defence, nor would for gold or fee be won their rightful causes down to tread. And when they stood in most necessity, he did supply their want, and gave them ever free. There, when the elfin knight arrived, was the first and chiefest of the seven, whose care was guests to welcome, towards him did pass, where, seeing mercy that his steps up bare and always led, to her with reverence rare he humbly louted in meek lowliness, and seemly welcome for her did prepare, for of their order she was patroness, I'll be Carissa, were their chiefest founderess. There she a while him stays, himself to rest, that to the rest more able he might be, during which time in every good behest and godly work of alms and charity she him instructed with great industry. Shortly therein so perfect he became that from the first unto the last degree his mortal life he learned had to frame in holy righteousness without rebuke or blame. Thenceforward by that painful way they pass forth to an hill that was both steep and high, on top whereof a sacred chapel was, and eke a little hermitage thereby wherein an aged holy man did lie, that day and night said his devotion, nor other worldly business did apply. His name was Heavenly Contemplation, of God and goodness was his meditation. Great grace that old man to him given had, for God he often saw from heaven's height, all were his earthly eyne both blunt and bad, and through great age had lost their kindly sight. Yet wondrous quick and persent was his sprite, as eagle's eye that can behold the sun. That hill they scale with all their power and might, that his frail thighs, nigh weary and fordone, can fail. But by her help the top at last he won. There they do find that godly aged sire with snowy locks adown his shoulders shed, as hoary frost with spangles doth attire the mossy branches of an oak half dead. Each bone might through his body well be read, and every sinew seen through his long fast, for naught he cared his carcass long unfed. His mind was full of spiritual repast, and pined his flesh to keep his body low and chaste, who, when these two approaching he espied, at their first presence grew a grieved sore that forced him lay his heavenly thoughts aside. And had he not that dame respected more, 
whom highly he did reverence and adore, he would not once have moved for the night. They him saluted, standing far afore, who, well them greeting, humbly did requite, and asked to what end they clomb that tedious height. What end, quoth she, should cause us take such pain, but that same end which every living wight should make his mark, high heaven to attain? Is not from hence the way that leadeth right to that most glorious house, that glistereth bright with burning stars and ever-living fire, whereof the keys are to thy hand behight by wise Fidelia? She doth thee require to show it to this knight according his desire. Thrice happy man, said then the father grave, whose staggering steps thy steady hand doth lead, and shows the way his sinful soul to save. Who better can the way to heaven read than thou thyself, that was both born and bred in heavenly throne, where a thousand angels shine? Thou dost the prayers of the righteous said present before the majesty divine, and his avenging wrath to clemency incline. Yet, since thou bidst, thy pleasure shall be done. Then come, thou man of earth, and see the way that never yet was seen of fairy's son, that never leads the traveller astray, but after labours long and sad delay brings them to joyous rest and endless bliss. But first thou must a season fast and pray, till from her bands the sprite of soil it is, and have her strength recured from frail infirmities. That done, he leads him to the highest mount, such one as that same mighty man of God, that blood-red billows like a walled front on either side disparted with his rod, till that his army dry foot through them yod, dwelt forty days upon, where, writ in stone with bloody letters by the hand of God, the bitter doom of death and baleful moan he did receive, whilst flashing fire about him shone, or like that sacred hill whose head full high adorned with fruitful olives all around, is, as it were, for endless memory of that dear Lord, who oft thereon was found, for ever with a flowering girland crowned. Or like that pleasant mount that is for a through famous poet's verse, each where renowned, on which the thrice three learned ladies play their heavenly notes, and make full many a lovely lay. From thence, far off, he unto him did shew a little path that was both steep and long, which to a goodly city led his view, whose walls and towers were builded high and strong of pearl and precious stone, that earthly tongue cannot describe, nor wit of man can tell. Too high a ditty for my simple song, the city of the great king highted well, wherein eternal peace and happiness doth dwell. As he thereon stood gazing, he might see the blessed angels to and fro descend from highest heaven, in gladsome company, and with great joy into that city wend, as commonly as friend does with his friend. Whereat he wondered much, and gan inquire what stately building durst so high extend her lofty towers unto the starry sphere, and what unknown nation there unpeopled were. Fair knight, quoth he, Jerusalem, that is, the new Jerusalem, that God has built for those to dwell in that are chosen his, his chosen people purged from sinful guilt with precious blood, which cruelly was spilt on cursed tree of that unspotted lamb that for the sins of all the world was killed. Now are they saints all in that city, Sam, more dear unto their God than younglings to their dam. Till now, said then the knight, I weened well that great Cleopolis, where I have been, in which that fairest fairy queen doth dwell, the fairest city was, that might be seen. And that bright tower, all built of crystal clean Panthea, seemed the brightest thing that was. But now, by proof, all otherwise I ween, for this great city that does far surpass, and this bright angel's tower quite dims that tower of glass. Most true, then said the holy aged man, yet is Cleopolis for earthly frame the fairest piece that I beholden can, and well beseems all knights of noble name that covet in the mortal book of fame to be a Ternizid that same to haunt, and done their service to that sovereign dame that glory does to them for Girton grant, for she is heavenly born, and heaven may justly vaunt, and thou, fair imp, sprung out from English race, however now accounted Elfin's son, well were they dost thy service for her grace to aid a virgin desolate for done. But when thou famous victory hast won, and high amongst all knights hast hung thy shield, thenceforth the suit of earthly conquest shun, and wash thy hands from guilt of bloody field. For blood cannot but sin, and wars but sorrows yield. 
Then seek this path that I to thee presage, which after all to heaven shall thee send. Then peaceably thy painful pilgrimage to yonder same Jerusalem do bend, where is for thee ordained a blessed end, for thou amongst those saints whom thou dost see shalt be a saint, and thine own nation's friend and patron. Thou St. George shalt call it be, St. George of Merry England, the sign of victory. Unworthy wretch, quoth he, of so great grace, how dare I think such glory to attain? These that have it attained were in like case, quoth he, as wretched, and lived in like pain. But deeds of arms must I at last be fain, and ladies love to leave, so dearly bought. What need of arms, where peace doth they remain, said he, and battles none are to be fought. As for loose loves, they're vain, and vanish into naught. Oh, let me not, quoth he, then turn again back to the world, whose joys so fruitless are. But let me hear, for A in peace remain, or straightway on that last long voyage fare, that nothing may my present hope impair. That may not be, said he, ne mayst thou yet forego that royal maid's bequeathed care, who did her cause into thy hand commit, till from her cursed foe thou have her freely quit. Then shall I soon, quoth he, so God me grace, abet that virgin's cause disconsolate, and shortly back return unto this place, to walk this way in pilgrim's poor estate. But now a reed, old father, why of late didst thou behight me born of English blood, whom all a fairy son do nominate? That word shall I, said he, avouch in good, sith to thee is unknown the cradle of thy brood. For well I wot thou springst from ancient race of Saxon kings, that have with mighty hand and many bloody battles fought in place, high reared their royal throne in Britain land, and vanquished them unable to withstand. From thence a fairy thee unweeting reft, there as thou slept'st in tender swaddling band, and her base elfin brood therefore they left. Such men do changelings call, so changed by fairies theft. Thence she thee brought into this fairy land, and in an heaped furrow did thee hide, where thee a ploughman all unweeting fond, as he his toilsome team that way did guide, and brought thee up in ploughman's state to bide, whereof Georgus he thee gave to name, till pricked with courage and thy forces pride, to fairy court thou camest to seek for fame, and prove thy puissant arms, as seems thee best became. O holy sire, quoth he, how shall I quite the many favours I with thee have found, that hast my name and nation read aright, and taught the way that does to heaven bound? This said, adown he looked to the ground to have returned, but dazed were his eyne, through passing brightness which did quite confound his feeble sense, and to exceeding shine. So dark are earthly things, compared to things divine. At last, when as himself he gan to find, to Una back he cast him to retire, who him awaited still with pensive mind, great thanks and goodly meed to that great sire he thence departing gave for his pains hire. So came to Una, who him joyed to see, and after little rest gan him desire of her adventure mindful for to be. So leave they take of Celia and her daughters three. The knight with that old dragon fights two days incessantly. The third him overthrows and gains most glorious victory. High time now gan it wax for Una fair to think of those her captive parents dear, and their for wasted kingdom to repair. Whereto, when as they now approached near, with hearty words her knight she gan to cheer, and in her modest manner thus bespake, Dear knight, as dear as ever knight was dear, that all these sorrows suffer for my sake, I heaven behold the tedious toil ye for me take. Now are we come unto my native soil, and to the place where all our perils dwell. Here haunts that fiend and does his daily spoil, therefore henceforth be at your keeping well and ever ready for your foeman fell. The spark of noble courage now awake, and strive your excellent self to excel, that shall ye ever more renowned make above all knights on earth that battle undertake. And pointing forth, lo, yonder is, said she, the brazen tower in which my parents dear for dread of that huge fiend imprisoned be, whom I from far see on the walls appear, whose sight my feeble soul doth greatly cheer. And on the top of all I do espy the watchman, waiting tidings glad to hear, that, oh, my parents, might I happily unto you bring, to ease you of your misery. 
With that, they heard a roaring, hideous sound that all the air with terror filled wide and seemed aneath to shake the steadfast ground. Eftsoons that dreadful dragon they espied, where stretched he lay upon the sunny side of a great hill, himself like a great hill. But also soon as he from far descried those glistering arms that heaven with light did fill, he roused himself full blithe and hastened them until. Then bade the knight his lady yield aloof, and to an hill herself withdraw aside, from whence she might behold that battle's proof, and eke be safe from danger far descried. She him obeyed, and turned a little wide. Now, O oh, thou sacred muse, most learned dame, fair imp of Phoebus and his aged bride, the nurse of time and everlasting fame, that warlike hands are noblest with immortal name. O oh, gently come into my feeble breast, come gently, but not with that mighty rage wherewith the martial troops thou dost infest, and hearts of great heroes dost enrage, that not their kindled courage may assuage soon as thy dreadful trump begins to sound. The god of war with his fierce equipage thou dost awake, sleep never he so sound, and scared nations dost with horror stern astound. Fair goddess, lay that furious fit aside, till I of wars and bloody Mars do sing, and Britain fields with Saracen blood bedyed, twixt that great fairy queen and Paynim king, that with their horror heaven and earth did ring, a work of labor long and endless praise. But now, a while, let down that haughty string, and to my tunes thy second tenor raise, that I, this man of God, his godly arms may blaze. By this the dreadful beast drew nigh to hand, half flying and half footing in his haste, that with his largeness measured much land, and made wide shadow under his huge waist, as mountain doth the valley overcast. Approaching nigh, he reared high afore his body monstrous, horrible and vast, which to increase his wondrous greatness more, was swoln with wrath, and poison, and with bloody gore and over all with brazen scales was armed, like plated coat of steel so couched near, that naught mote pierce, ne might his course be harmed with dint of sword, nor push of pointed spear, which, as an eagle seeing prey appear, his airy plumes doth rouse full rudely dight, so shaked he that horror was to hear, for, as the clashing of an armor bright, such noise his roused scales did send into the night. His flaggy wings, when forth it did display, were like two sails, in which the hollow wind is gathered full, and worketh speedy way. And eke the pens that did his pinions bind, were like mainyards, with flying canvas lined, with which, when as him list the air to beat, and thereby force unwanted passage find, the clouds before him fled for terror great, and all the heavens stood still amazed with his threat. His huge, long tail, wound up in hundred folds, does overspread his long brass scaly back, whose wreathed bots, whenever he unfolds, and thick and tangled knots adown does slack, bespotted all with shields of red and black, it sweepeth all the land behind him far, and of three furlongs does but little lack. And at the point two stings infixed are, both deadly sharp, that sharpest steel exceeding far. But stings and sharpest steel did far exceed the sharpness of his cruel rending claws. Dead was it sure, as sure as death indeed, whatever thing does touch his ravenous paws, or what within his reach he ever draws. But his most hideous head my tongue to tell does tremble, for his deep devouring jaws wide gaped like the grisly mouth of hell, through which into his dark abyss all raven fell. And that more wondrous was, in either jaw, three ranks of iron teeth enranged were, in which yet trickling blood and gobbets raw of late devoured bodies did appear, that sight thereof bred cold, congealed fear, which to increase, and all at once to kill, a cloud of smothering smoke and sulphur sear out of his stinking gorge forth steamed still, that all the air about with smoke and stench did fill. His blazing eyes, like two bright shining shields, did burn with wrath, and sparkled living fire, 
as two broad beacons set in open fields send forth their flames far off to every shire, and warning give that enemies conspire with fire and sword the region to invade. So flamed his eyne with rage and rancorous ire. But far within, as in a hollow glade, those glaring lamps were set that made a dreadful shade. So dreadfully he towards him did pass, for lifting up aloft his speckled breast, and often bounding on the bruised grass, as for great joyance of his new-come guest. Eftsoons he gan advance his haughty crest, as chafed boar his bristles doth uprear, and shook his scales to battle ready dressed, that made the Red Cross Knight nigh quake for fear, as bidding bold defiance to his foeman near. The knight gan fairly couch his steady spear, and fiercely ran at him with rigorous might. The pointed steel, arriving rudely there, his harder hide would neither pierce nor bite, but glancing by, forth passed forward right. Yet sore amoved with so puissant push, the wrathful beast about him turned light, and him so rudely passing by did brush with his long tail, that horse and man to ground did rush. Both horse and man up lightly rose again, and fresh encounter towards him addressed. But Dido's stroke yet back recoiled in vain, and found no place his deadly point to rest. Exceeding rage inflamed the furious beast to be avenged of so great despite, for never felt his imperceable breast so wondrous force from hand of living white, yet had he proved the power of many a puissant knight. Then, with his waving wings displayed wide, himself up high he lifted from the ground, and with strong flight did forcibly divide the yielding air, which nigh too feeble found her flitting parts, and element unsound to bear so great a weight. He, cutting way with his broad sails, about him soared round. At last, low stooping with unwieldy sway, snatched up both horse and man to bear them quite away. Long he them bore above the subject plain, so far as you and bow a shaft may send, till, struggling strong, did him at last constrain to let them down before his flight is end. As haggard hawk, presuming to contend with hardy fowl above his hable night, his weary pounces all in vain doth spend to trust the prey too heavy for his flight, which coming down the ground does free itself by fight. He, so disseized of his griping gross, the knight his thrilling spear again essayed in his brass-plated body to emboss, and three men strength unto the stroke he laid, wherewith the stiff beam quaked, as afraid, and glancing from his scaly neck, did glide close under his left wing, then broad displayed. The piercing steel there wrought a wound full wide, that with the uncouth smart the monster loudly cried. He cried as raging seas are wont to roar, when wintry storm his wrathful wreck does threat. The rolling billows beat the ragged shore, as they the earth would shoulder from her seat. And greedy gulf does gape, as he would eat his neighbor element in his revenge. Then gin the blustering brethren boldly threat, to move the world from off his steadfast henge, and boisterous battle make each other to avenge. The steely head stuck fast still in his flesh, till with his cruel claws he snatched the wood and quite asunder broke. Forth flowed fresh a gushing river of black, gory blood that drowned all the land whereon he stood. The stream thereof would drive a water mill. Trebly augmented was his furious mood, with bitter sense of his deep-rooted ill, that flames of fire he threw forth from his large nostril. His hideous tail then hurled he about, and therewith all enwrapped the nimble thighs of his froth-foamy steed, whose courage stout striving to loose the knot that fast him ties, himself in straighter bands too rash implies that to the ground he is perforce constrained to throw his rider, who can quickly rise from off the earth with dirty blood disdained, for that reproachful fall right foully he disdained and fiercely took his trenchion blade in hand, with which he struck so furious and so fell, that nothing seemed the puissance could withstand. Upon his crest the hardened iron fell, but his more hardened crest was armed so well that deeper dint therein would not make, 
Yet so extremely did the buff him quell, that from thenceforth he shunned the light to take. But when he saw them come, he did them still forsake. The knight was wroth to see his stroke beguiled, and smote again with more outrageous might. But back again the sparkling steel recoiled, and left not any mark where it did light, as if in adamant rock it had been pight. The beast, impatient of his smarting wound, and of so fierce and forcible despite, thought with his wings to sty above the ground, but his late wounded wing unserviceable found. Then, full of grief and anguish vehement, he loudly brayed, that like was never heard, and from his wide devouring oven sent a flake of fire that flashing in his beard him all amazed, and almost made a feared. The scorching flame sore swinged all his face, and through his armor all his body seared, that he could not endure so cruel case, but thought his arms to leave and helmet to unlace. Not that great champion of the antique world, whom famous poets first so much doth vaunt, and hath for twelve huge labors high extolled, so many furies and sharp fits did haunt when him the poisoned garment did enchant with centaur's blood, and bloody verses charmed, as did this knight, twelve thousand golders daunt, whom fiery steel now burnt, that erst him armed, that erst him goodly armed, now most of all him harmed. Faint, weary, sore, emboiled, grieved, brent with heat, toil, wounds, arms, smart, and inward fire, that never man such mischiefs did torment. Death better were, death did he oft desire, but death will never come when needs require. Whom so dismayed, when that his foe beheld, he cast to suffer him no more respire, but gan his sturdy stern about to weld, and him so strongly stroke, that to the ground him fell. It fortuned, as fair it then befell, behind his back, unweeting, where he stood of ancient time, there was a springing well from which fast trickled forth a silver flood, full of great virtues, and for medicine good. By long before that cursed dragon got that happy land, and all with innocent blood defiled those sacred waves, it rightly hopped the well of life, nay yet his virtues had forgot. For unto life the dead it could restore, and guilt of sinful crimes clean wash away. Those that with sickness were infected sore it could recure, and aged long decay renew, as one were born that very day. Both Silo this and Jordan did excel, and the English bath, and eke the German spa. Ne can suffice nor Hebrus match this well. Into the same the knight back overthrown fell. Now gan the golden Phoebus for to steep his fiery face in billows of the west, and his faint steeds watered in ocean deep, whilst from their journal labors they did rest. When that infernal monster, having cast his weary foe into that living well, can high advance his broad discolored breast above his wonted pitch, with countenance fell, and clapped his iron wings, as victor he did dwell which, when his pensive lady saw from far, great woe and sorrow did her soul assay, as weaning that the sad end of the war, and gan to highest God entirely pray, that feared chance from her to turn away. With folded hands and knees full lowly bent, all night she watched, no once a down would lay her dainty limbs in her sad dreariment, but praying still did wake, and waking did lament. The morrow next gan early to appear, that Titan rose to run his daily race. But early ere the morrow next gan rear out of the sea fair Titan's dewy face, up rose the gentle virgin from her place, and look at all about, if she might spy her loved knight to move his manly pace. For she had great doubt of his safety, since late she saw him fall before his enemy. At last... She saw where he upstarted brave out of the well wherein he drenched lay, as eagle fresh out of the ocean wave, where he hath left his plumes all hoary gray, and decked himself with feathers youthly gay, like Ayas hawk up mounts unto the skies his newly budded pinions to assay, and marvels at himself still as he flies. 
So new this newborn knight to battle new did rise. Whom when the damned fiend so fresh did spy, No wonder if he wondered at the sight, And doubted whether his late enemy it were, Or other new supplied knight. He, now to prove his late renewed might, High brandishing his bright dew-burning blade, Upon his crested scout so sordid smite, That to the skull a yawning wound it made, The deadly dint his dulled senses all dismayed. I wot not whether the revenging steel were hardened with that holy water dew, wherein he fell, or sharper edge did feel, or his baptized hands now greater grew, or other secret virtue did ensue. Else never could the force of fleshly arm, ne molten metal, in his blood imbrew. For till that stound could never white him harm, by subtlety, nor slight, nor might, nor mighty charm. The cruel wound enraged him so sore that loud he yelled for exceeding pain, as hundred ramping lions seemed to roar, whom ravenous hunger did there to constrain. Then gan he toss aloft his stretched train, and therewith scourged the buxom air so sore that to his force to yield in it was fain. Nay, aught his sturdy strokes might stand afore, that high trees overthrew, and rocks in pieces tore. The same advancing high above his head, with sharp intended sting, so root him smart that to the earth him drove as stricken dead, ne living white would have him life behot. The mortal sting his angry needle shot quite through his shield, and in his shoulder seized, where fast it stuck, ne would there out begot. The grief thereof him wondrous sore diseased, ne might his rankling pain with patience be appeased. But yet more mindful of his honour dear than of the grievous smart which him did ring, from loathed soil he can him lightly rear, and strove to loose the far infixed sting, which when in vain he tried with struggling, inflamed with wrath, his raging blade he heft and struck so strongly that the knotty string of his huge tail he quite asunder cleft, five joints thereof he hewed, and but the stump him left. Heart cannot think what outrage and what cries with foul and foldered smoke and flashing fire the hell-bred beast threw forth unto the skies, that all was covered with darkness dire. Then, fraught with rancor and engorged ire, he cast at once him to avenge for all, and gathering up himself out of the mire, with his uneven wings did fiercely fall upon his sun-bright shield, and gripped it fast withal. Much was the man encumbered with his hold, in fear to lose his weapon in his paw, ne wist yet how his talents to unfold. Nor harder was from Cerberus greedy jaw to pluck a bone, than from his cruel claw to reave by strength the griped gauge away. Thrice he essayed it from his foot to draw, and thrice in vain to draw it did essay. It booted not to think to rob him of his prey. Though when he saw no power might prevail, his trusty sword he called to his last aid, wherewith he fiercely did his foe assail, and double blows about him stoutly laid, that glancing fire out of the iron played, as sparkles from the anvil used to fly when heavy hammers on the wedge are swayed. Therewith at last he forced him to untie one of his grasping feet, him to defend thereby. The other foot, fast fixed on his shield, when as no strength nor stroke smote him constrained to loose, ne yet the warlike pledge to yield, he smote thereat with all his might and main that not so wondrous puissance might sustain. Upon the joint the lucky steel did light and made such way that hewed it quite in twain. The paw yet missed not his minished might, but hung still on the shield, as it at first was pight. From grief thereof, and devilish despite, from his infernal furnace, forth he threw huge flames, that dimmed all the heaven's light, and rolled in duskish smoke, and brimstone blue, as burning Etna from his boiling stew doth belch out flames, and rocks in pieces broke, and ragged ribs of mountains molten new, and wrapped in coal-black clouds and filthy smoke, that all the land with stench and heaven with horror choke. The heat whereof, and harmful pestilence, so sore him noid, that forced him to retire a little backward, for his best defence, to save his body from the scorching fire, 
which he from hellish entrails did expire. It chanced, eternal God that chance did guide, as he recoiled backward, in the mire his nigh for wearied feeble feet did slide, and down he fell, with dread of shame sore terrified. There grew a goodly tree him fair beside, loaden with fruit and apples rosy red, as they in pure vermilion had been dyed, whereof great virtues over all were read, for happy life to all which thereon fed, and life eke everlasting did befall. Great God it planted in that blessed stead with his almighty hand, and did it call the tree of life, the crime of our first father's fall. In all the world, like was not to be found save in that soil where all good things did grow, and freely sprung out of the fruitful ground as incorrupted nature did them sow, till that dread dragon all did overthrow. Another like fair tree eat grew thereby, whereof whoso did eat eftsoons did know both good and ill. O mournful memory! That tree, through one man's fault, hath done us all to die. From that first tree forth flowed as from a well a trickling stream of balm, most sovereign and dainty deer, which on the ground still fell and overflowed all the fertile plain, as it had dewed been with timely rain. Life and long health that gracious ointment gave, and deadly wounds could heal, and rear again the senseless course appointed for the grave. Into that same he fell, which did from death him save. For nigh thereto the ever damned beast durst not approach, for he was deadly made, and all that life preserved did detest. Yet he had oft adventured to invade. By this the drooping daylight gan to fade, and yield his room to sad succeeding night, who with her sable mantle gan to shade the face of earth, and ways of living white, and high her burning torch set up in heaven bright. When gentle Una saw the second fall of her dear knight, who, weary of long fight and faint through loss of blood, moved not at all, but lay as in a dream of deep delight, besmeared with precious balm, whose virtuous might did heal his wounds, and scorching heat allay, again she stricken was with sore affright, and for his safety gan devoutly pray, and watch the noyous night, and wait for joyous day. The joyous day gan early to appear, and fair Aurora from the dewy bed of aged Tython gan herself to rear, with rosy cheeks, for shame as blushing red. Her golden locks for haste were loosely shed about her ears, when Una her did mark climb to her chariot, all with flowers spread, from heaven high to chase the cheerless dark. With merry note her loud salutes the mounting lark. Then freshly up arose the doughty knight, all healed of his hurts and wounds wide, and did himself to battle ready dight, whose early foe awaiting him beside to have devoured, so soon as day he spied, when now he saw himself so freshly rear, as if late fight had not him damnified, he walks dismayed, and gan his fate to fear. Nathless, with wanted rage, he him advanced near. And in his first encounter, gaping wide, he thought at once him to have swallowed quite, and rushed upon him with outrageous pride, who, him encountering fierce as hawk in flight, perforce rebutted back. The weapon bright, taking advantage of his open jaw, ran through his mouth with so importune might that deep and pierced his darksome hollow maw, and back retired, his life blood forth with all did draw. So down he fell and forth his life did breathe that vanished into smoke and cloud as swift. So down he fell that dearth him underneath did groan as feeble so great load to lift. So down he fell, as an huge rocky cliff, whose false foundation waves have washed away, with dreadful poise is from the mainland rift, and rolling down great Neptune doth dismay. So down he fell, and like an heaped mountain lay. The knight himself even trembled at his fall, so huge and horrible a mass it seemed, and his dear lady that beheld it all durst not approach for dread, which she misdeemed. But yet at last, when as the direful fiend she saw not stir, off shaking vain affright, she nigher drew, and saw that joyous end. Then God she praised and thanked her faithful knight, 
that had achieved so great a conquest by his might. Fair Una to the Red Cross Knight betrothed is with joy, though false Duessa it to bar her false slights do employ. Behold, I see the haven nigh at hand, to which I mean my weary course to bend. Veer the main sheet, and bear up with the land, the which afore is fairly to be kenned, and seemeth safe from storms that may offend. There this fair virgin, weary of her way, must landed be, now at her journey's end. There eke my feeble bark a while may stay, till merry wind and weather call her thence away. Scarcely had Phoebus in the glooming east yet harnessed his fiery-footed team, and he reared above the earth his flaming crest, when the last deadly smoke aloft did steam, that sign of last outbreathed life did seem unto the watchman on the castle wall, who thereby dead that baleful beast did deem, and to his lord and lady loud gan call to tell how he had seen the dragon's fatal fall. Uprose with hasty joy and feeble speed that aged sire, the lord of all that land, and looked forth, to weet if true indeed those tidings were, as he did understand, which, when as true by trial he outfond, he bade to open wide his brazen gate, which long time had been shut, and out of hand proclaimed joy and peace through all his state, for dead now was their foe, which them forayed late. Then gan triumphant trumpets sound on high, that sent to heaven the echoed report of their new joy and happy victory against him that had them long oppressed with tort, and fast imprisoned in sieged fort. Then all the people, as in solemn feast, to him assembled with one full consort, rejoicing at the fall of that great beast, from whose eternal bondage now they were released. Forth came that ancient lord and aged queen, arrayed in antique robes down to the ground, and sad habiliments right well beseen, a noble crew about them waited round of sage and sober peers, all gravely gowned, whom far before did march a goodly band of tall young men, all hable arms to sound, but now they laurel branches bore in hand, glad sign of victory and peace in all their land. And to that doughty conqueror they came, and him before themselves prostrating low, their lord and patron loud did him proclaim, and at his feet their laurel boughs did throw. Soon after them, all dancing on a row, the comely virgins came with girlands dight, as fresh as flowers in meadow green do grow, when morning dew upon their leaves doth light, and in their hands sweet timbrels all upheld on height. And then before, the fry of children young, their wanton sports and childish mirth did play, and to the maidens sounding timbrels sung in well-attuned notes a joyous lay, and made delightful music all the way, until they came where that fair virgin stood, as fair Diana in fair summer's day, beholds her nymphs enranged in shady wood. Some wrestle, some do run, some bathe in crystal flood. So she beheld those maidens' merriment with cheerful view, who, when to her they came, themselves to ground with gracious humblest bent, and her adored by honorable name, lifting to heaven her everlasting fame. Then on her head they set a girl in green, and crowned her twixt earnest and twixt game, who in her self-resemblance well beseen did seem such as she was, a goodly maiden queen. And after... All the rascal many ran, heaped together in rude ravelment to see the face of that victorious man, whom all admired as from heaven sent, and gazed upon with gaping wonderment. But when they came where that dead dragon lay, stretched on the ground in monstrous large extent, the sight with idle fear did them dismay, ne durst approach him nigh to touch or once essay. Some feared and fled, some feared and well it feigned. One that would wiser seem than all the rest, warned him not touch, for yet perhaps remained some lingering life within his hollow breast, or in his womb might lurk some hidden nest of many dragonets his fruitful seed. Another said that in his eyes did rest yet sparkling fire, and bade thereof take heed. Another said he saw him move his eyes indeed. One mother when as her foolhardy child did come too near and with his talents play, 
half dead through fear, her little babe reviled, and to her gossips again in counsel say, How can I tell, but that his talents may yet scratch my son, or rend his tender hand? So diversely themselves in vain they fray, while some more bold to measure him nigh stand, to prove how many acres he did spread of land. Thus flocked all the folk him round about, the whiles that hoary king, with all his train being arrived where that champion stout after his foe's defeasance did remain, him goodly greets, and fair does entertain, with princely gifts of ivory and gold, and thousand thanks him yields for all his pain. Then when his daughter dear he does behold, her dearly doth embrace, and kisseth manifold. And after to his palace he them brings, With shams and trumpets, and with clarions sweet, And all the way the joyous people sings, And with their garments strows the paved street, Whence mounting up they find purveyance meet Of all that royal prince's court became, And all the floor was underneath their feet Bespread with costly scarlet of great name, On which they lowly sit, and fitting purpose frame. What needs me tell their feast and goodly guise, In which was nothing riotous nor vain? What needs of dainty dishes to devise, Of comely services, or courtly train? My narrow leaves cannot in them contain The large discourse of royal prince's state. Yet was their manner then but bare and plain, For the antique world excess and pride did hate. Such proud luxurious pomp is swollen up but late. Then, when with meats and drinks of every kind Their fervent appetites they quenched had, That ancient lord gan fit occasion find Of strange adventures and of perils sad Which in his travel and befallen had For to demand of his renowned guest, Who then, with utterance grave and countenance sad, From point to point, as is before expressed, Discoursed his voyage long, according his request. Great pleasure mixed with pitiful regard That godly king and queen did passionate, Whiles they his pitiful adventures heard, That oft they did lament his luckless state, And often blamed the too importune fate That heaped on him so many wrathful wreaks, For never gentle knight, as he of late So tossed was in fortune's cruel freaks, And all the while salt tears bedewed the hearer's cheeks. Then said that royal peer in sober wise, Dear son, great been the evils which ye bore From first to last in your late enterprise, That I note whether praise or pity more. For never living man I ween so sore In sea of deadly dangers was distressed, But since now safe ye sees it have the shore, And well arrived are, I God be blessed, Let us devise of ease and everlasting rest. Ah, dearest lord, said then that doughty knight, Of ease or rest I may not yet devise, For by the faith which I to arms have plight, I bound and am straight after this emprise, As that your daughter can you well advise, Back to return to that great fairy queen, And her to serve six years in warlike wise, Gainst that proud Paynim king that works her teen. Therefore I ought crave pardon till I there have been. Unhappy falls that heart necessity, quoth he, The troubler of my happy peace, And vowed foe to my felicity. Nay, I against the same can justly priest, But, since that band ye cannot now release, Nor done undo, for vows may not be vain, Soon as the term of those six years shall cease, Ye then shall hither back return again, The marriage to accomplish vowed betwixt you twain which for my part I covet to perform, in sort as through the world I did proclaim that whoso killed that monster most deform, and him in hardy battle overcame, should have mine only daughter to his dame, and of my kingdom heir apparent be. Therefore, since now to thee pertains the same, by due desert of noble chivalry, both daughter and e kingdom, lo, I yield to thee. Then forth he called that his daughter fair, the fairest oon, his only daughter dear, his only daughter and his only heir, who, forth proceeding with sad, sober cheer, as bright as doth the morning star appear out of the east, 
with flaming locks bedight to tell that dawning day is drawing near, and to the world does bring long wished light. So fair and fresh that lady showed herself in sight. So fair and fresh as freshest flower in May, for she had laid her mournful stole aside, and widow-like sad wimple thrown away, wherewith her heavenly beauty she did hide, whiles on her weary journey she did ride. And on her now a garment she did wear, all lily-white, without an spot or pride, that seemed like silk and silver woven near. But neither silk nor silver therein did appear. The blazing brightness of her beauty's beam, and glorious light of her sunshiny face to tell, were as to strive against the stream. My ragged rhymes are all too rude and base, her heavenly lineaments for to enchase. No wonder. For her own dear loved knight, all were she daily with himself in place, did wonder much at her celestial sight. Oft had he seen her fair, but never so fair dight. So fairly dight, when she in presence came, she to her sire made humble reverence, and bowed low that her right well became, and added grace unto her excellence, who with great wisdom and grave eloquence thus scan to say. But ere he thus had said, with flying speed and seeming great pretense, came running in, much like a man dismayed, a messenger with letters, which his message said. All in the open hall amazed stood at suddenness of that unwary sight, and wondered at his breathless hasty mood. But he for naught would stay his passage right, till fast before the king he did alight, where falling flat, great humbless he did make, and kissed the ground, whereon his foot was pight. Then to his hands that writ he did betake, which he disclosing, read thus as the paper spake. To thee, most mighty king of Eden fair, her greeting sends in these sad lines addressed, the woeful daughter and forsaken heir of that great emperor of all the West, and bids thee be advised for the best, ere thou thy daughter link in holy band of wedlock to that new unknown guest, for he already plighted his right hand unto another love, and to another land. To me, sad maid, or rather widow sad, he was affianced long time before, and sacred pledges he both gave and had, false errant knight, infamous, and forswore. Witness the burning altars which he swore, and guilty heavens of his bold perjury, which, though he hath polluted oft of yore, yet I to them for judgment just do fly, and them conjure to venge this shameful injury. Therefore, since mine he is, or free or bond, or false or true, or living or else dead, withhold, O sovereign prince, your hasty hand from knitting league with him, I you a reed. Now ween my right with strength adown to tread, through weakness of my widowhead, or woe. For truth is strong, her rightful cause to plead, and shall find friends if need requireth so. So bids thee well to fare, thy neither friend nor foe, Fidessa. When he these bitter biting words had read, the tidings strange did him abashed make, that still he sate long time astonished, as in great muse, no word to creature spake. At last, his solemn silence thus he break, with doubtful eyes fast fixed on his guest. Redoubted knight, that for mine only sake thy life and honour late adventurest, let not be hid from me that ought to be expressed. What mean these bloody vows and idle threats thrown out from womanish impatient mind? What heavens, what altars, what enraged heats here heap it up with terms of love unkind, my conscience clear with guilty bands would bind. High God be witness that I guiltless am. But if yourself, Sir Knight, ye faulty find, or rapid be in loves of former dame, with crime do not it cover, but disclose the same. To whom the Red Cross Knight this answer sent, My Lord, my King, be not hereat dismayed, till well ye wot by grave intendement what woman, and wherefore doth me upbraid with breach of love and loyalty betrayed. It was in my mishaps, as hitherward I lately travelled, that unwares I strayed out of my way through perils strange and hard. 
that day should fail me, ere I had them all declared. There did I find, or rather I was found, of this false woman that Fidessa hight. Fidessa hight the falsest dame on ground, most false Duessa, royal richly dight, that easy was to inveigle weaker sight, who by her wicked arts and wily skill, too false and strong for earthly skill or might, unwares me wrought unto her wicked will, and to my foe betrayed when least I fear it ill. Then stepped forth that goodly royal maid, and on the ground herself prostrating low, with sober countenance thus to him said, O oh, pardon me, my sovereign lord, to show the secret treasons which of late I know to have been wrought by that false sorceress. She, only she it is, that erst did throw this gentle knight into so great distress that death him did await in daily wretchedness. And now it seems that she suborned hath this crafty messenger with letters vain to work new woe and improvided scath by breaking of the band betwixt us twain, wherein she used hath the practic pain of this false footman cloaked with simpleness, whom if ye please for to discover plain, ye shall him Archimago find, I guess, the falsest man alive, who tries shall find no less, the king was greatly moved at her speech, and all with sudden indignation freight bade on that messenger rude hands to reach. That soon's the guard, which on his state did wait, attached that fater false, and bound him straight, who, seeming sorely chafed at his band, as chained bear whom cruel dogs do bait, with idle force did feign them to withstand, and often semblance made to scape out of their hand. But they him laid full low in dungeon deep, and bound him hand and foot with iron chains, and with continual watch did warily keep. Who then would think that by his subtle trains he could escape foul death or deadly pains? Thus, when that prince's wrath was pacified, he gan renew the late forbidden banes, and to the night his daughter dear he tied with sacred rites and vows for ever to abide. His own two hands the holy knots did knit that none but death for ever can divide. His own two hands, for such a term most fit, the housling fire did kindle and provide, and a holy water thereon sprinkled wide, at which the bushy teed a groom did light, and sacred lamp in secret chamber hide where it should not be quenched day nor night for fear of evil fates, but burnen ever bright. Then gan they sprinkle all the posts with wine, and made great feast to solemnize that day. They all perfumed with frankincense divine, and precious odors fetched from far away, that all the house did sweat with great array. And all the while sweet music did apply her curious skill the warbling notes to play, to drive away the dull melancholy, the whiles one sung a song of love and jollity, during the which there was an heavenly noise heard sound through all the palace pleasantly, like as it had been many an angel's voice singing before the eternal majesty in their trinal triplicities on high. Yet wist no creature whence that heavenly sweet proceeded, yet each one felt secretly himself thereby reft of his senses meet and ravished with rare impression in his sprite. Great joy was made that day of young and old, and solemn feast proclaimed throughout the land, that their exceeding mirth may not be told. Suffice it here by signs to understand the usual joys at knitting of love's band. Thrice happy man the knight himself did hold, possessed of his lady's heart and hand, and ever when his eye did her behold, his heart did seem to melt in pleasures manifold. Her joyous presence and sweet company, in full content, he there did long enjoy. No wicked envy, no vile jealousy, his dear delights were able to annoy. Yet swimming in that sea of blissful joy, he not forgot how he whilom had sworn in case he could that monstrous beast destroy, unto his fairy queen back to return, for which he shortly did, and Una left to mourn. Now strike your sails, ye jolly mariners, for we be come unto a quiet road where we must land some of our passengers, and light this weary vessel of her load. 
Here she a while may make her safe abode till she repaired have her tackles spent and want supplied, and then again abroad on the long voyage whereto she is bent. Well may she speed and fairly finish her intent. Right well I wot, most mighty sovereign, that all this famous antique history of some the abundance of an idle brain will judge it be and painted forgery, rather than matter of just memory. Sith none that breathe of living air does know where is that happy land of fairy which I so much do vaunt yet nowhere show, but vouch antiquities which nobody can know. But let that man with better sense advise that of the world least part to us is read, and daily how through hardy enterprise many great regions are discovered which to late age were never mentioned. Whoever heard of the Indian Peru? Or who inventress vessel measure at the Amazon huge river, now found true? Or fruitfullest Virginia, who did ever view? Yet all these were when no man did them know, yet have from wisest ages hidden been, and later times things more unknown shall show. Why then should witless man so much misween that nothing is but that which he hath seen? What if within the moon's fair shining sphere, what if in every other star unseen of other worlds he happily should hear? He wonder would much more, yet such to some appear. Of Fairyland, yet if he more inquire, by certain signs here set in sundry place he may it find. Now let him then admire, but yield his sense to be too blunt and base, that note without an hound fine footing trace. And thou, O fairest princess under sky, in this fair mirror mayst behold thy face, and thine own realms in lawn of fairy, and in this antique image thy great ancestry. The which, O oh, pardon me thus to enfold in covert veil and wrap in shadow's light, that feeble eyes your glory may behold, which else could not endure those beamers bright, but would be dazzled with exceeding light. O oh, pardon, and vouchsafe with patient ear the brave adventures of this fairy knight, the good Sir Guyon, graciously to hear, in whom great rule of temperance goodly doth appear. Canto One, Guyon, by Archimage abused, the Red Cross Knight awaits, finds Mordant and Amavia slain with pleasure's poisoned baits. That cunning architect of cankered guile whom prince's late displeasure left in bands, for falsed letters and suborned wile, soon as the Red Cross knight he understands to be departed out of Eden lands, to serve again his sovereign elfin queen, his arts he moves, and out of caitiff's hands himself he frees by secret means unseen. His shackles empty left, himself escaped clean and forth he fares full of malicious mind to work in mischief and avenging woe wherever he that godly knight may find his only heart sore and his only foe sith una now he all gates must forego whom his victorious hands did erst restore to native crown and kingdom late ago where she enjoys sure peace for evermore as weather-beaten ship arrived on happy shore him, therefore, now the object of his spite and deadly food he makes, him to offend, by forged treason or by open fight he seeks, of all his drift the aimed end. There, too, his subtle engines he does bend, his practic wit and his fair filed tongue, with thousand other slights, for well he kenned his credit now in doubtful balance hung, for hardly could be hurt who was already stung. Still, as he went, he crafty stales did lay, with cunning trains him to entrap unwares, and privy spiles placed in all his way, to weet what course he takes and how he fares, to catch him at a vantage in his snares. But now so wise and wary was the knight by trial of his former harms and cares, that he descried and shunned still his slight. The fish that once was caught new bait will hardly bite. Neth less than Chanter would not spare his pain in hope to win occasion to his will, which, when he long awaited had in vain, he changed his mind from one to other hill, for to all good he enemy was still. 
Upon the way him fortunate to meet, There marching underneath a shady hill, A goodly knight all armed in harness meet, That from his head no place appeared to his feet. His carriage was full comely and upright, His countenance demure and temperate, But yet so stern and terrible in sight, That cheered his friends and did his foes a mate. He was an elfin born, of noble state and mickle worship in his native land. Well could he tourney and enlists debate and knighthood took of good Sir Huon's hand, when with King Oberon he came to fairyland. Him also accompanied upon the way a comely palmer clad in black attire, of ripest years, and hairs all hoary gray, that with a staff his feeble steps did stire, lest his long way his aged limbs should tire. And if by looks one may the mind to read, he seemed to be a sage and sober sire, and ever with slow pace the knight did lead, who taught his trampling steed with equal steps to tread. Such when as Archimago did them view, he weened well to work some uncouth while. Eftsoons, untwisting his deceitful clue, he gan to weave a web of wicked guile, and with fair countenance and flattering style to them approaching, thus the knight bespake. Fair son of Mars, that seek with warlike spoil and great achievements, great yourself to make, vouchsafe to stay your steed for humble miser's sake. He stayed his steed for humble miser's sake, and bade tell on the tenor of his plaint, who, feigning then in every limb to quake through inward fear, and seeming pale and faint with piteous moan, his piercing speech can paint. Dear lady, how shall I declare thy case, whom late I left in languorous constraint? Would God thyself now present were in place to tell this rueful tale, thy sight could win thee grace, or rather would, oh, would it so had chanced that you, most noble sir, had present been when that lewd ribald with vile lust advanced, laid first his filthy hand on virgin clean to spoil her dainty corpse so fair and sheen as on the earth, great mother of us all, with living eye more fair was never seen, of chastity and honor virginal. Witness ye heavens, whom she in vain to help did call. How may it be, said then the knight half wroth, that knight should knighthood ever so have shent? None but that saw, quoth he, would ween for troth how shamefully that maid he did torment. Her looser golden locks he rudely rent, and drew her on the ground, and his sharp sword against her snowy breast he fiercely bent, and threatened death with many a bloody word. Tongue hates to tell the rest that I to see abhorred. Therewith, a moved from his sober mood, and lives he yet, said he, that wrought this act, and done the heavens afford him vital food? He lives, quoth he, and boasteth of the fact, nay yet hath any knight his courage cracked. Where may that treacher then, said he, be found, or by what means may I his footing tract? That shall I show, said he, as sure as hound the stricken deer doth challenge by the bleeding wound. He stayed not longer talk, but with fierce ire and zealous haste away is quickly gone, to seek that knight where him that crafty squire supposed to be. They do arrive anon, where sate a gentle lady all alone, with garments rent and hair dishevelled, wringing her hands and making piteous moan. Her swollen eyes were much disfigured, and her fair face with tears was foully blubbered. The knight, approaching nigh, thus to her said, Fair lady, through foul sorrow ill bedight, great pity is to see you thus dismayed, and mar the blossom of your beauty bright. For thee, appease your grief and heavy plight, and tell the cause of your conceived pain. For if he live that hath you done despite, he shall you do due recompense again, or else his wrong with greater puissance maintain which when she heard, as in despiteful wise, she willfully her sorrow did augment, and offered hope of comfort did despise. Her golden locks most cruelly she rent, and scratched her face with ghastly dreariment. Ne would she speak, ne see, ne yet be seen, but hid her visage, 
and her head down bent, either for grievous shame or for great teen, as if her heart with sorrow had transfixed been. Till her that squire bespake, Madame, my lief, for God's dear love, be not so willful bent, but do vouchsafe now to receive relief, the which good fortune doth to you present. For what boots it to weep and to weigh men when ill is chanced, but doth the ill increase, and the weak mind with double woe torment? When she her squire heard speak, she gan appease her voluntary pain, and feel some secret ease. Left soon she said, Ah, gentle trusty squire, what comfort can I, woeful wretch, conceive? Or why should ever I henceforth desire to see fair heaven's face, and life not leave, sith that false traitor did my honor reeve? False traitor, certes, said the fairy knight, I read the man that ever would deceive a gentle lady, or her wrong through might. Death were too little pain for such a foul despite. But now, fair lady, comfort do you make, and read who hath ye wrought this shameful plight, that short revenge the man may overtake, where so he be, and soon upon him light. Certes, said she, I wot not how he hight, but under him a grey steed did he wield, who sides with dappled circles were indict. Upright he rode, and in his silver shield he bore a bloody cross that quartered all the field. Now, by my head, said Guyon, much I muse how that same knight should do so foul a miss, or ever gentle damsel so abuse. For may I boldly say, he surely is a right good knight and true of word I wis. I present was and can it witness well when arms he swore, and straight did enter press the adventure of the errant damosel, in which he hath great glory won, as I hear tell. Natheless, he shortly shall again be tried, and fairly quit him of the imputed blame, else be ye sure he dearly shall abide, or make you good amendment for the same. All wrongs have mends, but no amends of shame. Now, therefore, lady, rise out of your pain, and see the salving of your blotted name, for loath she seemed thereto, but yet did feign, for she was inly glad her purpose so to gain. Her purpose was not such as she did feign, nor yet her person such as it was seen, but under simple show and semblant plain lurked false duessa secretly unseen, as a chaste virgin that wrong had been, so had false Archimago her disguised to cloak her guile with sorrow and sad teen, and eke himself had craftily devised to be her squire and do her service well aguised. Her late, forlorn and naked, he had found where she did wander in waste wilderness, lurking in rocks and caves far underground, and with green moss covering her nakedness to hide her shame and loathly filthiness, Sith her Prince Arthur of proud ornaments and borrowed beauty spoiled. Her, natheless, the enchanter finding fit for his intents, did thus revest and decked with new habiliments. For all he did was to deceive good knights and draw them from pursuit of praise and fame to slug in sloth and sensual delights and end their days with irrenowned shame, and now exceeding grief him overcame to see the red cross thus advanced high. Therefore this crafty engine he did frame against his praise to stir up enmity of such as virtues like mote unto him a lie. So now he guyan guides an uncouth way through woods and mountains, till they came at last into a pleasant dale that lowly lay betwixt two hills, whose high heads overplaced the valley did with cool shade overcast. Through midst thereof a little river rolled, by which there sate a knight with helm unlaced, himself refreshing with the liquid cold, after his travel long and labors manifold. Lo, yonder he, cried Archimage aloud, that wrought the shameful fact which I did show, and now he doth himself in secret shroud to fly the vengeance of his outraged due, but vain, for ye shall dearly do him rue, so God ye speed and send you good success, which we far off will here abide to view. So they him left, inflamed with wrathfulness, that straight against that night his spear he did address, who, seeing him from far so fierce to prick, his warlike arms about him gan embrace, and in the rest his ready spear did stick. 
Though, when as still he saw him towards pace, he gan encounter him in equal race. They been met, both ready to a frap, when suddenly that warrior gan abase his threatening spear, as if some new mishap had him betid, or hidden danger did entrap, and cried, Mercy, Sir Knight, and mercy, Lord, for mine offence and heedless hardiment, that had almost committed crime abhorred, and with reproachful shame mine honour shent, whilst cursed steel against that badge I bent, the sacred badge of my Redeemer's death, which on your shield is set for ornament. But his fierce foe, his steed, could stay aneath, who pricked with courage keen, did cruel battle breathe. But when he heard him speak, straightway he knew his error, and himself inclining, said, Ah, dear Sir Guyon, well becometh you, but me behoveth rather to abraid, whose hasty hand so far from reason strayed, that almost it did heinous violence on that fair image of that heavenly maid, that decks and arms your shield with fair defence, your curtsy takes on you another's due offence. So been they both at one, and done uprear their beavers bright, each other for to greet. Goodly comportance each to other bear, and entertain themselves with curtsies meet. Then said the Red Cross Knight, Now mote I weet, Sir Guyon, why with so fierce salience and fell intent ye did at erst me meet? For sith I know your goodly governance, great cause I ween you guided, or some uncouth chance. Certes, said he, well mote I shame to tell the fond and cheason that me hither led, a false, infamous fater late befell me for to meet, that seemed ill bestead and plained of grievous outrage which he read a knight had wrought against a lady gent, which to avenge he to this place me led, where you he made the mark of his intent, and now is fled. Foul shame him follow where he went. So can he turn his earnest unto game, through goodly handling and wise temperance. By this his aged guide in presence came, who, soon as on that night his eye did glance, eftsoons of him had perfect cognizance. Sith him in fairy court he late advised, and said, Fair son, God give you happy chance, and that dear cross upon your shield devised, wherewith above all knights ye goodly seem aguised. Joy may you have, and everlasting fame, of late most hard achievement by you done, for which enrolled is your glorious name in heavenly registers above the sun, where you a saint with saints your seat have won. But wretched we, where ye have left your mark, must now anew begin like race to run. God guide ye, Guyon, well to end thy walk, and to the wished haven bring thy weary bark. Palmer, him answered the Red Cross Knight, his be the praise that this achievement wrought, who made my hand the organ of his might. More than good will to me attribute not, for all I did I did but as I ought. But you, fair sir, whose pageant next ensues, well mote ye thee, as well can wish your thought, that home ye may report thrice happy news, for well ye worthy been for worth and gentle thews. So courteous Conji both did give and take, with right hands plighted, pledges of good will. Then Guyon forward gan his voyage make with his black palmer, that him guided still. Still he him guided over dale and hill, and with his steedy staff did point his way, his race with reason, and with words his will. From foul intemperance he oft did stay, and suffered not in wrath his hasty steps to stray. In this fair wise they travelled long a fear, through many hard assays which did betide, of which he honour still awaited bare, and spread his glory through all countries wide. At last, as chanced them by a forest side to pass, for succour from the scorching ray, they heard a rueful voice that dernly cried with piercing shrieks and many a doleful lay, which to attend while their forward steps they stay. But if the careless heavens, quoth she, despise the doom of just revenge, and take delight to see sad pageants of men's miseries, as bound by them to live in lives despite, yet can they not warn death from wretched wight. Come then, come soon, come sweetest death to me, and take away this long-lent loathed light.'
Sharp be thy wounds, but sweet the medicines be That long captived souls from weary thraldom free. But thou, sweet babe, whom frowning froward fate Hath made sad witness of thy father's fall, Sith heaven thee deigns to hold in living state, Long mayst thou live and better thrive withal Than to thy luckless parents did befall. Live thou, and to thy mother dead, Attest that clear she died from blemish criminal. Thy little hands imbrued in bleeding breast, Lo, I for pledges leave, so give me leave to rest. With that, a deadly shriek she forth did throw, that through the wood re-echoed again, and after gave a groan so deep and low that seemed her tender heart was rent in twain, or thrilled with point of thorough piercing pain, as gentle hind, who sides with cruel steel through launched, forth her bleeding life does reign, whiles the sad pang approaching she doth feel, braze out her latest breath, and up her eyes doth seal. Which when that warrior heard, dismounting straight from his tall steed, he rushed into the thick, and soon arrived where that sad portrait of death and labor lay, half dead, half quick, in whose white alabaster breast did stick a cruel knife that made a grisly wound, from which forth gushed a stream of gore-blood thick that all her goodly garments stained around, and into a deep sanguine died the grassy ground. Pitiful spectacle of deadly smart, beside a bubbling fountain low she lay, which she increased with her bleeding heart, and the clean waves with purple gore did ray. All's in her lap a lovely babe did play his cruel sport instead of sorrow due, for in her streaming blood he did embay his little hands and tender joints and brew, pitiful spectacle as ever I did view. Besides them both upon the soiled grass the dead course of an armed knight was spread, whose armor all with blood besprinkled was. His ruddy lips did smile, and rosy red did paint his cheerful cheeks, yet being dead. Seemed to have been a goodly personage, now in his freshest flower of lusty head, fit to inflame fair lady with love's rage, but that fierce fate did crop the blossom of his age. Whom when the good Sir Guyon did behold, his heart can wax as stark as marble stone, and his fresh blood did freeze with fearful cold, that all his senses seemed bereft atone. At last his mighty ghost gan deep to groan, as lion grudging in his great disdain mourns inwardly, and makes to himself moan, till ruth and frail affection did constrain his stout courage to stoop and show his inward pain. Out of her gored wound the cruel steel he lightly snatched and did the floodgate stop with his fair garment. Then gan softly feel her feeble pulse to prove if any drop of living blood yet in her veins did hop, which when he felt to move, he hoped fair to call back life to her forsaken shop. So well he did her deadly wounds repair, that at the last she gan to breathe out living air which he perceiving greatly can rejoice, and goodly counsel that for wounded heart is meetest medicine, tempered with sweet voice. I, me dear lady, which the image art of rueful pity and impatient smart, what direful chance, armed with revenging fate or cursed hand, hath played this cruel part, thus foul to hasten your untimely date? Speak, O oh dear lady, speak. Help never comes too late. Therewith her dim eyelids she up can rear, on which the dreary death did sit, as sad as lump of lead, and made dark clouds appear. But when as him, all in bright armor clad, before her standing she espied had, as one out of a deadly dream affright, she weakly started, yet she nothing drad. Straight down again herself in great despite she groveling through to ground, as hating life and light. The gentle knight, her soon with careful pain uplifted light, and softly did uphold. Thrice he arreared, and thrice she sunk again, till he his arms about her sides can fold, and to her said, 
Yet if the stony cold have not all seized on your frozen heart, let one word fall that may your grief unfold, and tell the secret of your mortal smart. He oft finds present help who does his grief impart. Then casting up a deadly look, full low she sight from bottom of her wounded breast, and after many bitter throbs did throw, with lips full pale and faltering tongue oppressed, these words she breathed forth from riven chest, Leave, ah, leave off whatever white thou be, to let a weary wretch from her due rest, and trouble dying soul's tranquillity. Take not away now got which none would give to me. Ah, far be it, said he, dear dame, from me to hinder soul from her desired rest, or hold sad life in long captivity. For all I seek is but to have redressed the bitter pangs that doth your heart infest. Tell then, old lady, tell what fatal brief hath with so huge misfortune you oppressed, that I may cast to compass your relief, or die with you in sorrow and partake your grief. With feeble hands, then stretched forth on high, as heaven accusing guilty of her death, and with dry drops congealed in her eye, in these sad words she spent her utmost breath. Hear then, O oh man, the sorrows that uneath my tongue can tell, so far as sense they pass. Lo, this dead corpse that lies here underneath, the gentlest knight that ever on green grass gay steed with spurs did prick, the good Sir Mordant was, was... I, the while that he is not so now, my lord, my love, my dear lord, my dear love, so long as heavens just with equal brow vouchsafed to behold us from above. One day, when him high courage did him move, as once ye knights to seek adventures wild, he pricked forth his puissant force to prove. Me, then, he left and wombed of this child, this luckless child whom thus ye see with blood defiled. Him fortunate, hard fortune ye may guess, to come where vile Acrasia does one, Acrasia, a false enchanteress that many errant knights hath foul for done, within a wandering island that doth run and stray in perilous gulf her dwelling is. Fair sir, if ever there ye travel, shun the cursed land where many wend amiss, and know it by the name, it height the bower of bliss. Her bliss is all in pleasure and delight, wherewith she makes her lovers drunken mad, and then, with words and weeds of wondrous might, on them she works her will to uses bad. My liefest lord she thus beguiled had, for he was flesh, all flesh doth frailty breed, whom when I heard to been so ill bestead, weak wretch, I wrapped myself in palmer's weed, and cast to seek him forth through danger and great dread. Now had fair Cynthia, by even turns, full measure in three quarters of her year, and thrice three times had filled her crooked horns, when as my womb her burden would forbear, and bade me call Lucina to me near. Lucina came, a man-child forth I brought, the woods, the nymphs, my bowers, my midwives were, hard help at need, so dear thee, babe, I bought, yet not too dear I deemed, while so my dear I sought. Him so I sought, and so at last I found, where him that witch had thralled to her will in chains of lust and lewd desires abound, and so transformed from his former skill that me he knew not, neither his own ill, till through wise handling and fair governance I him recured to a better will, purged from drugs of foul intemperance, than means I gan devise for his deliverance which when the vile enchantress perceived how that my lord from her I would reprive, with cup thus charmed him parting she deceived. Sad verse, give death to him that death does give, and loss of love to her that loves to live, so soon as Bacchus with the nymph does link. 
So parted we, and on our journey drive, Till coming to this well, he stooped to drink. The charm fulfilled, dead suddenly he down did sink. Which when I wretch, not one word more she said, But breaking off the end for want of breath, And sliding soft, as down to sleep her laid, And ended all her woe in quiet death. That seeing, good Sir Guyon, Could uneath from tears abstain, For grief his heart did great, And from so heavy sight his head did wreath, Accusing fortune and to cruel fate, Which plunged had fair lady in so wretched state. Then turning to his palmer said, Old sire, behold the image of mortality And feeble nature clothed with fleshly tire, When raging passion with fierce tyranny Robs reason of her due regality, And makes its servant to her basest part, The strong it weakens with infirmity. And with bold fury arms the weakest heart. The strong through pleasure soonest falls, The weak through smart. But temperance, said he, with golden squire, Betwixt them both can measure out a mean, Neither to melt in pleasure's hot desire, Nor fry in heartless grief and doleful teen. Thrice happy man who fares them both atween. But sit this wretched woman, Overcome of anguish rather than of crime hath been, Reserve her cause to her eternal doom, And in the mean vouchsafe her honorable tomb. Palmer, quoth he, Death is an equal doom to good and bad, The common inn of rest. But after death the trial is to come, When best shall be to them that lived best. But both alike, when death hath both suppressed, Religious reverence doth burial teem, which whoso wants, wants so much of his rest. For all so great shame after death I ween, As self to die in bad, unburied bad to be. So both agree their bodies to engrave, The great earth's womb they open to the sky, And with sad cypress seemly it embrave. Then covering with a clod their closed eye, They lay therein those courses tenderly and bid them sleep in everlasting peace. But ere they did their utmost obsequy, Sir Guyon, more affection to increase, benempt a sacred vow, which none could a release. The dead knight's sword out of his sheath he drew, with which he cut a lock of all their hair, which, meddling with their blood and earth, he threw into the grave, and gan devoutly swear, such and such evil God on Guyon rear, And worse and worse, young orphan, be thy pain, If I or thou due vengeance to forbear, Till guilty blood her guerdon to obtain. So shedding many tears, they closed the earth again. Babe's bloody hands may not be cleansed, The face of golden mean. Her sister's two extremities drive her to banish clean. Thus when Sir Guyon, with his faithful guide, had with due rites and dolorous lament the end of their sad tragedy uptied, the little babe up in his arms he hent, who with sweet pleasance and bold blandishment gan smile on them, that rather ought to weep, as careless of his woe, or innocent of that was done. That ruth and pierced deep in that night's heart, and words with bitter tears did steep. Ah, luckless babe, born under cruel star! And in dead parents' baleful ashes bred, Full little weenest thou what sorrows are Left thee for portion of thy livelihead. Poor orphan, in the wide world scattered As budding branch rent from the native tree, And thrown forth till it be withered, Such is the state of men. Thus enter we into this life with woe, And end with misery. Then soft himself inclining on his knee Down to that well, did in the water wean, so love does loathe disdainful nicety, his guilty hands from bloody gore to clean. He washed them oft, and oft, yet not they been for all his washing cleaner. Still he strove, yet still the little hands were bloody seen, the which him into great amazement drove, and into diverse doubt his wavering wonder clove. 
He wist not whether blot of foul offence might not be purged with water nor with bath, or that high God in lieu of innocence imprinted had that token of his wrath, to show how sore blood guiltiness he hates, or that the charm and venom which they drunk, their blood with secret filth infected hath, being diffused through the senseless trunk, that through the great contagion direful deadly stung. Whom thus at gaze the palmer gan to board with goodly reason, and thus fair bespake. Ye been right hard a mated, gracious lord, and of your ignorance great marvel make, whiles cause not well conceived ye mistake. But know that secret virtues are infused in every fountain, and in every lake, which, who hath skill them rightly to have choosed, to proof of passing wonders, hath full often used. Of those, some were so from their source endued by great dame nature, from whose fruitful pap their wellhead spring, and are with moisture dewed, which feeds each living plant with liquid sap, and fills with flowers fair flora's painted lap. But other some, by gift of later grace, or by good prayers, or by other hap, had virtue poured into their water's base, and thenceforth were renowned and sought from place to place. Such is this well, wrought by occasion strange, which to her nymph befell. Upon a day, as she the woods with bow and shafts did range, the heartless hind and roebuck to dismay, Dan Faunus chanced to meet her by the way, and kindling fire at her fair burning eye, inflamed was to follow beauty's chase, and chased her, that fast from him did fly. As hind from her, so she fled from her enemy. At last, when failing breath began to faint, and saw no means to scape, of shame afraid, she set her down to weep for sore constraint, and to Diana, calling loud for aid, her dear besought to let her die a maid. The goddess heard, and sudden, where she sate, welling out streams of tears, and quite dismayed with stony fear of that rude rustic mate, transformed her to a stone from steadfast virgin state. Lo, now she is that stone, from whose two heads, as from two weeping eyes, fresh streams do flow, yet cold, through fear, and old conceived dreads, and yet the stone her semblance seems to show, shaped like a maid, that such she may her know, and yet her virtues in her water bide, for it is chaste and pure as purest snow, ne lets her waves with any filth be dyed, but ever like herself unstained hath been tried. From thence it comes that this babe's bloody hand may not be cleansed with water of this well. Ne certes, sir, strive you it to withstand, but let them still be bloody as befell, that they his mother's innocence may tell, as she bequeathed in her last testament, that as a sacred symbol it may dwell in her son's flesh to mind revengement, and be for all chaste dames an endless monument. He hearkened to his reason, and the child uptaking to the palmer gave to bear, but his sad father's arms with blood defiled and heavy load himself did lightly rear. And turning to that place in which while e'er he left his lofty steed with golden cell and goodly gorgeous barbs, him found not there. By other accident that erst befell he is conveyed, but how or where he of it's not tell. Which when Sir Guyon saw, all were he wroth, yet all gates mote he soft himself appease, and fairly fair on foot, however loath. His double burden did him sore dis-ease. So long they travelled with little ease, till that at last they to a castle came, built on a rock adjoining to the seas. It was an ancient work of antique fame, and wondrous strong by nature, and by skilful frame. Therein three sisters dwelt of sundry sort, the children of one sire by mothers three, who dying whilom did divide this fort to them by equal shares in equal fee. But strifeful mind and diverse quality drew them in parts, and each made others foe. Still did they strive and daily disagree. The eldest did against the youngest go, and both against the middest meant to work and woe. Where, when the knight arrived, he was right well received, as knight of so much worth became, of second sister, who did far excel the other two. Medina was her name, a sober, sad, and comely, courteous dame, 
who, rich of raid, and yet in modest guise, in goodly garments that her well became, fair marching forth in honorable wise, him at the threshold met, and well did enterprise. She led him up into a goodly bower, and comely courted with meet modesty. Nay in her speech, nay in her havior, was lightness seen, or looser vanity, but gracious womanhood and gravity, above the reason of her youthly years, her golden locks she roundly did up tie in braided trammels, that no looser hairs did out of order stray about her dainty ears. Whilst she herself thus busily did frame, seemly to entertain her new-come guest, news hereof to her other sisters came, who all this while were at their wanton rest, according each her friend with lavish fest. They were two knights of peerless puissance, and famous far abroad for warlike guest which to these ladies love did countenance, and to his mistress each himself strove to advance. He that made love unto the eldest dame was hight Sir Hudibras, an hardy man, yet not so good of deeds as great of name, which he by many rash adventures when, since errant arms to sue he first began. More huge in strength than wise in works he was, and reason with fool hard eyes overran. Stern melancholy did his courage pass, and was, for terror more, all armed in shining brass. But he that loved the youngest was sans loy, he that fair Una late foul outraged, the most unruly and the boldest boy that ever warlike weapons managed, and to all lawless lust encouraged through strong opinion of his matchless might, nay aught he cared whom he endamaged by tortuous wrong, or whom bereaved of right. He now this lady's champion chose for love to fight. These two gay knights, vowed to so diverse loves, each other does envy with deadly hate, and daily war against his foeman moves, in hope to win more favor with his mate, and others pleasing service to abate to magnify his own. But when they heard how in that place strange knight arrived late, both knights and ladies forth right angry fared, and fiercely unto battle stern themselves prepared. But ere they could proceed unto the place where he abode, themselves at discord fell, and cruel combat joined in middle space. With horrible assault and fury fell, they heaped huge strokes, the scorned life, to quell, that all on uproar from her settled seat the house was raised, and all that in did dwell. Seemed that loud thunder with amazement great did rend the rattling skies with flames of foldering heat. The noise thereof called forth that stranger knight to weet what dreadful thing was there in hand. Where, when as two brave knights in bloody fight, with deadly rancor he enranged fond, his sun-broad shield about his rest he bond, and shining blade unsheathed with which he ran into that stead their strife to understand. And at his first arrival then began with goodly means to pacify well as he can. But they, him spying, both with greedy force at once upon him ran, and him beset with strokes of mortal steel without remorse, and on his shield like iron sledges bet, as when a bear and tiger, being met in cruel fight on Libic ocean wide, espy a traveller with feet sir bet, whom they in equal prey hope to divide, they stint their strife, and him assail on every side. But he, not like a weary travelier, their sharp assault right boldly did rebut, and suffered not their blows to bite him near, but with redoubled buffs them back did put, whose grieved minds, which collar did in glut, against themselves turning their wrathful spite, gan with new rage their shields to hew and cut. But still when Guyan came to part their fight with heavy load on him they freshly gan to smite. As a tall ship tossed in troublous seas, whom raging winds, threatening to make the prey of the rough rocks, do diversely disease, meets two contrary billows by the way, that her on either side do soar essay, and boast to swallow her in greedy grave, she, scorning both their spites, does make wide way, and with her breast breaking the foamy wave, does ride on both their backs, and fair herself doth save. So boldly he him bears, and rusheth forth between them both by conduct of his blade. Wondrous great prowess and heroic worth he showed that day, and rare ensample made, when two so mighty warriors he dismayed. 
At once he wards and strikes, he takes and pays, now forced to yield, now forcing to invade. Before, behind, and round about him lays, so double was his pains, so double be his praise. Strange sort of fight, three valiant knights to see three combats join in one, and to derain a triple war with triple enmity, all for their lady's froward love to gain, which gotten was but hate. So love does reign in stoutest minds, and maketh monstrous war. He maketh war, he maketh peace again, and yet his peace is but continual jar. O oh, miserable men that to him subject are! Whilst thus they mingled were in furious arms, the fair Medina, with her tresses torn and naked breast, in pity of their harms, amongst them ran, and falling them before and besought them by the womb which them had borne, and by the loves which were to them most dear, and by the knighthood which they sure had sworn, their deadly cruel discord to forbear, and to her just conditions of fair peace to hear. But her two other sisters standing by, her loud gain said, and both their champions bade pursue the end of their strong enmity, as ever of their loves they would be glad. Yet she, with pithy words and counsel sad, still strove their stubborn rages to revoke, that at the last, suppressing fury mad, they gan abstain from dint of direful stroke, and hearken to the sober speeches which she spoke. Ah, puissant lords, what cursed evil sprite, or fell Irinus, in your noble hearts her hellish brand hath kindled with despite, and stirred you up to work your willful smarts? Is this the joy of arms? Be these the parts of glorious knighthood after blood to thrust, and not regard you right and just as arts? Vain is the vaunt and victory unjust that more to mighty hands than rightful cause doth trust. And were there rightful cause of difference, yet were not better fair it to accord than with blood guiltiness to heap offence and mortal vengeance join to crime abhorred? Oh, fly from wrath, fly, O oh, my liefest lord! Sad be the sights and bitter fruits of war, and thousand furies wait on wrathful sword. Nay, aught the praise of prowess more doth mar than foul revenging rage and base contentious jar. But lovely concord and most sacred peace doth nourish virtue and fast friendship breeds. Weak she makes strong, and strong thing doth increase, till it the pitch of highest praise exceeds. Brave be her wars and honourable deeds, by which she triumphs over ire and pride, and wins an olive girland for her meads. Be therefore, O my dear lords, pacified, and this misseeming discord meekly lay aside. Her gracious words their rancor did appall, and sunk so deep into their boiling breasts, that down they let their cruel weapons fall, and lowly did abase their lofty crests to her fair presence and discreet behests. Then she began a treaty to procure and establish terms betwixt both their requests, that as a law for ever should endure, which to observe, in word of knights they did assure which to confirm and fast to bind their league, after their weary sweat and bloody toil she them besought, during their quiet trigue, into her lodging to repair a while to rest themselves, and grace to reconcile. They soon consent, so forth with her they fare, where they are well received, and made to spoil themselves of soiled arms, and to prepare their minds to pleasure, and their mouths to dainty fare. And those two froward sisters, their fair loves, came with the meek, all were they wondrous loath, and feigned cheer, as for the time behooves, but could not color yet so well the troth, but that their natures bad appeared in both, for both did at their second sister grutch, and inly grieve, as doth an hidden moth the inner garment fret, not that her touch. One thought her cheer too little, the other thought too much. Elissa, so that eldest height, did deem such entertainment base, ne aught would eat, ne aught would speak, but evermore did seem as discontent for want of mirth or meat. No solace could her paramour entreat her once to show, ne court nor dalliance, but with bent lowering brows, as she would threat, she scowled and frowned with froward countenance, unworthy of fair lady's comely governance. But young Parissa was of other mind, full of disport, still laughing, loosely light, and quite contrary to her sister's kind. No measure in her mood, no rule of right, but pour it out in pleasure and delight. 
In wine and meats she flowed above the bank, and in excess exceeded her own might. In sumptuous tire she joyed herself to prank, but of her love too lavish, little have she thank. Fast by her side did sit the bold sans loy, fit mate for such a mincing minion, who in her looseness took exceeding joy, might not be found a franker frannian of her lewd parts to make companion. But Hudibras, more like a malcontent, did see and grieve at his bold fashion. Hardly could he endure his hardiment, yet still he sat, and inly did himself torment. Betwixt them both the fair Medina sate with sober grace and goodly carriage. With equal measure she did moderate the strong extremities of their outrage. That froward pair she ever would assuage when they would strive due reason to exceed. But that same froward twain would accourage and of her plenty add unto their need. So kept she them in order and herself in heed. Thus fairly she attempered her feast, and pleased them all with meat satiety. At last, when lust of meat and drink was ceased, she Guyon dear besought of courtesy to tell from whence he came through jeopardy, and whither now on new adventure bound, who with bold grace and comely gravity, drawing to him the eyes of all around, from lofty siege began these words aloud to sound. This thy demand, O lady, doth revive fresh memory in me of that great queen, great and most glorious virgin queen alive, that with her sovereign power and scepter sheen all fairyland doth peaceably sustain. In widest ocean she her throne does rear, that over all the earth it may be seen, as morning sun her beams dispread and clear, and in her face fair peace and mercy doth appear. In her the riches of all heavenly grace in chief degree are heaped up on high, and all that else this world's enclosure base hath great or glorious in mortal eye adorns the person of her majesty, that men beholding so great excellence and rare perfection in mortality do her adorn with sacred reverence as the idol of her maker's great magnificence. To her I homage and my service owe in number of the noblest knights on ground, amongst whom on me she deigned to bestow order of maidenhead the most renowned that may this day in all the world be found. An yearly solemn feast she wants to hold, the day that first doth lead the year around, to which all knights of worth and courage bold resort to hear of strange adventures to be told. There this old palmer showed himself that day, and to that mighty princess did complain of grievous mischiefs which a wicked fay had wrought, and many whelmed in deadly pain, whereof he craved redress. My sovereign, whose glory is in gracious deeds, and joys throughout the world her mercy to maintain, eftsoons devised redress for such a noise. Me, all unfit for so great purpose, she employs. Now hath fair Phoebe, with her silver face thrice seen the shadows of the nether world, sith last I left that honourable place, in which her royal presence is enrolled. Nay ever shall I rest in house nor hold till I that false Acrasia have won, of whose foul deeds too hideous to be told I witness am, and this the wretched son whose woeful parents she hath wickedly fordone. Tell on, fair sir, said she, that doleful tale from which sad Ruth does seem you to restrain, that we may pity such unhappy bale, and learn from pleasures poison to abstain. Ill by example, good doth often gain. Then forward he his purpose gan pursue, and told the story of the mortal pain which Mordant and Amavia did rue, as with lamenting eyes himself did lately view. Night was far spent. And now in ocean deep, Orion, flying fast from hissing snake, his flaming head did hasten for to steep, when of his piteous tale he end did make. Whilst with delight of that he wisely spake, those guests beguiled did beguile their eyes of kindly sleep that did them overtake. At last, when they had marked the changed skies, they wist their hour was spent, then each to rest him highs. Vain braggadocio, getting Guyon's horse, is made the scorn of knighthood true, and is of fair Belphoebe foul forlorn. 
Soon as the morrow fair with purple beams dispersed the shadows of the misty night, and Titan, playing on the eastern streams, clear the dewy air with springing light, Sir Gion, mindful of his vow of plight, uprose from drowsy couch, and him addressed unto the journey which he had behight. His puissant arms about his noble breast, and many-folded shield he bound about his rest. Then taking congee of that virgin pure, the bloody-handed babe unto her truth did earnestly commit, and her conjure in virtuous lore to train his tender youth, and all that gentle nurture in sooth, and that so soon as riper years he wrought, he might, for memory of that day's ruth, be called ruddy main, and thereby taught to venge his parents' death on them that had it wrought. So forth he fared, as now befell on foot, sith his good steed is lately from him gone. Patience, perforce, helpless, what may it boot to fret for anger, or for grief to moan? His palmer now shall foot no more alone. So fortune wrought, as under green wood side he lately hard that dying lady grown, he left his steed without and spear beside, and rushed in on foot to aid her ere she died. The whiles a losel wandering by the way, one that to bounty never cast his mind, and a thought of honor ever did assay his baser breast, but in his kestrel kind a pleasing vein of glory vein did find, to which his flowing tongue and troublous sprite gave him great aid, and made him more inclined. He, that brave steed there finding ready dight, purloined both steed and spear, and ran away full light. Now gan his heart all swell in jollity, and of himself great hope and help conceived, that, puffed up with smoke of vanity, and with self-loved personage deceived, he gan to hope of men to be received for such as he him thought or fain would be. But for in court gay portents he perceived, and gallant show to be in greatest gree, eftsoons to court he cast to advance his first degree. And by the way he chanced to espy one sitting idle on a sunny bank, to whom a vaunting in great bravery as peacock, that his painted plumes doth prank, he smote his courser in the trembling flank, and to him threatened his heart-thrilling spear. The silly man, seeing him ride so rank and aim at him, fell flat to ground for fear, and crying, Mercy! loud, his piteous hands gan rear. Thereat the scarecrow, wexed wondrous proud, through fortune of his first adventure fair, and with big thundering voice reviled him loud, Vile caitiff, vassal of dread and despair, unworthy of the common breathed air, why livest thou dead dog a linger day, and dost not unto death thyself prepare? Die, or thyself my captive yield for a. Great favor I thee grant, for answer thus to stay. Hold, O oh dear Lord, hold your dead-doing hand, then loud he cried. I am your humble thrall. Ah, oh, wretch, quoth he, thy destinies withstand my wrathful will, and do for mercy call. I give thee life, therefore prostrated fall, and kiss my stirrup, that thy homage be. The miser threw himself, as an offal, straight at his foot in base humility, and cleeped him his liege to hold of him in fee. So happy peace they made and fair accord. Eftsoons this liegeman gan to wex more bold, and when he felt the folly of his lord, in his own kind he gan himself unfold. For he was wily witted and grown old in cunning slights and practic knavery. From that day forth he cast for to uphold his idle humor with fine flattery, and blow the bellows to his swelling vanity. Trumpart, fit man for braggadocio, to serve at court in view of vaunting eye. Vain glorious man, when fluttering wind does blow in his light wings, is lifted up to sky. The scorn of knighthood and true chivalry to think without desert of gentle deed and noble worth to be advanced high, such praise is shame, but honor, virtue's meed, doth bear the fairest flower in honorable seed. 
So forth they pass a well-consorted pair, Till that at length with Archimage they meet, Who, seeing one that shone in armor fair, On goodly course with thundering with his feet, Eft soon supposed him a person meet Of his revenge to make the instrument. For since the Red Cross knight he erst did weet To be with Gion, knit in one consent, The ill which erst to him he now to Gion meant. And coming close to Trumpart gan inquire of him what mighty warrior that mote be that rode in golden cell with single spear, but wanted sword to wreak his enmity. He is a great adventurer, said he, that hath his sword through hard essay forgone, and now hath vowed, till he avenged be of that despite, never to wear a none. That spear is him enough to done a thousand groan. And Chanter greatly joyed in the vaunt, And weened well, ere long, his will to win, And both his phone with equal foil to daunt. Though to him louting lowly did begin to plain Of wrongs which had committed been by Gion, And by that false Red Cross knight, Which too, through treason a deceitful gin, Had slain Sir Mordant and his lady bright, That mote him honour win to wreak so foul despite. Therewith all suddenly he seemed enraged, and threatened death with dreadful countenance, as if their lives had in his hand been gauged, and with stiff force shaking his mortal lance, to let him weet his doughty valiance, thus said, Old man, great sure shall be thy meed, if, where those knights for fear of due vengeance do lurk, thou certainly to me a reed, that I may wreak on them their heinous, hateful deed. Certes, my lord, said he, that shall I soon, and give you eke good help to their decay. But mote I wisely you advise to do, give no odds to your foes, but do purvey yourself of sword before that bloody day. For they be to the prowest knights on ground, and oft approved in many hard assay. And eke of surest steel that may be found, do arm yourself against that day them to confound. Dotard, said he, let be thy deep advice. Seems that through many years thy wits thee fail, And that weak eld hath left thee nothing wise. Else never should thy judgment be so frail To measure manhood by the sword or mail. Is not enough four quarters of a man Without an sword or shield, an host to quail? Thou little wottest what this right hand can. Speak they which have beheld the battles which it wan. The man was much abashed at his boast, yet well he wist that whoso would contend with either of those knights on even coast should need of all his arms him to defend, yet feared lest his boldness should offend. When Braggadocchio said, once I did swear, when with one sword seven knights I brought to end, thenceforth in battle never sword to bear, but it were that which noblest knight on earth doth wear. Perdee, sir knight, said then the enchanter Blythe, that shall I shortly purchase to your haunt, for now the best and noblest knight alive Prince Arthur is that one's in Fairyland. He hath a sword that flames like burning brand. The same by my device I undertake shall by to-morrow by thy side be fond. At which bold word that boaster gan to quake, and wondered in his mind what mote that monster make. He stayed not for more bidding, but away was sudden vanished out of his sight. The northern wind his wings did broad display at his command, and reared him up light from off the earth to take his airy flight. They looked about, but nowhere could a spy track of his foot. Then, dead through great affright, they both nigh were, and each bad other fly. Both fled at once, ne ever back returned I. Till that they come unto a forest green, In which they shroud themselves from causeless fear. Yet fear them follow still, whereso they been, Each trembling leaf and whistling wind they hear, As ghastly bug their hair on end does rear. Yet both do strive their fearfulness to feign. At last they heard a horn that shrilled clear Throughout the wood that echoed again, And made the forest ring as it would rive in twain. 
Eft through the thick they heard one rudely rush, With noise whereof he from his lofty steed Down fell to ground, and crept into a bush, To hide his coward head from dying dread. But Trumpert stoutly stayed to take in heed Of what might hap. Eft soon there stepped forth a goodly lady Clad in hunter's weed, that seemed to be a woman of great worth, And by her stately portents born of heavenly birth. Her face, so fair as flesh it seemed not, But heavenly portrait of bright angel's hue, Clear as the sky without in blame or blot, Through goodly mixture of complexions due. And in her cheeks the vermeil red did shew Like roses in a bed of lily shed, The which ambrosial odours from them threw, And gazers sense with double pleasure fed, Able to heal the sick and to revive the dead. In her fair eyes two living lamps did flame, Kindled above at heavenly Maker's light, And darted fiery beams out of the same, So passing persant and so wondrous bright, That quite bereaved the rash beholder's sight. In them the blinded God his lustful fire to kindle, Oft assayed, but had no might. For, with dread majesty and awful ire, She broke his wanton darts, and quenched base desire. Her ivory forehead full of bounty brave, Like a broad table did itself dispread, For love his lofty triumphs to engrave, And write the battles of his great godhead. All good and honour might therein be read, For there their dwelling was. And when she spake, sweet words like dropping honey she did shed, And twixt the pearls and rubens softly break A silver sound that heavenly music seemed to make. Upon her eyelids, Many graces sate, under the shadow of her even brows, Working bell guards and amorous retreat, And every one her with a grace endows, And every one with meekness to her bows. So glorious mirror of celestial grace, And sovereign monument of mortal vows, How shall frail pen describe her heavenly face, For fear, through want of skill, her beauty to disgrace? So fair, and thousand, thousand times more fair she seemed, When she presented was to sight, And was a clad, for heat of scorching air, All in a silken camas, lily-white, Purfled upon with many a folded plight, Which all above besprinkled was throughout With golden egulets, that glistered bright Like twinkling stars, and all the skirt about Was hemmed with golden fringe. Below her ham her weed were somewhat train, And her straight legs most bravely were embailed In gilden buskins of costly court wain, All barred with golden bends, Which were entailed with curious antics, And full fair omailed. Before they fastened were under her knee In a rich jewel, And therein entrailed the ends of all their knots, That none might see how they within their foldings Close and rapid be. Like two fair marble pillars they were seen, Which do the temple of the god support, Whom all the people deck with girlands green, And honour in their festival resort. Though same, with stately grace and princely port, She taught to tread when she herself would grace, But with the woody nymphs when she did play, Or when the flying libbard she did chase, She could them nimbly move, and after fly apace. And in her hand a sharp boar spear she held, And at her back a bow and quiver gay, Stuffed with steel-headed darts, Wherewith she quelled the salvage beasts In her victorious play, Knit with a golden baldric, Which forlay athwart her snowy breast, And did divide her dainty paps, Which like young fruit in May, Now little gan to swell, And being tied, Through her thin weed their places only signified. Her yellow locks, crisped like golden wire, About her shoulders were in loosely shed, And when the wind amongst them did inspire, They wavered like a pennon wide to spread, And low behind her back were scattered. And whether art it were, or heedless hap, As through the flowering forest rash she fled, In her rude hairs sweet flowers themselves did lap, And flourishing fresh leaves and blossoms did enwrap.
such as Diana by the sandy shore of swift Eurotus, or on Synthus green, where all the nymphs have her unwares forlore, wandereth alone with bow and arrows keen to seek her game. Or as that famous queen of Amazons, whom Pyrrhus did destroy, the day that first of Priam she was seen, did show herself in great triumphant joy to succor the weak state of sad afflicted Troy. Such when as heartless Trumpart heard it view, he was dismayed in his coward mind, and doubted whether he himself should shoe, or fly away, or bide alone behind. Both fear and hope he in her face did find, when she at last him spying thus bespake, Hail, groom, didst thou thou see a bleeding hind, whose right haunch erst my steadfast arrow strake? If thou didst tell me, that I may her overtake. Wherewith revived, this answer forth he threw. O oh, goddess, for such I thee take to be, for neither doth thy face terrestrial shoe nor voice sound mortal, I avow to thee such wounded beast as that I did not see, sith erst into this forest wild I came. But mote thy goodly head forgive it me to weet which of the gods I shall thee name, that unto thee due worship I may rightly frame. To whom she thus, but ere her words ensued, unto the bush her eye did sudden glance, in which vain braggadocio was mewed, and saw it stir. She left her piercing lance, and towards gan a deadly shaft advance in mind to mark the beast, at which sad stour trumpered forth step to stay the mortal chance, out crying, Oh, whatever heavenly power or earthly wight thou be, withhold this deadly hour! O oh, stay thy hand, for yonder is no game for thy fierce arrows them to exercise. But lo, my lord, my liege, whose warlike name is far renowned through many bold emprise, and now in shade he shrouded yonder lies. She stayed. With that he crawled out of his nest, forth creeping on his cative hands and thighs, and standing stoutly up, his lofty crest did fiercely shake, and rouse as coming late from rest. As fearful fowl that long in secret cave for dread of soaring hawk herself hath hid, not caring how, her silly life to save, she her gay painted plumes disordered, seeing at last herself from danger rid, peeps forth, and soon renews her native pride. She gins her feathers foul disfigured, proudly to prune, and set on every side. So shakes off shame, nothing's how erst she did her hide. So when her goodly visage he beheld, he gan himself to vaunt. But when he viewed those deadly tools, which in her hand she held, soon into other fits he was transmued, till she to him her gracious speech renewed. All hail, Sir Knight, and well may thee befall, as all the like which honor have pursued through deeds of arms and prowess martial. All virtue merits praise, but such the most of all. To whom he thus, O oh, fairest under sky, true be thy words, and worthy of thy praise, that warlike feats dost highest glorify. Therein have I spent all my youthly days, and many battles fought, and many frays throughout the world, where so they might be found, endeavoring my dreaded name to raise above the moon, that fame may it resound in her eternal trump, with laurel girland crown. But what art thou, O lady, which dost range in this wild forest, where no pleasure is, and dost not it for joyous court exchange amongst thine equal peers, where happy bliss and all delight does reign much more than this? There thou mayst love, and dearly loved be, and swim in pleasure, which thou here dost miss. There mayst thou best be seen, and best mayst see. The wood is fit for beasts. The court is fit for thee. Whoso in pomp of proud estate, quoth she, does swim, and bathes himself in courtly bliss, does waste his days in dark obscurity, and in oblivion ever buried is. Where ease abounds, it's eath to do amiss. But who his limbs with labors and his mind behaves with cares, cannot so easy miss. Abroad in arms, at home in studious kind, Who seeks with painful toil shall honor soonest find. In woods, 
in waves, in wars she wants to dwell, and will be found with peril and with pain. Nay can the man that molds in idle cell unto her happy mansion attain. Before her gate high God did sweat ordain, and wake full watches ever to abide. But easy is the way, and passage plain to pleasure's palace. It may soon be spied, and day and night her doors to all stand open wide. In prince's court the rest she would have said, but that the foolish man, filled with delight of her sweet words, that all his sense dismayed, and with her wondrous beauty ravished quite, gan burn in filthy lust, and leaping light thought in his bastard arms her to embrace. With that she, swarving back, her javelin bright against him bent, and fiercely did menace, so turned her about, and fled away apace, which when the peasant saw, amazed he stood, and grieved at her flight. Yet durst he not pursue her steps through wild unknown wood. Besides, he feared her wrath, and threatened shot, whilst in the bush he lay, yet not forgot. Ne cared he greatly for her presence vain, but turning said to Trumpert, What foul blot is this to-night, that lady should again depart to woods untouched, and leave so proud disdain? Perdi, said Trumpert, let her pass at will, lest by her presence danger might befall, for who can tell, and sure I fear it ill, but that she is some power celestial. For while she spake, her great words did appall my feeble courage and my heart oppress, that yet I quake and tremble over all. And I, said Bragadocchio, thought no less, when first I heard her horn sound with such ghastliness, for from my mother's womb this grace I have, me given by eternal destiny, that earthly thing may not my courage brave dismay with fear, or cause one foot to fly, but either hellish fiends or powers on high. Which was the cause, when erst that horn I heard, weaning it had been thunder in the sky, I hid myself from it as one afeard. But when I other knew myself, I boldly reared. But now, for fear of worse that may be tied, let us soon hence depart. They soon agree. So to his steed he got, and gan to ride, as one unfit therefore, that all might see he had not trained been in chivalry, which well that valiant courser did discern, for he despised to tread in due degree, but chafed and foamed with courage fierce and stern, and to be eased of that base burden still did earn. Guyon does Fiora bind in chains, and stops occasion, delivers Fidon, and therefore by strife is railed upon. In brave pursuit of honorable deed, there is, I know not what, great difference between the vulgar and the noble seed, which unto things of valorous pretense seems to be born by native influence, as feats of arms and love to entertain. But chiefly, skill to ride seems a science proper to gentle blood. Some others feign to manage steeds, as did this vaunter, but in vain. But he, the rightful owner of that steed, who well could manage and subdue his pride, the whiles on foot was forced for to yield with that black palmer, his most trusty guide, who suffered not his wandering feet to slide. But when strong passion or weak fleshliness would from the right way seek to draw him wide, he would, through temperance and steadfastness, teach him the weak to strengthen and the strong suppress. It fortunate, forth-faring on his way, he saw from far, or seemed for to see, some troublous uproar or contentious fray, whereto he drew in haste to agree. A madman, or that feigned mad to be, drew by the hair along upon the ground a handsome stripling with great cruelty whom sore he bet, and gored with many a wound, that cheeks with tears and sides with blood did all abound. And him behind a wicked hag did stalk in ragged robes and filthy disarray. Her other leg was lame, that she note walk, but on a staff her feeble steps did stay. Her locks, that loathly were and hoary gray, grew all afore, and loosely hung unrolled, but all behind was bald and worn away, that none thereof could ever taken hold, and eke her face ill-favoured, full of wrinkles old. 
And ever as she went, her tongue did walk in foul reproach in terms of vile despite, provoking him by her outrageous talk to heap more vengeance on that wretched wight. Sometimes she wrought him stones wherewith to smite, sometimes her staff, though it her one leg were, without in which she could not go upright. Any evil mean she did forbear that might him move to wrath and indignation rear. The noble Guyon, moved with great remorse, approaching, first the hag did thrust away, and after, adding more impetuous force, his mighty hands did on the madman lay and plucked him back, who, all on fire, straightway against him, turning all his fell intent, with beastly, brutish rage gan him assay, and smot and bit and kicked and scratched and rent, and did he wist not what in his avengement. And sure he was a man of mickle might, had he had governance it well to guide, but when the frantic fit inflamed his sprite, his force was vain, and struck more often wide than at the aimed mark which he had eyed, and oft himself he chanced to hurt unwares, whilst reason, blent through passion, not descried, but as a blindfold bull at random fares, and where he hits, not knows, and whom he hurts, not cares. His rude assault and rugged handling, strange seem it to the knight, that a with foe in fair defence and goodly managing of arms was wont to fight. Yet now the mo was he abashed now, not fighting so, but more enfierced through his currish play, him sternly gripped, and hailing to and fro, to overthrow him strongly did essay, but overthrew himself unwares and lower lay. And being down, the villain sore did beat and bruise with clownish fists his manly face, and eke the hag with many a bitter threat still called upon to kill him in the place, with whose reproach and odious menace the knight him boiling in his haughty heart knit all his forces and gan soon unbrace his grasping hold, so lightly did upstart and drew his deadly weapon to maintain his part. Which when the palmer saw, he loudly cried, Not so, O Gion! Never think that so that monster can be maestered or destroyed. He is not, ah, he is not such a foe as steel can wound, or strength can overthrow. That same is Führer, cursed, cruel wight, that under knighthood works much shame and woe, and that same hag his aged mother hight Occasion, the root of all wrath and despite, with her, who so will raging Führer tame, must first begin, and well her aminage. First her restrain from her reproachful blame and evil means, with which she doth enrage a frantic son, and kindles his courage. Then, when she is withdrawn, or strong withstood, it's eath his idle fury to assuage, and calm the tempest of his passion wood. The banks are overflown when stopped is the flood. Therewith Sir Guyon left his first emprise, and, turning to that woman, fast her hent by the whole locks that hung before her eyes, and to the ground her threw. Yet knowed she stent her bitter railing and foul revilement, but still provoked her son to wreak her wrong. But natheless he did her still torment, and catching hold of her ungracious throng, thereon an iron lock did fasten firm and strong. Then, when as use of speech was from her reft, with her two crooked hands she signs did make, and beckoned him the last help she had left. But he that last left help away did take, and both her hands fast bound unto a stake that she notes stir. Then gan her son to fly full fast away, and did her quite forsake. But Guyon after him in haste did hie, and soon him overtook in sad perplexity. In his strong arms he stiffly him embraced, who him gained striving, not at all prevailed, for all his power was utterly defaced, and furious fits at erst quite were enquailed. Oft he reinforced, and oft his forces failed, yet yield he would not, nor his rancor slack. Then him to ground he cast, and rudely hailed, and both his hands fast bound behind his back, and both his feet in fetters to an iron rack. With hundred iron chains he did embind, and hundred knots that did him sore constrain. Yet his great iron teeth he still did grind, and grimly gnash, threatening revenge in vain. His burning iron, whom bloody strakes did stain, stared full wide, and threw forth sparks of fire, and more for rank despite than for great pain, shaked his long locks, colored like copper wire, and bit his tawny beard to show his raging ire. 
Thus, when as Guyon Fuhrer had captived, turning about, he saw that wretched squire, whom that mad man of life nigh late deprived, lying on ground, all soiled with blood and mire, whom, when as he perceived to respire, he gan to comfort, and his wounds to dress. Being at last recured, he gan inquire what hard mishap him brought to such distress, and made that caitiff's thrall the thrall of wretchedness. With heart then throbbing, and with watery eyes, Fair sir, quoth he, what man can shun the hap that hidden lies unwares him to surprise? Misfortune waits advantage to entrap the man most wary in her whelming lap. So me, weak wretch, of many, weakest one, unweeting and unware of such mishap, she brought to mischief through occasion, where this same wicked villain did me light upon. It was a faithless squire that was the source of all my sorrow and of these sad tears, with whom from tender dug of common nurse at once I was upbrought, and eft, when years more ripe, us reason lent to choose our peers, ourselves in league of vowed love we knit, in which we long time without jealous fears or faulty thoughts continued as was fit, and for my part I vow dissembled not a whit. It was my fortune, common to that age, to love a lady fair of high degree, the which was born of noble parentage, and set in highest seat of dignity, yet seemed no less to love than love to be. Long I her served, and found her faithful still, nay everything could cause us disagree. Love that two hearts makes one, makes eke one will, each strove to please, and others pleasure to fulfill. My friend, hight Philemon, I did partake of all my love and all my privity, who greatly joyous seemed for my sake, and gracious to that lady as to me. Ne ever wight that mote so welcome be as he to her, without an blot or blame. Ne ever thing that she could think or see, but unto him she would impart the same. O oh, wretched man, that would abuse so gentle dame! At last such grace I found and means I wrought, that I that lady to my spouse had won. A cord of friends, consent of parents sought, affiance made, my happiness begun. There wanted naught but few rites to be done which marriage make. That day too far did seem. Most joyous man, on whom the shining sun did show his face, myself I did esteem, and that my falser friend did no less joyous deem. But ere that wished day his beam disclosed, he, either envying my toward good, or of himself to treason ill-disposed, one day unto me came in friendly mood, and told, for secret, how he understood that lady whom I had to me assigned, had both disdained her honorable blood, and eke the faith which she to me did bind, and therefore wished me stay till I more truth should find. The gnawing anguish and sharp jealousy which his sad speech infixed in my breast, rankled so sore and festered inwardly, that my engrieved mind could find no rest, till that the truth thereof I did outrest, and him besought, by that same sacred band betwixt us both, to counsel me the best. He then with solemn oath and plighted hand assured, ere long the truth to let me understand. Ere long, with like, again he boarded me, saying he now had bolted all the flower, and that it was a groom of base degree which of my love was partner Paramour, who used in a darksome inner bower her oft to meet, which better to approve, he promised to bring me at that hour when I should see that would me nearer move and drive me to withdraw my blind, abused love. This graceless man, for furtherance of his guile, did court the handmaid of my lady dear, who, glad him bosom his affection vile, did all she might more pleasing to appear. One day, to work her to his will more near, he wooed her thus. Priene, so she hight, what great despite doth fortune to thee bear, thus lowly to abase thy beauty bright, that it should not deface all others' lesser light? But if she had her least help to thee lent, To adorn thy form according thy desart, Their blazing pride thou wouldst soon have blent, And stained their praises with thy least good part. Ne should fair Clarabel with all her art, Though she thy lady be, approach thee near. 
for proof thereof, this evening, as thou art, array thyself in her most gorgeous gear, that I may more delight in thy embracement, dear. The maiden, proud through praise and mad through love, him hearkened to, and soon herself arrayed, the whiles to me the treacher did remove his crafty engine, and, as he had said, me leading, in a secret corner laid the sad spectator of my tragedy. Where left he went, and his own false part played, disguised like that groom of base degree whom he had feigned the abuser of my love to be. Eftsoons he came unto the pointed place, and with him brought Priene, rich arrayed in Clarabella's clothes. Her proper face I not discerned in that darksome shade, but weaned it was my love with whom he played. Ah, oh God, what horror and tormenting grief my heart, my hands, mine eyes, and all assayed. Me liefer were ten thousand deaths as brief than wound of jealous worm and shame of such reprief. I home returning, fraught with foul despite and chawing vengeance all the way I went, soon as my loathed love appeared in sight with wrathful hand, I slew her, innocent, that after soon I dearly did lament. For when the cause of that outrageous deed demanded, I made plain and evident, her faulty handmaid which that bale did breathe confess, how Philemon her wrought to change her weed which when I heard, with horrible affright and hellish fury all enraged, I sought upon myself that vengeable despite to punish. Yet it better first I thought to wreak my wrath on him that first it wrought. To Philemon, false, fate, or Philemon I cast to pay that I so dearly bought. Of deadly drugs I gave him drink anon, and washed away his guilt with guilty potion. Thus heaping crime on crime and grief on grief, To loss of love, adjoining loss of friend. I meant to purge both with a third mischief, And in my woes beginner it to end. That was Priene. She did first offend, she last should smart. With which cruel intent, when I at her my murderous blade did bend, She fled away with ghastly dreariment, and I, pursuing my fell purpose, after went. Fear gave her wings, and rage enforced my flight. Through woods and plains so long I did her chase, Till this madman, whom your victorious might, Hath now fast bound me met in middle space. As I her, so he me pursued apace, And shortly overtook. I, breathing ire, sore chafered at my stay in such a case, And with my heat, kindled his cruel fire, which kindled once, his mother did more rage inspire. Betwixt them both they have me done to die through wounds and strokes and stubborn handling that death were better than such agony as grief and fury unto me did bring, of which in me yet sticks the mortal sting that during life will never be appeased. When he thus ended had his sorrowing, said Guyon, Squire, sore have you been diseased, but all your hurts may soon through temperance be eased. Then gan the palmer thus, Most wretched man, that to affections does the bridle lend. In their beginning they are weak and wan, but soon through sufferance grow to fearful end. Whiles they are weak, betimes with them contend, for when they once to perfect strength do grow, Strong wars they make, and cruel battery bend, Gainst fort of reason it to overthrow. Wrath, jealousy, grief, love, this squire have laid thus low. Wrath, jealousy, grief, love, do thus expel. Wrath is a fire, and jealousy a weed. Grief is a flood, and love a monster fell. The fire of sparks, the weed of little seed, The flood of drops, the monster, filth did breed. But sparks, seed, drops, and filth do thus delay. The sparks soon quench, the springing seed outweed, The drops dry up, and filth wipe clean away. So shall wrath, jealousy, grief, love, die and decay.
Unlucky squire, said Guyan, sith thou hast fallen into mischief through intemperance, henceforth take heed of that thou now hast passed, and guide thy ways with wary governance, lest worse betide thee by some later chance. But read how thou art named, and of what kin. Feed on a height, quoth he, and do advance mine ancestry from famous Coradin, who first to raise our house to honor did begin. Thus as he spake, lo, far away they spied a varlet running towards hastily, whose flying feet so fast their way applied, that round about a cloud of dust did fly, which mingled all with sweat did dim his eye. He soon approached, panting, breathless, hot, and all so soiled that none could him descry. His countenance was bold, and bashed not for Guyon's looks, but scornful eye-glance at him shot. Behind his back he bore a brazen shield, on which was drawn fair in colors fit a flaming fire in midst of bloody field, and round about the wreath this word was writ, Burnt I do burn. Right well beseemed it to be the shield of some redoubted knight, and in his hand two darts exceeding flit and deadly sharp he held, whose heads were dight in poison and in blood, of malice and despite. When he in presence came, to Guyon first he boldly spake, Sir Knight, if knight thou be, abandon this forestalled place at erst, for fear of further harm I counsel thee, or by the chance at thine own jeopardy. The knight, at his great boldness, wondered, and though he scorned his idle vanity, yet mildly him to purpose answer it, for not to grow of naught he had conjectured. Varlet, this place most due to me, I deem, yielded by him that held it forcibly. But whence should come that harm which thou dost seem to threat to him that minds his chance to buy? Perdi, said he, here comes and is hard by a knight of wondrous power and great assay, that never yet encountered enemy but did him deadly daunt or foul dismay. Nay thou for better hope, if thou his presence stay. How hight he then, said Guyon, and from whence? Pyrocles is his name, renowned far for his bold feats and hardy confidence. Full oft approved in many a cruel war, the brother of Chimocles, both which are the sons of old Acrates in despite, Acrates, son of Phlegaton and Jar, but Phlegaton is son of Herebus and Night, but Herebus, son of Eternity, is height. So from immortal race he does proceed, that mortal hands may not withstand his might. Dread for his daring do and bloody deed, for all in blood and spoil is his delight. His am I, Aten, his in wrong and right, that matter make for him to work upon, and stir him up to strife and cruel fight. Fly, therefore, fly this fearful stead anon, lest thy fool hard eyes work thy sad confusion. His be that care whom most it doth concern, said he. But whither with such hasty flight art thou now bound? For well mote I discern great cause that carries thee so swift and light. My lord, quoth he, may sent and straight behight to seek occasion where so she be, for he is all disposed to bloody fight, and breathes out wrath and heinous cruelty. Hard is his hap that first falls in his jeopardy. Madman, said then the palmer, that does seek occasion to wrath and cause of strife, she comes unsought and shunned follows eke. Happy who can abstain when rancor rife kindles revenge and threats his rusty knife, Woe never once where every cause is caught, and rash occasion makes unquiet life. Then lo, where bound she sits whom thou hast sought, said Guyon, let that message to thy lord be brought. That when the varlet heard and saw, straightway he wexed wondrous wrath, and said, Vile knight, that knights and knighthood dost with shame upbray, and show'st the example of thy childish might, with silly weak old woman thus to fight. Great glory and gay spoil sure hast thou got, and stoutly prove thy puissance here in sight. That shall Pyrocles well requite, I wot, and with thy blood abolish so reproachful blot. With that one of his thrillant darts he threw, 
edded with ire and vengeable despite. The quivering steel his aimed end well knew, and to his breast itself intended right. But he was wary, and ere it impite in the meant mark, advanced his shield atween, on which it seizing no way enter might, but back rebounding left the forkhead clean. Eftsoons he fled away, and might nowhere be seen. Pyrocles does with Gion fight, and Furo's chain unbinds, of whom sore hurt for his revenge at in Chimocles finds. Whoever doth to temperance apply his steadfast life, and all his actions frame, trust me, shall find no greater enemy than stubborn perturbation to the same. To which right well the wise do give that name, for it the goodly peace of stayed minds does overthrow, and troublous war proclaim. His own woe's author, who so bound it finds as did Chimocles, and it willfully unbinds. After that varlet's flight, it was not long ere on the plain fast pricking, Gion spied one in bright arms embattled full strong, that as the sunny beams do glance and glide upon the trembling wave, so shine it bright, and round about him threw forth sparkling fire that seemed him to inflame on every side. His steed was bloody red and foamed ire, when with the maestring spur he did him roughly stire. Approaching nigh, he never stayed to greet nor chaffer words, proud courage to provoke, but pricked so fierce that underneath his feet the smouldering dust did round about him smoke, both horse and man nigh able for to choke. And fairly couching his steel-headed spear, him first saluted with a sturdy stroke. It booted not Sir Gion coming near to think such hideous puissance on foot to bear, but lightly shunned it and passing by with his bright blade did smite at him so fell that the sharp steel, arriving forcibly on his broad shield, bit not, but glancing fell on his horse-neck before the quilted cell, and from the head the body sundered quite. So him dismounted low he did compel on foot with him to match an equal fight. The trunked beast, fast bleeding, did him foully dight. Sore bruised with the fall, he slow uprose, and all enraged thus him loudly shent. Disleal knight, whose coward courage chose to wreak itself on beast all innocent, and shunned the mark at which it should be meant, thereby thine arm seems strong, but manhood frail. So hast thou oft with guile thine honor blent. But little may such guile thee now avail, if wanted force and fortune do not much me fail. With that he drew his flaming sword, and struck at him so fiercely, that the upper marge of his sevenfold shield away it took, and glancing on his helmet, made a large and open gash therein. Were not his targe that broke the violence of his intent, the weary soul from thence it would discharge. Nathless, so sore a buff to him he lent, that made him reel, and to his breast his beaver bent. Exceeding wroth was Gion at that blow, and much ashamed, that stroke of living arm should him dismay, and make him stoop so low, though otherwise it did him little harm. Though hurling high his iron braced arm, he smote so manly on his shoulder plate, that all the left side it did quite disarm. Yet there the steel stayed not, but inly bait deep in his flesh, and opened wide a red floodgate. Deadly dismayed with horror of that dint Pyrocles was, and grieved eke entire, yet not the more did it his fury stint, but added flame unto his former fire, that well nigh mould his heart in raging ire, and thenceforth his approved skill to ward or strike or hurtle round in warlike gyre, remembered he, ne cared for his safeguard, but rudely raged, and like a cruel tiger fawed. He hewed and lashed and foined and thundered blows, and every way did seek into his life. Ne plate ne mail could ward so mighty throws, but yielded passage to his cruel knife. But Gion, in the heat of all his strife, was wary wise, and closely did await a vantage, whilst his foe did rage most rife. Sometimes athwart, sometimes he struck him straight, and falsed oft his blows, to lewd him with such bait. 
Like as a lion whose imperial power a proud, rebellious unicorn defies, to avoid the rash assault and wrathful stour of his fierce foe, him to a tree applies, and when him running in full course he spies, he slips aside, the whiles that furious beast, his precious horn, sought of his enemies, strikes in the stock, ne thence can be released, but to the mighty victor yields a bounteous feast. With such fair slight him Guyon often failed, till at the last all breathless, weary, faint him spying, with fresh onset he assailed, and kindling new his courage seeming quaint, struck him so hugely that through great constraint he made him stoop perforce unto his knee, and do unwilling worship to the saint that on his shield depainted he did see, such homage till that instant never learned he. Whom Guyan seeing stoop, pursued fast the present offer of fair victory, and soon his dreadful blade about he cast, wherewith he smote his haughty crest so high, that straight on ground made him full low to lie. Then on his breast his victor foot he thrust. With that he cried, Mercy! Do me not die, ne deem thy force by fortune's doom unjust, that hath moger her spite thus low me laid in dust. Eftsoons his cruel hand Sir Guyan stayed, tempering the passion with advisement slow, and maistering might on enemy dismayed, for the equal die of war he well did know, then to him said, Live, and allegiance owe to him that gives thee life and liberty, and henceforth by this day's example trow that hasty wrath and heedless hazardry do breed repentance late and lasting infamy. So up he let him rise, who with grim look and countenance stern upstanding gan to grind his grated teeth for great disdain, and shook his sandy locks, long hanging down behind, knotted in blood and dust, for grief of mind, that he in odds of arms was conquered. Yet in himself some comfort he did find, that him so noble knight had maistered, whose bounty more than might, Yet both he wondered, which Guyan marking said, Be not aggrieved, Sir Knight, that thus ye now subdued are. Was never man who most conquests achieved, but sometimes had the worse and lost by war, yet shortly gained that loss exceeded far. Loss is no shame, nor to be less than foe, but to be lesser than himself doth mar both losers' lot and victors' praise also. Vain others overthrows, who self doth overthrow. Fly, O Pyrocles, fly the dreadful war that in thyself thy lesser parts do move. Outrageous anger and woe-working jar, direful impatience and heart-murdering love, those those thy foes, those warriors, far remove, which thee to endless bale captived lead. But sit in might thou didst my mercy prove, of courtesy, to me the cause of read that thee against me drew with so impetuous dread. Dreadless, said he, that shall I soon declare. It was complained that thou hadst done great tort unto an aged woman, poor and bare, and thralled her in chains with strong effort, void of all succor, and needful comfort, that ill beseems thee, such as I thee see, to work such shame. Therefore I thee exhort to change thy will, and set occasion free, and to her captive son yield his first liberty. Thereat Sir Guyan smiled, and is that all, said he, that thee so sore displeased hath? Great mercy, sure, for to enlarge a thrall whose freedom shall thee turn to greatest scath. Nathless, now quench thy hot and boiling wrath, lo, there they be, to thee I yield them free. Thereat he, wondrous glad, out of the path did lightly leap, where he them bound did see, and gan to break the bands of their captivity. 
Soon as occasion felt herself untied, before her son could well assoiled be, she to her use returned, and straight defied both Gion and Pyrocles. The one, said she, because he won, the other, because he was won. So matter did she make of naught to stir up strife and do them disagree. But soon as furor was enlarged, she sought to kindle his quenched fire, and thousand causes wrought. It was not long, ere she inflamed him so, that he would all gates with Pyrocles fight, and his redeemer challenged for his foe, because he had not well maintained his right, but yielded had to that same stranger knight. Now gan Pyrocles wex as wood as he, and him affronted with impatient might, so both together fierce and grasped be, whilst Gion standing by, their uncouth strife to see. Him all that while occasion did provoke against Pyrocles, and new matter framed upon the old, him stirring to be roke of his late wrongs, in which she oft him blamed for suffering such abuse as knighthood shamed, and him disabled quite. But he was wise, ne would with vain occasions be inflamed. Yet others she more urgent did devise, yet nothing could him to impatience entice. There fell contention still increased more, and more thereby increased Führer's might, that he his foe has hurt and wounded sore, and him in blood and dirt to deform it quite. His mother eke, more to augment his spite, now brought to him a flaming firebrand, which she in Stygian lake, a burning bright, had kindled. That she gave into his hand, that armed with fire, more hardly he mote him with stand. Though gan that villain wex so fierce and strong that nothing might sustain his furious force, he cast him down to ground, and all along drew him through dirt and mire without remorse, and foully battered his comely course, that Gion much disdained so loathly sight. At last he was compelled to cry perforce, Help, O Sir Gion, help, most noble knight, to rid a wretched man from hands of hellish white. The knight was greatly moved at his plaint, and gan him dight to succor his distress, till that the palmer, by his grave restraint, him stayed from yielding pitiful redress, and said, Dear son, thy causeless ruth repress, ne let thy stout heart melt in pity vain. He that his sorrow sought through willfulness, and his foe fettered, would release again, deserves to taste his folly's fruit. Repented pain? Gion obeyed. So him away he drew from needless trouble of renewing fight, already fought, his voyage to pursue. But rash Pyrocles' varlet, eight in height, when late he saw his lord in heavy plight, under Sir Gion's puissant stroke to fall, him deeming dead, as then he seemed in sight, fled fast away to tell his funeral unto his brother, whom Chimocles men did call. He was a man of rare redoubted might, famous throughout the world for warlike praise and glorious spoils, purchased in perilous fight. Full many doughty knights he in his days had done to death, subdued in equal phrase, whose carcasses, for terror of his name, of fowls and beasts he made the piteous praise, and hung their conquered arms for more to fame on gallow trees, in honor of his dearest dame. His dearest dame is that enchanteress the vile Acrasia, that with vain delights and idle pleasures in her bower of bliss does charm her lovers, and the feeble sprites can call out of the bodies of frail whites, whom then she does transform to monstrous hues, and horribly misshapes with ugly sights, captived eternally in iron mews and darks and dens, where Titan his face never shews. There Aten found Chimocles sojourning to serve his lemon's love, for he by kind was given all to lust and loose living, whenever his fierce hands he free mote find. And now he has poured out his idle mind in dainty delices and lavish joys, having his warlike weapons cast behind, and flows in pleasures and vain pleasing toys, mingled amongst loose ladies and lascivious boys. And over him art striving to compare with nature, 
Did an arbor green to spread, framed of wanton ivy flowering fair, through which the fragrant eglantine did spread his prickling arms, entrailed with roses red, which dainty odors round about them threw, and all within with flowers was garnished, that when mild Zephyrus amongst them blew, did breathe out bounteous smells, and painted colors shew. And fast beside there trickled softly down a gentle stream, whose murmuring wave did play amongst the pumy stones, and made a sound to lull him soft asleep that by it lay. The weary traveller, wandering that way, therein did often quench his thirsty heat, and then by it his weary limbs display, whiles creeping slumber made him to forget his former pain, and wiped away his toilsome sweat. And on the other side a pleasant grove was shot up high, full of the stately tree that dedicated is to Olympic Jove, and to his son Alcides, when as he gained in Nemea goodly victory. Therein the merry birds of every sort chaunted aloud their cheerful harmony, and made amongst themselves a sweet consort, that quickened the dull sprite with musical comfort. There he him found all carelessly displayed in secret shadow from the sunny ray, on a sweet bed of lilies softly laid, amidst a flock of damsels fresh and gay, that round about him dissolute did play their wanton follies and light merriment, every of which did loosely disarray her upper parts of meat habiliments, and show them naked, decked with many ornaments. And every of them strove with most delights him to a great and greatest pleasure's shew. Some framed fair looks, glancing like evening lights, others sweet words dropping like honeydew. Some bathed kisses, and did soft embrew the sugared liquor through his melting lips. One boasts her beauty, and does yield to view her dainty limbs above her tender hips. Another her outboasts, and all for trial strips. He, like an adder lurking in the weeds, his wandering thought in deep desire does steep, and his frail eye with spoil of beauty feeds. Sometimes he falsely feigns himself to sleep, whilst through their lids his wanton eyes do peep to steal a snatch of amorous conceit whereby close fire into his heart does creep, so them deceives, deceived in his deceit, made drunk with drugs of dear voluptuous receipt. Atten arriving there, when him he spied thus in still waves of deep delight to wade, fiercely approaching to him loudly cried, Chimocles, oh, no but Chimocles shade, in which that manly person late did fade, what is become of great Acrates' son, or where hath he hung up his mortal blade, that hath so many haughty conquests won? Is all his force forlorn, and all his glory done? Then pricking him with his sharp-pointed dart, he said, Up, up, thou womanish, weak knight, that here in lady's lap and tumid art, unmindful of thy praise and prowest might, and wheatless eke of lately wrought despite, while sad Pyrocles lies on senseless ground, and groaneth out his utmost grudging sprite, through many a stroke and many a streaming wound, calling thy help in vain, that here in joys are drowned. Suddenly, out of his delightful dream, the man awoke, and would have questioned more, but he would not endure that woeful theme for to dilate at large, but urged sore with piercing words and pitiful implore him hasty to arise. As one affright with hellish fiends or furies mad uproar, he then uprose, inflamed with fell despite, and called for his arms, for he would all gates fight. They been abroad. He quickly does him dight, and, lightly mounted, passeth on his way. Ne lady's love, ne sweet entreaties might appease his heat, or hasty passage stay, for he has vowed to be avenged that day, that day itself him seemed all too long, on him that did Pyrocles dear dismay. So proudly pricketh on his courser strong, and at an a him pricks with spurs of shame and wrong. Gion is of a modest mirth led into loose desire, 
fights with Chimocles while his brother burns in furious fire. A harder lesson to learn continence in joyous pleasure than in grievous pain, for sweetness doth allure the weaker sense so strongly that an ease it can refrain from that which feeble nature covets vain. But grief and wrath, that be her enemies and foes of life, she better can restrain. Yet virtue vaunts in both her victories, and Gion in them all shows goodly maesteries. Whom bold Chimocles, travelling to find with cruel purpose, bent to wreak on him the wrath which Aten kindled in his mind, came to a river, by whose utmost brim waiting to pass, he saw whereas did swim along the shore as swift as glance of eye, a little gondola bedecked trim with boughs and arbors woven cunningly, that like a little forest seemed outwardly. And therein sate a lady fresh and fair, making sweet solace to herself alone. Sometimes she sung as loud as lark in air, sometimes she laughed that nigh her breath was gone. Yet there was not with her else any one that might to her move cause of merriment. Matter of mirth enough, though there were none she could devise, and thousand ways invent to feed her foolish humor and vain jolliment. Which when far off Chimocles heard and saw, he loudly called to such as were aboard the little bark unto the shore to draw, and him to ferry over that deep ford. The merry mariner unto his word soon hearkened, and her painted boat straightway turned to the shore, where that same warlike lord she in received. But Aten by no way she would admit, albeit the night her much did pray. Eftsoons her shallow ship away did slide, more swift than swallow shears the liquid sky, without an oar or pilot it to guide, or winged canvas with the wind to fly. Only she turned a pin, and by and by it cut away upon the yielding wave. Ne carried she her course for to apply, for it was taught the way which she would have and both from rocks and flats itself could wisely save. And all the way the wanton damsel found new mirth her passenger to entertain, for she in pleasant purpose did abound, and greatly joyed merry tales to feign, of which a storehouse did with her remain. Yet seemed nothing well they her became, for all her words she drowned with laughter vain, and wanted grace in uttering of the same, that turned all her pleasance to a scoffing game. And otherwhiles vain toys she would devise, as her fantastic wit did most delight. Sometimes her head she fondly would aguise with gaudy girlands, or fresh flowerets dight about her neck, or rings of rushes plight. Sometimes, to do him laugh, she would essay to laugh at shaking of the leaver's light, or to behold the water work and play about her little frigate, therein making way. Her light behavior and loose dalliance gave wondrous great contentment to the knight, that of his way he had no sovenance, nor care of vowed revenge and cruel fight, but to weak wench did yield his martial might. So easy was to quench his flamed mind with one sweet drop of sensual delight. So easy is to pease the stormy wind of malice in the calm of pleasant womankind. Diverse discourses in their way they spent, amongst which Chimocles of her questioned both what she was and what that usage meant which in her cot she daily practised. Vain man, said she, that wouldst be reckoned a stranger in thy home, and ignorant of Phaedria, for so my name is read, of Phaedria thine own fellow servant, for thou to serve Acrasia thyself dost vaunt. In this wide inland sea that hight by name the idle lake, my wandering ship I row, that knows her port and thither sails by aim. Ne care, ne fear I how the wind do blow, or whether swift I wend or whether slow, both slow and swift alike to serve my turn. Ne swelling Neptune, ne loud thundering Jove can change my cheer, or make me ever mourn. My little boat can safely pass this perilous bourne. Whilst thus she talked, and whilst thus she toyed, they were far past the passage which he spake, and come unto an island, waste and void, that floated in the midst of that great lake. 
There her small gondole her port did make, And that gay pair issuing on the shore disburdened her. Their way they forward take into the land That lay them fair before, Whose pleasant she him shewed, And plentiful great store. It was a chosen plot of fertile land Amongst wide waves set, like a little nest, As if it had by nature's cunning hand Been choicely picked out from all the rest, And laid forth for ensample of the best. No dainty flower or herb that grows on ground, No arboret with painted blossoms dressed, And smelling sweet, but there it might be found, To bud out fair, and her sweet smells throw all around. No tree whose branches did not bravely spring, No branch whereon a fine bird did not sit, No bird but did her shrill notes sweetly sing, No song but did contain a lovely dit. Trees, branches, birds, and songs Were framed fit for to allure frail mind To careless ease. Careless the man soon walks, And his weak wit was overcome Of thing that did him please. So pleased did his wrathful purpose fair appease. Thus, when she had his eyes and senses fed with false delights and filled with pleasures vain, into a shady dale she soft him led and laid him down upon a grassy plain. And her sweet self, without dread or disdain, she set beside, laying his head disarmed in her loose lap it softly to sustain. Where soon he slumbered, Fearing not be harmed, the whiles with a lovely she thus him sweetly charmed. Behold, O oh man, that toilsome pains does take, the flowers, the fields, and all that pleasant grows, how they themselves do thine ensample make, whiles nothing envious nature them forth throws out of her fruitful lap. How no man knows they spring, they bud, they blossom fresh and fair, And deck the world with their rich, pompous shows. Yet no man for them taketh pains or care, Yet no man to them can his careful pains compare. The lily, lady of the flowering field, The flower de loose, her lovely paramour, Bid thee to them thy fruitless labors yield, And soon leave off this toilsome, weary stour. Lo, lo, how brave she decks her bounteous bower With silken curtains and gold coverlets, Therein to shroud her sumptuous bellamour. Yet neither spins, nor cards, nor cares, nor frets, But to her mother nature all her care she lets. Why then dost thou, O man, that of them all art lord, And eke of nature sovereign, Willfully make thyself a wretched thrall, And waste thy joyous hours in needless pain, Seeking for danger and adventures vain? What boots it, all to have and nothing use? Who shall him rue that swimming in the main Will die for thirst, and water doth refuse? Refuse such fruitless toil, and present pleasures choose. By this she had him lulled fast asleep, That of no worldly thing he cared to take. Then she with liquor strong his eyes did steep, That nothing should him hastily awake. So she him left, and did herself betake unto her boat again, With which she cleft the slothful wave of that great greasely lake. Soon she that island far behind her left, And now is come to that same place where first she weft. By this time was the worthy Guyon brought unto the other side Of that wide strand where she was rowing, and for passage sought. Him needed not long call. She soon to hond her ferry brought, Where him she biding fond with his sad guide. Himself she took aboard, but the black palmer suffered still to stand ne would for price or prayers once afford to ferry that old man over the perilous ford. Guyon was loath to leave his guide behind, yet, being entered, might not back retire. For the flit bark, obeying to her mind, forth launched quickly as she did desire. Ne gave him leave to bid that aged sire adieu, but nimbly ran her wonted course through the dull billows thick as troubled mire. Whom neither wind out of their seat could force, Nor timely tides did drive out of their sluggish source. And by the way, as was her wonted guise, Her merry fit she freshly gan to rear, And did of joy and jollity devise, 
herself to cherish, and her guest to cheer. The knight was courteous, and did not forbear her honest mirth and pleasures to partake, but when he saw her toy and jibe and jeer, and pass the bonds of modest merrymake, her dalliance he despised, and follies did forsake. Yet she still followed her former style, and said and did all that mote him delight, till they arrived in that pleasant isle, where sleeping late she left her other night. But when as Guyon of that land had sight, he wist himself amiss, and angry said, Ah, dame, perdie, ye have not done me right, thus to mislead me, whiles I you obeyed, me little needed from my right way to have strayed. Fair sir, quoth she, be not displeased at all, who fares on sea may not command his way, ne wind and weather at his pleasure call, the sea is wide and easy for to stray, the wind unstable and doth never stay. But here a while ye may in safety rest till seasons serve new passage to essay. Better safe port than be in seas distressed. Therewith she laughed and did her earnest end in jest. But he, half discontent, mote natheless himself appease, and issued forth on shore. The joys whereof and happy fruitfulness such as he saw, she gan him lay before, and all, though pleasant, yet she made much more. The fields did laugh, the flowers did freshly spring, the trees did bud and early blossoms bore, and all the choir of birds did sweetly sing, and told that garden's pleasures in their caroling. And she, more sweet than any bird on bough, would oftentimes amongst them bear a part, and strive to pass, as she could well enough, their native music by her skilful art. So did she all that might his constant heart withdraw from thought of warlike enterprise, and drown in dissolute delights apart, where noise of arms or view of martial guise might not revive desire of knightly exercise. But he was wise and wary of her will, and ever held his hand upon his heart, yet would not seem so rude and threw it ill as to despise so courteous seeming part that gentle lady did to him impart. But fairly tempering, fond desire subdued, and ever her desired to depart. She list not here, but her disports pursued, and ever bade him stay till time the tide renewed. And now by this Chimocles' hour was spent that he awoke out of his idle dream, and shaking off his drowsy dreariment, gan him advise, how ill did him beseem in slothful sleep his molten heart to steam, and quench the brand of his conceived ire. Lo, up he started, stirred with shame extreme, nestayed for his damsel to inquire, but marched to the strand their passage to require. And in the way... He with Sir Guyon met, accompanied with Phaedria the fair. Eftsoons he gan to rage and inly fret, crying, Let be that lady debonair, thou recreant knight, and soon thyself prepare to battle, if thou mean her love to gain. Lo, lo, already how the fowls in air do flock, awaiting shortly to obtain thy carcass for their prey, the guerdon of thy pain. And therewithal he fiercely at him flew, and with importune outrage him assailed, who soon prepared to field his sword forth drew, and him with equal value countervailed. Their mighty strokes, their habergeons dismailed, and naked made each other's manly spalls. The mortal steel dispiteously entailed deep in their flesh, quite through the iron walls, that a large purple stream adown their jambos falls. Chimocles, that had never met before so puissant foe, with envious despite his proud presumed force increased more, disdaining to be held so long in fight. Sir Guyon, grudging not so much his might as those unknightly railings which he spoke, with wrathful fire his courage kindled bright, thereof devising shortly to be roke, and doubling all his powers redoubled every stroke. Both of them high at once their hands enhanced, and both at once their huge blows down did sway. Chimocles' sword on Guyon's shield glanced, and thereof nigh one quarter sheared away. 
But Guyon's angry blade so fierce did play on the other's helmet, which, as Titan shone, that quite it clove his plumed crest in tway, and bare it all his head unto the bone, wherewith astonished still he stood as senseless stone. Still as he stood, fair Phaedria, that beheld that deadly danger, soon atween them ran, and at their feet herself most humbly fell, crying with piteous voice and countenance wan, Ah, oh, well away, most noble lords, how can your cruel eyes endure so piteous sight to shed your lives on ground? Woe worth the man that first did teach the cursed steel to bite in his own flesh and make way to the living sprite. If ever love of lady did empierce your iron breasts or pity could find place, withhold your bloody hands from battle fierce and sith for me fight. To me this grace both yield to stay your deadly strife a space. They stayed a while, and forth she gan proceed. Most wretched woman, and of wicked race, that am the author of this heinous deed, and cause of death between two doughty knights do breed. But if for me ye fight, or me will sarve, not this rude kind of battle, nor these arms are meet, the which do men in bale to starve, and doleful sorrow heap with deadly harms, such cruel game my skarmoges disarms. Another war, and other weapons I do love, where love does give his sweet alarms without bloodshed, and where the enemy does yield unto his foe a pleasant victory. Debateful strife and cruel enmity, the famous name of knighthood foully shend, but lovely peace and gentle amity, and in amours the passing hours to spend, the mighty martial hands do most commend. Of love they ever greater glory bore than of their arms. Mars is Cupido's friend, and is for Venus loves renowned more than all his wars and spoils the which he did of yore. Therewith she sweetly smiled. They, though full bent to prove extremities of bloody fight, yet at her speech their rages gan relent, and calm the sea of their tempestuous spite. Such power have pleasing words, such is the might of courteous clemency and gentle heart. Now, after all was ceased, the fairy knight besought that damsel suffer him depart, and yield him ready passage to that other part. She no less glad than he desirous was of his departure thence, for of her joy and vain delight she saw he light did pass, a foe of folly and immodest toy, still solemn sad or still disdainful coy, delighting all in arms and cruel war, that her sweet peace and pleasures did annoy, troubled with terror and unquiet jar, that she well pleased was thence to amove him far. Though him she brought aboard and her swift boat forthwith directed to that further strand, the which on the dull waves did lightly float, and soon arrived on the shallow sand where gladsome Guyon sallied forth to land, and to that damsel thanks gave for reward. Upon that shore he spied Aten's stand, there by his master left, when late he fared in Phaedria's flit bark over that perilous shard. Well could he him remember, sith of late he with Pyrocles sharp debatement made. Straight gan he him revile and bitter rate, as shepherd's cur that in dark evening's shade hath tracted forth some savage beast's trade. Vile miscreant, said he, whether dost thou fly the shame and death which will thee soon invade? What coward hand shall do thee next to die, that art thus foully fled from famous enemy? With that he stiffly shook his steel-head dart, but sober Guyon, hearing him so rail, though somewhat moved in his mighty heart, yet with strong reason maestered passion frail and passed fairly forth. He, turning tail, back to the strand retired, and there still stayed awaiting passage, which him late did fail. The whiles Chimocles, with that wanton maid, the hasty heat of his avowed revenge, delayed. Whilst there the varlet stood, he saw from far an armed knight that towards him fast ran. He ran on foot, 
as if in luckless war his forlorn steed from him the victor wan. He seemed breathless, heartless, faint, and wan, and all his armor sprinkled was with blood, and soiled with dirty gore that no man can discern the hue thereof. He never stood, but bent his hasty course towards the idle flood. The varlet saw, when to the blood he came, how without stop or stay he fiercely leapt, and deep himself beducked in the same, that in the lake his lofty crest was stepped. Nay, of his safety seemed care he kept, but with his raging arms he rudely flashed the waves about, and all his armor swept, that all the blood and filth away was washed. Yet still he bet the water and the billows dashed, ate and drew nigh, to weet what it might be, for much he wondered at that uncouth sight. Whom should he but his own dear lord there see, his own dear lord Pyrocles, in sad plight, ready to drown himself for fell despite? Harrow now out, and well away, he cried, what dismal day hath lent this cursed light to see my lord so deadly damnified? Pyrocles, oh, Pyrocles, what is thee betide? I burn, I burn, I burn, then loud he cried, oh, how I burn with implacable fire, yet not can quench mine inly flaming side, nor sea of liquor cold, nor lake of mire, nothing but death can do me to respire. Ah, be it, said he, from Byrocles far, after pursuing death once to require, or think that aught those puissant hands may mar, Death is for wretches, born under unhappy star. Her deed, then, is it fit for me, said he, that am, I ween, most wretched man alive, burning in flames, yet no flames can I see, and dying daily, daily yet revive. Oh, Aten, help to me last death to give. The varlet at his plaint was grieved so sore that his deep wounded heart in two did rive, and his own health, remembering now no more, did follow that example which he blamed before. Into the lake he leapt, his lord to aid, so love the dread of danger doth despise, and of him catching hold him strongly stayed from drowning. But more happy he than wise, of that sea's nature did not him avise. The waves thereof so slow and sluggish were, engrossed with mud, which did them foul agrise, that every weighty thing they did up bear, nay aught mote ever sink down to the bottom there. Whiles thus they struggled in that idle wave, and strove in vain, the one himself to drown, the other both from drowning for to save, lo! To that shore one in an ancient gown, whose hoary locks great gravity did crown, holding in hand a goodly arming sword, by fortune came, led with the troublous sound. Where drenched deep he found in that dull ford the careful servant, striving with his raging lord. Here maiden spying, knew right well of yore, and loudly called, Help, help, O Archimage, to save my lord in wretched plight for law. Help with thy hand, or with thy counsel, sage. Weak hands, but counsel is most strong in age. Him, when the old man saw, he wondered sore to see Pyrocles there so rudely rage. Yet, Sithen's help, he saw he needed more than pity. He, in haste, approached it to the shore, and called, Pyrocles, what is this I see? What hellish fury hath at erst thee hent? Furious ever I thee knew to be, yet never in this strange astonishment. These flames, these flames, he cried, do me torment. What? Flames, quoth he, when I thee present see in danger rather to be drent than brent. Harrow the flames which me consume, said he, ne can be quenched within my secret bowels be. That cursed man, that cruel fiend of hell, furor, oh, furor hath me thus bedight. His deadly wounds within my liver swell, and his hot fire burns in mine entrails bright. Kindled through his infernal brand of spite, Sith late with him I battle vain would boast, That now I ween Jove's dreaded thunder light Does scorch not half so sore, Nor damned ghost in flaming phlegaton Does not so fellly roast. Which when as Archimago heard, His grief he knew right well, And him at once disarmed. 
then searched his secret wounds, and made a brief of every place that was with bruising harmed, or with the hidden fire too inly warmed. Which done, he balms and herbs thereto applied, and evermore with mighty spells them charmed, that in short space he has them qualified, and him restored to health that would of all gates died. Guyon finds Mammon in a delve, sunning his treasure whore, is by him tempted and led down to see his secret store. As pilot, well expert in perilous wave, that to a steadfast star his course hath bent, when foggy mists or cloudy tempests have the faithful light of that fair lamp blent and covered heaven with hideous dreariment, upon his card and compass firms his eye, the maesters of his long experiment, and to them does the steady helm apply, bidding his winged vessel fairly forward fly, so Guyon, having lost his trusty guide, late left beyond that idle lake, proceeds yet on his way of none accompanied, and evermore himself with comfort feeds of his own virtues and praiseworthy deeds. So long he yode, yet no adventure found, which fame of her shrill trumpet worthy reads, for still he travelled through wide wasteful ground that not but desert wilderness showed all around at last he came unto a gloomy glade covered with boughs and shrubs from heaven's light whereas he sitting found in secret shade an uncouth savage and uncivil white of grisly hue and foul ill-favoured sight his face with smoke was tanned, and eyes were bleared, his head and beard with soot were ill bedight, his coal black hands did seem to have been seared in smith's fire spitting forge, and nails like claws appeared. His iron coat, all overgrown with rust, was underneath enveloped with gold, whose glistering gloss, darkened with filthy dust, well it appeared to have been of old a work of rich entail and curious mould, woven with antiques and wild imagery, and in his lap a mass of coin he told, and turn it upside down to feed his eye and covetous desire with his huge treasury and round about him lay on every side great heaps of gold that never could be spent, of which some were rude ore, not purified of Mulciber's devouring element, some others were new-driven, and distent into great ingos, and to wedges square, some in round plates without an monument, but most were stamped, and in their metal bare the antique shapes of kings and keysers strange and rare. Soon as Egyon saw, in greater fright and haste he rose, for to remove aside those precious hills from strangers' envious sight, and down them poured through an hole full wide into the hollow earth them there to hide. But Gion, lightly to him leaping, stayed his hand, that trembled as one terrified, and though himself were at the sight dismayed, yet him perforce restrained, and to him doubtful said, what art thou, man, if man at all thou art, that here in desert hast thine habitants, and these rich heaps of wealth dost hide apart from the world's eye, and from her right usance? Thereat with staring eyes, fixed askance, in great disdain, he answered, Hardy elf, that darest view my direful countenance, I read thee rash and heedless of thyself to trouble my still seat, and heaps of precious pelf, God of the world and worldlings I may call great mammon, greatest God below the sky, that of my plenty pour out unto all, and unto none my graces do envy, riches, renown, and principality, honor, estate, and all this world is good, for which men swink and sweat incessantly, from me do flow into an ample flood, and in the hollow earth have their eternal brood. Wherefore, if me thou deign to serve and sue, at thy command, lo, all these mountains be. Or, if to thy great mind or greedy view all these may not suffice, there shall to thee ten times so much be numbered frank and free. Mammon, said he, thy godhead's vaunt is vain, and idle offers of thy golden fee. To them that covet such eye-glutting gain, proffer thy gifts, and fitter servants entertain. Me ill besits that in dare-doing arms and honor's suit my vowed days do spend unto thy bounteous baits and pleasing charms, with which weak men thou witchest to attend, 
Regard of worldly muck doth foully blend, and lo, abase the high heroic sprite, that joys for crowns and kingdoms to contend. Fair shields, gay steeds, bright arms be my delight. Those be the riches fit for an adventurous knight. Vain glorious elf, said he, dost not thou weet that money can thy wants at will supply? Shields, steeds, and arms, and all things for thee meet, it can purvey in twinkling of an eye, and crowns and kingdoms to thee multiply. Do not I kings create and throw the crown sometimes to him that low in dust doth lie, and him that reigned into his room thrust down? and whom I lust do heap with glory and renown. All otherwise, said he, I riches read, and deem them brute of all disquietness, first got with guile, and then preserved with dread, and after spent with pride and lavishness, leaving behind them grief and heaviness. Infinite mischiefs of them do arise, strife and debate, bloodshed and bitterness, outrageous wrong and hellish covetise, that noble heart as great dishonour doth despise. Neither thine be kingdoms, neither scepters thine, but realms and rulers thou dost both confound, and loyal truth to treason dost incline. Witness the guiltless blood poured oft on ground, the crowned often slain, the slayer crowned, the sacred diadem in pieces rent, and purple robe gored with many a wound, castles surprised, great cities sacked and brent. So makest thou kings, and gainest wrongful government. Long were to tell the troublous storms that toss the private state, and make the life unsweet, who swelling sails in Caspian sea doth cross, and in frail wood on Adrian gulf doth fleet, doth not, I ween, so many evils meet? Then Mammon, waxing wroth, and why, then, said, are mortal men so fond and undiscreet so evil thing to seek unto their aid, and having not, complain, and having it, upbraid? Indeed, quoth he, through foul intemperance, frail men are oft captived to covetize. But would they think, with how small alloance untroubled nature doth herself suffice, such superfluities they would despise, which with sad cares impeach our native joys. At the well head the purest streams arise, but mucky filth his branching arms annoys, and with uncomely weeds the gentle wave accloys. The antique world in his first flowering youth found no defect in his creator's grace, but with glad thanks and unreproved truth the gifts of sovereign bounty did embrace. Like angel's life was then men's happy case, but later ages pride, like corn-fed steed, abused her plenty, and fat swollen increased to all licentious lust, and gan exceed the measure of her mean and natural first need. Then gan a cursed hand the quiet womb of his great-grandmother with steel to wound, and the hid treasures in her sacred tomb with sacrilege to dig. Therein he found fountains of gold and silver to abound, of which the matter of his huge desire and pompous pride eft soon he did compound. Then avarice gan through his veins inspire his greedy flames, and kindled life-devouring fire. Son said then he, let be thy bitter scorn, and leave the rudeness of that antique age to them that lived therein in state forlorn. Thou that dost live in later times must wage thy works for wealth, and life for gold engage. If then thee list my offered grace to use, take what thou please of all this surplusage. If thee list not, leave have thou to refuse. But thing refused, do not afterward accuse. Me list not, said the elfin knight, receive thing offered till I know it well begot. Now wot I, but thou didst these goods bereave from rightful owner by unrighteous lot, or that blood guiltiness or guile them blot. But dee, quoth he, yet never I did view na tongue did tell, na hand these handled not, but safe I have them kept in secret mew from heaven's sight, and power of all which them pursue. What secret place, quoth he, can safely hold so huge a mass, and hide from heaven's eye? Or where hast thou thy one, that so much gold thou canst preserve from wrong and robbery? 
Come thou, quoth he, and see. So by and by through that thick covert he him led, and found a darksome way, which no man could descry, that deep descended through the hollow ground, and was with dread and horror compassed around. At length they came into a larger space that stretched itself into an ample plain, through which a beaten broad highway did trace that straight did lead to Pluto's grisly reign. By that way's side there sate infernal pain, and fast beside him sat tumultuous strife, and one in hand an iron whip did strain, the other brandished a bloody knife, and both did gnash their teeth, and both did threaten life. On the other side, in one consort, there sate cruel revenge and rancorous despite, disloyal treason and heart-burning hate, but gnawing jealousy out of their sight, sitting alone, his bitter lips did bite. And trembling fear still to and fro did fly, and found no place where safe he shroud him might. Lamenting sorrow did in darkness lie, and shame his ugly face did hide from living eye. And over them sad horror with grim hue did always soar, beating his iron wings. And after him owls and night ravens flew, the hateful messengers of heavy things, of death and dolor telling sad tidings. While sad Selino, sitting on a cliff, a song of bale and bitter sorrow sings, that heart of flint asunder could have rift, which having ended, after him she flieth swift. All these before the gates of Pluto lay, by whom they passing spake unto them not. But the elfin knight with wonder all the way did feed his eyes and filled his inner thought. At last him to a little door he brought, that to the gate of hell which gaped wide was next adjoining. Nay them parted aught, betwixt them both was but a little stride that did the house of riches from hell mouth divide. Before the door sat self-consuming care, day and night keeping wary watch and ward for fear lest force or fraud should unaware break in and spoil the treasure there in guard. Ne would he suffer sleep once thitherward approach, shall be his drowsy den were next, for next to death is sleep to be compared. Therefore his house is under his annexed. Here sleep, there riches and Hellgate them both betwixt. So soon as Mammon there arrived, the door to him did open and afforded way. Him followed eke Sir Gion evermore, a darkness him a danger might dismay. Soon as he entered was, the door straightway did shut, and from behind it forth there leapt an ugly fiend, more foul than dismal day, the which with monstrous stalk behind him stepped, and ever as he went, due watch upon him kept. Well hoped he, ere long, that hardy guest, if ever covetous hand, or lustful eye, or lips he laid on anything that liked him best, or ever sleep his eye-strings did untie, should be his prey. And therefore still on high he over him did hold his cruel claws, threatening with greedy gripe to do him die, and rend in pieces with his ravenous paws, if ever he transgressed the fatal Stygian laws. That house's form within was rude and strong, like an huge cave, hewn out of rocky clift, from whose rough vault the ragged breeches hung, embossed with massy gold of glorious gift, and with rich metal loaded every rift, that heavy ruin they did seem to threat, and over them Arachne high did lift her cunning web, and spread her subtle net, and wrap it in foul smoke and clouds more black than jet. Both roof and floor and walls were all of gold, but overgrown with dust and old decay, and hid in darkness, that none could behold the hue thereof, for view of cheerful day did never in that house itself display, but a faint shadow of uncertain light, such as a lamp whose life does fade away, or as the moon, clothed with cloudy night, does show to him that walks in fear and sad affright. In all that room was nothing to be seen but huge great iron chests and coffers strong, all barred with double bends, that none could wean them to a force by violence or wrong. On every side they placed were along, but 
All the ground with skulls was scattered, and dead men's bones which round about were flung, whose lives it seemed while om there were shed, and their vile carcasses now left unburied. They forward pass, Negayan yet spoke word, till that they came unto an iron door, which to them opened of his own accord, and showed of riches such exceeding store as I of man did never see before, nay ever could within one place be found, though all the wealth which is, or was of yore, could gathered be through all the world around, and that above were added to that underground. The charge thereof unto a covetous sprite commanded was who thereby did attend, and warily awaited day and night from other covetous fiends it to defend, who it to rob and ransack did intend. Then Mammon, turning to that warrior, said, Lo, here the world is bliss, lo, here the end to which all men do aim, rich to be made. Such grace now to be happy is before thee laid. Certes, said he, I nil thine offered grace, ne to be made so happy to intend. Another bliss before mine eyes I place, another happiness, another end. To them that list these base regards I lend, but I, in arms and in achievements brave, do rather choose my flitting hours to spend, and to be lord of those that riches have, than them to have myself, and be their servile slave. Thereat the fiend his gnashing teeth did grate and grieved so long to lack his greedy prey. For well he weened that so glorious bait would tempt his guest to take thereof a say. Had he so done, he had him snatched away more light than culver in the falcon's fist. Eternal God thee save from such decay. But when as Mammon saw his purpose missed, him to entrap unwares another way, he wist. Thence forward he am led, and shortly brought unto another room, whose door forthright to him did open, as it had been taught. Therein an hundred ranges were in pite, and hundred furnaces all burning bright. By every furnace many fiends did bide, deformed creatures horrible in sight, and every fiend his busy pains applied to melt the golden metal ready to be tried. One, with great bellows gathered filling air, and with forced winds of fuel did inflame. Another did the dying bronze repair with iron tongs, and sprinkled off the same with liquid waves, fierce Vulcan's rage to tame, who, maestering them, renewed his former heat. Some scummed the dross that from the metal came, some stirred the molten ore with ladles great, and every one did swink, and every one did sweat. But when an earthly white they present saw, glistering in arms and battleless array, from their hot work they did themselves withdraw, to wonder at the sight, for till that day they never creature saw that came that way. Their staring eyes, sparkling with fervent fire, and ugly shapes, did nigh the man dismay, that were it not for shame, he would retire, till that him thus bespake their sovereign lord and sire. Behold, thou fairy son, with mortal eye, that living eye before did never see, the thing that thou didst crave so earnestly to wheat, whence all the wealth late showed by me proceeded. Lo, now is revealed to thee. Here is the fountain of the world is good. Now, therefore, if thou wilt enriched be, avise thee well, and change thy willful mood, lest thou perhaps hereafter wish and be withstood. Suffice it then, thou money god, quoth he, that all thine idle offers I refuse. All that I need I have. What needeth me to covet more than I have cause to use? With such vain shows thy worldlings vile abuse, but give me leave to follow mine emprise. Mammon was much displeased, yet note he choose but bear the rigor of his bold misprise, and thence him forward led him further to entice. He brought him through a darksome narrow strait to a broad gate, all built of beaten gold. The gate was open, but therein did wait a sturdy villain, striding stiff and bold, as if that highest god defy he would. 
In his right hand an iron club he held, but he himself was all of golden mold, yet had both life and sense, and well could weld that cursed weapon when his cruel foes he quelled. Disdain he called it was, and did disdain to be so called, and who so did him call. Stern was his look, and full of stomach vain, his portents terrible, and stature tall, far passing the height of men terrestrial, like a huge giant of the titan's race, that made him scorn all creatures great and small, and with his pride all others power to face, more fit amongst black fiends than men to have his place. Soon as those glitterant arms he did espy, that with their brightness made that darkness light, his harmful club he gan to hurtle high, and threaten battle to the fairy knight, who likewise gan himself to battle dight, till Mammon did his hasty hand withhold, and counseled him abstain from perilous fight, for nothing might abash the villain bold, nor mortal steel and pierce his miscreated mould. So, having him with reason pacified, and the fierce Carl commanding to forbear, he brought him in. The room was large and wide, as it some guild or solemn temple were. Many great golden pillars did upbear the massy roof, and riches huge sustain, and every pillar decked was full dear with crowns and diadems and titles vain, which mortal princes wore whiles they on earth did reign. A rout of people there assembled were of every sort and nation under sky, which with great uproar pressed to draw near to the upper part, where was advanced high a stately siege of sovereign majesty, and thereon sat a woman, gorgeous gay, and richly clad in robes of royalty, that never earthly prince in such array his glory did enhance and pompous pride display. Her face right wondrous fair did seem to be, that her broad beauty's beam great brightness threw through the dim shade, that all men might it see. Yet was not that same her own native hue, but wrought by art and counterfeited shoe, thereby more lovers unto her to call. Nathless most heavenly fair indeed and view she by creation was, till she did fall. Thenceforth she sought for helps to cloak her crime withal. There, as by glistering glory she did sit, she held a great gold chain a linked well, whose upper end to highest heaven was knit, and lower part did reach to lowest hell, and all that press did round about her swell to catch and hold of that long chain, thereby to climb aloft and others to excel. That was ambition, rash desire to sty, and every link thereof a step of dignity. Some thought to raise themselves to high degree by riches and unrighteous reward, some by close shouldering, some by flattery, others through friends, others for base regard, and all by wrong ways for themselves prepared. Those that were up themselves kept others low, those that were low themselves held others hard, ne suffered them to rise or greater grow, but every one did strive his fellow down to throw. Which when as Guyan saw, he gan inquire what meant that press about that lady's throne, and what she was that did so high aspire. Him Mammon answered it, that goodly one whom all that folk with such contention do flock about, my dear, my daughter is, honor and dignity from her alone derived are, and all this world is bliss for which ye men do strive, few get, but many miss. And fair philotomy she rightly hight, The fairest white that oneth under sky. But that this darksome netherworld Her light doth dim with horror and deformity, Worthy of heaven and high felicity, From whence the gods have her for envy thrust. But sith thou hast found favor in mine eye, Thy spouse I will her make, if that thou lust, That she may thee advance for works and merits just. Gramercy, Mammon, said the gentle knight, for so great grace, and offered high estate. But I that him frail flesh and earthly white, unworthy match for such immortal mate myself well wot, and mine unequal fate, and were I not, yet is my troth a plight, and love avowed to other lady late, that to remove the same I have no might, to change love causeless is reproach to warlike knight. Mammon immoved was with inward wrath. 
Yet, forcing it to feign, him forth thence led, through grisly shadows by a beaten path, into a garden goodly garnished with herbs and fruits, whose kind mote not be read. Not such as earth out of her fruitful womb throws forth to men sweet and well savoured, but direful deadly black, both leaf and bloom, fit to adorn the dead and deck the dreary tomb. There mournful cypress grew in greatest store, and trees of bitter gall, and heaven sad, dead sleeping poppy, and black hellebore, cold coloquintida, and tetra mad, mortal somnitis, and secuta bad, with which the unjust Athenians made to die wise Socrates, who thereof quaffing glad, poured out his life and last philosophy to the fair Critias, his dearest Bellamy. The garden of Proserpina this height, and in the midst thereof a silver seat with a thick arbor goodly overdight, in which she often used from open heat herself to shroud, and pleasures to entreat. Next thereunto did grow a goodly tree with branches broad to spread, and body great, clothed with leaves, that none the wood mote see, and loaden all with fruit as thick as it might be. Their fruit were golden apples glistering bright, that goodly was their glory to behold. On earth like never grew, ne living white like ever saw, but they from hence were sold. For those which Hercules with conquest bold got from great Atlas' daughters hence began, and planted there did bring forth fruit of gold. And those with which the Euboean young man wan swift Atalanta, when through craft he her outran. Here also sprung that goodly golden fruit with which a conscious got his lover true, whom he had long time sought with fruitless suit. Here eke that famous golden apple grew, the which amongst the gods false Ate threw, for which thy Dian ladies disagreed, till partial Paris dempt in Venus due, and had of her fair Helen for his mead, that many noble Greeks and Trojans made to bleed. The warlike elf much wondered at this tree so fair and great, that shadowed all the ground, and his broad branches laden with rich feed did stretch themselves without the utmost bound of this great garden, compassed with a mound, which overhanging they themselves did steep in a black flood, which flowed about it round. That is the river of Cositus deep, in which full many souls do endless wail and weep, which to behold he clomb up to the bank, and looking down saw many damned whites in those sad waves which direful deadly stank, plunged continually of cruel sprites, that with their piteous cries and yelling shrites they made the further shore resound and wide. Amongst the rest of those same rueful sights, one cursed creature he by chance espied that drenched lay full deep under the garden side. Deep was he drenched to the upmost chin, yet gaped still as coveting to drink of the cold liquor which he waded in, and stretching forth his hand, did often think to reach the fruit which grew upon the brink, but both the fruit from hand and flood from mouth did fly aback, and made him vainly swink. The whiles he starved with hunger and with drouth, he daily died, yet never throughly die in couth. The knight him seeing labor so in vain asked who he was, and what he meant thereby, who, groaning deep, thus answered him again, Most cursed of all creatures under sky, lo, Tantalus, I here tormented lie, of whom high Jove want while om feasted be. Lo, here I now for want of food do die. But if that thou be such as I thee see, of grace I pray thee, give to eat and drink to me. Nay, nay, thou greedy Tantalus, quoth he, abide the fortune of thy present fate, and unto all that live in high degree and sample be of mind intemperate, to teach them how to use their present state. Then gan the cursed wretch aloud to cry, accusing highest Jove and gods in great, and eke blaspheming heaven bitterly, as author of injustice there to let him die. He looked a little further, and espied another wretch whose carcass deep was drenched within the river, 
which the same did hide, but both his hands, most filthy feculent, above the water were on high extent, and feigned to wash themselves incessantly, yet nothing cleaner were for such intent, but rather fouler seemed to the eye, so lost his labor vain and idle industry. The knight him calling asked who he was, who, lifting up his head, him answered thus, I pilot am the falsest judge, alas, and most unjust, that by unrighteous and wicked doom to Jews despiteous delivered up the Lord of life to die, and did a quite a merger felonous, the whiles my hands I washed in purity, the whiles my soul was soiled with foul iniquity. Infinite mo tormented in like pain he there beheld, too long here to be told, ne mammon would there let him long remain, for terror of the tortures manifold, in which the damned souls he did behold, but roughly him bespake, Thou fearful fool, why takest not of that same fruit of gold, ne sittest down on that same silver stool, to rest thy weary person in the shadow cool? All which he did, to do him deadly fall in frail intemperance through a sinful bait, to which, if he inclined had at all, that dreadful fiend which did behind him wait, would him have rent in thousand pieces straight. But he was wary wise in all his way, and well perceived his deceitful slight, ne suffered lust his safety to betray, so goodly did beguile the guiler of his prey. And now he has so long remained there that vital powers gan wex both weak and wan, for want of food and sleep, which to upbear like mighty pillars this frail life of man, that none without the same enduring can. For now three days of men were full outwrought since he this hardy enterprise began. For the great mammon fairly he besought into the world to guide him back as he him brought. The god, no loath, yet was constrained to obey, for linger time than that no living wight below the earth might suffer be to stay. So back again him brought to living light. But all so soon as his enfeebled sprite can suck this vital air into his breast, as overcome with too exceeding might, the life did flit away out of her nest, and all his senses were with deadly fit oppressed. Sir Gion, laid in swoon, is by Acrates' son despoiled, whom Arthur soon hath rescued and Paynim brethren foiled. And is there care in heaven, and is there love in heavenly spirits to these creatures base that make compassion of their evils move? There is, else much more wretched were the case of men than beasts. O oh, the exceeding grace of highest God, that loves his creatures so, and all his works with mercy doth embrace, that blessed angels he sends to and fro to serve to wicked man, to serve his wicked foe. How oft do they their silver bowers leave to come to succor us that succor want? How oft do they with golden pinions cleave the flitting skies, like flying perswivant against foul fiends to aid us militant? They for us fight, they watch, and duly ward, and their bright squadrons round about us plan, and all for love, and nothing for reward. Oh, why should heavenly God to man have such regard? During the while that Gion did abide in Mammon's house, the palmer, whom while ere that wanton maid of passage denied, by further search had passage found elsewhere, and being on his way, approached near where Gion lay in trance, when suddenly he heard a voice that called loud and clear, Come hither, come hither, oh, come hastily, that all the fields resounded with a rueful cry. The palmer lent his ear unto the noise, to wheat who called so importunately, again he heard a more efforced voice that bade him come in haste. He by and by his feeble feet directed to the cry, which to that shady delve him brought at last where Mammon erst did sun his treasury. There the good Gion he found slumbering fast in senseless dream, which sight at first him sore aghast. Beside his head there sat a fair young man of wondrous beauty and of freshest years, whose tender bud to blossom new began, and flourish fair above his equal peers. His snowy front, 
curled with golden hairs, like Phoebus' face adorned with sunny rays, divinely shone, and two sharp winged shears, decked with diverse plumes like painted jays, were fixed at his back to cut his airy ways. Like as Cupido on Aldean hill, when having laid his cruel bow away, and mortal arrows, wherewith he doth fill the world with murderous spoils and bloody prey, with his fair mother he him dights to play, and with his goodly sisters, graces three. The goddess, pleased with his wanton play, suffers herself through sleep beguiled to be, the whiles the other ladies mind their merry glee. Whom when the palmer saw, abashed he was through fear and wonder, That he naught could say till him the child bespoke. Long lacked, alas, hath been thy faithful aid in hard assay, Whiles deadly fit thy pupil doth dismay. Behold this heavy sight, thou reverend sire, But dread of death and dolor do away. For life ere long shall to her home retire, And he that breathless seems shall courage bold respire. The charge which God doth unto me aret, of his dear safety, I to thee commend. Yet will I not forgo, nay yet forget the care thereof myself unto the end, but evermore him succor and defend against his foe and mine. Watch thou, I pray, for evil is at hand him to offend. So having said, eftsoons he gan display his painted nimble wings, and vanished quite away. The palmer, seeing his left empty place, and his slow eyes beguiled of their sight, walked sore afraid, and standing still a space gazed after him, as foul escaped by flight. At last, him turning to his charge behight, with trembling hand his troubled pulse gan try, where finding life not yet dislodged quite, he much rejoiced, and cured it tenderly, as chicken newly hatched from dreaded destiny. At last he spied where towards him did pace two Paynim knights, all armed as bright as sky, and them beside an aged sire did trace, and far before a light-foot page did fly that breathed strife and troublous enmity. Those were the two sons of Acrates old, who, meeting erst with Archimago sly, for by that idol strong, of him were told that he which erst them combated was Gion bold which to avenge on him they dearly vowed, wherever that on ground they mote him find. False Archimage provoked their courage proud, and strifeful Aten to their stubborn mind coals of contention and hot vengeance time. Now been they come, whereas the palmer say, keeping that slumbered course to him assigned, well knew they both his person, sith of late with him in bloody arms they rashly did debate. Whom when Pyrocles saw, inflamed with rage, that sire he foul bespake, Thou dotard vile, that with thy bruteness shents thy comely age, Abandon soon I read the caitiff spoil of that same outcast carcass, That erewhile made itself famous through false treachery, And crowned his coward crest with knightly style. Lo, where he now inglorious doth lie, To prove he lived ill, that did thus foully die. To whom the palmer fearless answer it, Certes, Sir Knight, ye been too much to blame, Thus for to blot the honour of the dead, And with foul cowardize his carcass shame, Whose living hands immortalized his name. Vile is the vengeance on the ashes cold, And envy base to bark at sleeping fame. Was never white that treason of him told, Yourself his prowess proved, And found him fierce and bold. Then said Chimocles, Palmer, thou dost dote, Ne canst of prowess, Ne of knighthood deem, Save as thou seest or hearst. But well I wot, That of his puissance trial made extreme. Yet gold all is not that doth golden seem, Ne all good knights that shake well spear and shield, the worth of all men by their end esteem, And then due praise or due reproach them yield. Bad, therefore, I him deem, That thus lies dead on field. Good or bad, gan his brother fierce reply, What do I reck, sith that he died entire? Or what doth his bad death now satisfy The greedy hunger of revenging ire, Sith wrathful hand wrought not her own desire? 
Yet, since no way is left to wreak my spite, I will him reave of arms the victor's hire, and of that shield more worthy of good knight, for why should a dead dog be decked in armor bright? Fair sir, said then the palmer suppliant, for knighthood's love do not so foul a deed, ne blame your honor with so shameful vaunt of vile revenge, to spoil the dead of weed is sacrilege, and doth all sins exceed. But leave these relics of his living might to deck his hearse, and trap his tomb-black steed. What hearse or steed, said he, should he have dight, but be entombed in the raven or the kite? With that, rude hand upon his shield he laid, and the other brother gan his helm unlace, both fiercely bent to have him disarrayed, till that they spied where towards them did pace an armed knight of bold and bounteous grace, whose squire bore after him an heaven lance and covered shield, well kenned him so far spaced than chanter by his arms and eminence, when under him he saw his Libyan steed to prance, and to those brethren said, Rise, rise, belive, and unto battle do yourselves address, for yonder comes the prowest knight alive, Prince Arthur, flower of grace and nobleness, that hath to pain him knights wrought great distress, and thousand sarsons foully done to die. That word so deep did in their hearts impress, that both eftsoons upstarted furiously, and gan themselves prepare to battle greedily. But fierce Pyrocles, lacking his own sword, the want thereof now greatly gan to plain, and Archimage besought him that afford which he had brought for Bregadocchio vain. So would I, said the enchanter, glad and fain beteemed you this sword due to defend, or aught that else your honor might maintain, but that this weapon's power I well have kenned to be contrary to the work which ye intend. For that same knight's own sword this is, of yore which Merlin made by his almighty art, for that his nursling, when he knighthood swore, therewith to dun his foe's eternal smart. The metal first he mixed with medi wart, that no enchantment from his dint might save, that it in flames of Etna wrought apart, and seven times dipped in the bitter wave of hellish sticks, which hidden virtue to it gave. The virtue is that neither steel nor stone the stroke thereof from entrance may defend, ne ever may be used by his phone, ne forced his rightful owner to offend, ne ever will it break, ne ever bend, wherefore more dure it rightfully is height. In vain, therefore, Pyrocles, should I lend the same to thee against his lord to fight, for sure it would deceive thy labor and thy might. Foolish old man, said then the pagan wroth, that weenest words or charms may force withstand, soon shalt thou see and then believe for troth that I can carve with this enchanted brand his lord's own flesh, therewith out of his hand that virtuous steel he rudely snatched away, and Guyan's shield about his rest he bond, so ready dight fierce battle to essay, and match his brother proud in battleless array. By this that stranger knight in presence came, and goodly salute them, who not again him answered as courtesy became, but with stern looks and stomachous disdain gave signs of grudge and discontentment vain. Then, turning to the palmer, he can spy where at his feet, with sorrowful domain and deadly hue, an armed corse did lie, in whose dead face he read great magnanimity. Said he then to the palmer, Reverend sire, what great misfortune hath petted this night? Or did his life her fatal date expire? Or did he fall by treason, or by fight? However, sure I rue his piteous plight. Not one nor other, said the palmer grave, hath him befallen, but clouds of deadly night a while his heavy eyelids covered have, and all his senses drowned in deep senseless wave which those his cruel foes that stand hereby, making advantage to revenge their spite, would him disarm and treat and shamefully, unworthy usage of redoubted knight. But you, fair sir, whose honorable sight doth promise hope of help and timely grace, mote I beseech to succor his sad plight, and by your power protect his feeble case. First praise of knighthood is foul outrage to deface,
Palmer, said he, no knight so rude, I ween, as to don outrage to a sleeping ghost. Ne was there ever noble courage seen that in advantage would his puissance boast? Honor is least where odds appeareth most. Maybe that better reason will assuage the rash revenger's heat. Words well disposed have secret power to pease inflamed rage. If not, leave unto me thy knight's last patronage. Though turning to those brethren thus bespoke, Ye warlike pair, whose valorous great might it seems just wrongs to vengeance to provoke to wreak your wrath on this dead-seeming night, Mote aught allay the storm of your despite and settle patience in so furious heat? But not to debate the challenge of your right, but for this carcass, pardon, I entreat, whom fortune hath already laid in lowest seat. To whom Chimocles said, For what art thou that makes thyself his daysman to prolong the vengeance pressed? Or who shall let me now on this vile body from to wreak my wrong and make his carcass as the outcast dung? Why should not that dead carry and satisfy the guilt, which, if he lived had thus long, his life for due revenge should dear abide? The trespass still doth live, I'll be the person die. Indeed, then said the prince, the evil done dies not when breath the body first doth leave, but from the grandsire to the nephew's son and all his seed the curse doth often cleave, till vengeance utterly the guilt bereave. So straightly God doth judge, but gentle knight that doth against the dead his hand uprear, his honor stains with rancor and despite, and great disparagement makes to his former might. Pyrocles gan reply the second time, and to him said, Now, felon, sure I read how that thou art partaker of his crime, therefore by termagant thou shalt be dead. With that, his hand more sad than lump of lead, uplifting high, he weened with more dure his own good sword, Mordure, to cleave his head. The faithful steel such treason nold endure, but swerving from the mark, his lord's life did assure. Yet was the force so furious and so fell, that horse and man it made to reel aside. Nathless the prince would not forsake his cell, for well of yore he learned had to ride. But full of anger, fiercely to him cried, False traitor miscreant, thou broken hast the law of arms to strike foe undefied. But thou thy treason's fruit, I hope, shalt taste right sour and feel the law the which thou hast defaced. With that his baleful spear he fiercely bent against the pagan's breast, and therewith thought his cursed life out of her lodge have rent. But ere the point arrived where it ought, that sevenfold shield which he from Guyon brought, he cast between toward the bitter stound. Through all those folds the steelhead passage wrought, and through his shoulder pierced, wherewith to ground he groveling fell, all gored in his gushing wound. Which when his brother saw, fraught with great grief and wrath, he to him leaped furiously, and foully said, by Mahun, cursed thief, that direful stroke thou dearly shalt abide. Then, hurling up his harmful blade on high, smote him so hugely on his haughty crest, that from his saddle forced him to fly. Else smote it needs down to his manly breast, have cleft his head in twain, and life thence dispossessed. Now was the prince in dangerous distress, wanting his sword when he on foot should fight. His single spear could do him small redress against two foes of so exceeding might, the least of which was match for any knight. And now the other, whom he erst did daunt, had reared himself again to cruel fight, three times more furious and more puissant, unmindful of his wound, of his fate ignorant. So both at once him charge on either side with hideous strokes and importable power that forced him his ground to traverse wide and wisely watched toward that deadly stour, for in his shield as thick as stormy shower their strokes did rain, yet did he never quail nor backward shrink, but as a steadfast tower whom foe with double battery doth assail them on her bulwark bears and bids them not avail, so stoutly he withstood their strong assay, till that at last, 
When he advantage spied, his poignant spear he thrust with puissant sway at proud Chimocles, whilst his shield was wide, that through his thigh the mortal steel did dried. He, swarving with the force, within his flesh did break the lance, and let the head abide. Out of the wound the red blood flowed fresh, that underneath his feet soon made a purple flesh. Horribly then he gan to rage and rail, cursing his gods and himself damning deep. Also when his brother saw the red blood rail adown so fast, and all his armor steep, for very fellness loud he gan to weep, and said, Caitiff, curse on thy cruel Han that twice hath sped, yet shall it not thee keep from the third brunt of this my fatal brand. Lo, where the dreadful death behind thy back doth stand. With that he struck, and the other struck withal, that nothing seemed mote bear so monstrous might. The one upon his covered shield did fall, and glancing down would not his owner bite, but the other did upon his truncheon smite, which hewing quite asunder further way it made, and on his hackaton did light, the which, dividing with importune sway, it seized in his right side, and there the dint did stay. Wide was the wound, and a large lukewarm flood, red as the rose, thence gushed grievously, that when the pain him spied the streaming blood, gave him great heart and hope of victory. On the other side, in huge perplexity, the prince now stood, having his weapon broke. Not could he hurt, but still at war did lie, yet with his truncheon he so rudely stroked Chimocles twice, that twice him forced his foot revoke. Whom when the palmer saw in such distress, Sir Guyan's sword he lightly to him wrought, and said, Fair son, great God thy right hand bless, to use that sword so wisely as it ought. Glad was the knight, and with fresh courage fraught, when as again he armed felt his hond, then, like a lion which hath long time sought his robbed whelps, and at the last them fond amongst the shepherd's swains, then wexeth wood and yawned, so fierce he laid about him, and dealt blows on either side, that neither mail could hold nor shield defend the thunder of his throes. Now to Pyrocles many strokes he told, eft to Chimocles twice so many fold, then back again turning his busy hand, them both at once compelled with courage bold to yield wide way to his heart-thrilling brand, and though they both stood stiff, yet could not both withstand, as savage bull, whom two fierce mastiffs bait, when rancor doth with rage him once and gore, forgets with wary ward them to await, but with his dreadful horns them drives afore, or flings aloft, or treads down in the floor, breathing out wrath and bellowing disdain, that all the forest quakes to hear him roar, so raged Prince Arthur, twixt his foemen twain, that neither could his mighty puissance sustain. But ever at Pyrocles when he smit, who Guyan's shield cast ever him before, whereon the fairy queen's portrait was writ, his hand relented, and the stroke forbore, and his dear heart the picture gan adore, which oft the pain him saved from deadly stour. But him henceforth the same can save no more, for now arrived is his fatal hour, that not avoided be by earthly skill or power. For when Chimocles saw the foul reproach which them appeached, pricked with guilty shame and inward grief, he fiercely gan approach, resolved to put away that loathly blame, or die with honor and desert of fame. And on the hauberk stroke the prince so sore, that quite disparted all the Lincoln frame, and pierced to the skin, but bit no more, yet made him twice to reel that never moved afore, whereat when fierced with wrath and sharp regret, he stroke so hugely with his borrowed blade that it impierced the pagan's burgonet, and cleaving the hard steel did deep invade into his head, and cruel passage made quite through his brain. He, tumbling down on ground, breathed out his ghost, which to the infernal shade fast flying, there eternal torment found for all the sins wherewith his lewd life did abound which when his German saw, the stony fear ran to his heart, and all his sense dismayed, ne thenceforth life ne courage did appear, but as a man whom hellish fiends afraid, long trembling still he stood. At last thus said, Traitor, what hast thou done? 
How ever may thy cursed hand so cruelly have swayed against that knight? Harrow and well away, after so wicked deed, why livest thou longer day? With that, all desperate as loathing light, and with revenge desiring soon to die, assembling all his force and utmost might, with his own sword he fierce at him did fly, and struck and foined and lashed outrageously without in reason or regard. Well knew the prince, with patience and sufferance sly, so hasty heat soon cooled to subdue, though when this breathless walks, that battle can renew. As when a windy tempest bloweth high, That nothing may withstand his stormy stour, The clouds, as things afraid, before him fly, But also soon as his outrageous power is laid, They fiercely then begin to shower, And, as in scorn of his spent stormy spite, Now all at once their malice forth to pour. So did Prince Arthur bear himself in fight, And suffered rash Pyrocles waste his idle might. At last, when as the Saracen perceived how that strange sword refused to serve his need, but when he stroked most strong the dint deceived, he flung it from him, and devoid of dread, upon him lightly leaping without heed, twixt his two mighty arms and grasped fast, thinking to overthrow and down him tread. But him in strength and skill the prince surpassed, and through his nimble slight did under him downcast. Not booted it the pain him then to strive, For as a bitter in the eagle's claw, That may not hope by flight to escape alive, Still waits for death with dread and trembling awe, So he, now subject to the victor's law, Did not once move nor upward cast his eye, For vile disdain and rancor, Which did gnaw his heart in twain with sad melancholy, As one that loathed life, and yet despised to die. But full of princely bounty and great mind, The conqueror not carried him to slay, But casting wrongs and all revenge behind, More glory thought to give life than decay, And said, Pain him, this is thy dismal day. Yet if thou wilt renounce thy miscreants, And my true liegeman yield thyself for a, Life will I grant thee for thy valiance, And all thy wrongs will wipe out of my sovenance. Fool, said the pagan, I thy gift defy, but use thy fortune as it doth befall, and say that I not overcome do die, but in despite of life for death do call. Wroth was the prince, and sorry yet withal that he so willfully refused grace, yet sith his fate so cruelly did fall, his shining helmet he can soon unlace, and left his headless body bleeding all the place. By this Sir Guyon from his trance awaked, life having maestred her senseless foe, and looking up, when as his shield he lacked, and sword saw not, he wexed wondrous woe. But when the palmer, whom he long ago had lost, he by him spied, right glad he grew, and said, Dear sir, whom wandering to and fro I long have lacked, I joy thy face to view. Firm is thy faith, whom danger never from me drew. But read, what wicked hand hath robbed me of my good sword and shield? The palmer, glad with so fresh hue uprising him to see, him answer it. Fair son, be no whit sad for want of weapons. They shall soon be had. So gan he to discourse the whole debate, which that strange knight for him sustained had, and those two Saracens confounded late, whose carcasses on ground were horribly prostrate. Which when he heard and saw the tokens true, his heart with great affection was embayed, and to the prince bowing with reverence due, as to the patron of his life, thus said, my lord, my liege, by whose most gracious aid I live this day and see my foes subdued, what may suffice to be for me repaid of so great graces as ye have me shewed, but to be ever bound to whom the infant thus? Fair sir, what need good turns be counted? as a servile bond to bind their doers to receive their meed. Are not all knights, by oath bound to withstand oppressor's power by arms and puissant hand, suffice that I have done my due in place? So goodly purpose they together fond of kindness and of courteous a grace, the whiles false Archimage and Aten fled apace.
The house of temperance, in which doth sober Alma dwell, besieged of many foes, whom stranger knights to flight compel. Of all God's works which do this world adorn, there is no one more fair and excellent than is man's body, both for power and form, whiles it is kept in sober government, but none than it more foul and indecent, distempered through misrule and passion space. It grows a monster, and incontinent doth lose its dignity and native grace. Behold who list both one and other in this place. After the Paynim brethren conquered where, the Briton prince, recovering his stolen sword, and Guyon his lost shield, they both affair, forth passed on their way in fair accord, till him the prince with gentle court did board. Sir knight, mote I of you this curtsy read, to weep why on your shield, so goodly scored, bear ye the picture of that lady's head? Full lively is the semblant, though the substance dead. Fair sir, said he, if in that picture dead such life ye read, and virtue in vain show, what mote ye ween if the true livelihead of that most glorious visage ye did view? But if the beauty of her mind ye knew, that is, her bounty and imperial power, thousand times fairer than her mortal hue, oh, how great wonder would your thoughts devour, and infinite desire into your spirit's power! She is the mighty queen of fairy, whose fair retreat I in my shield do bear. She is the flower of grace and chastity, throughout the world renowned far and near, my leaf, my liege, my sovereign, my dear, whose glory shineth as the morning star, and with her light the earth and lumens clear. Far reach her mercies and her praises far, as well in state of peace as puissance in war. Thrice happy man, said then the Briton knight, whom gracious lot and thy great valiance have made thee soldier of that princess bright, which with her bounty and glad countenance doth bless her servants and them high advance. How may strange knight hope ever to aspire by faithful service and meet eminence unto such bliss? Sufficient were that hire for loss of thousand lives to die at her desire. Said Guyon, Noble lord, what meed so great or grace of earthly prince so sovereign, but by your wondrous worth and warlike feat ye well may hope, and easily attain? But were your will her sold to entertain, and numbered be amongst knights of maidenhead, great guerdon well I wot should you remain, and in her favour high be reckoned, as Artegall and Sophie now be honour it. Sir, it is, then said the prince, I God avow that sith I arms and knighthood first did plight, my whole desire hath been, and yet is now, to serve that queen with all my power and might. Now hath the sun, with his lamp-burning light, walked round about the world, and I no less, sith of that goddess I have sought the sight, yet nowhere can her find. Such happiness heaven doth to me envy, and fortune favourless. Fortune, the foe of famous Chevisance, seldom, said Guyon, yields to virtue aid, but in her way throws mischief and mischance, whereby her course is stopped and passage stayed. But you, fair sir, be not herewith dismayed, but constant keep the way in which ye stand, which, were it not that I am else delayed with hard adventure which I have in hand, I labour would to guide you through all fairyland. Gramercy, sir, said he, but mote I wot what strange adventure do you now pursue? Perhaps my succour or advisement meet, mote stead you much your purpose to subdue. Then can Sir Guyon all the story shew of false Acrasia and her wicked wiles, which to avenge the palmer him forth drew from fairy court. So talked they the whiles they wasted had much way, and measured many miles. And now, fair Phoebus gan decline in haste his weary wagon to the western vale, when as they spied a goodly castle, placed for by a river in a pleasant dale, which, choosing for that evening's hospital, they thither marched. But when they came in sight, and from their sweaty coursers did avail, they found the gates fast barred long ere night, and every loop fast locked, as fearing foes despite, which when they saw, they weened foul reproach was to them done their entrance to forestall, till that the squire gan nigher to approach, and wind his horn under the castle wall, that with the noise it shook as it would fall. 
Eftsoon's forth looked from the highest spire the watch, and loud unto the knights did call, to weet what they so rudely did require, who gently answered, they entrance did desire. Fly, fly, good knights, said he, fly fast away, if that your lives ye love, as meet ye should, fly fast and save yourselves from near decay. Here may ye not have entrance, though we would, we would and would again, if that we could, but thousand enemies about us rave, and with long siege us in this castle hold. Seven years this wise they us besieged have, and many good knights slain that have us sought to save. Thus as he spoke, lo, with outrageous cry, a thousand villains round about them swarmed out of the rocks and caves adjoining nigh. Vile caitive wretches, ragged, rude, deformed, all threatening death, all in strange manner armed, some with unwieldy clubs, some with long spears, some rusty knives, some staves in fire warmed. Stern was their look, like wild, amazed steers, staring with hollow eyes and stiff, upstanding ears. Fiercely at first those knights they did assail, and drove them to recoil, but when again they gave fresh charge, their forces gan to fail, unable their encounter to sustain. For with such puissance and impetuous main those champions broke on them, that forced them fly like scattered sheep, when as the shepherd swain a lion and a tiger doth espy, with greedy pace forth rushing from the forest nigh. A while they fled, but soon returned again with greater fury than before was found, and evermore their cruel capitaine sought with his rascal routs to enclose them round, and overrun to tread them to the ground. But soon the knights with their bright burning blades broke their rude troops, and orders did confound, hewing and slashing at their idle shades, for though they bodies seem, yet substance from them fades. As when a swarm of gnats at eventide out of the fens of Allen do arise, their murmuring small trumpets sound and wide, whiles in the air their clustering army flies, that as a cloud doth seem to dim the skies, ne man nor beast may rest or take repast for their sharp wounds and noyous injuries, till the fierce northern wind with blustering blast doth blow them quite away and in the ocean cast. Thus, when they had that troublous rout dispersed, unto the castle gate they come again, and entrance craved, which was denied erst. Now when report of that their perilous pain and cumbrous conflict which they did sustain came to the lady's ear which there did dwell, she forth issued with a goodly train of squires and ladies equipaged well, and entertained them right fairly as befell. Alma, she called it was, a virgin bright, that had not yet felt Cupid's wanton rage. Yet was she wooed of many a gentle knight, and many a lord of noble parentage, that sought with her to link in marriage. For she was fair, as fair mote ever be, and in the flower now of her freshest age, yet full of grace and goodly modesty, that even heaven rejoiced her sweet face to see. In robe of lily-white she was arrayed, that from her shoulder to her heel down wrought, the train whereof loose far behind her strayed, branched with gold and pearl most richly wrought, and born of two fair damsels which were taught that service well. Her yellow golden hair was trimly woven, and in tresses wrought, nay other tire she on her head did wear, but crowned with a garland of sweet rosier. Goodly she entertained those noble knights, and brought them up into her castle hall, where gentle court and gracious delight she to them made with mildness virginal, showing herself both wise and liberal. There, when they rested had a season due, they her besought, a favor special, of that fair castle to afford them view. She granted, and them leading forth the same did shew. First she them led up to the castle wall, that was so high as foe might not it climb, and all so fair and fensible withal. Not built of brick, nor yet of stone and lime, but of thing like to that Egyptian slime, whereof King Nine while own built Babel Tower. But, O oh, great pity, that no longer time so goodly workmanship should not endure. 
Soon it must turn to earth, no earthly thing is sure. The frame thereof seemed partly circular and part triangular, a work divine. Those two the first and last proportions are, the one imperfect, mortal, feminine, the other immortal, perfect, masculine. And twixt them both a quadrate was the base, proportioned equally by seven and nine. Nine was the circle set in heaven's place, all which compacted made a goodly diapace. Therein two gates were placed seemly well. The one before, by which all in did pass, did the other far in workmanship excel, uh, for not of wood, nor of enduring brass, but of more worthy substance framed it was, doubly disparted. It did lock and close, that when it locked, none might thorough pass, and when it opened, no man might it close, still open to their friends, and closed to their foes. Of hewn stone the porch was fairly wrought, stone more of value and more smooth and fine than jet or marble far from Ireland brought, over the which was cast a wandering vine, and chased with a wanton ivy twine and over it a fair portcullis hung, which to the gate directly did incline with comely compass and compacture strong, neither unseemly short nor yet exceeding long. Within the barbican a porter sate, day and night duly keeping watch and ward, nor white nor word mote pass out of the gate but in good order and with due regard. Utterers of secrets he from thence debarred, babblers of folly and blazers of crime. His lorumbell might loud and wide be hard, when cause required, but never out of time. Early and late it rung, at evening and at prime. And round about the porch on every side, twice sixteen warders sat, all armed bright in glistering steel and strongly fortified. Tall yeomen seemed they, and of great might, and were enranged, ready still for fight. By them, as Alma passed with her guests, they did obeisance as beseemed right, and then again returned to their rests. The porter eke to her did lout with humble jests. Thence she them brought into a stately hall, wherein were many tables fair to spread, and ready dight with drappets festival against the viand should be ministered. At the upper end there sate, clad in red down to the ground, a comely personage, that in his hand a white rod managed, he steward was, height diet, ripe of age, and in demeanour sober, and in counsel sage. And through the hall there walked to and fro a jolly yeoman, marshal of the same, whose name was Appetite. He did bestow both guests and meat, whenever in they came, and knew them how to order without blame, as him the steward bade. They both atone did duty to their lady as became, who, passing by, forth led her guests anone into the kitchen room, ne spared for niceness none. It was a vault built for great dispense, with many ranges reared along the wall, and one great chimney, whose long tunnel thence the smoke forth threw, and in the midst of all there placed was a cauldron, wide and tall, upon a mighty furnace, burning hot more hot than et nor flaming mongible, for day and night it brent, ne ceased not, so long as anything it in the cauldron got. But to delay the heat, lest by mischance it might break out and set the whole on fire, there added was, by goodly ordinance, an huge great pair of bellows, which did stire continually, and cooling breath inspire. About the cauldron many cooks acoiled with hooks and ladles, as need did require, the whiles the viands in the vessel boiled, they did about their business sweat and sorely toiled. The maester cook was called Concoction, a careful man and full of comely guise. The kitchen clerk, the tight digestion, did order all the cates in seemly wise, and set them forth as well he could devise. The rest had several offices assigned, some to remove the scum as it did rise, others to bear the same away did mine and others it to use according to his kind. But all the liquor, which was foul and waste, not good nor serviceable else for aught, they in another great round vessel placed, till by a conduit pipe it thence were brought, and all the rest, that noyous was and not, by secret ways that none might it espy, was close conveyed, and to the back gate brought, that cleeped was Port Esquiline, whereby it was avoided quite and thrown out privily.
Which goodly order and great workman's skill, when as those knights beheld, with rare delight and gazing wonder they their minds did fill, for never had they seen so strange a sight. Thence back again fair Alma led them right, and soon into a goodly parlour brought, that was with royal arras richly dight, in which was nothing portrait nor wrought, not wrought nor portrait, but easy to be thought. And in the midst thereof upon the floor a lovely bevy of fair ladies sate, courted of many a jolly paramour, the which them did in modest wise a mate, and each one sought his lady to a great. And eke amongst them little Cupid played his wanton sports, being returned late from his fierce wars, and having from him laid his cruel bow, wherewith he thousands hath dismayed. Diverse delights they found themselves to please, some song in sweet consort, some laughed for joy, some played with straws, some idly sat at ease, but other some could not abide to toy, all pleasance was to them grief and annoy. This frowned, that fawned, the third for shame did blush, another seemed envious or coy, another in her teeth did gnaw a rush. But at these strangers' presence every one did hush. Soon as the gracious Alma came in place, they all at once out of their seats arose, and to her homage made with humble grace, whom when the knights beheld, they gan dispose themselves to court, and each a damsel chose. The prince, by chance, did on a lady light that was right fair and fresh as morning rose, but somewhat sad and solemn eke in sight, as if some pensive thought constrained her gentle sprite. In a long purple pall, whose skirt with gold was fretted all about, she was arrayed, and in her hand a poplar branch did hold, to whom the prince in courteous manner said, Gentle madame, why be ye thus dismayed, and your fair beauty do with sadness spill? Lives any that you hath thus ill paid, or done you love, or done you lack your will? Whatever be the cause, it sure beseems you ill. Fair sir, said she, half in disdainful wise, how is it that this mood in me ye blame, and in yourself do not the same advise? Him ill beseems another's fault to name, that may unwares be blotted with the same. Pensive I yield I am, and sad in mind, through great desire of glory and of fame. Nay aught I ween are ye therein behind, that have twelve months sought one, yet nowhere can her find? The prince was inly moved at her speech, well weeting true what she had rashly told, yet with fair semblance sought to hide the breach, which change of color did perforce unfold, now seeming flaming hot, now stony cold. Though turning soft aside, he did inquire what white she was that poplar branch did hold. It answered was, her name was Praise Desire, that by well-doing sought to honor to aspire. The whiles the fairy knight did entertain another damsel of that gentle crew that was right fair and modest of domain, but that too oft she changed her native hue. Strange was her tire, and all her garment blue, close round about her tucked with many a plight. Upon her fist the bird which shunneth view and keeps in coverts close from living white did sit, as yet ashamed how rude Pan did her dight. So long as Guyan with her commoned, unto the ground she cast her modest eye, and ever and anon with rosy red the bashful blood her snowy cheeks did dye, that her became as polished ivory which cunning craftsman hand hath overlaid with fair vermilion of pure castery. Great wonder had the knight to see the maid so strangely passioned, and to her gently said, Fair damsel, seemeth by your troubled cheer, that either me too bold ye ween, this wise you to molest, or other ill to fear that in the secret of your heart close lies, from whence it doth as cloud from sea arise. If it be I, of pardon I you pray. But if aught else that I mote not devise, I will, if please you would discure, assay to ease you of that ill so wisely as I may. She answered not but more abashed for shame held down her head, the whiles her lovely face the flashing blood with blushing did inflame, and the strong passion marred her modest grace, that Guyan marveled at her uncouth case. 
till Alma himp spake. Why wonder ye, fair sir, at that which ye so much embrace? She is the fountain of your modesty. You shamefast are, but shamefastness itself is she. Thereat the elf did blush in privity, and turned his face away. But she the same dissembled fair, and feigned to oversee. Thus they a while with court and goodly game themselves did solace each one with his dame, till that great lady thence away them sought to view her castle's other wondrous frame. Up to a stately turret she them brought, ascending by ten steps of alablaster wrought. That turret's frame most admirable was, like highest heaven compassed around, and lifted high above this earthly mass which it surviewed, as hills done lower ground, but not on ground mote like to this be found, not that which antique Cadmus whilom built in Thebes, which Alexander did confound, nor that proud tower of Troy, though richly gilt, from which young Hector's blood by cruel Greeks was spilt. The roof hereof was archered overhead, and decked with flowers and herbers daintily. Two goodly beacons set in watches stead therein gave light and flamed continually, for they of living fire most subtly were made, and set in silver sockets bright, covered with lids devised of substance sly, that readily they shut and open might. Oh, who can tell the praises of that maker's might? Ne can I tell, ne can I stay to tell this part's great workmanship and wondrous power, that all this other world's work doth excel, and likest is unto that heavenly tower that God hath built for his own blessed bower. Therein were diverse rooms and diverse stages, but three the chiefest and of greatest power, in which there dwelt three honorable sages, the wisest men I ween that lived in their ages. Not he whom Greece, the nurse of all good arts, by Phoebus' doom, the wisest thought alive, might be compared to these by many parts. Nor that sage Pylian sire, which did survive three ages such as mortal men contrive, by whose advice old Priam's city fell, with these in praise of policies most strive. These three, in these three rooms, did sundry dwell, and counselled fair Alma how to govern well. The first of them could things to come foresee, the next could of things present best advise, the third things past could keep in memory, so that no time nor reason could arise, but that the same could one of these comprise. For thee the first did in the four parts sit, that naught mote hinder his quick prejudice. He had a sharp foresight and working wit, that never idle was, ne once could rest a whit. His chamber was dispainted all within with sundry colors, in the which were writ infinite shapes of things dispersed thin, some such as in the world were never yet, ne can devise it be of mortal wit, some daily seen and known by their names, such as in idle fantasies do flit, infernal hags, centaurs, fiends, hippodames, apes, lions, eagles, owls, fools, lovers, children, dames. And all the chamber filled was with flies, which buzzed all about, and made such sound that they encumbered all men's ears and eyes, like many swarms of bees, assembled round after their hives with honey to abound. All those were idle thoughts and fantasies, devices, dreams, opinions unsound, shows, visions, soothsays, and prophesies, and all that feigned is, as leasings, tales, and lies. Amongst them all sate he which wanted there that hight Phantastes by his nature true, a man of years yet fresh, as mote appear, of swarth complexion and of crabbed hue, that him full of melancholy did shew, bent hollow beetle brows, sharp staring eyes that mad or foolish seemed, one by his view mote deem him born with ill-disposed skies, when oblique Saturn sate in the house of agonize. Whom Alma having showed to her guests, thence brought them to the second room, whose walls were painted fair with memorable jests of famous wizards, and with picturals of magistrates, of courts, of tribunals, of commonwealths, of states, of policy, of laws, of judgments, and of decretals, all arts, all science, all philosophy, 
and all that in the world was a thought wittily. Of those that room was full, and them among there sate a man of ripe and perfect age, who did them meditate all his life long, that through continual practice and usage he now was grown right wise and wondrous sage. Great pleasure had those stranger knights to see his goodly reason and grave personage that his disciples both desired to be. But Alma thence them led to the hindmost room of three. That chamber seemed ruinous and old, and therefore was removed far behind, yet were the walls that did the same uphold right firm and strong, though somewhat they declined. And therein sat an old, old man half blind, and all decrepit in his feeble course, yet lively vigor rested in his mind, and recompensed him with a better scorse. Weak body well is changed for mind's redoubled force. This man of infinite remembrance was, and things foregone through many ages held, which he recorded still as they did pass, ne suffered them to perish through long eld, as all things else the which this world doth weld, but laid them up in his immortal scrine, where they for ever incorrupted dwell. The wars he well remembered of King Nine, of old Asaracus, and Inachus divine. The years of Nestor nothing were to his, nor yet Methuselah, though longest lived, for he remembered both their infancies. Nay wonder then, if that he were deprived of native strength now that he them survived. His chamber all was hanged about with rolls and old records from ancient times derived, some made in books, some in long parchment scrolls that were all worm-eaten and full of canker-holes. Amidst them all, he in a chair was set, tossing and turning them without an end. But, for he was unable them to fet, a little boy did on him still attend, to reach whenever he for aught did send, and oft when things were lost or laid amiss, that boy them sought, and unto him did lend. Therefore he anamnestes clepid is, and that old man eumnestes, by their properties. The knights, their entering, did him reverence due, and wondered at his endless exercise. Then, as they gan his library to view, and antique registers for to advise, there chanced to the prince's hand to rise an ancient book, hight Britain Monuments, that of this land's first conquest did devise, and old divisions into regiments, till it reduced was to one man's governments. Sir Guyon chanced eke on another book that hight Antiquity of Fairyland, in which, when as he greedily did look, the offspring of elves and fairies there he fond, as it delivered was from hand to hand. Whereat they, burning both with fervent fire, their country's ancestry to understand, craved leave of Alma and that aged sire to read those books, who gladly granted their desire. A chronicle of Britain kings from Brute to Uther's reign, and rolls of elfin emperors till time of Gloriane. Who now shall give unto me words and sound equal unto this haughty enterprise? Or who shall lend me wings with which from ground my lowly verse may loftily arise, and lift itself unto the highest skies? More ample spirit than hitherto was wont here needs me, whilst the famous ancestries of my most dreaded sovereign I recount, by which all earthly princes she doth far surmount. Nay, under sun that shines so wide and fair, whence all that lives does borrow life and light, lives aught that to her lineage may compare, which, though from earth it be derived right, yet doth itself stretch forth to heaven's height. And all the world with wonder overspread, a labor huge, exceeding far my might. How shall frail pen, with fear disparaged, conceive such sovereign glory and great bountyhead? Argument worthy of Meonian quill, or rather worthy of great Phoebus wrote, whereon the ruins of great Ossa Hill and triumphs of Phlegrian Jove he wrote, that all the gods admired his lofty note. But if some relish of that heavenly lay his learned daughters would to me report, to deck my song withal, I would assay thy name, O sovereign queen, to blazon far away. Thy name, O sovereign queen, thy realm and race, from this renowned prince derived are, who mightily upheld that royal mace which now thou bearst, to thee descended far from mighty kings and conquerors in war, thy fathers 
and great-grandfathers of old, whose noble deeds above the northern star immortal fame for ever hath enrolled, as in that old man's book they were in order told. The land which warlike Britons now possess, and therein have their mighty empire raised, in antique times was salvage wilderness, unpeopled, unmanured, unproved, unpraised. Ne was it island then, ne was it paced amid the ocean waves, ne was it sought of merchants far for profits therein praised, but was all desolate, and of some thought by sea to have been from the Celtic mainland brought. Nay, did it then deserve a name to have, till that the venturous mariner that way, learning his ship from those white rocks to save, which all along the southern sea coast lay, threatening unheedy wreck and rash decay, for safety's sake, that same his sea mark made, and named it Albion. But later day, finding in it fit ports for fisher's trade, gan more the same frequent, and further to invade. But far inland a salvage nation dwelt of hideous giants and half-beastly men, that never tasted grace nor goodness felt, but like wild beasts lurking in loathsome den, and flying fast as roebuck through the fen, all naked without shame or care of cold, by hunting and by spoiling livid then of stature huge, and eke of courage bold, that sons of men amazed their sternness to behold. But whence they sprung, or how they were begot, aneath is to assure, aneath to wean that monstrous error which doth somersault, that Diocletian's fifty daughters sheen into this land by chance have driven been, where, companying with fiends and filthy sprites, through vain illusion of their lust unclean, they brought forth giants and such dreadful whites as far exceeded men in their immeasured mites. They held this land, and with their filthiness polluted the same gentle soil long time, that their own mother loathed their beastliness, and gan abhor her brood's unkindly crime, all were they born of her own native slime until that Brutus, anciently derived from royal stock of old Assarix line, driven by fatal error, here arrived, and them of their unjust possession deprived. But ere he had established his throne, and spread his empire to the utmost shore, he fought great battles with his salvage phone, in which he them defeated evermore, and many giants left on groaning floor, that well can witness yet unto this day the western hoch, besprinkled with the gore of mighty Goemot, whom in stout fray Corinius conquered and cruelly did slay. And eke that ample pit, yet far renowned for the large leap which Deban did compel Coolan to make, being eight lugs of ground, into the which returning back he fell. But those three monstrous stones do most excel, which that huge son of hideous Albion, whose father, Hercules in France did quell, great Godmer, through, in fierce contention at bold Canutus, but of him was slain anon. In meed of these great conquests by them got, Corinius had that province utmost west to him assigned for his worthy lot, which of his name and memorable jest he called it Cornwall, yet so called it best, and Deben's share was that is Devonshire. But Canute had his portion from the rest, the which he called Canutium for his hire. Now Cantium, which Kent we commonly inquire. Thus Brute, this realm unto his rule subdued, and reigned long in great felicity, loved of his friends and of his foes eschewed. He left three sons, his famous progeny, born a fair Inogene of Italy, mongst whom he parted his imperial state and Locrin left chief lord of Brittany. At last, ripe age bade him surrender late his life and long good fortune unto final fate. Locrin was left the sovereign lord of all, but Albanact had all the northern part, which of himself Albania he did call, and Camber did possess the western quart, which Severn now from Logris doth depart, and each his portion peaceably enjoyed. Ne was their outward breach, nor grudge in heart, that once their quiet government annoyed, but each his pains to others' profit still employed. 
until a nation strange, with visage swart and courage fierce, that all men did affray, which through the world then swarmed in every part, and overflowed all countries far away, like noise great flood, with their importune sway this land invaded with like violence, and did themselves through all the north display, until that Locrine, for his realm's defense, did head against the make and strong munificence. He them encountered a confused rout, for by the river that Whilom was hight the ancient abbess, where with courage stout he them defeated in victorious fight, and chased so fiercely after fearful flight, that forced their chieftain, for his safety's sake, their chieftain Humber name it was aright, unto the mighty stream him to betake, where he an end of battle and of life did make. The king returned proud of victory, and insolent walks through unwanted ease, that shortly he forgot the jeopardy which in his land he lately did appease, and fell to vain voluptuous disease. He loved fair lady Estrild, lewdly loved, whose wanton pleasures him too much did please, that quite his heart from Gwendoline removed from Gwendoline his wife, though always faithful proved. The noble daughter of Corinius would not endure to be so vile disdained, but gathering force and courage valorous, encountered him in battle well ordained, in which him vanquished she to fly constrained. But she so fast pursued that him she took and threw in bands, where he till death remained. All's his fair lemon, flying through a brook she overhent, not moved with her piteous look. But both herself and eke her daughter dear, begotten by her kingly paramour, the fair Sabrina, almost dead with fear, she there attached, far from all succour. The one she slew in that impatient stour, but the sad virgin, innocent of all, adown the rolling river she did pour, which of her name now Severn men do call. Such was the end that to disloyal love did fall. Then for her son, which he to Locrin bore, Madden, was young, unmeet the rule to sway, in her own hand the crown she kept in store till riper years he wrought, and stronger stay, during which time her power she did display through all this realm the glory of her sex, and first taught men a woman to obey. But when her son to man's estate did wex, she it surrendered, nay herself would linger vex. Though Madden reigned, unworthy of his race, for with all shame that sacred throne he filled. Next, Memprise, as unworthy of that place, in which, being consorted with Manild, for thirst of single kingdom him he killed. But Ebrenect salved both their infamies with noble deeds, and warred on Brenchild in Henault, where yet of his victorize brave monuments remain, which yet that land envies. An happy man in his first days he was, and happy father of fair progeny. For all so many weeks as the year has, so many children he did multiply, of which were twenty sons, which did apply their minds to praise and chivalrous desire. Those Germans did subdue all Germany, of whom it height. But in the end their sire with foul repulse from France was forced to retire, which blot his son succeeding in his seat, the second fruit, the second both in name and eke in semblance of his puissance great, right well recured, and did away that blame with recompense of everlasting fame. He with his victor sword first opened the bowels of wide France, a forlorn dame, and taught her first how to be conquered, since which with sundry spoils she hath been ransacked. Let Scaldis tell, and let tell Hania, and let the marsh of Esthambruges tell what color were their waters that same day, and all the moor twixt Elversham and Dell, with blood of Henalois, which therein fell. How oft that day did sad Brunchildis see the green shield died in dolorous vermel, that not squith Gwirid it most seemed to be, but rather Esquith Goch, sign of sad cruelty. His son, King Leal, by father's labor long enjoyed an heritage of lasting peace, and built Caerleal, and built Caerleon strong. Next, Hudibras, his realm did not increase, but taught the land from weary wars to cease.
whose footsteps bladded following, in arts excelled at Athens all the learned priests, from whence he brought them to these salvage parts, and with sweet science mollified their stubborn hearts. Example of his wondrous faculty, behold, the boiling baths at Carbidon, which seethe with secret fire eternally, and in their entrails full of quick brimstone, nourish the flames which they are warmed upon that to their people wealth they forth do well, and health to every foreign nation. Yet he at last, contending to excel the reach of men, through flight into fond mischief fell. Next him King Lear, in happy peace long reigned, but had no issue male him to succeed, but three fair daughters, which were well uptrained in all that seemed fit for kingly seed, Mongst whom his realm he equally decreed to have divided, though when feeble age nigh to his utmost date he saw proceed, he called his daughters, and with speeches sage inquired which of them most did love her parentage. The eldest, Goneril, gan to protest that she much more than her own life him loved, and Regan greater love to him professed than all the world, whenever it were proved. But Cordial said she loved him as behooved, whose simple answer, wanting colors fair to paint it forth, him to displeasance moved, that in his crown he counted her no heir, but twixt the other twain his kingdom whole did share. So wedded one to Maglan, king of Scots, and the other to the king of Cambria, and twixt them shared his realm by equal lots. But without dower the wise Cordelia was sent to Agonip of Celtica. Their aged sire, thus eased of his crown, a private life led in Albania with Goneril, long had in great renown, that not him grieved to bin from rule deposed down. But true it is that when the oil is spent the light goes out, and weak is thrown away. So when he had resigned his regiment, his daughter gan despise his drooping day, and weary wax of his continual stay. Though to his daughter Regan he repaired, who him at first well used every way, but when of his departure she despaired, her bounty she abated, and his cheer impaired. The wretched man can then advise too late that love is not where most it is professed, too truly tried in his extremest state. At last, Resolved likewise to prove the rest, he to Cordelia himself addressed, who with entire affection him received, as for her sire and king her seemed best. And after all, an army strong she leaved to war on those which him had of his realm bereaved. So to his crown she him restored again, in which he died, made ripe for death by eld, and after willed it should to her remain, who peaceably the same long time did weld, and all men's hearts in due obedience held, till that her sister's children, waxen strong, through proud ambition against her rebelled, and overcomen kept in prison long, till, weary of that wretched life, herself she hung. Then gan the bloody brethren both to reign, but fierce Kanda gan shortly to envy his brother Morgan, pricked with proud disdain to have a peer in part of sovereignty, and kindling coals of cruel enmity raised war, and him in battle overthrew, whence as he to those woody hills did fly which height of him Glamorgan, there him slew. Then did he reign alone, when he none equal knew, his son Rivalo his dead room did supply, in whose sad time blood did from heaven rain. Next great Gergustus, then fair Cecily, in constant peace their kingdoms did contain, after whom Lego and Kinmark did reign, and Gorbogut, till far in years he grew. Then his ambitious sons unto them twain are wrought the rule, and from their father drew. Stout Ferex and stern Porex him in prison threw. But, oh, the greedy thirst of royal crown, That knows no kindred, nor regards no right, Stirred Porex up to put his brother down, Who unto him assembling foreign might, Made war on him, and fell himself in fight. 
whose death to avenge his mother merciless, most merciless of women, widen height, her other son fast sleeping did oppress, and with most cruel hand him murdered pitiless. Here ended Brutus' sacred progeny, which had seven hundred years this scepter born, with high renown and great felicity. The noble branch from the antique stock was torn through discord, and the royal throne forlorn. Thenceforth this realm was into factions rent, whilst each of Brutus boasted to be born, that in the end was left no monument of Brutus, nor of Britain's glory ancient. Then up arose a man of matchless might and wondrous wit to manage high affairs, who, stirred with pity of the stressed plight of this sad realm, cut into sundry shares by such as claimed themselves brute rightful heirs, gathered the princes of the people loose to take in counsel of their common cares, who, with his wisdom won, him straight did choose their king and swore him fealty to win or lose. Then made he head against his enemies, and Imner slew of Logris miscreate, then Ruddock and proud stater, both allies, this of Albany newly nominate, and that of Cambry king confirmed late, he overthrew through his own valiance, whose countries he reduced to quiet state, and shortly brought to civil governance, now one, which erst were many made through variance. Then made he sacred laws, which some men say were unto him revealed in vision, by which he freed the traveller's highway, the church's part, and ploughman's portion, restraining stealth and strong extortion, the gracious Numa of Great Brittany. For till his days the chief dominion by strength was wielded without policy. Therefore he first wore crown of gold for dignity. Don Wallow died, for what may live for A, and left two sons of peerless prowess both, that sacked Rome too dearly did assay the recompense of their perjured oath, and ransacked Greece well tried when they were wroth. Besides subjected France and Germany, which yet their praises speak, all be they loath and inly tremble at the memory of Brennus and Belinus, kings of Brittany, Next them did Gurgant, great Belinus' son, in rule succeed, and eke in father's praise. He Easterland subdued, and Denmark won, and of them both did foy and tribute raise, the which was due in his dead father's days. He also gave to fugitives of Spain, whom he at sea found wandering from their ways, a seat in Ireland safely to remain, which they should hold of him as subject to retain. After him reigned Gwytheline his heir, the justest man and truest in his days, who had to wife Dame Mercia the fair, a woman worthy of immortal praise, which for this realm found many goodly lays, and wholesome statutes to her husband brought, her many deemed to have been of the fays, as was Egeria that Numa taught. Those yet of her be Mercian laws, both named and thought. Her son Sicilus after her did reign, and then Chimarus, and then Danius, next whom Orindus did the crown sustain, who, had he not with wrath outrageous and cruel rancor dimmed his valorous and mighty deeds, should match it have the best. As well in that same field victorious against the foreign Morans he expressed, yet lives his memory, though carcass sleep in rest. Five sons he left begotten of one wife, all which successively by turns did reign. First Gorboman, a man of virtuous life, next Archigald, who for his proud disdain deposed was from princedom sovereign, and piteous Elidor put in his stead, who shortly it to him restored again, till by his death he had recovered it, but Peridur and Vigent him disthronized. In wretched prison long he did remain, till they outreigned had their utmost date, and then therein receased was again, and ruled long with honorable state, till he surrendered realm and life to fate. Then all the sons of these five brethren reigned by due success, and all their nephews late. Even thrice eleven descents the crown retained, till aged Heli by due heritage it gained. He had two sons, whose eldest called Lud, 
left of his life most famous memory and endless monuments of his great good. The ruined walls he did re-edify of Troynovant against force of enemy, and built that gate which of his name is height, by which he lies entombed solemnly. He left two sons, two young to rule aright, Androgeus and Tenantius, pictures of his might. Whilst they were young, Cassibelain, their eme, was by the people chosen in their stead, who on him took the royal diadem, and goodly well long time it governed, till the proud Romans him disquieted, and warlike Caesar, tempted with the name of this sweet island never conquered, and envying the Britons' blazed fame, O oh, hideous hunger of dominion, hither came. Yet twice they were repulsed back again, and twice reinforced back to their ships to fly, the whiles with blood they all the shore did stain, and the grey ocean into purple dye. Nay had they footing found at last per die, had not Androgeus, false to native soil and envious of uncle's sovereignty, betrayed his country unto foreign spoil. Naught else but treason from the first this land did foil. So by him Caesar got the victory, through great bloodshed and many a sad assay, in which himself was charged heavily of hardy Nennius, whom he yet did slay, but lost his sword, yet to be seen this day. Thenceforth this land was tributary made to ambitious Rome, and did their rule obey, till Arthur all that reckoning did defray, yet oft the Britain kings against them strongly swayed. Next him Tenantius reigned, then Kimberline, what time the eternal lord in fleshly slime and womb it was, from wretched Adam's line to purge away the guilt of sinful crime. O oh, joyous memory of happy time, that heavenly grace so plenteously displayed! O oh, too high ditty for my simple rhyme! Soon after this the Romans him were raid, for that their tribute he refused to let be paid. Good Claudius, that next was emperor, an army brought, and with him battle fought, in which the king was by a treacher disguised slain, ere any thereof thought. Yet ceased not the bloody fight for aught, for Arveridge his brother's place supplied, both in his arms and crown, and by that draught did drive the Romans to the weaker side, that they to peace agreed. So all was pacified. Was never king more highly magnified, nor dread of Romans, than was Arveridge, for which the emperor to him allied his daughter Genuus in marriage. Yet shortly he renounced the vassalage of Rome again, who hither hastily sent Vespasian, that with great spoil and rage for wasted all, till Genuissa gent persuaded him to cease, and her lord to relent. He died, and him succeeded Marius, who joyed his days in great tranquillity. Then Coil, and after him good Lucius, that first received Christianity, the sacred pledge of Christ's evangelie. Yet true it is, that long before that day hither came Joseph of Arimathy, who brought with him the Holy Grail, they say, and preached the truth, but since it greatly did decay. This good king shortly without issue died, whereof great trouble in the kingdom grew, that did herself in sundry parts divide, and with her power her own self overthrew, whilst Romans daily did the weak subdue, which seeing stout Bunduca up arose, and taking arms the Britons to her drew, with whom she marched straight against her foes, and them unwares besides the Severn did enclose. There she with them a cruel battle tried, not with so good success as she deserved, by reason that the captains on her side corrupted by Paulinus from her swerved, yet such as were through former flight preserved, gathering again, her host she did renew, and with fresh courage on the victor served. But being all defeated save a few, rather than fly or be captived, herself she slew. O oh, famous monument of women's praise, matchable either to Semiramis, whom antique history so high doth raise, or to Hypsiphil, or to Thomaris. Her host two hundred thousand numbered is, who, whilst good fortune favoured her might, 
triumphed oft against her enemies. And yet, though overcome in hapless fight, she triumphed on death in enemies' despite. Her relics, fulgent having gathered, fought with Severus and him overthrew, yet in the chase was slain of them that fled. So made them victors whom he did subdue. Then can Carousius tyrannize anew, and gainst the Romans bent their proper power. But him Electus treacherously slew, and took on him the robe of emperor. Natheless the same enjoyed but short happy hour, for Asclepiad at him overcame, and left inglorious on the vanquished plain, without or robe or rag to hide his shame. Then afterwards he in his stead did reign, but shortly was by coil in battle slain, who, after long debate since Lucy's time, was of the Britons first crowned sovereign. Then gan this realm renew her passed prime, he of his name coiled Chester built of stone and lime. Which when the Romans heard, they hither sent Constantius, a man of mickle might, with whom King Coil made an agreement, and to him gave for wife his daughter bright, fair Helena, the fairest living white, who in all godly thews and goodly praise did far excel, but was most famous height for skill in music of all in her days, as well in curious instruments as cunning lays, of whom he did great Constantine beget, who afterward was emperor of Rome, to which, whilst absent he his mind did set, Octavius here leapt into his room, and it usurped by unrighteous doom. But he, his title justified by might, slaying Traherne, and having overcome the Roman legion in dreadful fight, so settled he his kingdom, and confirmed his right. But wanting issue male, his daughter dear he gave in wedlock to Maximian, and him with her made of his kingdom heir, who soon by means thereof the empire wan, till murdered by the friends of Gratian. Then gan the Huns and Picts invade this land during the reign of Maximinian, who dying left none heir them to withstand but that they overran all parts with easy hand. The weary Britons, whose war-able youth was by Maximian lately led away, with wretched miseries and woeful ruth, were to those pagans made an open prey, and daily spectacle of sad decay, whom Roman wars, which now four hundred years and more had wasted, could no whit dismay, till by consent of commons and of peers they crowned the second Constantine with joyous tears, who, having oft in battle vanquished those spoilful Picts and swarming Easterlings, long time in peace his realm established, yet oft annoyed with sundry board ragings of neighbor Scots and foreign scatterlings, with which the world did in those days abound which to outbar, with painful pionings, from sea to sea he heaped a mighty mound, which from Alquid to Penwelt did that border bound. Three sons he dying left all under age, by means whereof their uncle Vortigier usurped the crown during their pupilage, which the infant's tutor gathering to fear, them closely into armor did bear, for dread of whom, and for those Picts a noise, he sent to Germany strange aid to rear, from whence eftsoons arrived here three hoys of Saxons, whom he for his safety employs. Two brethren were their capitans, which I tengest and horses, well approved in war, and both of them men of renowned might, who, making vantage of their civil jar, and of those foreigners which came from far, grew great, and got large portions of land, that in the realm ere long they stronger are than they which sought at first their helping hand, and vortiture enforced the kingdom to a band. But by the help of Vortimir his son, he is again into his rule restored, and Hengist, seeming sad for that was done, receive it is to grace and due accord, through his fair daughter's face and flattering word. Soon after which, three hundred lords he slew of British blood, all sitting at his board, whose doleful monuments who list to rue the eternal marks of treason may at Stonehenge view. 
By this, the sons of Constantine, which fled, Ambrose and Uther, did ripe years attain, and here arriving strongly challenged the crown which Vortiger did long detain, who, flying from his guilt, by them was slain, and Hengist eke soon brought to shameful death. Thenceforth Aurelius peaceably did reign, till that through poison stopped was his breath, so now entombed lies at Stonehenge by the heath. After him Uther, which Pendragon hight, succeeding, there abruptly it did end, without full point or other seizure right, as if the rest some wicked hand did rend, or the author self could not at least attend to finish it, that so untimely breach the prince himself half seemed to offend, yet secret pleasure did offence impeach, and wonder of antiquity long stopped his speech. At last, quite ravished with delight to hear the royal offspring of his native land, cried out, Dear country, oh, how dearly dear ought thy remembrance and perpetual band be to thy foster child, that from thy hand did common breath and nourishment receive. How brutish is it not to understand how much to her we owe, that all us gave, that gave unto us all whatever good we have. But Guyon, all this while his book did read, nay yet has ended, for it was a great and ample volume that doth far exceed my leisure, so long leaves here to repeat. It told how first Prometheus did create a man of many parts from beasts derived, and then stole fire from heaven to animate his work, for which he was by Jove deprived of life himself, and heartstrings of an eagle rived. That man so made, he called it Elf, to wheat quick, the first author of all elf in kind, who, wandering through the world with weary feet, did in the gardens of Adonis find a goodly creature whom he deemed in mind to be no earthly white, but either sprite or angel, the author of all womankind. Therefore a fay he her according height, of whom all fairies spring and fetch their lineage right. Of these a mighty people shortly grew, and puissant kings which all the world wore aid, and to themselves all nations did subdue. The first and eldest which that scepter swayed was Elfin, him all India obeyed, and all that now America men call. Next him was noble Elfinan, who laid Cleopolis' foundation first of all, but Elphiline enclosed it with a golden wall. His son was Elphinel, who overcame the wicked goblins in bloody field. But Elphant was of most renowned fame, who all of crystal did Penthea build. Then Elphar, who two brethren giants killed, the one of which had two heads, the other three. Then Elphinor, who was in magic skill. He built by art upon the glassy sea a bridge of brass, whose sound heaven's thunder seemed to be. He left three sons, the which in order reigned, and all their offspring in their due descents, even seven hundred princes, which maintained with mighty deeds their sundry governments, that were too long their infinite contents here to record, nay much material. Yet should they be most famous monuments and brave example both of martial and civil rule to kings and states imperial. After all these Elphiclius did reign, the wise Elphiclius, in great majesty, who mightily that scepter did sustain, and with rich spoils and famous victory did high advance the crown of fairy. He left two sons, of which fair Elpharon, the eldest brother, did untimely die, whose empty place the mighty Oberon doubly supplied in spousal and dominion. Great was his power and glory over all which him before that sacred seat did fill, that yet remains his wide memorial. He dying left the fairest Tenaquil, him to succeed therein by his last will. Fairer and nobler liveth none this hour, ne like in grace, ne like in learned skill. Therefore they Glorian call that glorious flower. Long mayst thou Glorian live in glory and great power. 
beguiled thus with delight of novelties and natural desire of country state, so long they read in those antiquities that how the time was fled they quite forgate, till gentle Alma, seeing it so late, perforce their studies broke, and then besought to think how supper did them long await. So half unwilling from their books them brought, and fairly feasted, as so noble knights she ought. The enemies of temperance besiege her dwelling place. Prince Arthur them repels, and foul Meleager doth deface. What war so cruel, or what siege so sore, as that which strong affections do apply against the fort of reason evermore, bring the soul into captivity? Their force is fiercer through infirmity of the frail flesh, relenting to their rage, and exercise most bitter tyranny upon the parts brought into her bondage. No wretchedness is like to sinful bellinage, but in a body which doth freely yield his parts to reason's rule obedient, and letteth her that ought the scepter wield, all happy peace and goodly government is settled there in sure establishment. There Alma, like a virgin queen most bright, doth flourish in all beauty excellent, and to her guests doth bounteous banquet dight, a tempered goodly well for health and for delight. Early before the morn, with crimson ray, the windows of bright heaven opened had, through which into the world the dawning day might look, that maketh every creature glad, uprose Sir Gion in bright armor clad, and to his purposed journey him prepared. With him the palmer, eke in habit sad, himself addressed to that adventure hard. So to the river's side they both together fared. Where them awaited ready at the ford the ferryman, as Alma had behight, with his well-rigged boat. They go aboard, and he eftsoons gan launch his bark forthright. Ere long they rowed were quite out of sight, and fast the land behind them fled away. But let them pass, whiles wind and weather right to serve their turns, here I a while must stay to see a cruel fight done by the prince this day. For all so soon as Gion thence was gone upon his voyage with his trusty guide, that wicked band of villains fresh begone that castle to assail on every side, and lay strong siege about it far and wide. So huge and infinite their numbers were, that all the lands they under them did hide, so foul and ugly, that exceeding fear their visages impressed, when they approached near. Them in twelve troops their captain did dispart, and round about in fittest steads did place, where each might best offend his proper part, and his contrary object most deface, as every one seemed meetest in that case. Seven of the same against the castle gate in strong entrenchments he did closely place, which with incessant force and endless hate they battered day and night, and entrance did await. The other five, five sundry ways he set against the five great bulwarks of that pile, and unto each a bulwark did aret, to sail with open force or hidden guile, in hope thereof to win victorious spoil. They all that charge did fervently apply with greedy malice and importune toil, and planted there their huge artillery, with which they daily made most dreadful battery. The first troop was a monstrous rabblement of foul misshapen whites, of which some were headed like owls with becks uncomely bent, others like dogs, others like griffins drear, and some had wings, and some had claws to tear, and every one of them had lince's eyes, and every one did bow and arrows bear. All those were lawless lusts, corrupt envies, and covetous aspects, all cruel enemies. Those same against the bulwark of the sight did lay strong siege and battleless assault. Nay once did yield it respite day nor night. But soon as Titan gan his head exalt, and soon again as he his light with halt, their wicked engines they against it bent, that is, each thing by which the eyes may fault. But two, then all, more huge and violent, beauty and money, they that bulwark sorely rent. The second bulwark was the hearing sense, against which the second troop designment makes, deformed creatures in strange difference, some having heads like hearts, some like to snakes, some like wild boars late roused out of the brakes, slanderous reproaches and foul infamies, 
leasings, backbitings, and vainglorious crakes, bad counsels, praises, and false flatteries, all those against that fort did bend their batteries. Likewise that same third fort, that is the smell, of that third troop was cruelly assayed, whose hideous shapes were like to fiends of hell, some like to hounds, some like to apes dismayed, some like to puttocks, all in plumes arrayed, all shaped according their conditions, for by those ugly forms wherein portrayed foolish delights and fond abusions, which do that sense besiege with light illusions. And that fourth band, which cruel battery bent against the fourth bulwark, that is the taste, was, as the rest, a greasy rabblement, some mouthed like greedy ostriches, some faced like loathly toads, some fashioned in the waist like swine, for so deformed is luxury, surfeit, misdiet, and unthrifty waste, vain feasts, and idle superfluity, all those this senses for to sail incessantly. But the fifth troop, most horrible of hue, and fierce of force, was dreadful to report, for some like snails, some did like spiders shoe, and some like ugly urchins thick and short. Cruelly they assailed that fifth fort, armed with darts of sensual delight, with stings of carnal lust, and strong effort of feeling pleasures, with which day and night against that same fifth bulwark they continued fight. Thus these twelve troops, with dreadful puissance against that castle, restless siege did lay, and evermore their hideous ordinance upon the bulwarks cruelly did play, that now it gan to threaten near decay, and evermore their wicked capitaine provoked them the breaches to assay, sometimes with threats, sometimes with hope of gain, which by the ransack of that peace they should attain. On the other side, the sieged castle's ward, their steadfast stones did mightily maintain, and many bold repulse and many hard achievement wrought, with peril and with pain, that goodly frame from ruin to sustain. And those two brethren giants did defend the walls so stoutly with their sturdy main, that never entrance any durst pretend, but they to direful death their groaning ghosts did send. The noble virgin, lady of the place, was much dismayed with that dreadful sight, for never was she in so evil case, till that the prince, seeing her woeful plight, gan her recomfort from so sad a fright, offering his service and his dearest life for her defense against that carl to fight which was their chief and author of that strife, she him remercied as the patron of her life. Eftsoons himself in glitter and arms he dight, and his well-proved weapons to him hent. So, taking courteous congee, he behight those gates to be unbarred, and forth he went. Fair moti see, the prowest and most gent that ever brandished bright steel on high, whom soon as that unruly rabblement with his gay squire issuing did espy, they reared a most outrageous dreadful yelling cry and therewithal at once at him let fly their fluttering arrows, thick as flakes of snow, and round about him flock impetuously, like a great water-flood that, tumbling low from the high mountains, threats to overflow with sudden fury all the fertile plain, and the sad husbandman's long hope doth throw adown the stream, and all his vows make vain. Nor bounds, nor banks his headlong ruin may sustain, Upon his shield their heaped hail he bore, and with his sword dispersed the rascal flocks, which fled asunder, and him fell before, as withered leaves dropped from their dryad stalks when the wroth western wind does reave their locks. And underneath him his courageous steed, the fierce Spumador, trod them down like docks, the fierce Spumador born of heavenly seed, such as Laomedon of Phoebus' race did breed which sudden horror and confused cry, when as their captain heard, in haste he yowed the cause to wheat, and fault to remedy. Upon a tiger swift and fierce he rode, that as the wind ran underneath his load, whilst his long legs nigh wrought unto the ground, for large he was of limb and shoulders broad, but of such subtle substance and unsound, that like a ghost he seemed, whose grave clothes were unbound. 
and in his hand a bended bow was seen, and many arrows under his right side, all deadly dangerous, all cruel keen, headed with flint and feathers bloody dyed, such as the Indians in their quivers hide. Those could he well direct, and straight as line, and bid them strike the mark which he had eyed. Ne'er was their salve, ne'er was their medicine, that mote recure their wounds, so inly they did tine. As pale and wan as ashes was his look, his body lean and meager as a rake, and skin all withered like a dried rook, thereto as cold and dreary as a snake, that seemed to tremble evermore and quake. All in a canvas thin he was bedight, and girded with a belt of twisted brake. Upon his head he wore an helmet light made of a dead man's skull, that seemed a ghastly sight. Maleager was his name, and after him there followed fast at hand two wicked hags, with hoary locks all loose and visage grim, their feet unshod, their bodies wrapped in rags, and both as swift on foot as chased stags. And yet the one her other leg had lame, which with a staff all full of little snags she did support, and impotence her name. But the other was impatience, armed with raging flame. Soon as the carl from far the princess spied glistering in arms and warlike ornament, his beast he fellly pricked on either side, and his mischievous bow full ready bent, with which at him a cruel shaft he sent. But he was wary, and it warded well upon his shield, that it no further went, but to the ground the idle quarrel fell. Then he another and another did expel, which to prevent, the prince his mortal spear soon to him wrought, and fierce at him did ride to be avenged of that shot while e'er. But he was not so hardy to abide that bitter stound, but turning quick aside his light-foot beast, fled fast away for fear. Whom to pursue, the infant after hide, as fast as his good courser could him bear. But labor lost it was to ween approach him near. For as the winged wind his tiger fled, that view of eye could scarce him overtake, and scarce his feet on ground were seen to tread. Through hills and dales he speedy way did make, and a hedge and a ditch his ready passage break, and in his flight the villain turned his face, as once the Tartar by the Caspian lake, when as the Russian him in fight does chase, unto his tiger's tail, and shot at him apace. Apace he shot, and yet he fled apace, still as the greedy knight nigh to him drew, and oftentimes he would relent his pace, that him his foe more fiercely should pursue, who, when his uncouth manner he did view, he gan advise to follow him no more, but keep his standing and his shafts as chew, until he quite had spent his perilous store, and then assail him fresh, ere he could shift for more. But that lame hag, still as abroad he strew his wicked arrows, gathered them again, and to him brought fresh battle to renew, which he espying cast her to restrain from yielding succor to that cursed swain, and her attaching thought her hands to tie. But soon as him dismounted on the plain, that other hag did far away espy, binding her sister, she to him ran hastily, and catching hold of him, as down he leant, him backward overthrew, and down him stayed with their rude hands and grisly grapplement, till that the villain, coming to their aid, upon him fell and load upon him laid, Full little wanted, but he had him slain, and of the battle baleful end had made, had not his gentle squire beheld his pain, and come unto his rescue ere his bitter bane. So greatest and most glorious thing on ground may often need the help of weaker hand, so feeble is man's state and life unsound, that in assurance it may never stand, till it dissolved be from earthly band. Proof be thou, prince, the proudest man alive, and noblest born of all in Britain land. Yet thee fierce fortune did so nearly drive, that had not grace thee blessed, thou shouldest not survive. The squire arriving, fiercely in his arms snatched first the one, and then the other jade, his chiefest lets and authors of his harms, and them perforce withheld with threatened blade, lest that his lord they should behind invade. The whiles the prince, pricked with reproachful shame, as one awaked out of long slumbering shade, 
reviving thought of glory and of fame, united all his powers to purge himself from blame. Like as a fire, the which in hollow cave hath long been under kept and down suppressed, with murmurous disdain doth inly rave and grudge, in so strait prison to be pressed, at last breaks forth with furious unrest, and strives to mount unto his native seat. All that did erst did hinder and molest, it now devours with flames and scorching heat, and carries into smoke with rage and horror great. So mightily the Briton prince him roused out of his hold, and broke his caitive bands, and as a bear whom angry curs have toused, having off shaked them and escaped their hands, becomes more fell, and all that him withstands treads down and overthrows. Now had the carl alighted from his tiger, and his hands discharged of his bow in deadly quarrel, to seize upon his foe flat lying on the marl which now him turned to disadvantage dear, for neither can he fly, nor other harm, but trust unto his strength and manhood mere, sith now he is far from his monstrous swarm, and of his weapons did himself disarm. The knight, yet wrathful for his late disgrace, fiercely advanced his valorous right arm, and him so sore smote with his iron mace, that groveling to the ground he fell, and filled his place. Well weened he that field was then his own, and all his labor brought to happy end, when sudden up the villain overthrown out of his swoon arose, fresh to contend, and gan himself to second battle bend, as hurt he had not been. Thereby there lay an huge great stone, which stood upon one end, and had not been removed many a day. Some landmark seemed to be or sign of sundry way. The same he snatched, and with exceeding sway threw at his foe, who was right well aware to shun the engine of his meant decay. It booted not to think that throw to bear, but ground he gave, and lightly leapt a rear, eft fierce returning, as a falcon fair, that once hath failed of her souse full near, remounts again into the open air, and unto better fortune doth herself prepare. So brave returning with his brandished blade, he to the carl himself again addressed, and struck at him so sternly that he made an open passage through his riven breast, that half the steel behind his back did rest, which drawing back, he looked evermore when the heart blood should gush out of his chest, or his dead corse should fall upon the floor. But his dead corse upon the floor fell nay the more, nay drop of blood appeared shed to be all with a wound so wide and wondrous that through his carcass one might plainly see. Half in amaze with horror hideous, and half in rage to be deluded thus, again through both the sides he struck him quite, that made his sprite to groan full piteous. Yet nor the more forth fled his groaning sprite, but freshly as at first prepared himself to fight. Thereat he smitten was with great affright, and trembling terror did his heart appall. Ne wist he what to think of that same sight, ne what to say, ne what to do at all. He doubted lest it were some magical illusion that did beguile his sense, or wandering ghost that wanted funeral, or airy spirit under false pretense, or hellish fiend raised up through devilish science. His wonder far exceeded reason's reach, that he began to doubt his dazzled sight, and oft of error did himself a peach. Flesh without blood, a person without sprite, Wounds without hurt, a body without might, That could do harm, yet could not harm it be, That could not die, yet seemed a mortal white, That was most strong in most infirmity. Like did he never hear, like did he never see. A while he stood in this astonishment, Yet would he not, for all his great dismay, give over to effect his first intent, and that most means of victory assay, or that most issue of his own decay. His own good sword Mordure, that never failed at need till now, he lightly threw away, and his bright shield that naught him now availed, and with his naked hands him forcibly assailed, twixt his two mighty arms, him up he snatched and crushed his carcass so against his breast that the disdainful soul he thence dispatched, 
and idle breath all utterly expressed. Though, when he felt him dead, adown he cast the lumpish corse unto the senseless ground, adown he cast it with so puissant rest that back again it did aloft rebound, and gave against his mother earth a groanful sound. As when Jove's harness-bearing bird from high stoops at a flying heron, with proud disdain, the stone-dead quarry falls so forcibly that it rebounds against the lowly plain, a second fall redoubling back again. Then thought the prince all peril sure was past, and that he victor only did remain. No sooner thought than that the carl as fast gan heap huge strokes on him as ere he down was cast. Nigh his wit's end then walks the mazed knight, and thought his labor lost and travel vain against this lifeless shadow so to fight. Yet life he saw and felt his mighty mane, that whilst he marveled still did still him pain. For thee he gan some other ways advise how to take life from that dead living swain, whom still he marked freshly to arise from the earth, and from her womb new spirits to reprise. He then remembered well that had been said how Thirth his mother was, and first him bore. She eke, so often as his life decayed, did life with usury to him restore, and raised him up much stronger than before, so soon as he unto her womb did fall. Therefore to ground he would him cast no more, nay him commit to grave terrestrial, but bear him far from hope of succor usual. Though up he caught him twixt his puissant hands, and, having screwed out of his carrion course the loathful life, now loosed from sinful bands, upon his shoulders carried him perforce above three furlongs, taking his full course, until he came unto a standing lake. Him thereinto he threw without remorse, ne stirred, till hope of life did him forsake. So end of that Carl's days, and his own pains did make which, when those wicked hags from far did spy, like two mad dogs they ran about the lands, and one of them with dreadful yelling cry, throwing away her broken chains and bands, and having quenched her burning firebrands, headlong herself did cast into that lake. But impotence, with her own willful hands, one of Meleager's cursed darts did take, so rived her trembling heart, and wicked end did make. Thus now alone he conqueror remains, though, coming to his squire that kept his steed, thought to have mounted, but his feeble veins him failed thereto, and served not his need, through loss of blood which from his wounds did bleed, that he began to faint, and life decay. But his good squire, him helping up with speed, with steadfast hand upon his horse did stay, and led him to the castle by the beaten way where many grooms and squires ready were to take him from his steed full tenderly, and eke the fairest Alma met him there with balm and wine and costly spicery to comfort him in his infirmity. Eftsoons she caused him up to be conveyed, and of his arms despoil it easily. In sumptuous bed she made him to be laid, and all the while his wounds were dressing, by him stayed. Guyon, by Palmer's governance, passing through perils great, doth overthrow the bower of bliss and accresy defeat. Now gins this goodly frame of temperance fairly to rise, and her adorned head, to prick of highest praise, forth to advance, formerly grounded and fast settled on firm foundation of true bounty head. And this brave knight that for that virtue fights, now comes to point of that same perilous stead where pleasure dwells in sensual delights, amongst thousand dangers and ten thousand magic mites. Two days now in that sea he sailed has, ne ever land beheld, ne living wight, ne aught save peril, still as he did pass. Though when appeared the third morrow bright upon the waves to spread her trembling light, an hideous roaring far away they heard, that all their senses filled with affright, and straight they saw the raging surges reared up to the skies, that them of drowning made afeard. Said then the boatman, Palmer, 
steer aright, and keep an even course, for yonder way we needs must pass. God do us well acquite, that is the gulf of greediness, they say, that deep engorgeth all this world as prey, which having swallowed up excessively, he soon in vomit up again doth lay, and belcheth forth his superfluity, that all the seas for fear do seem a way to fly. On the other side an hideous rock is pite of mighty magnus stone, whose craggy cliff, depending from on high dreadful to sight, over the waves his rugged arms doth lift, and threateneth down to throw his ragged rift on whoso cometh nigh. Yet nigh it draws all passengers that none from it can shift, for whiles they fly that gulf's devouring jaws, they on this rock are rent and sunk in helpless walls. Forward they pass, and strongly he them rose, until they nigh unto that gulf arrive, where stream more violent and greedy grows. Then he with all his puissance doth strive to strike his oars, and mightily doth drive the hollow vessel through the threatful wave, which gaping wide to swallow them alive in the huge abyss of his engulfing grave, doth roar at them in vain, and with great terror rave. They passing by, that grisly mouth did see sucking the seas into his entrails deep, that seemed more horrible than hell to be, or that dark dreadful hole of tartar steep, through which the damned ghosts done often creep back to the world, bad livers to torment. But not that falls into this direful deep, nay that approacheth nigh the wide descent, may back return, but is condemned to be drent. On the other side they saw that perilous rock threatening itself on them to ruinate, on whose sharp clifts the ribs of vessels broke and shivered ships which had been wrecked late, yet stuck, with carcasses exanimate of such as, having all their substance spent on wanton joys and lusts intemperate, did afterwards make shipwreck violent, both of their life and fame, for ever foully blent. For thee this height the rock of vile reproach, a dangerous and detestable place, to which nor fish nor fowl did once approach, but yelling mews with seagulls hoarse and base, and cormorants with birds of ravenous race, which still sat waiting on that wasteful cliff for spoil of wretches, whose unhappy case after lost credit and consumed thrift, at last them driven hath to this despairful drift. The palmer, seeing them in safety past, thus said, Behold examples in our sights of lustful luxury and thriftless waste. What now is left of miserable whites, which spent their looser days in lewd delights, but shame and sad reproach, here to be read by these rent relics, speaking their ill plights? Let all that live hereby be counselled to shun rock of reproach, and it as death to dread. So forth they row it, and that ferryman with his stiff oars did brush the seas so strong that the hoar waters from his frigate ran, and the light bubbles danced all along, whilst the salt brine out of the billows sprung. At last, far off, they many islands spy, on every side floating the floods among. Then said the knight, Lo, I the land descry. Therefore, old sire, thy course do thereunto apply. That may not be, said then the ferryman, lest we unweeting hap to be fordone. For those same islands, seeming now and then, are not firm land, nor any certain one, but straggling plots which to and fro do run in the wide waters. Therefore are they hight the wandering islands. Therefore do them shun, for they have oft drawn many a wandering white into most deadly danger and distressed plight. Yet well they seem to him that far doth view both fair and fruitful, and the ground is spread with grassy green of delectable hue, and the tall trees with leaves apparelled are decked with blossoms dyed in white and red that mote the passengers there to allure. But whosoever once hath fastened his foot thereon may never it recure, but wandereth evermore uncertain and unsure. As thy of Delos, while o men report, amid the Gian Sea long time did stray, ne made for shipping any certain port, 
till that Latona, travelling that way, flying from Juno's wrath and hard assay, of her fair twins was there delivered, which afterwards did rule the night and day. Thenceforth it firmly was established, and for Apollo's honour highly harried. They to him hearken as beseemeth meet, and pass on forward. So their way does lie that one of those same islands, which do fleet in the wide sea, they needs must pass and by, which seemed so sweet and pleasant to the eye, that it would tempt a man to touch in there. Upon the bank they sitting did espy a dainty damsel, dressing of her hair, by whom a little skippet floating did appear. She them espying, loud to them can call, bidding them nigher drawn to the shore, for she had cause to busy them withal, and therewith loudly laughed. But now the more would they once turn, but kept on as afore, which when she saw, she left her locks undight, and running to her boat without an oar, from the departing land it launched light, and after them did drive with all her power and might, whom overtaking she in merry sort them gan to board and purpose diversely, now feigning dalliance and wanton sport, now throwing forth lewd words immodestly, till that the palmer gan full bitterly her to rebuke for being loose and light, which not abiding but more scornfully scoffing at him that did her justly white, she turned her boat about and from them row it quite. That was the wanton Phaedria, which late did ferry him over the idle lake, whom not regarding, they kept on their gate, and all her vain allurements did forsake. When them the wary boatman thus bespake, Here now behoveth us well to advise, and of our safety good heed to take, for here before a perilous passage lies, where many mermaids haunt, making false melodies. But by the way there is a great quicksand, and a whirlpool of hidden jeopardy. Therefore, Sir Palmer, keep an even hand, for twixt them both the narrow way doth lie. Scarce had he said, when hard at hand they spy that quicksand nigh with water cover it. But by the checkered wave they did descry it plain, and by the sea discolour it. It called was the quicksand of unthrifty head. They passing by a goodly ship did see, laden from far with precious merchandise, and bravely furnished a ship might be, which through great disadventure, or misprise, herself had run into that hazard eyes, whose mariners and merchants with much toil laboured in vain to have recured their prize, and the rich wares to save from piteous spoil, but neither toil nor travel might her back recoil. On the other side they see that perilous pool that called was the whirlpool of decay, in which full many had with hapless duel been sunk, of whom no memory did stay, whose circled waters wrapped with whirling sway like to a restless wheel still running round did covet as they passed by that way to draw their boat within the utmost bound of his wide labyrinth, and then to have them drowned. But thiefful boatman strongly forth did stretch his brawny arms, and all his body strain, that that most sandy beach they shortly fetch, whilst the dread danger does behind remain. Sudden they see from midst of all the main the surging waters like a mountain rise, and the great sea puffed up with proud disdain to swell above the measure of his guise, as threatening to devour all that his power despise. The waves come rolling, and the billows roar outrageously, as they enraged were. Or wrathful Neptune did them drive before his whirling chariot for exceeding fear, for not one puff of wind there did appear, that all the three thereat walks much afraid, unweeting what such horror strange did rear. Eftsoons they saw an hideous host arrayed of huge sea monsters, such as living sense dismayed. Most ugly shapes and horrible aspects, such as Dame Nature's self mote fear to see, or shame that ever should so foul defects from her most cunning hand escaped be, all dreadful portraits of deformity, spring-headed hydras and sea-shouldering whales, great whirlpools which all fishes make to flee, bright scolopendries armed with silver scales, mighty monoceroses with immeasured tails.
the dreadful fish that hath deserved the name of death, and like him looks in dreadful hue, the grisly waterman that makes his game the flying ships with swiftness to pursue, the horrible sea satyr that doth shew his fearful face in time of greatest storm, huge Xiphias, who mariners eschew no less than rocks, as travellers inform, and greedy rosmarines with visages deform. All these, and thousand thousands, many more, and more deformed monsters thousandfold, with dreadful noise and hollow rumbling roar, came rushing in the foamy waves and rolled, which seemed to fly for fear them to behold. Nay wonder if these did the night appall, for all that here on earth we dreadful hold be but as bugs to fear and babes withal, compared to the creatures in the seas and trawl. Fear not, then said the palmer well advised, for these same monsters are not these indeed, but are into these fearful shapes disguised by that same wicked witch, to work us dread, and draw from on this journey to proceed. Though lifting up his virtuous staff on high, he smote the sea, which calm it was with speed, and all that dreadful army fast gan fly into great Tethys bosom, where they hidden lie. Quit from that danger, forth their course they kept, and as they went, they heard a rueful cry of one that wailed and pitifully wept, that through the sea the resounding plaints did fly. At last they in an island did espy a seemly maiden, sitting by the shore, that with great sorrow and sad agony seemed some great misfortune to deplore, and loud to them for succor call it evermore which Guyon, hearing straight his palmer bade to steer the boat towards that doleful maid, that he might know and ease her sorrow sad, who, him advising better, to him said, Fair sir, be not displeased if disobeyed, for ill it were to hearken to her cry, for she is inly nothing ill apaid, but only womanish fine forgery your stubborn heart to affect with frail infirmity. To which, when she your courage hath inclined through foolish pity, then her guileful bait she will embosom deeper in your mind, and for your ruin at the last await. The night was ruled, and the boatman straight held on his course with stayed steadfastness, nay ever shrunk, nay ever sought to bait his tired arms for toilsome weariness, but with his oars did sweep the watery wilderness. And now... They nigh approached to the stead whereas those mermaids dwelt. It was a still and calmy bay, on the one side sheltered with the broad shadow of an hoary hill, on the other side an high rock towered still, that twixt them both a pleasant port they made, and did like an half-theatre fulfill. There those five sisters had continual trade, and used to bathe themselves in that deceitful shade. They were fair ladies, till they fondly strived with Thaliconian maids for maestery, of whom they overcommon were deprived of their proud beauty, and one moiety transformed to fish for their bold circuitry, but the upper half their hue retained still, and their sweet skill in wanted melody, which ever after they abused to ill, to lure weak travellers, whom gotten they did kill. So now to Guyon as he passed by, their pleasant tunes they sweetly thus applied. O thou fair son of gentle fairy, that art in mighty arms most magnified above all knights that ever battle tried, O turn thy rudder hitherward a while, here may thy storm-bet vessel safely ride. This is the port of rest from troublous toil, the world's sweet inn from pain and wearisome turmoil. With that, the rolling sea, resounding soft in his big bass, them fitly answered, and on the rock the waves breaking aloft, a solemn mien unto them measured. The while sweet Zephyrus loud whistled his treble, a strange kind of harmony, which Guyan senses softly tickled, that he the boatman bade row easily, and let him hear some part of their rare melody. But him the palmer from that vanity with temperate advice discounseled, that they had passed, and shortly gan descry the land to which their course they leveled, when suddenly a gross fog overspread with his dull vapour all that desert has, 
and heaven's cheerful face envelope it, that all things one and one as nothing was, and this great universe seemed one confused mass. Thereat they greatly were dismayed, ne wist how to direct their way in darkness wide, but feared to wander in that wasteful mist for tumbling into mischief unespied. Worse is the danger hidden than descried. Suddenly an innumerable flight of harmful fowls about them fluttering cried, and with their wicked wings them oft did smite, and sore annoyed, groping in that grisly night. Even all the nation of unfortunate and fatal birds about them flocked were, such as by nature men abhor and hate. The ill-faced owl, death's dreadful messenger, the hoarse night-raven, trump of doleful drear, the leather-winged bat, day's enemy, the rueful stritch, still waiting on the bier, the whistler shrill, that whoso hears doth die, the hellish harpies, prophets of sad destiny. All those, and all that else does horror breed, about them flew, and filled their sails with fear. Yet stayed they not, but forward did proceed, whilst the one did row, and the other stiffly steer, till that at last the weather gan to clear, and the fair land itself did plainly show. Said then the palmer, Lo, where does appear the sacred soil where all our perils grow? Therefore, Sir Knight, your ready arms about you throw. He hearkened, and his arms about him took, the whiles the nimble boat so well her sped, that with her crooked keel the land she struck. Then forth the noble Guyon sallied, and his sage palmer that him governed, but the other by his boat behind did stay. They marched fairly forth of naught a dread, both firmly armed for every hard assay, with constancy and care, gainst danger and dismay. Ere long they heard an hideous bellowing of many beasts that roared outrageously, as if that hunger's point or Venus' sting had them enraged with fell circuitry. Yet not they feared, but passed on hardily until they came in view of those wild beasts, who all at once gaping full greedily and rearing fiercely their upstarting crests, ran towards to devour those unexpected guests. But soon as they approached with deadly threat, the palmer over them his staff upheld, his mighty staff that could all charms defeat. Eftsoons their stubborn courages were quelled, and high advanced crests down meekly felled. Instead of fraying, they themselves did fear, and trembled as them passing they beheld. Such wondrous power did in that staff appear, all monsters to subdue to him that did it bear. Of that same wood it framed was cunningly, of which Caduceus whilom was made, Caduceus the rod of Mercury with which he once the Stygian realms invade, through ghastly horror and eternal shade. The infernal fiends with it he can assuage, and Orcus tame, whom nothing can persuade, and rule the furies when they most do rage. Such virtue in his staff had eke this palmer sage. Thence passing forth they shortly do arrive, whereas the bower of bliss was situate, a place picked out by choice of best alive, that nature's work by art can imitate, in which whatever in this worldly state is sweet and pleasing unto living sense, or that made daintiest fantasy a great, was poured forth with plentiful dispense, and made there to abound with lavish affluence. Goodly it was enclosed round about, as well there entered guests to keep within, as those unruly beasts to hold without. Yet was the fence thereof but weak and thin, not feared their force, that fortilage to win, but wisdom's power and temperance's might, by which the mightiest things have force had been. And eke the gate was wrought of substance light rather for pleasure than for battery or fight. It framed was of precious ivory, that seemed a work of admirable wit, and therein all the famous history of Jason and Medea was writ, her mighty charms, her furious loving fit, his goodly conquest of the golden fleece, his false faith and love too lightly flit, the wondered Argo which in ventrous peace first through the Euxine sea bore all the flower of Greece, he might have seen the frothy billows fry under the ship 
As there are them she went, that seemed the waves were into ivory, or ivory into the waves were sent, and otherwhere, the snowy substance strent with vermil, like the boy's blood therein shed, a piteous spectacle did represent, and other whiles with gold besprinkled, it seemed the enchanted flame which did Creusa wed. All this and more might in that goodly gate be read, that ever open stood to all which thither came. But in the porch there sate a comely personage of stature tall, and semblance pleasing more than natural, that travellers to him seemed to entice. His looser garment to the ground did fall, and flew about his heels in wanton wise, not fit for speedy pace or manly exercise. They in that place him genius did call, not that celestial power, to whom the care of life and generation of all that lives pertains in charge particular, who wondrous things concerning our welfare and strange phantoms doth let us oft foresee, and oft of secret ill bids us beware, that is our self, whom though we do not see, yet each doth in himself it well perceive to be. Therefore a god him sage antiquity did wisely make, and good adjustes call. But this same was to that quite contrary, the foe of life, that good envies to all, that secretly doth us procure to fall, through guileful semblance which he makes us see. He of this garden had the governal, and pleasure's porter was devised to be, holding a staff in hand for more formality. With diverse flowers he daintily was decked, and strowed round about, and by his side a mighty mazer bowl of wine was set, as if it had to him been sacrificed. Wherewith all newcome guests he gratified, so did he eke Sir Guyon passing by, but he his idle courtesy defied, and overthrew his bowl disdainfully, and broke his staff with which he charmed semblance sly. Thus being entered, they behold around a large and spacious plain, on every side strowed with pleasance, whose fair grassy ground mantled with green and goodly beautified with all the ornaments of Flora's pride, wherewith her mother art, as half in scorn of niggard nature, like a pompous bride did deck her, and too lavishly adorn, when forth from virgin bower she comes in early morn. There to the heavens, always jovial, looked on them lovely, still in steadfast state, ne suffered storm nor frost on them to fall, their tender buds or leaves to violate, nor scorching heat nor cold intemperate to afflict the creatures which therein did dwell. But the mild air, with season moderate, gently attempered, and disposed so well that still it breathed forth sweet spirit and wholesome smell more sweet and wholesome than the pleasant hill of Rhodope, on which the nymph that bore a giant babe herself for grief did kill, or the Thessalian Tempe, where of your fair Daphne Phoebus' heart with love did gore, or Ida, where the gods loved to repair, whenever they their heavenly bowers forlore, or sweet Parnass, the haunt of muses fair, or Eden's self, if aught with Eden mote compare. Much wondered Guyon at the fair aspect of that sweet place, yet suffered no delight to sink into his sense, nor mind effect, but passed forth and looked still forward right, bridling his will and maistering his might, till that he came unto another gate, no gate, but like one, being goodly dight with boughs and branches, which did broad dilate their clasping arms in wanton wreathings intricate. So fashioned a porch with rare device arched overhead with an embracing vine, whose bunches hanging down seemed to entice all passers-by to taste their luscious wine, and did themselves into their hands incline as freely offering to be gathered some deep empurpled as the hyacinth, some as the rubain laughing sweetly red, some like fair emeralds not yet well ripened, and them amongst some were of burnished gold, so made by art to beautify the rest, which did themselves amongst the leaves enfold as lurking from the view of covetous guests, that the weak boughs with so rich load oppressed 
did bow adown as overburden it. Under that porch a comely dame did rest clad in fair weeds, but foul disordered, and garments loose that seemed unmeet for womanhead. In her left hand a cup of gold she held, and with her right the riper fruit did reach, whose sappy liquor, that with fullness swelled, into her cup she screws, with dainty breach of her fine fingers, without foul impeach, that so fair winepress made the wine more sweet. Thereof she used to give to drink to each whom passing by she happened to meet. It was her guise, all strangers, goodly so to greet. So she to Guyon offered it to taste, who, taking it out of her tender hand, the cup to ground did violently cast, that all in pieces it was broken fond, and with the liquor stained all the lawn, whereat excess exceedingly was wroth, yet note the same amend, nay yet withstand, but suffered him to pass, all were she loath, who, not regarding her displeasure, forward goeth. There the most dainty paradise on ground itself doth offer to his sober eye, in which all pleasures plenteously abound, and none does others' happiness envy. The painted flowers, the trees upshooting high, the dales for shade, the hills for breathing space, the trembling groves, the crystal running by, and that which all fair works doth most to grace, the art which all that wrought appeared in no place. One would have thought, so cunningly the rude and scorned parts were mingled with the fine, that nature had for wantonness ensued art, and that art at nature did repine. So striving each the other to undermine, each did the other's work more beautify. So differing both in wills, agreed in fine, so all agreed through sweet diversity this garden to adorn with all variety. And in the midst of all a fountain stood of richest substance that on earth might be, so pure and shiny that the silver flood through every channel running one might see. Most goodly it with curious imagery was overwrought, and shapes of naked boys, of which some seemed with lively jollity to fly about playing their wanton toys, whilst others did themselves embay in liquid with joys. And over all a purest gold was spread a trail of ivy in his native hue, for the rich metal was so colored that white who did not well advised it view would surely deem it to be ivy true. Lo, his lascivious arms adown did creep, that themselves dipping in the silver dew their fleecy flowers they tenderly did steep, which drops of crystal seemed for wantonness to weep. Infinite streams continually did well out of this fountain sweet and fair to see, the which into an ample laver fell, and shortly grew to so great quantity that, like a little lake it seemed to be, whose depth exceeded not three cubits height, that through the waves one might the bottom see, all paved beneath with jasper shining bright, that seemed the fountain in that sea did sail upright and all the margent round about was set with shady laurel trees thence to defend the sunny beams which on the billows bet and those which therein bathed moat offend as guyan happened by the same to wend two naked damsels he therein espied which therein bathing seemed to contend and wrestle wantonly ne cared to hide their dainty parts from view of any which them eyed Sometimes the one would lift the other quite above the waters, and then down again her plunge as overmastered by might, where both a while would cover and remain, and each the other from to rise restrain, the whilst their snowy limbs, as through a veil, so through the crystal waves appeared plain. Then suddenly both would themselves unhail, and damorous sweet spoils to greedy eyes reveal. As that fair star, the messenger of morn, his dewy face out of the sea doth rear, or as the Cyprian goddess, newly born of the ocean's fruitful froth, did first appear, such seemeth they, and so their yellow hair, crystalline humour, dropped down apace. Whom such, when Guyan saw, he drew him near, and somewhat can relent his earnest pace, his stubborn breast gan secret pleasance to embrace. 
The wanton maidens, him espying, stood gazing a while at his unwanted guise. Then the one herself low ducked in the flood, abashed that her a stranger did avise. But the other rather higher did arise, and her two lily paps aloft displayed, and all that might his melting heart entice to her delights she unto him berayed. The rest, hid underneath, him more desirous made. With that, the other likewise up arose, and her fair locks, which formerly were bound up in one knot, he low adown did lose, which, flowing long and thick, her clothes around, and ivory in golden mantle crown. So that fair spectacle from him was reft, yet that which reft it no less fair was found, so hid in locks and waves from lookers' theft, not but her lovely face she for his looking left. With all she laughed, and she blushed with all that blushing to her laughter gave more grace, and laughter to her blushing, as did fall. Now when they spied the knight to slack his pace, them to behold, and in his sparkling face the secret signs of kindled lust appear, their wanton merriments they did increase, and to him beckoned to approach more near, and showed him many sights that courage cold could rear. On which, when gazing him the palmer saw, he much rebuked those wandering eyes of his, and, counseled well, him forward thence did draw. Now are they come nigh to the bower of bliss, of her fond favorite so named a miss. When thus the palmer, now, sir, well of eyes, for here the end of all our travel is, here one's a crasia, whom we must surprise, else she will slip away and all our drift despise. Eftsoons they heard a most melodious sound, of all that most delight a dainty ear, such as at once might not on living ground save in this paradise be heard elsewhere. Right hard it was for white which did it hear to read what manner music that might be, for all that pleasing is to living ear was there consorted in one harmony. Birds, voices, instruments, winds, waters, all agree. The joyous birds shrouded in cheerful shade their notes unto the voice a tempered sweet. The angelical soft trembling voices made to the instruments divine respondents meet. The silver sounding instruments did meet with the bass murmur of the waters fall. The waters fall with difference discreet, now soft, now loud, unto the wind did call. The gentle warbling wind low answered to all. There, whence that music seemed heard to be, was the fair witch, herself now solacing with a new lover, whom, through sorcery and witchcraft, she from far did thither bring. There she had him now laid a slumbering in secret shade after long wanton joys, whilst round about them pleasantly did sing many fair ladies and lascivious boys, that ever mixed their song with light licentious toys. And all that while, right over him she hung, with her false eyes fast fixed in his sight, as seeking medicine when she was stung, or greedily depasturing delight, and oft inclining down with kisses light, for fear of waking him, his lips bedewed, and through his humid eyes did suck his sprite, quite molten into lust and pleasure lewd, wherewith she sighed soft, as if his case she grew. The while some one did chant this lovely lay. Ah, see, who so fair thing dost feign to see In springing flower the image of thy day. Ah, see the virgin rose, how sweetly she Doth first peep forth with bashful modesty, That fairer seems the less ye see her may. Lo, see soon after, how more bold and free Her bared bosom she doth broad display. Lo, see soon after how she fades and falls away. So passeth in the passing of a day of mortal life the leaf, the bud, the flower. Ne more doth flourish after first decay that erst was sought to deck both bed and bower of many a lady and many a paramour. Gather therefore the rose whilst yet is prime, for soon comes age that will her pride deflower. Gather the rose of love whilst yet is time, whilst loving thou mayst loved be with equal crime. 
he ceased, and then gan all the choir of birds their diverse notes to tune unto his lay, as in approvance of his pleasing words. The constant pair heard all that he did say, yet swarved not, but kept their forward way, through many covered groves and thickets close, in which they creeping did at last display that wanton lady with her lover nose, whose sleepy head she in her lap did soft dispose. Upon a bed of roses she was laid, as faint through heat, or dight to pleasant sin, and was arrayed, or rather disarrayed, all in a veil of silk and silver thin, that hid no whit her alablaster skin, but rather showed more white, if more might be, more subtle web arachne cannot spin, nor the fine nets which oft we woven see of scorched dew do not in there more lightly flee. Her snowy breast was bare to ready spoil of hungry eyes, which note therewith be filled, and yet, through languor of her late sweet toil, few drops more clear than nectar forth distilled, that like pure orient pearls adown it trilled. And her fair eyes, sweet smiling in delight, moistened their fiery beams, with which she thrilled frail hearts, yet quenched not, like starry light which, sparkling on the silent waves, does seem more bright. The young man sleeping by her seemed to be some goodly swain of honourable place, that certes it great pity was to see him his nobility so foul deface, a sweet regard and amiable grace mixed with manly sternness did appear yet sleeping in his well-proportioned face, and on his tender lips the downy hair did now but freshly spring and silken blossoms bear. His warlike arms, the idle instruments of sleeping praise, were hung upon a tree, and his brave shield, full of old monuments, was foully raced, that none the signs might see, ne for them, ne for honour carried he, ne aught that did to his advancement tend, but in lewd loves and wasteful luxury his days, his goods, his body he did spend. O oh, horrible enchantment, that him so did blend! The noble elf and careful palmer drew so nigh them, minding not but lustful game, that sudden forth they on them rushed, and threw a subtle net, which only for the same the skilful palmer formerly did frame. So held them under fast, the whiles the rest fled all away for fear of fouler shame. The fair enchantress, so unwares oppressed, tried all her arts and all her slights thence out to rest, and eke her lover strove, but all in vain, for that same net so cunningly was wound that neither guile nor force might it distrain. They took them both, and both them strongly bound in captive bands, which there they ready found. But her in chains of adamant he tied, for nothing else might keep her safe and sound, but verdant, so he hight, he soon untied, and counsel sage in steed thereof to him applied, but all those pleasant bowers and palace brave, Guyan broke down with rigor pitiless, nay aught their goodly workmanship might save them from the tempest of his wrathfulness, but that their bliss he turned to balefulness, their groves he felled, their gardens did deface, their arbors spoil, their cabinets suppress, their banquet houses burn, their buildings race, and of the fairest late now made the foulest place. Then led they her away, and eke that night they with them led, both sorrowful and sad. The way they came, the same return they write, till they arrived where they lately had charmed those wild beasts that raged with fury mad, which now awaking, fierce at them gan fly, as in their mistress rescue whom they lad. But then the palmer soon did pacify. Then Guyan asked, What meant those beasts which there did lie? Said he, these seeming beasts are men, indeed, whom this enchantress hath transformed thus, while Homer lovers, which her lusts did feed, now turned into figures hideous, according to their minds like monstrous. Sad end, quoth he, of life intemperate, and mournful meed of joys delicious. But Palmer, if it mote thee so a great, let them return it be unto their former state. Straightway he with his virtuous staff them struck, and straight of beasts they comely men became, 
Yet being men, they did unmanly look, and stared ghastly, some for inward shame, and some for wrath to see their captive dame. But one above the rest in special, that had an hog been late, I grill by name, repined greatly, and did him miscall, that had from hoggish form him brought to natural. Said Guyon, See the mind of beastly man that hath so soon forgot the excellence of his creation, when he life began, that now he chooseth with vile difference to be a beast and lack intelligence. To whom the palmer thus, the dunghill kind delights in filth and foul incontinence. Let drill be grill, and have his hoggish mind, but let us hence depart, whilst weather serves and wine. End of Canto 12. Recording by Thomas Copeland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.